CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall, bringing you, hopefully, an enjoyable shudder. Certainly, fans of the occult like the dark and dangerous tales we spin because of the vicarious enjoyment that comes from the delicious shivers of the supernatural. But let me issue a warning to all you ghost lovers. Do not, I repeat, do not ever make the mistake of thinking that ghosts are fun. Mrs. Mary Boyne and her husband did, and this tale tells what happened to them. Our mystery drama, Afterward, was adapted from the Edith Wharton classic, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Murray Burnett and stars Celeste Holm. Remember the phrase, Kilroy was here, so popular back in the days of World War II? I feel certain most of you remember, but if we go back a few years farther, how many of you recall the phrase, the little man who wasn't there? What do all these phrases have to do with our tale? Well, stretching a point, we might say that our story concerns the ghost that wasn't there, or at least not when you expected him. If this sounds confusing, let's listen to the lady whose story it is. Mary Boyne. My address is Suite 357 in a wood, Dorsetshire, England. Of course, I'm American and alone and sane. The reason I mention sanity is because they call this place a rest home, but actually it's a place for people who have money and who are supposed to be not quite right in the head. I told you I'm sane but I must confess it's difficult to understand how I managed to retain my sanity after what happened. But you be the judge and jury. I'll start at the beginning, back in America, in a little town of Waukesha, and the little house where I lived happily with Ned. Ned! You're home early! You bet. I'm not only home early, darling, but I'm home for good. I've sold the Blue Star Mine for five million dollars. Oh! Mary, Mary, oh. my love, are you all right? Oh, yes! Fine, uh-huh. darling, but, but uh, you're joking. Never, never more serious. We're finished with drudgery, darling. Finished living in this house, in this town, and don't even bother to pack. Let's oh. just make our dream come true today. Oh. I know that Americans are often impulsive, generous, and even, forgive me, sometimes a trifle foolish, but <laughs> I must. Say, Mr. and Mrs. Boyne, you are something new in my experience as a realtor. Well, is that a nice English way of saying you don't have a suitable house for us? Not at all, Mr. Boyne. Oh, please forgive my husband, Mrs. Stair, but our search for a house in England is the answer to what both he and I have always considered an impossible dream. You see, I was born in England, and I went to America as a child, and... I've always wanted to return, and now we can. Uh, Is it so strange that we want a house we ourselves can remodel and modernize? No, that's understandable. But to be so far from any means of transportation. Perhaps I should say that Ned and I are really looking for two things. To get away from our old lifestyle in America and to find our roots. Uh, Yes, I have a house that seems to be made to order for your specifications. It's been on the market for years because it needs so much remodeling and it's 14 miles from the nearest rail station. Great, great. Let me finish. It was built in the time of the Tudors. Oh. Needs a tremendous amount of modernization, particularly in the matter of heating and hot water. Sounds super to me. 
But how about a ghost, Mrs. Stair? Oh, Dorsetshire is full of ghosts. That's nice. But I did so on one of my own, you know, right on the premises. Uh, Mrs. Boyden, you shouldn't ask for anything like that. There is a traditional ghost that goes along with the house. A particularly nasty ghost. Ghosts are a rather strange one. Strange? How so? Because the history of the ghost of your house at Ling is that no one knows that they've seen the ghost until long afterward. Well, that's crazy. What in the world makes a ghost a ghost? Except for the fact that you know when you see it. It either moans or wears white shrouds or touches you with icy fingers. Now, the only thing I can tell you is that there are stories about the ghost of Ling and every single one of them is identical. The person who sees the ghost doesn't know it's a ghost until afterward. Oh, forget it, Mary. No, no, life is too short to enjoy a ghost. You've got to wait to find out if it's a real <laughs> ghost or not. No, but, th but this house at Ling seems to have so much else going for it. Darling, I think we really should take a look at it. We went, we looked, and we were conquered. Both Ned and I fell instantly in love with Ling. It was a lovely old Tudor house, just as the agent had described it. Exactly what we'd both dreamed of. And it was definitely secluded. We bought it and moved in. But although I was in seventh heaven and up to my ears in planning for remodeling the old house, there was something definitely wrong with Ned. Oh, these powders don't do a thing for my headaches. Well, the doctor said... I know what the doctor said, darling, and I followed his prescription, but I still have the headaches. Darling, mm -hmm. do you think perhaps we've made a mistake about this house? No, no, Ling is perfect. Perfect. We both knew it the moment we saw it. The gardens are a delight, and under your tender, loving care, grow more beautiful every day. Oh, with Hilton's great help. Nonsense. Oh, Hilton is a good gardener, darling, but he hasn't your green thumb. <laughs> no, no, my love. The house is perfect, and there's absolutely nothing wrong. These headaches will go away in time. So you're not going to tell me? Dear heart, there is nothing to tell. But I knew better. Something was very wrong, and I intended to find out what it was. Lydia Westlake was the village librarian and had been ever since the oldest inhabitant could remember. Well, hey, Mrs. Boyne, what a pleasure. Is there anything I can do for you? Miss Westlake, I really must apologize for not coming to see you and this lovely old library before. Oh, my dear, no apologies necessary. Everyone in town knows how busy you've been patching up, Ling. Well, that's one reason I'm here. To ask if you have any... Any books about the history of Ling? Ah, you mean about the architecture? Mm, not exactly. The whole... Well, everything. Maybe even something about the ghost. Well, I really shouldn't say this, but it's best for everyone to try to forget about the Ling ghost. Oh, believe me. Oh, I believe you, Miss Westlake, but I'm, I'm still interested in everything about Ling. Well, very well. You'll find some books on the history of Ling under G226. There were three books. I took them all and went back to Ling and started to read. Two incidents mentioned the Ling ghost, and they were absolutely horrifying. What I hadn't told the librarian was that I wanted to find out more about the ghost because of the way Ned was acting. Who the devil is it? Well, it's me, darling. I'm sorry, Mary. It's, it's just that I'm, uh... Well, I'm sorry. Have the servants been interrupting you? No, 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 no. Uh, oh, gosh, we've never kept secrets from each other. It's my consultation work with the Blue Star Mine back in the States. But why in the world should that be so disturbing? Well, there were, there were some uh, problems I, I hadn't, uh, hadn't expected. But I've never seen you like this. Is there any chance we'll have to go back to America? No, 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 no. It's nothing like that. It's just that there's a... Well, there's a troublemaker who's after me. Uh, darling, tell me how you're coming with the house and your research on the ghost. I don't want to hear anything more about that ghost. Well, why this sudden about face? I just don't, that's all. Let's make a pact. You stop worrying, and I'll stop talking about the ghost. didn't work. Oh, how I wish it had. Perhaps things would not have turned out the way they did. 
if we had left Ling and I had listened to my presentiment about the Ling ghost, Ned grew more irritable and I ever more frightened. What's the matter with those fools back in Waukesha? They can't handle the simplest matters without asking me a million questions. Ned, why don't you give up the consulting job? We don't really need it. I mean, do we? No, no, not the money, but in a way... Well, in a way, we do need it. I don't understand. Well, it's a complicated business, Mary, involving lawyers and a lot of legal matters that would only bore you. Bore me? I'd rather be bored or or sad or anything. If only I could see you more relaxed. Well, you will. You will, darling. It'll just uh, take a little time. Time for what? Well, I, uh, I have problems with the Blue Star. So, uh, look, why, why don't you bring me up to date on your ghost, huh? Oh, Ned, because I'm frightened. I read a story in one of those books I took from the library about the young wife of the son of the man who built Ling. Uh Uh-huh. And what about it? Well, it seems she had fallen madly in love with one of the men here before she met the Ling son. And... Oh, Ned, must I? Well, please, darling. It can't be all that shocking now in this day and age. Well, she... She disposed of an unwanted child and kept it a secret. Oh, Some years later, after she was happily married and had a little girl of her own, she was out strolling through these gardens one day when she met an absolutely enchanting young girl, Mm -hmm. just about her daughter's age. They all hit it off very well, and and soon the three became friends. The only thing was that they couldn't ever figure out where this enchanting child lived or who were her parents. And this began to worry the young mistress of Ling, until one day, her daughter disappeared and was never found or seen again. Well, I, uh, I don't understand. Don't you? The mother did. She had seen the ghost of Ling, her daughter's little friend. The ghost was the illegitimate child she'd killed. Only she didn't know till afterward. I'm sorry, Mary, for making you tell me that story. It's all right. There's more in those old books. There's something about a secret staircase. Oh? I should be able to locate it. You get a marvelous bird's eye view of the entire country. Well, that sounds like fun. Why don't you help me search for it? Ah, uh, can't. Uh, I have to work on my correspondence, but if and when you find it, uh, give me a shot. I'll be in the library. I set off on another exploration of Ling, but this time with a purpose. And finally... Just like a heroine in some gothic novel, I pressed a panel of the old wainscoting in one of the rooms, and it slid back, revealing a small circular flight of stairs leading up. I climbed the tiny corkscrew staircase to the roof of Ling. Oh, the book hadn't exaggerated the beauty of the view. I called excitedly down the stairs, Ned, Ned, I found it, and it's beautiful. Come up here and see. Oh, darling, this is really something. (laughs) Why, you can see for miles. How did you find it? Just followed the directions in the book. Went around pressing the paneling, and suddenly there it was. The staircase. (laughs) Just look. Of course, I know you can see farther than I can. Oh, but darling, your eyes are more beautiful. (laughs) Hello. Who's that? Who? Where? Well, can't you see that man coming towards the house? I've got to go down and see who it is. Ned! Ned! Wait for me! There you are, darling. I've been looking all over for you. Well, I've been uh, right here in the library. Oh, you dashed off that roof and went running out the front door. Who was it? Uh, who was what? The man you saw coming toward you in the garden. Oh, that man. Well, I, uh... You see, dear, I thought I saw the gardener and I ran after him to tell him about some of the drains which need tending. But, uh, you see, he disappeared before I reached him. Disappeared? Mm-hmm. But he seemed to be walking so slowly and toward the house, not away from it. Well, that's the way it seemed to me, too. But uh, I guess uh, we must have been wrong. Unless, uh, unless it could have been uh, the ghost. we all know there are no such things as ghosts, or at least some of us know. But one thing we would all 
agree upon is that if there really are ghosts, they won't go away even if you don't mention them. Institutions for the mentally ill have come a long way. They are quite beautiful and often look like an ideal retirement home. Even on the inside, where everyone wears a smile, it takes an expert to be able to see some of the anguish that lies behind the smile, like the pain that continually racks Mary Boyne. None of the staff nor the guests at Innerwood Rest Home can understand why I hate to hear the sound of the postman's whistle when he comes with the mail. They think it's because I have no one who cares enough to write to me. Well, it's true that I have no one, but the reason I dread the postman's whistle is because if it weren't for the postman and the mail and... There I am, confusing you again. But it all relates to one arrival of the mail at Lane. Oh, this is, uh, from old Joe Sitwell asking how we are, and, uh, uh this one's for you. <laughs> I'm so glad there are no letters to disturb you. What's this? Hmm? Let me see. It's a newspaper clipping. Front page article from the Waukesha Sentinel. Hmm? It says that a man named Elwell has brought a lawsuit against you. That there was something wrong about the Blue Star Mine. I haven't read it all, uh, but... Darling, uh... <sighs> You wouldn't understand more than half of it, even if you finished. Well, maybe not. But now I understand what it is that's been bothering no, you. No, it, it's really nothing, darling. Nothing? On the front page of the Sentinel? <sighs> Ned, mm. what's this all about? Oh, now, why don't we have some tea first? This lawsuit isn't new to you. No. No, of course not. I've, uh... I've known about it for some time. Of course you have, and you've been having sleepless nights and headaches for some time. What does this man accuse you of? Oh, pretty nearly everything he could dream up. Why? Why would a man do that? Oh, because he figures he can make some money. But surely he must have some reason. There must be something he thinks you've done. All right. All right, darling, I'll tell you the whole story. Mary, dear, you must know that whenever a fortune is made overnight, there are always some envious people who believe they deserve a share of the windfall. And that's exactly what Elwell thinks. Who is Elwell? I don't know that name. Well, he's a, he's a man I put in to the Blue Star. He made some money, and now he wants more. How did you put him into it? Well, he, he uh, brought me the samples to be assayed, and... Uh, well, I told you about it at the time, but I uh, didn't make a big deal out of it in case they proved to be worthless. I think I'm... Be but if everything is the way you say, and you paid him... Well, of course I paid him. Well, then why does he sue you now? Oh, well, probably because some lawyer got hold of him and talked him into it, hoping for a fat fee. Or, or maybe he thought I'd get scared. Now, Bob Elwell ought to have known me better than that. I certainly agreed with that. Anyone did business with Ned would know he wasn't the sort to be frightened of anything. But there was no question that he was worried. And I was hardly surprised when he turned to me one night and said... Charlie, have you any idea how long it's supposed to be before you know whether or not you've seen the Ling ghost? Why, no. None. Have you? No. No, of course not. It's a rather an odd question to ask me, darling, unless you think you have seen the ghost. Well, I uh, really don't know why I asked the question. It just popped into my head, and so I asked it. I know your engineer's mind, Ned. And I know how it worries and worries about a problem until you've solved it. Now, I want you to tell me something on your solemn word of honor. Promise. Okay, my word of honor. That you believe you have seen the Ling Ghost and that you're trying to keep it from me and that's what's worrying you? Cross my heart, darling. I don't think I've seen the Ling Ghost. At least, not to my knowledge, because according to the ancient tradition, one really doesn't know when he's seen the ghost. With that, I had to be satisfied. I knew my husband. There was no more to be gained from questioning him. But I thought to myself, maybe there was something to be gained from questioning the ghost. That is, if I could manage to locate the elusive spirit. Of course, I knew that you weren't supposed to be able to know you'd seen the ghost, but I was haunted by the idea of the disappearing figure we'd seen from the rooftop. 
So once again I climbed the small secret stairway and stood on the roof ledge. I cupped my hands and shouted to the sky, Oh, spirit, specter, shadow, whatever you choose to call yourself, we've done you no harm. We want to live here in peace. Oh, ghost of Ling, break with the past. Break with tradition and show yourself to me. Mary, Mary, what on earth do you think you're doing? That's obvious, isn't it, darling? Well, if you mean you're making a darn fool of yourself and, incidentally, of me, yes. Well, I'm sorry if I was stupid. It isn't stupidity, Mary. It's just this obsession of yours with a ghost. You're only adding to my worries. I don't want that. You know I don't want that. Well, then maybe, maybe we should leave Ling. Oh, but I love this house, and so do you. Well... But I think there's something else we have to do, and let's get right on with it. Ned was just trying to help me, like the staff here at Innerwood. And he thought, maybe by arranging a seance with a reputable and respected medium, might put my mind at rest. Ned thought that perhaps the medium might be able to get through and reach the ghost. Uh, Now, you both understand that as a man of integrity, I can promise you nothing? Yes, Mr. Woods, you've already made that very clear. It is difficult to overemphasize the possibility of failure. Can we start, please? Please be patient, Mrs. Boyne. All the research I have done on the ghost of Ning seems to bear out the tradition. He or she appears and only afterwards do the people realize they have made contact with the ghost. Yes, we know all that, but isn't it also true that there's never been an attempt to reach this ghost through a reputable medium? Uh, that, that is so. Well, that's why we came to you. I want to find out if there is a ghost of Ling, and if there is, you should be able to reach him. I should, but uh, as I said... Please, it... let's not go through all that again. Let's hope you will succeed. Right. Now, this is our first seance. Ah, uh, well... I'm afraid it is very much like what you have read in books and heard about. We will keep this room dimly candled it, just as it is now. And so, I ask you to join hands with me. Huh? That is it. Now, close your eyes and concentrate. On what? On the ghost. But I want... Just... Think of the ghost, Mrs. Boyne. If there is any communication, it must come through me. Is that all? Is it over now? It is over. Yes. Well, you said you might fail. I did not fail. But we didn't see or hear a thing. Did you, Ned? Oh, oh, nothing. I pierced the veil. I reached my control. Well, then what... You said you thought I was an expert. And I believe I convinced you that I am not a fake. Well, okay, but if you reach... Let me assure you that there is no spirit, no ghost, happy or unhappy, inhabiting these premises at Ling. Tell me, did you believe Mr. Woods? Well, darling, he's supposed to be the best, and he said there definitely wasn't any ghost at Ling. Hey, Hmm? something's happened to you. What? It's happened since the sale. I don't know what you're talking about. You're different. Oh, come on, Mary. Maybe something did happen at that sale. What? I mean, those drawn lines in your face have disappeared. Smiles come back into your eyes. You slept better last night. Come on, admit it. All right, all right, I admit that. But it has nothing to do with the seance. Well, then what caused the change? Well, perhaps it was a cable I received yesterday saying that I could probably expect some very good news about that Elwell suit very shortly. And it was the lawsuit that bothered you after all. Well, yes, perhaps more than I knew. Well, at any rate, we'll find out with tomorrow's mail. Has the mail come yet? No, 
No, not yet, darling. Anyway, I thought you were you were going to be all taken up with that engineer from Dorsetshire who's going to show us how to install a hot water system. Well, I'm looking forward to his visit, but I, I remember what you said about the oh, mail. Oh, oh, there's the postman now, dear. Yeah, let me beat you to it, Mary. <laughs> we'll go together. All right. Ah, here we are. Oh, air mail special from Waukesha. What does it say? Open it, open it. All right. Ah, good news, darling. You mean you've won? You've won the lawsuit? Oh, the suit's been withdrawn, so there's nothing to worry about. Then everything's all right. Oh, couldn't be righter. No, how about giving me a kiss and you go wait for that engineer? the strangest things I remember was my total sense of security as Ned held me in his arms. I left Ned and walked out into the gardens. Oh, the day was beautiful. It seemed even brighter than it actually was because of the change in Ned. As I walked along the flagstones, I, I heard footsteps behind me. I stopped and turned. I came to see Mr. Boyne. I'm Mrs. Boyne. Do you have an appointment with my husband? I think he expects me. Well, he's working on a book. So he never sees anyone in the morning. Oh. Wait. You seem tired. Have you come a long way? Yes. I have come a long way. Well, then I suppose if you'll go to the house, my husband will see you. You'll find him in the library. It's that way. I watched the stranger enter the house, and then I went to find the gardener, and soon the engineer arrived. And the morning just sped by. We'd finished with the plans for the hot water system and it was time for lunch. I went to the dining room, but Ned wasn't at the table. Nor was he in the library. I remember calling and calling and then asking the servants whether they'd seen him. But Ned was nowhere to be found. Not at the luncheon, not in the garden, not in the house. He didn't come back that afternoon. Nor was he there for dinner. By that time, I was frantic and called the police. The local police shook their heads and called in Scotland Yard. Well, now, Mrs. Bourne, I can only try to reassure you by telling you that we haven't found your husband's body. Well, that's very reassuring, Inspector. You, you're telling me my husband has just disappeared into thin air, vanished without a trace? Oh, no, ma'am. What I'm trying to say is that if there was any foul play, and in these cases sometimes there is, we usually find the body of the dead man within 48 oh. hours. So perhaps I was clumsy, uh. but I was trying to tell you that there is hope that Mr. Boyne is alive. Well, then where is he? Oh, of course, I can't answer that question for you at this time. But I promise you, Mrs. Boyne, all the resources of Scotland Yard will be employed to find him for you. I must admit, the inspector kept his word and also kept my hopes alive. The Yard kept me up to date on every development. But alas, they were so pitifully few. They did nothing to nourish my hope that my darling Ned would soon come back to me. All the resources of Scotland Yard, will they prove to be as ineffective as all the king's men and all the king's horses in putting Humpty Dumpty together again? Will they come up with some strange and sinister solution to the disappearance of Ned Boyne? I'll be back with the answers shortly. The disappearance of husbands is usually regarded by most police as a mystery with fairly obvious solutions. Most commonly, the police look for the runaway mate who's been unable to cope with a nagging wife. Or, secondarily, a woman who has decided to strike out looking for a new mate by disposing of the old one. Of course, neither of these theories was even entertained for a moment by Scotland Yard in the case of the disappearance of Ned Boyne. Ah, uh, Mrs. Boyne, we all know what a good marriage you and Mr. Boyne had. But we're momentarily at a loss. A man just doesn't vanish off the face of the earth. Not without leaving clues. Something that will help us find him. Now, if you don't mind, we'll just go back once more over the way you found out he, he was gone. 
I spent most of the morning with a Mr. Loomis, an engineer from Dorsetshire, going over some plans he had for installing a hot water system. If you don't mind, I'd like to get to the stranger who asked for your husband. Well, I've told you everything I know about him. And told it well, ma'am. A good description. Much better than we got from Nellie, the housemaid. She saw him too? Oh, yes, indeed. We even found out that he wrote his name on a card he gave her. Well, then you should know. If I may, ma'am, let me just condense the maid's testimony from my notes here. Now, she said that the gentleman was a stranger and perhaps a foreigner. He asked for Mr. Boyne, and she asked who was calling, and then he wrote his name on a piece of paper and asked her to carry it into your husband. Well, didn't you ask her what Ned, uh, my husband, said when she brought him the paper? Well, Nellie told us your husband didn't have time to say anything, because just as she handed the paper to Mr. Boyne, she realized that the stranger had followed her into the library. She left them together. If Nellie says that she left this stranger alone in the library with my husband, how can we be so sure that Ned left the house? Ah, it isn't the maid's evidence we're going by, ma'am. Hilton, the gardener, swears he saw your husband leave the house by the front door, accompanied by a gentleman. And he gives a description which pretty much tallies with yours and Nellie's. But why? Why would Ned just go off like that without a word to me or to anyone? You've already said your husband has been worried. So if you could give us some clue as to what it was that was bothering him... Well, I've told you about that lawsuit back in America. But you didn't tell us about the seance and your attempts to locate the Ling ghost. Now, surely, Inspector, you're not going to tell me that Scotland Yard is taking ghost stories seriously. Oh, no, ma'am. But if Mr. Boyne did, it might be some explanation of his erratic behavior. Are you telling me that you think my husband was mentally ill? Well, now, Mum, we need something to explain a happily married wealthy man walking off in the middle of the morning accompanied by a stranger and so far leaving no trace. Well, what about that unfinished letter you found in the library? You obviously had to do with that business in America, which you, Mum, assured us wasn't bothering your husband one bit. But he did write the word safer, didn't he? Who was Parvis? Ah, now, we've checked, and Mr. Parvis is a perfectly respectable attorney back in Waukesha. And your husband's unfinished letter simply reads, My dear Parvis, I have just received your letter announcing Elwell's death, and while I suppose there is now no farther risk of trouble, it might be safer... There. He says trouble, doesn't he? Oh, he does indeed. And you believe that trouble could be so serious as to make him disappear without a word to you about it? Or the reason for leaving? Oh, no, we just can't believe that, Mrs. Boyne. Then what do you believe? I mean, what has happened? Mrs. Boyne, has your husband ever suffered from amnesia? Never. Does he have any medical history you could tell us about? Ned was always healthy. Well, England is a hard place to get lost in, Mum. It's almost impossible for two men to slip unnoticed through or out of the country. How about just walking? Mrs. Boyne, we have every official means of investigation working, and we've found nothing. And so things remained at a stalemate for the next fortnight, despite the fact that my husband's name was headlined in every newspaper and his likeness looked down into my anguished eyes from the walls of every town and village. There was still not one single word of him and no trace of his movements. And then one morning, Nellie brought a card to me in the library with the name Edward Parvis on it, and a new hope flooded my heart. Mrs. Boyne? Mr. Parvis, from Waukesha. You're the attorney my husband wrote to. Yes, I found myself here in England, and I thought I should visit you. Oh, and... I'm so glad you did. You heard, of course, of my husband's disappearance, and I'm hoping that you've come to shed some light on it. Well, I'm afraid you're in for a disappointment, my errand is of quite a different nature. But his last unfinished letter was to you. I mean, surely... Uh, Mrs. It... Boyne, is it possible you're unaware of what went on back at Waukesha? Oh, my husband and I were very close. We had no secrets from each other. Well, I'm wondering what you mean to do about Bob Elwell's family. Bob Elwell's family? I'm completely confused. I, I don't know them. 
Uh, Mr. Parvis, you must bear with me. I do need your help. And I'm almost beginning to believe you. Well, First of all, Bob Elwell is dead. His wife's oh. a proud woman, and oh, she fought on as long as she could. It's come out now how badly off the family is, and we're taking up a fund for her. Elwell. Wait. That was the man Ned told me had helped him with the Blue Star. That's what he told you, is it? Well, it's true, isn't it? Well, it's true, and yet it's... Well, all I can say is that it was business. I don't understand at all. Bob Elwell just wasn't smart enough, let's put it that way. It's the kind of thing that happens every day in business. Mr. Parvis, I think you're trying to tell me nicely that my husband did something dishonorable. Well, I, I don't want you getting the wrong idea about Ned. He committed no crime. What exactly did he do? He, well, he went into business with Bob Elwell, and uh, Bob should have been more careful about what he signed. Why don't you come right out and say that Bob Elwell should never have trusted Ned? Well, it was Elwell's claim that he came to Ned with the first samples from the Blue Star... Uh, you see, the Blue Star had been started and then abandoned. And uh, Elwell believed there was a chance the previous owners had quit too soon. But he came to my husband with this sample. That's right. And your husband assayed. They both wanted to keep the whole thing quiet, because if there was any chance the Blue Star was still worth something, well, I don't have to tell you what that would have meant. And Ned decided that the Blue Star was still a gold mine. Right. Your husband and Elwell had to buy the Blue Star. They bought it together? They did. Elwell borrowed most of the money he put up to purchase the mine. Well, so far that all seems pretty straightforward. Uh-huh. Ned had the papers drawn up, and Elwell, well, he should have read them more carefully. Why? What did the papers say? That after Elwell had been paid back, for the money he'd invested and received a profit of 5%, the entire ownership of the Blue Star reverted to Ned. Oh, no. Well, it was business, Mrs. Boyne. Elwell didn't have to sign it. Well, evidently, his lawyers felt that there was some merit to his claim when he sued Ned recently. Well, they soon found out they didn't have a leg to stand on. But if Elwell was so badly off, where did he find the money to hire lawyers? A lot of people thought Elwell had been treated badly, and his lawyer was one of them. You mean they took the case for nothing? On a contingency basis. But when they saw they didn't have a case, they advised Elwell to withdraw the suit. Elwell became despondent and shot himself. Shot himself? He killed himself because of that? Well, he didn't kill himself exactly. He... Dragged on two months before he died. And he tried to kill himself and failed? And then tried again? No. He didn't have to try again. Well, the newspapers got hold of it, and it's all been raked up again, and this collection thing's been started. You know, most of us back in Waukesha like Bob Elwell. Here, here's an account of the whole thing from the Sentinel. Uh, maybe it would help you if you looked it over. From the headline, it would seem the Sentinel knows who's to blame. Widow of Ned Boyne's victim forced to appeal for aid. And I thought maybe you might care to... This picture! This, this picture! It says this is Robert Elwell. Yes, it is. But this is the man, the man who came for my husband. I mean, I'd know him anywhere. Mrs. Boyne, I... I don't think you're very well. Shall I call somebody? No, no, this is Robert Elwell. This is the man who spoke to me in the garden. That can't be the man. It's Robert Elwell. It was Robert Elwell who came for him. Came for Ned? Elwell was dead. You know that now, don't you? Robert Elwell came for him. Now, Mrs. Boyne, well, surely you remember your husband's unfinished letter to me. It was... Written after he'd heard of Elwell's death. Robert Elwell was the man who spoke to me. That's impossible. I think I'm mad. I'm not. I'm quite sane. Will you answer me one question, please? When did Robert Elwell try to kill himself? When? Yes, the date. Please try to remember. 
I don't think we should continue this conversation, Mrs. Bo- I have a reason for asking. I'm sure you have, but... Well, I really can't remember. I, I guess about two months before he actually died. I need the exact date. Uh, we might find it in the paper here. Uh, yes, here it is. Last October. The 20th, wasn't it? Yeah, the 20th. Then you did know about Elwell all the time. I know now. Sunday, the 20th. That was the day he came here first. Came here first? Yes. You... You saw him twice then? Yes, twice. First on the 20th of October. I remember because that was the day I first discovered the secret staircase. And we saw him from the roof. He was dressed just as he is in the picture in the newspaper. My husband saw him first. He was frightened and ran down ahead of me. But there was no one there. He had vanished. You say Elwell vanished? Yes. I see now what happened. He tried to come then, but he wasn't really dead. He couldn't reach us. He had to wait two months to die. And then he came back again. And Ned went with him. (gasps) Oh, good Lord. I sent him to Ned. I told him where to go. I sent him to this room. That's what they say about the Ling ghost. One never really knows that he's seen the ghost till afterward. Long, long afterward. All the doctors at the rest home where they're treating Mrs. Mary Boyne are convinced that she's suffering from an almost historic sense of loss and bereavement because of the inexplicable disappearance of her husband. They're also all convinced that if only they could furnish her with a satisfactory explanation of that disappearance, she would be cured. But of course, we know better. At least, we who believe know that it's the explanation rather than the disappearance that's the root of her trouble. I'll be back in a moment. And now, the shortest ghost story in the world... The long, dark, memory-filled corridors of one of the great art museums of the world just before closing time. A man hastens to the exit. He's joined by another art lover. The first man says, Hey, it's pretty spooky around here at this hour. Yes, says the second man. Do you believe in ghosts? No, says the first man. Do you? Yes, replies the second, and vanishes. Our cast included Celeste Holm, Larry Haynes, Joan Shea, Guy Sorrell, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. still resounds today. The twist of fate, we say. Bad luck, ill fortune, or it's all in the lap of the gods. Many of us believe our lives are preordained. Does man really have a chance to stop destiny? Our 
Hour Mystery Drama, All Things Are Possible, was adapted from the classic by Leo Tolstoy, especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis, and stars Paul Hecht. is now, but it could have been yesterday or the day before. When Leo Tolstoy wrote this tale, it was his today, and so we shall tell it in our today. The people have not changed, nor have their dreams, their hopes, their fears, or possibly their fate. John Agar, a young merchant who owns two haberdashery stores and his own home in northern Ohio, tells the story. I did it all on my own. I was raised in the town of Cavalier, named after the first white man to explore Ohio. Married two years ago, my wife, Virginia, has a baby. Six months old she is. The two stores are doing well. I guess I've just been lucky, that's all. Until I got that invitation... Jack, this is the second time I've called you to come to dinner. Now, it's all getting cold. I'm sorry, Jenny. I'm just looking at the mail. Hey, this looks good. What is it? Meatloaf? Uh, I didn't have a moment to myself today. Does that mean you didn't have any lunch? How's Sarah? Oh, she's been asleep since six. She just loves that little rubber duck you gave her. <laughs> I couldn't get her out of the tub. <laughs> so you didn't have any lunch, Jack? Well, how could I? Didn't even have time to look at the mail. That's what I was just doing. Hey, hey, look at this. What is it? Yeah, go on. You read it. It'll make you proud of me. I'm already proud of you. No, no, you read it. Um, on behalf of the menswear fashion industry, because of your outstanding sales record, you have been selected to represent the retail trade of the Lake Erie region at the annual menswear convention in Toledo. Isn't that nice? Nice. Nice, Ginny. It's an honor. It's a lucky break. Do you really think luck had anything to do with it? Sounds like common sense to me. Yeah, more like dollars and cents. Both our stores, Ginny, High Fashion 1 and High Fashion 2, are in great shape. How long will you be gone? Uh, a couple of days, I guess. Uh, let's see, when does it start? Friday, Friday the 13th. Hey, that's the day after tomorrow. Wow, I got a lot to do before that. Friday the 13th? You've got to be kidding. No, no, that's what it says here, this Friday. But the 13th? Oh, come on, Ginny, you're not superstitious, are you? This is almost the 21st century. We don't believe in all that uh, spook and fate stuff. Oh, I guess I don't really. It just seems strange. Oh, it's only a little trip to Toledo for a few days. What can happen? I know I'm being silly, Jack. Uh, forgive me and, and, and finish your dinner. Oh, it's only six. Go back to sleep, sweetheart. Why aren't you getting up so early? Well, I was thinking last night this would be a good chance for me to stop off and see my folks. I haven't been up that way since summer, so I've got to hurry up and get things in order at the stores and take off before lunch. You're leaving today? Yeah, well, what's the matter with you, honey? I mean, are you still asleep? I told you I was. Maybe I'll spend the night with Mom and Dad. Maybe I'll hit the road and make Toledo tonight. Gives me a little time there before the convention starts to, you know, shake a few hands, find out what's going on. Oh, Jack, don't go today. Wait till tomorrow. Why? Just don't go today, for my sake. Well, you got to give me a better reason than that. Well, uh, I had a bad dream about you. Yeah, you're afraid when I get to the big city, some, some beautiful high-fashion buyer will turn my head? Oh, I, 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 I don't know what I'm afraid of. All I know is I, I had a bad dream. Well, what was it? Well... Uh, I dreamt you came back from Toledo, and, and when you walked in the door, yeah. you were all stooped over like an old man, and, and, and your hair had turned white. <laughs> Boy, you sure dream the craziest dream. Oh. I'm going to take a shower. Uh, would, would you get down the overnight bag from the closet and stick a few shirts and socks in it Please, for me? Please, Jack. Honey, what is this? Come on, let, let go of me. I, I want to take my shower. I'm asking you, please don't drive out there today. You're crazy. I can't just change my plans because you had a nightmare. A, a dream is a dream. That's all it is. Would you let go oh, of me? Jack, you've got to listen to me. I, oh, oh. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Jenny. I, 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 look, I didn't mean to push you, but oh. no, you're really too much. 
Now, well, stop it, Ginny. I didn't hurt you. I accidentally shoved you, and uh, you just landed back on the bed. Oh, now, look what you've done. You've awakened the baby. I hated myself all that morning while I was preparing our ad campaign for the end-of-the-month sale. I I'd never done anything like that to Ginny before. I, I don't know what had come over me. When I got home at noon, I apologized, but Ginny didn't say a word. She just looked at me as if she'd never see me again. I backed out the car, headed north, and about five o'clock pulled into my folks' place. Nobody home. A note in the bottle for the milkman said they were going away for the weekend. I was so angry at myself, I drove into Cane's Falls, found a bar, and went in. Hey, John. John Agar. Over here, pal. Hi. Hey, Billy. <laughs> what are you doing in this oh, bird? Just passing through, pal. Now, ease yourself gently on one of these stools. What's yours? Oh, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, beer, I guess. Like that, too, Harry. Oh, let me see, John. When when was the last time I saw you, huh? Oh, don't tell me. I remember over Christmas and New Year's. Remember? <laughs> I, I came through Cavalier. We were pushing those nylon shirts with the button-down collars. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, thanks, Harry. Uh, thanks, well, tell me, how's the wife and the baby? Well, you got a good memory. Yeah, a salesman's got to have a good memory. That's half the job. <laughs> Besides, uh, your Virginia is one swell-looking woman. <laughs> no one could forget her. Uh, she's fine. Uh, they're both fine. Uh, baby, too. Jenny, uh, Jenny didn't want me to go to the convention. Oh, is that where you're headed? What luck! So am I! So you just ducked in here for a refresher, eh? Actually, I came this way to drop in on my folks, but uh, they're away. Oh. Well, why don't you try the hotel? There's only one in town. I mean, it's not your fancy motel type of thing, but it's good for a night. Or uh, were you going to push on for the big city? No, 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 I'm bushed. Hey, John, uh, you know, we got a new line of indoor-outdoor cold-weather shirts in suede, corduroy, flannel, plaid, you name it. I can really make you a deal. I got my samples at the hotel. Now, why don't we head back? You get yourself a room. It's just up the street here. And I'd like to show you my stuff. I couldn't shake that salesman. I got myself a room in the kind of a hotel that should have been torn down years ago. And finally, when I did get rid of Billy West, it was 11 o'clock. I tried calling Ginny, but no answer. I knew she was home all right, but she turned off the phone. So next morning, I called her about seven. Jack, is that you? Yeah, I'm in Cane's Falls, Ginny. Give my regards to your mom and dad. Uh, they're not here. I'm in a hotel. <laughs> Such a flea bag. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. Darling, I'm sorry we quarreled yesterday. I miss you. Ah, uh, don't you worry. I'm on my way out for breakfast. Uh, I'll be in Toledo by lunchtime. Uh, I'll call you tonight from there. Jack, will you take care? Of course. What do you think? Please be careful. I, I, I don't I, I don't know why I have this premonition, but I do. Uh, nothing to worry about. You'll be careful, won't you? I promise. Jack, will you say I love you? Sure. You know I love you. Always have. Always will. See you soon. Oh, I hope so. I'll pray for you. I made Toledo in a little under three hours. I checked into the Netherland where the convention was being held, hung up my other suit, left my bag on the bed. I'd unpack it later. I wondered if I should call Jenny to tell her I'd arrived safely. Then I thought, now nah, I'll call her tonight. And then there was someone at the door. Uh, just, just a moment. Mr. John Agar. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's, that's me. Detective Brennan, Toledo Police. May I come in? Uh, sure. Uh, is, uh, is there anything the matter? Hey, you got a policeman standing out there. He'll wait in the hall for me. Now, Mr. Agar, did you spend last night at the Keynes Falls Hotel? Yes, I did. Which room did you occupy? Uh, I was on the first floor at the end of the hall by, by the fire escape. I... I think it was the only one they had. Do you know who occupied the room next to you? No, no, I didn't know anybody there. Are you sure? Now, please be careful in your answer. This is a serious matter. I want the truth. Oh, uh, wait. Yeah, I, I did meet a salesman I knew, uh, Mr. West, uh, Billy West, earlier in the day. We had some dinner, 
And then I went to his room uh, to see some men's apparel he was selling. But I didn't see him after that. He must have been asleep when I checked out. What time was that? Oh, uh, about 8. 8 o'clock this morning. I, I packed, had breakfast, and then I came back up to my room to pick up my bag and my suit. Do you always check out that early? Well, I wanted to get an early start. Say, uh, what is all this? We had some information wired to us that you spent quite some time yesterday in a bar and later at the hotel with Mr. West. Yeah, I did. I'm, I'm not denying that, but uh, why, why all these questions? If I were a thief or I don't know what. Uh, look, I'm here in Toledo for the convention. Uh, Billy will be showing up here, too. I'm afraid not, Mr. Agar. Mr. West was found this morning in his hotel room with his throat cut. Good Lord. That's awful. I, uh, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to look through your bag. Sure. Sure, go right ahead. I haven't unpacked it yet. Uh, here, it's just not locked. Uh, I'll open it for you. I don't know what you're looking for. Well, help yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. What's this? What? It, it's it, a, a knife. I, I I never saw that before. It, there appear to be some fresh stains on it. Maybe blood. Well, and on the handkerchief wrapped around the handle. I, 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 I don't understand. It, my suitcase... I had better warn you, Mr. Agar, that anything you say may be held in evidence against you. But in spe I, I just don't understand what, what a knife would be doing in my bag. I'd like you to accompany us to police headquarters. Uh, this, is, this is like a nightmare. I... I'm dreaming all this. I've got to be. It's like a nightmare. It is truly happening to you. You remember we introduced today's mystery drama with a few words about the power of fate? Now we ask, what web is being spun around our young husband? What's in store for him? We shall find out whether the black ace of spades is in the cards for John Agar when I return shortly with Act Two. Men at some times are masters of their fates, writes the great dramatist. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. But is this true? Young up-and-coming John Agar, a guest of honor at a business convention, has been suddenly held for questioning on suspicion of murder. How could this be young John's fault? A knife, perhaps bloodied, perhaps a murder weapon, has been found in his luggage. What happens now? I was locked up. The blood on the knife was that of poor Billy West's. Why would anybody want to kill him? Why would I want to kill him? They told me I could make one telephone call, and so I called Virginia at home. She left our baby with a neighbor and arrived at the jail a day later. Oh, my darling, Jack. You look so ill. Well, I haven't slept for two nights. I called Harold Baker to ask him to take the case, but Shirley says he went on a hunting trip and won't be back for three weeks. Well, i got to have a lawyer... Uh, how about old Mr. Simmons? I thought of him and I called, but he's retired. He doesn't do any more legal work. Perhaps the Hammonds know someone. You've forgotten, darling. The Hammonds moved to Cleveland. Oh, yeah. What am I going to do? i I, I got to have someone to hear my side of it. What do you mean, your side of it, Jack? This is a murder case. Out and out murder. It's not a parking violation. It's murder, honey. Well, is it true what they told me? It, it was Billy West? It's all circumstantial. Somebody killed him and put the knife in my bag. Why implicate me? I don't know. Hey, wait a minute. I, I, I didn't know you knew him. Well, he stayed at the house, don't you remember? We put him up for a few days over New Year's. I, I clean forgot. You forgot we had our biggest quarrel about him? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess it was all so unpleasant, I, I just put it out of my mind. You were very nasty. And it, it didn't mean a thing. No, I don't know. You don't like to find your wife kissing a shirt salesman in the kitchen. It was under the mistletoe, Jack. It wasn't anything. Yeah, yeah. It comes back to me now. I knew you shouldn't have gone a day early to that convention. I had a feeling. And last night, I had that dream again. You all bent over with white hair. I'd forgotten all about Billy West and you. Isn't that something? 
Jack, I have to know. Uh, did you... Did you... Uh, did I kill him? Ginny, is that what you were going to say? No, 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 no. I think I you'd better go now. The guard's looking oh. at his watch anyway. My visiting time is probably up. Well, what are you going to do about a lawyer? I guess the court will appoint someone. That's what they usually do when you don't have your own. Goodbye, Ginny. Take care, Sarah. Y you... You want me to go now? Well, it's no use in you staying on in Toledo. Better go back home. Don't you want me here for the trial and everything? You, well, no, no. I, I'd rather you were... I'd rather you were home with a baby. Oh, I'm sorry about what I said, Jack. I, I didn't mean it. No, no. You didn't mean it. That's exactly what you said when I found you and him in the kitchen. I wish you wouldn't bring that up again. I'd had too much wine. That's all it was. Yeah. Take care, Jenny. Oh, I hate to leave you here like this. Well, there's nothing much you can do. Say a prayer, maybe. The next weeks were a jumble of events. Drunks in the cell next to me and visits from a very young, pink-faced lawyer the court had appointed. He was very nervous. Mine was his first big case. I'll get you off with life, he said. I think that's the best we can hope for. But I'm innocent, I told him. Somebody planted that knife on me. And they found out your wife was having an affair with Billy West. Used to go visit him in Cincinnati. But, but that's not possible. That's not true. Ask her. Uh, they've got witnesses, he says. They've built up an awfully strong case against you. But a man doesn't murder for those reasons. Not me. Life is sacred to me. Murder is a sin against the Almighty. John Agar, you have been found guilty of murder in the first degree. You are hereby sentenced to life imprisonment in the Ohio State Penitentiary. Don't ask me what years in a prison are like to a lifer. I couldn't tell you. Ten years... 3,600 days, each day compacted against the last, just like garbage and just as worthless. Ginny came to see me on visiting days less and less. An appeal was made by the same young attorney, but refused. The case was closed, and I was closed along with it, to be forgotten. Fifteen years in the pen... Then 20. Hey, Grandpa. I want to talk to you. <laughs> Grandpa, he calls me. I was 45. I looked 70. I got a message for you. You have? You got a daughter called Sarah. She's 21. Yes? My old lady knows it. She knows Sarah's mother, too. Used to, used to be your old lady. Name's Virginia, huh? Yes. Who are you? My name's Red. Like the color of my nose. <laughs> Before I got bald, I had red hair, see? <laughs> You're new here, huh? I've been here six months. What are you in for? Twenty years, they think. Listen, uh, the message I got is that your old lady is sick, like to die. If you got any drag with a warden, maybe he'll let you out to see her. Ginny? Ginny is dying? I pass it along for what it's worth. I do you a favor, Grandpa? Maybe someday you'll do me one, huh? I didn't know if I wanted to see Ginny again. I didn't know if she wanted to see me. Like I did every night, I prayed to God. For over 20 years, I'd been believing in him, asking him to find the real murderer and set me free. But what could I do, Lord, about Ginny? The next day I knew... The warden gave me a week of liberty. Who? Who is it? Ginny? It's, uh... It's me. John. Ah. Uh, w what are you doing here? Are, are you out of prison? Ginny. How, how are you? I can't see you so well. Um, my eyes went bad on me. Come, come closer. 
Am I dreaming? No, no, Ginny. It's it's me. They, they let me out to come visit you. It, it, it's just like that dream. Your your hair is white, like snow. It's been a long time since you came to the jail to see me. A long, long time. I got married again, Jack. My husband ran out on me. But but I still got Sarah. She comes around. I I thought maybe I'd go see her. She she must be all grown up by now. She's married. They have a baby. I wish I could see him. You can't, Jack. She wouldn't understand her father was in prison. Why did you tell her? That you were dead. Dead? <laughs> well, you weren't far wrong. I, I thought it was for the best, Jack. Yeah. Do you still think I killed Billy West? I never really believed that. I don't know why I said it. Why did you stop coming to see me? My husband wouldn't let me. Oh, Jack. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Your voice is just the same. But you don't look the same. I'm not the same, Ginny. Do you forgive me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. It was hard for me when you stopped coming to see me, stopped bringing Sarah, but... I understand. Oh, that's good. Stay stay beside me and, and, and uh, keep talking. I'll, I'll just, I'll just close my eyes. I'm so, so tired. Oh, your hair is so white. Now, now, you lie quiet. Don't you strain yourself. Now, let me see uh, what to tell you. Hey, I was talking to a fellow the other day, and he told me that our state flower, the Ohio state flower, is a red carnation. Now, huh. isn't that a pretty flower? Ah, oh, I love carnation. Yeah. They, they, uh, they, they, they smell like cinnamon. And best of all, I, I bet you can't guess this one, Ginny. What's our motto? Ah, uh, motto. Yeah, the motto of Ohio. With God, all things are possible. Heh, how about that? Do you hear me, Ginny? Maybe your husband will come back if you believe that. All things are possible. Ginny? Ginny? Oh, Ginny. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. My Ginny was no more. I sat there for a long time, and then I got up and went back to my prison. Half my life I'd been locked up, paying for someone else's crime. That night before going to bed, I prayed again to God and asked Him what was the meaning of my wasted life? What was I here on earth? To do. In the morning, I remembered I'd been dreaming of sitting in my own house in Cavalier, in the kitchen, eating meatloaf with Ginny and baby Sarah laughing to herself in her crib. The prison was getting more crowded by now, so they moved me into another cell. Well, look who's come to share my sweet grandpa himself. Hello, Red. This is my bed. That's yours. Ah, thanks. Hey, uh, I heard about your wife. My old lady came yesterday and told me. I'm uh, sorry. That's bad luck. Hey, you want a piece of chocolate cake? My old lady baked it. No, no. Thanks, Red. Sure, I, I get you. You don't feel much like celebrating. But I tell you something, Grandpa, I'm celebrating. Just because I got 20 years hanging on me don't mean I aim to be here that long. <laughs> You're going to help me. What do you want? I want out. 
Oh, you take. Yeah, they all do. But I'm really innocent. Yes, but I'm not the man to persuade. You should have convinced the jury. Look, I mean, the money was mine by rights. I was cheated out of it. I only stole it to get it back. You got 20 years for that? If you're a three-time loser. Yeah. I'd done other things which nobody knows about. Anyway, I won't be here that long. Why do you tell me? I need your help, Grandpa. What can I do? Look, watch this. I lift off my mattress. I take apart the frame. You see? I put this together. And there you are. A shovel. I work in the laundry, see? And there's a place in the back where no one comes. I've been digging my way out. Every day I fill up my pockets and shoes with the dirt I dig out. And I dump it in the yard when no one's looking. I've been making me a tunnel. And it's pretty long already. They'll catch you. No, they won't. Because, see, I got you. And I trust you. But I'm not going to help you. Oh, yes, you are, Grandpa, just by keeping quiet. That's all the help I want. You, uh, you won't want to cross me. A shovel ain't the only thing I make out of a bed. Look at this. Feel that edge. It's a nice, sharp shiv. Me and Knives are old friends. I'd done other things which nobody knows about. Yep, yeah, that was what he said. All the while I was trying to pray that night, I could hear those words. It was a man just like this, quick to use a knife, who could have killed Billy West. God wouldn't turn his back on me like that. Make me share a tiny cell with the same man who had choked off my freedom and my life. They say fortune and fate share the same wheel and are born and die in the same bed. John Agar, who for two dozen years has served time for someone else, now suspects the man in the cell with him is the very man who wronged him. If it is so, if it is not so, we shall find out when I return shortly with Act Three. For many years, John Agar took comfort in the certain knowledge that God was his friend, his protector. He believed with all the sincerity of his soul that somehow, somewhere, in his early days, he must have sinned sufficiently for God to take away his freedom. But surely by now, he's been punished enough. Why now is he being tortured so with these horrible suspicions? It affects his days, it haunts his nights. Uh, oh, let, let me go. Let me go. Uh, I, I don't know anything about it. It's not mine. Hey. It's not mine. Hey. Uh, somebody put it there. Hey. What's uh, the matter, Grandpa? Where am I? Oh, wake up. Where am I? Oh. Oh. It's you. It's you. Hey. You ain't been sleeping too good since you moved in with me. That's nothing. That's nothing. It's a dream. That's all a bad dream. Yeah, like what? I... I don't know. What I... do you mean you don't know? You've just been screaming your head off. Yeah. I live here too, you know. Yeah, they were... I was being held for something. Something I didn't do. So what was the something? My... My wife. Jenny, Virginia. My wife, I... You know, I was in a hotel where I'd been before a, a, a long time ago. And I opened the door and she was lying there. Dead. Killed. They said I did it. Somebody, Listen, Grandpa. And, and my daughter, Sarah, she she was a, a grown-up woman, and, and she looked at me and ran away. Grandpa, your trouble is you got too much conscience. Oh, what time is it? Listen to me. I know all about what they say, about how you killed someone. I heard about that. And how you say you didn't. Okay, take it from me. Don't let it get to you. You'll get stir-crazy. Huh? Oh, the time. Still dark. Now, how about you and me trying to catch some more sleep? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry I woke you, Red. 
Oh, you didn't wake me. I've been lying here thinking, planning. <laughs> They'll never catch me again. You don't think a person ought to pay for their crimes? No, I don't. Do you think you should have spent most of your life here in a pen? There could only be one reason. I must have deserved it. It was God's will. Ah, God's will, nothing. I made my plans without him. Listen. I told my old lady to sell out and move to this old hotel and I know about. To take a room under another name and I'd meet her there. It's a crummy old joint in Cain's Falls. I was there years ago. Did, did, did you say Cain's Falls? Yeah. Nobody will ever look for me there. He was there years ago. How can I go on taking all of this? The old hotel in Cain's Falls. This red is, is like an albatross around the neck of the ancient mariner. Release me, Lord, from this. Every day, when Red went out to the laundry to dig more of his tunnel, I would pray that he'd get caught. I've been watching you, Grandpa. I don't think you like me. I try not to think of you at all. It's better for me if I don't. You're not getting any ideas, are you? Ideas? I wouldn't want to interfere with your lifespan, as the saying goes. You don't frighten me, Red. There's nothing you can do to me anymore. Ah, don't get wise with me, old man. Look, I'm making you an offer. When that tunnel is through, you can take off with me. Is that fair? But if you talk so much as a whisper, you wake up one morning with your throat cut. I have no wish to escape. And you have no need to kill me. You killed me long ago. As for informing on you, maybe I will. Maybe I won't. As God tells me. You asked to see me, Warden. Yes, I did, John. Thank you for waiting. <laughs> One of the accomplishments of prisoners, Warden. I'm going to put my problem to you right away. After lockup last night, when everyone was returned to his cell... One of the guards discovered a tunnel being dug out of the laundry. Now, every inmate has been questioned. No one, not a single prisoner, knows a thing. Of course, it's not possible that this could have been done without someone's knowledge. Why are you telling me all this, Wharton? Because every single prisoner questioned has put on a blank face and denied any knowledge of who dug that tunnel. And I can only mean whoever it was has so intimidated those who share his secret that they won't talk. Well, how can you ask me then to inform if this man is violent? Oh, John, I've known you for 25 years. You were already here serving time when I became warden. I know you have a sense of truth and honor. Every time your name has come up for clemency, you know I've gone to bat for you. Yes, I know that, warden. I... I cannot repay you. But one day, God will. I ask you, John, before the Almighty, will you tell me who dug that tunnel? Why was I being put to this trial? Supposing I told the warden what I knew, and they put Red into solitary. Well, that would be justice. Why should I protect the man who ruined my life? Solitary confinement for him is nothing compared to what I've suffered. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm putting two and two together and making five. And even if Red did murder Billy West, paying him back now, what good would it do to me? A week went by. John, have you changed your mind? Warden, I can't be the judge. What do you mean? It isn't given to me to judge someone else or even to accuse him. Are you sure the man you're protecting is worthy of your protection? Please, Wharton, don't ask any more of me, I beg you. 
Well, the only conclusion I can draw is that you were an accomplice. And as an accomplice, I have no alternative but to place you in solitary. What? Me? In solitary? <laughs> Good Lord. I am still being punished for him. It's mad. Punished for who, John? <laughs> mad. It's mad. What is it? I... I can't tell you. It isn't God's will that I should be the instrument. It is not for me to tell. Do what you like with me, Warden. I am in your hands. They told me you... You wouldn't rat to the Warden. Red. Do you mind if I just... If I just don't talk to you anymore. The words seem to stick in my throat. I... Yeah, what's the use? Listen, I look at you sitting on that bed and I ask myself, why? Oh, so you guessed, huh? Now, I know. Oh, why don't those guards come? Every minute in this cage with you is terrible for me. I'm being torn apart. Oh, Grand boy. I, 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 John, forgive me. Me? Forgive you? Yes, forgive me. It was me in that hotel and the case. No. No, I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear. No, no, you, you, you got it. You, you, you're my priest. This is my confession. Tell it to someone else, for God's sake. I gotta tell you. No. Look, see, I got up the fire escape in the night, and I, I found a door unlocked. And when I was leaving, the man woke up. He saw me. I, I had to cut his throat. And, and then I went next door. Your door was open, too. And I was going to rob you, but I heard a noise, and I, I hit my knife oh. with a handkerchief. I'd held it with in your bag, and I ducked out the fire escape. You, you, you never woke up. I knew it. I felt it all along. It was you. I, I could have killed you, but I let you live. You? <laughs> you let me live? Look, Grandpa, forgive me. What do you care if I forgive you? What good is that to you? Look, John, I'm on my knees to you. Forgive me. But I'll, I'll tell the warden. I'll, I'll go and tell him it was me who killed that man on the hotel, and they'll release you. You'll be free, and you can go home. Oh, yeah, where would I go? Huh? To who? 25 years. My wife is dead. My daughter believes I'm dead. I have For nowhere God to go. God's sake, forgive me. I will not. I cannot. God will forgive you. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe I'm a hundred times worse than you. No! I... God! God! I want to talk to the warden! God! myself telling Red it was not up to me to judge or forgive him, and I can feel what I felt as I was saying those words. I was stepping out of my house on a warm, sunny day, and Ginny was waving to me from the doorstep. It was a beautiful day to walk to work. Here in this cell, I felt a lightness and a happiness. All the confinement of years in this prison was lifted from my shoulders, and I could breathe. It was intoxicating. So many, many times had I longed for the chance to walk out of here a free man. But the lightness and happiness now was upon me. I didn't need to leave my cell anymore. I prayed. If indeed, with God, all things are possible for him to release me. Leo Tolstoy, who gave us that enduring classic, War and Peace, ends his story this way. The man we have called Red, the criminal, confessed his guilt. The order came through for the reprieve of the man they called Grandpa, when the warden himself came to the cell, he found that death had stolen the march. John Agar had received his reward, eternal deliverance. I'll be back shortly. A few words about that 
that genius Leo Tolstoy, whose story, God Sees the Truth But Waits, inspired our dramatization. One of Tolstoy's beliefs, one that is reflected in many of his works, is that death is the glorious completion of life, that fear of death is a superstition, that belief in God is inevitable, and the hand fate deals you is always for the best. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Martha Greenhouse, Ian Martin, and William Griffiths. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Washington Monday night announced Israel will accept an immediate ceasefire in southern Lebanon, provided the Palestine Liberation Organization agrees to put down its arms also. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. The statement says Israeli Defense Minister Ezer Weizmann met with the UN Peacekeeping Force commander in the Middle East and expressed Israel's readiness to stop fighting. The embassy said Weizmann also expressed Israeli willingness to permit villagers in southern Lebanon to return to their homes. But in Washington, CBS News diplomatic correspondent Marvin Kalb reports an Israeli pullout from Lebanon is apparently dependent on replacement by either a U.N. force or a beefed-up Christian Lebanese force or a combination of the two. The announcement comes on the eve of Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin's talks in Washington with President Carter. More news in a moment. All week long, feeling strong, the best is yet to come. Weekends were made for special friends. Weekends were made for you and me. Weekends were made for special friends. Weekends were made for Nickelodeon. If you're a once-in-a-while Michelob drinker, you know how special it tastes. Why not let it be special more often? Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. An armed man who'd been demanding that police supply him with narcotics surrendered Monday night after holding two women hostages, including his ex-wife, inside a California bank at gunpoint. The incident, which lasted seven and a half hours, took place at a Wells Fargo bank in Santa Clara. Police Captain Lauren Pierce told CBS News the incident ended peacefully. The suspect surrendered himself about an hour ago. And um, after a long negotiation, he just put his hands on top of his head and walked out the front door. Uh, all hostages uh, have been freed. Uh, no one was injured. There was a third hostage all of the time hiding upstairs in the bank, and uh, she concealed herself uh, until uh, the suspect surrendered, and uh, we found her upstairs unharmed. Police said the man, identified as 27-year-old Robert Foster, fired as many as 15 shells from his shotgun during the ordeal. They also said he was given a quantity of morphine about an hour before he surrendered. An 18-inch military shell exploded in a mobile home in Riley, Kansas, Monday night, killing two people and injuring five others. Neighbors said a 14-year-old boy, one of those killed, apparently discovered the shell near the home, brought it inside, and dropped it on the floor. Federal authorities have brought criminal charges against two officials of international telephone and Telegraph. Fred Graham in Washington has details. Edward Garrity, a senior vice president of ITT, and Robert Barellas, an ITT public relations man, were accused of six felony counts of perjury, obstruction of government proceedings, and making false statements during their Senate testimony about ITT's activities in Chile. It was 
five years ago today that the men testified, and the statute of limitations would have run out today, but the Justice Department got in under the wire by filing information, the legal equivalent of grand jury indictments, charging that the two corporate officials lied when they swore that ITT had no part in financing the CIA's unsuccessful efforts to prevent the election of Marxist candidate Salvador Allende as president of Chile. The Justice Department issued a statement that no charges will be brought against Harold Janine, the chairman of ITT's board of directors, who also testified and had been a target of a grand jury investigation into possible perjury. Fred Graham, CBS News, at the Justice Department. The Senate on Monday defeated two attempts by opponents to add crippling amendments to the main Panama Canal Treaty, but the lawmakers have not been able to work out a timetable for a final vote. The Joint Economic Committee of Congress Monday said the lawmakers should seriously consider a $33 billion reduction in Social Security taxes this year, half of it for individuals and half for corporations. It was only late last year Congress approved huge new increases in the retirement tax, but now, faced with mounting pressure from taxpayers, many lawmakers are ready to moderate those increases. This is Doug Poling, CBS News. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. There is a land of the living and a land of the dead... And the bridge is love. Love is the only survival, the only meaning. Yes, in the end, only love remains. Only love can prove and validate our existence. Therefore, we can say, where there was love, there was no death. Our mystery drama... It's Hard to Be Rich was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Lloyd Batista. It's a seedy, sagging, down-at-the-heels building. It even looks tired. Well, it should. It's at least a hundred years old. It was built originally as a mammoth showplace, as a sumptuous, luxurious townhouse of a self-made, freshly minted millionaire. But all that was part of a distant past, in another world, during a different incarnation. It has long since been converted into apartments. I suppose flats would be a more descriptive term. There is no longer even the slightest hint of style or grace. And obviously, the people who live there cannot afford anything better. I heard you the first time. Are you the superintendent? A joint like this don't have no superintendent. I'm the janitor. Oh, the rental office sent me. Oh, uh, that's uh, for 2G, huh? The vacant apartment. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one flight of stairs in the back. It's all right. Up the stairs. We don't have no elevator. That's all right. Okay. Let's go. You, uh, you want to watch your step in the dark. There's a light bulb halfway up, but it, uh, it burned out. <laughs> I forgot to put in a new one. It's all right. Yeah, with you, everything's all right, huh? What do you do? I'm a writer. Uh, yes, she is. 2G. Step into the parlor, said the spider to the fly. <laughs> yeah, this is it. You got your bedroom in there, the kitchen's over there, and that way's the bathroom. You don't like the furniture, you can buy your own. I'll take it. You ain't even looked at it. It's all right. So, uh, you're a writer, huh? Uh, what do you write? Uh, should I ever heard of you? Hey, what's your name? Brooks. Stephen Brooks. Uh, don't ring a bell. What do you write? Books, movies, TV? No. Well, you gotta write something if you're a writer. I beg your pardon. I was just asking, what do you write? Essays. Oh, yeah? yeah. <laughs> you know, I always wanted to be a writer. Oh, 
some of the stories I could tell you. <laughs> you uh, why'd you want to live in a hole like this? It's... It's really quite nice. Yeah, well, to each their own. When do you want to move in? When? Oh, today, I suppose, if it's ready. Pal, she's as ready as she'll ever be. Yes? Hello. I'm Hilda. Yes. Hilda. Hugo's wife. Hugo? Hugo, the superintendent. Oh. You must be Mr. Brooks, the new tenant. Yes. Would you want me to come in a couple of three times a week and clean the place up? You know, vacuum the rug in here, mop the floors in the kitchen and bathroom, the windows, and so forth. <laughs> if you think it, maybe you can get somebody cheaper someplace else, good luck. But I, I'm in the same building. You, you don't have to pay me car fare. <laughs> well, uh, yes, yes, I suppose it might be a good idea. Let me start right now. The place is all messed up. Why, why don't you stop by tomorrow? Funny duck. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Upstairs in 2G. Oh, him. <laughs> Something's wrong uh, here. Pass me some more of that spaghetti. That's what packs the lard on you. Then why do you make it? Because a sensible person eats a sensible amount. Mm. Why do you think 2G's a funny duck? Huh? You're changing the subject. Well, you brought it up. What's he doing here? What do you mean, what's he doing here? He's living here. But why here? Why in a place like this? The price is right. Come on, Hugo. This is a guy with dough. Yeah. Who told you? He told me. Well... Yeah. What did he tell you? This is a guy that went to one of them big Ivy League colleges. Yeah. A guy that spends a fortune on clothes. What did you do? Ask him? I never said a word. And what made him volunteer this kind of information? He didn't know he was telling it to me. Yeah? What was he doing? Talking in his sleep? I ring the bell. He opens the door. He says, yes. That's all he says. Just. Yes. And right off, I had him cold. Yeah. I heard that, yes, before. Where? Where I used to work, upstairs made at the Pembertons. They're the old money, the real old money. They've been millionaires for hundreds of years. All the people that would come there, they were all cut out of the same cloth. That's how they'd all say, yes, with that little whistle at the end. You know what would be great with a spaghetti? Wine. And the way they say, oh, is if they're chewing on it and don't want to ever let go. Hey, Hilda, what are you building here? And they never, ever give you a direct order. Like they won't say, come here tomorrow. They say, why don't you stop by tomorrow? Yeah, well, that's great. Now leave us have some red wine. This guy is loaded, Hugo. How do you know? Did you count his money? The suit he's wearing. You know what it goes for? That wool's imported from Scotland. Of course, you've seen the price tag. Hey, uh, what do we got for dessert? The shoes. Did you see the shoes? Always look at the shoes. That's the tip-off. I seen shoes. I polish shoes like them at Pemberton's. They're referred to as boots. They come from England. What happened to that cake I bought last night? So just by looking at this guy without saying one single word... I can vouch for the fact he's rich. How do you know he didn't steal the clothes? He's rich, Hugo. Yeah. Did you look at his hands? Those are the kind of soft white hands that never done a day's work. This is a society guy. If the cake's gone, I'll take ice cream. This is real society. Old line, old time society. You know what I mean? Okay, okay. So what? You're not curious? Listen, maybe you got some pie? And he's wearing a watch. Yeah, yeah, I seen the watch. How much do you think that watch is worth? Oh, fifty thousand dollars. Not fifty, but I seen watches like that before, and they go two, three grand. Yeah, very good. It's just like you said, the guy's loaded. Hugo, why would a man in his position want to live here? Well, it's a free country, ain't it? But what's here? I can see there ain't gonna be no dessert. Well, at least we're going to have some coffee. Why in this crummy neighborhood? The neighborhood ain't that bad. For him. 
And why does he want that dark, dingy little apartment? Look, so long as he pays the rent and behaves himself, who cares? Uh, who's that right in the middle of dinner? Well, why don't you answer it? Yeah. Oh, it's uh, Mr. Brooks. Good evening, Mr. Brooks. Won't you please come in? I... I don't wish to disturb anyone. That's what we're here for, Mr. Brooks, to be disturbed. Ain't that so, Hugo? Yeah, I guess you could say that. Uh, uh could I, uh, offer you a, a cup of coffee, Mr. Brooks? Mr. Brooks? Who is playing the piano? The piano? Well, ain't nobody playing a piano in this place. Nobody in any of the apartments has a piano. But someone is playing. Uh, I don't mind. It's just I don't particularly care for the melody. Mr. Brooks, I don't see how it's possible. It's a dinky little melody at best. I suppose she has the right to practice it. She? Well, the touch is surely that of a woman. But I do find it very loud from time to time. Well, somebody's playing the TV or the radio too loud. Uh, this is not the radio or the TV. Someone is practicing. Well, I don't know who that could be. <laughs> Perhaps you might be kind enough to come upstairs and listen for yourself. Right here in this room. It's very loud and quite clear. Do you hear something, Hilda? No. Nah. Me neither. She's evidently stopped. Well, she does that from time to time for several minutes... And then she resumes. Well, it can't be coming from in the house. Maybe somebody was down in the street and they was playing a radio very loud. I'm sorry I disturbed you. It's okay. Let us hope this is the end of it. It happens to be my most unfavorite melody. Good night, Mr. Brooks. Yeah, good night. Ah, there it goes again. What's that, Mr. Brooks? The music. The music? What music? Well, listen. There, don't you recognize it? That's for Elise. Are you sure? I don't hear anything. <laughs> how can you not hear anything? Hugo, do you hear? Just a second. Uh, how, how can you not hear? Well, it's certainly clear enough. Loud enough. Hugo, did you hear? Obviously, someone next door is practicing. But there isn't anybody next door who could... Uh, listen... You hear it, don't you, Hugo? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, sure, I hear it. Hugo. And don't you think it's rather loud? Yeah, yeah, I guess it is. Well, I don't wish to be unreasonable. Yeah, but... sure, well, Mr. Brooks, I understand. I I can take care of it right away. <laughs> you want to come on, Hilda? Yeah, I'd better. Uh, thank you, Hugo. Oh, it was my pleasure. Let's go, Hilda. Um, good night, Mr. Brooks. Hey, Hugo. Don't say nothing. There was no music. Okay. What do you mean, okay? You're right. There was no music. He's standing there. He says, you hear the music, Hugo? And you say, yeah, I hear it. I tell the truth, and so I'm the one that looks like a nut. Who asked you to tell the truth? But there's no music. Nobody's playing the piano. But he hears it. How can he hear it? He thinks he hears it. Then he has to be crazy. Hugo you got to do something. What do you want me to do? I don't know. But I, I'm scared. Scared of what? I don't know that either. Well, look, honey, it takes all kinds. And he looks harmless. And so we have, we might say, an eccentric gentleman who hears music that is not audible to anybody else. Does that mean a weakness in his sense of perception or theirs? Of course, we all hear a different drummer. Yes, a different drum. But we didn't say anything about a different piano. We shall have a great deal more to say when Act Two arrives shortly. It is not given to all of us to hear all the sounds of music, says the philosopher. Some are deaf to the melody of the wind, the song of the rain, the ballad of the ocean, the rhythm of the rippling seas of grain. True. But what about a piano in the next apartment? 
Yes. It's me, Hilda. You said to come back and clean today. Oh, well, um... It won't take long. I'll get this place ship shape in no time. Look, uh, you want me to do some shopping for you? Uh, shopping? Well, lots of times men don't like to shop for food, you know. Oh. Unless you want to eat all your meals out. Although that could be expensive, you know what I mean? Well, i got to get started. Do the rug in here first. Wait. What's that? W would you like to turn that off, please? Is something the matter? And there she goes again. There who goes again? Where is it coming from? Uh, uh, did your husband speak to her? Uh, I, uh, He um, should. Uh... Mr. Brooks, you say you hear someone playing a piano. I certainly do. It's coming from the next apartment. There is no next apartment. Mr. Brooks, that wall over there that you're looking at, there's no apartment on the other side of it. It's just the stairway and the hall. I don't wish to make a nuisance of myself, Hilda. But surely, surely we may reach some accommodation. I, I've been unable to work. I... I cannot concentrate. Well, I'm sorry. I came but... here to get away from everything. Do you understand? <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you, Mr. Brooks, is that there is no... I must do this vitally important work. It was necessary for me to isolate from all distractions, and so I found this place where no one knows me, where no one who does know me would ever look. Do you understand? Yeah, sure. It's difficult work. It will affect the entire course of my future life. But every time I sit down and begin to work, there's that... that... music again. Music. If someone chooses to practice an hour a day, or, or even two, perhaps three, but to play continuously... Mr. Brooks, all I'm trying to tell you is that there's no place that music could be covered. My from. dear lady, it is coming from the next apartment. If you want to look for yourself, you'll see that it's like I told you. There's no apartment on that side. And the only other two apartments on the floor here, they don't have pianos. Ah. Ah, and now we have a brief respite. And so I shall sit down to my work again. But... Just as I immerse myself, she will begin again. Hilda, I I'm afraid I must insist. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll uh, talk to Hugo about well, it. Could you do that right now, please? Yeah. I'll be back right away. Oh, this is absolutely impossible. She must be made to stop. Really, it's gone too far. Would you please allow people to know just a little bit of peace now and then? He's hearing that thing again. Yeah? You better go up there, Hugo. After supper. I don't think it can wait. What's the difference when I go up? What am I going to do about it? I don't know. It bothers me, Hugo. Some people see things, and then you got some people that hear things. What's the big deal? Hugo, I'm scared. That guy's harmless. Would you please go up there? If he hears music, he don't need me. He needs them guys in our white coats. Please come in, Hugo. Now then, who has been in my apartment... I, I don't know what you mean, Mr. Brooks. Well, I should think it's obvious. Not to me. Well, late this afternoon, I went out for a walk. I wandered about for an hour or two. And when I came back, I knew someone had been in here. Well, I don't see how anybody could have been in uh, here. lady, there was a definite odor of Bersus. Yeah? It's a very distinctive French perfume. I know it quite well. Who has been in here? Nobody. I know I didn't give the key to nobody. And yet, what can you say about the perfume? How did it get in here? How? Do you dismiss the evidence of your own nose? Surely you will admit that Persus has a most unique aroma. Well, yeah, if you say so. Oh, Hugo, 
I simply must be allowed to do my work in peace. Now, what with some woman playing a piano next door... But I don't... And with some other woman making free to enter my apartment and leave behind her the distracting fragrance of Bersus. Mr. Brooks, you know, it could be... Uh, maybe you ain't feeling well. What are you saying, Hugo? Oh, don't get me wrong. It's just, uh, you could be under the weather. No. This impossible woman. There she goes again. Hugo, put an end to it now. I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, you say it's coming from the other side of that wall? Well, it's obvious. <laughs> you want to step this way just a second? What for? Well, I got to show you something. It won't take a second. Yes. Well, if you just come out here. Well, we uh, we've been trying, me and Hilda, to convince you that past this wall here is nothing, no other apartment. You can see now. Well, then where is that coming from? Where is what coming from? Very well, Hugo. That will be all. I shall take the matter to the building management office. Oh, now, you don't want to know nothing like that, Mr. Brooks. No, you leave me no alternative. I make a legitimate complaint. And you react by casting doubt on my sanity. Oh, look, Mr. Brooks, if you say you hear a piano and, uh, and, and, and I don't, uh, well, I'm the one who could be crazy as far as that goes. Now, there must be a room. A hidden room. A secret room. Yeah, sure, sure, that makes sense. Well, there's no other possibility. You're saying there's a dame in a secret hidden room and she's playing a piano? Obviously. Okay. So that's your answer. I guess we solved that one, huh? Yeah, but what do you intend to do about it? Yeah. All right. Uh, here's what's going to happen. I, um, I'll write up a report to the manager, you know. I'll give him the full details and then he's got the ball and he'll have to run with it. But meanwhile, that woman is driving me mad. We've well, got to admit, Mr. Brooks, we're doing the best we can. Uh, all right. Why, why don't you go inside and relax? Take it from me. Everything's going to be okay. Good night. Good night. Oh, stop it. Stop it. You needn't shout. Well, I'm sorry. My nerves are... Are, are what? Well, I've had a very difficult time. So have I. But I... Who... Who are you? I'm Jenny. What are you doing here? I live here. Oh, but... I may ask, who are you? And what are you doing in my suite? Your suite? Oh, yes. Daddy actually had them build a suite for each of the children. I have a bedroom, a sitting room, and a music studio. Do you like it? I don't see you. Now, how did you get in here? Versus. You're wearing Versus. Do you like it? It's the very latest perfume from Paris. Very expensive. That's why Daddy bought it. I must be. No, I am. I'm dreaming. You must tell me how you managed to get in here. Are you a thief? Well, no, I... I just rented the apartment. I can't follow a word you say. But you have very nice brown eyes. Oh, what would Daddy say if he knew there was a man up here? He'd probably have Higgins thrash you within an inch of your life. Higgins? Oh, Higgins is a mountain of a man. He fought in the ring. Yes, he lost to John L. Sullivan. But surely there's no disgrace in that. Your father employs a man who fought against John L. Sullivan? Of course. Oh, that's impossible. Why? Well, because that would be every bit of... A hundred years ago. Oh, my goodness. What are you saying? It was last Christmas. Who are you? I told you. I'm Jenny. Jenny Cartwright. J.J.'s daughter. J.J. Cartwright? J.J. Cartwright? You've never heard of J.J. Cartwright? J.J. Cartwright? That, that name is familiar. It should be. Daddy owns half of New York. Ah, Cartwright. Cartwright. 
He was one of those millionaires who were made by the Civil War. He, he sold goods to both sides. <laughs> well, as Daddy always says, business is business. Uh, and he built a magnificent mansion on... Wait. Downtown. Everybody knows that. This... This is the old Cartwright Mansion. Oh, no. This is the new Cartwright Mansion. I like you. You say the most extravagant things. Oh, you better go now. Go? I think I hear Daddy coming. But... Besides, I should be practicing. Jenny? Jenny, where... Where are you? Where did you go? You're gonna what? I'm gonna report this thing to Mr. Freeman. He'll think you're a nut. Tenants complain, you send it on to the manager. But the manager only disregards it. Okay, leave him disregarded. This way I'm covered. So he claims there's a secret room. Yeah. So... What more do you need to prove he's a nut? Well, there could be a secret room. Wait a minute. What'd you say? I said there could be a secret room. Oh, we could have another nut growing here. Well, you know what this place was first. Yeah, I know what it was. The old Cartwright Mansion. So? So? There's all kind of walls and passageways. Where? Well, it's all been bricked up, sealed off. Yeah. Who knows what this place must have looked like? How it's been changed around? There could be a secret room. It's my fault. I put you on this diet. It's good for your heart, but it's bad for your head. Oh, come on. All I'm saying is there could be a secret room. All right. And inside is a lady that's playing the piano. Well, that ain't too far off. Old J.J. Cartwright, he had a daughter. She was going to be a piano player. Uh-huh. She was going to give concerts. But in them days, you, you didn't have this uh, women's lib. So ladies didn't do things in public, you know what I mean? You're off again. He should have been a writer if you go. Th this, this daughter of his, she, she was murdered. Yeah? By who? Well, they don't know by who. She was found murdered in the room. They figure maybe some prowler did it. I figure something else. Maybe it was a boyfriend. It don't matter now, does it? I'm only bringing the whole thing up to prove that there could have been a secret room. And inside is a lady who's been dead maybe 80, 90 years, and she's playing the piano. No, I didn't say that. This, Mr. Brooks, I told you before... He scares me. And I told you he's just a harmless nut. Well, if I didn't tell you before, Hugo, I should have. There's no such thing as a harmless oh, nut. Oh, Hilda. You never know. Hey, hey, where are you going? Hugo, I'm going to settle this thing once and for all. And when a woman gets that certain tone in her voice, respect it and believe her. Our friend Hilda is one of those smart, no-nonsense ladies who always manages to move right into the heart of the matter. Yet, what is there she can say to Mr. Stephen Brooks? We know he's a hard man to convince. But wait, who said she's going to see Mr. Brooks? For further developments, we await Act 3. As far as some women are concerned, you play with fire when you arouse their passions. With others, you handle dynamite when you pique their curiosity. In either case, your meddling may be fatal. For didn't the Roman philosopher say, a woman walks through life on two legs. One is called curiosity, the other is called passion. Yes, that's exactly what he said. Hello there, O'Malley. Well, it's Hilda. I see you're on foot these days. Well, they took us out of the cars. Get close to the people, they said. Walking's good for you, Officer O'Malley. If I'd wanted to walk, I'd have joined the post office. Maybe I can get you off the beach. Oh, this is worth listening to. We have a fellow rented a flat. Name of Brooks. Stephen Brooks. Is he wanted for something? Something like what? He's rich. Well, then why should he rent a flat down here? That's what you should be investigating. He's... 
nuts. <laughs> if we arrested every nut in the city, the streets would be deserted. <laughs> Stephen Brooks talks like a legitimate swell, wears clothes that cost a fortune, has a watch worth two, three thousand. Why does he come here? Is he hiding, running away? From what? If I were pounding a beat and wanted to make detective, I'd look around and ask around, maybe find out. Uh, Stephen Brooks, you say his name is, eh? Huh? Mm-hmm. Well, perhaps this does bear a little looking into. Here, wrapped up in this handkerchief. What is it? I swiped it from the kitchen. It's a glass with his fingerprints on it. Oh, well, no. So, do you want to get started, or do you expect me to do all your work for you? I meant to ask, did you ever send that thing into the manager about Mr. Brooks? Yeah. And? And he tore it up and said the guy's a nut. We established that already. Although I noticed the last couple of days we haven't heard from him. Yeah, that's right. No complaints either. You uh, been up there to clean? I rang the bell a couple of times. He won't let me in. Why not? He says he's too busy. I knock on the door, and while I'm waiting, I listen. He seems to be talking to somebody. Yeah, to himself. No, to somebody. To a woman. I think her name is Jenny. What does he say? I can't make it out exactly. Ah. Uh-huh. But it proves he's crazy. Oh, just because he talks to himself? In an ordinary guy, maybe. But he's a writer. What does that have to do with it? Maybe he's writing, uh, you know, speeches, and he's saying them out loud. Sure. Look, as long as he don't bother nobody. Okay. Oh, it's you again. I, I'm trying to work. At what? At my book, and, and your piano playing it. It disturbs me. Something should disturb you. What did you say? I read what you've been writing. And... Yes. And? It's too... placid. Placid? To begin, you have no original ideas of your own. So you pick at the writings of other men. Well, that's criticism. But criticism should also have an original insight. Poor Stephen. Why do you say, poor Stephen? You could also say, poor Jenny. But why? We're so alike, you and I. In what way? We're children of the very rich, both of us. Nobody considers our problems. What problems? Everyone worries about the children of the poor. Well, shouldn't they? Of course. But meanwhile, what about us? It isn't easy to be born rich. You never know. What do you never know? Stop pretending, Stephen. You never know anything. Your friends. Do you have them because of your money? Or or because of you? And it's the same with love. Don't say it isn't. Well? But the worst part is if you want to do something. Be somebody on your own. Other people have to work for it. You don't. Daddy buys it. Daddy invites people to hear me play. Do you know who has listened to me? Mr. Tchaikovsky, Mr. Rubenstein, Mr. Verdi, Mr. Offenbach. And what did they say? They all smiled. And they all said, very good. Well? But were they thinking of how much money Daddy gives to orchestras and operas and concert halls and conservatories? But they liked you. I don't know. I think my playing is... is like your writing. Uh, I don't understand. It doesn't have anything underneath. Well, I don't know about you, but but I'm good. Are you? Yes. We don't have it. What don't we have? I mean, look look at me. Look at me. I'm talking to... I think I'm talking. I delude myself into believing I'm talking to a girl who died long before I was born. You are now as sane as you have ever been in your life. Jenny Cartwright, spoiled daughter of a millionaire of the last century. You are standing in my house, in my room. Oh, no. Do you know what your house has become? A tenement. Do you know what your rooms are? A miserable little flat. In your eyes. 
You know that you need inspiration and motivation to write, so you come here to pretend. To pretend you're poor, starving. But it doesn't help. It won't work. I'll show you. I'll show everybody. I was waiting for someone like you. Someone who is like me. Someone who has also deluded himself. We can help each other. Help me close the piano, and I'll help you forget your pens and paper. You think I can't write? I'll show you. I'll prove something to you. Well, come in, Officer O'Malley. Hey, thank you. Have you any news of our friend? Yes, considerable news. He comes from a fabulously wealthy family. I knew that all along. They are at present living in England, although they do maintain establishments in New York, Palm Springs, and Paris. Uh, Rome, too, I believe. Carry on, Officer O'Malley. He was married, was your Mr. Brooks. Ah. But she is dead. Murdered. Oh. Yes. This is the news. She was alone in the townhouse in London. Jenny, her name was. Beautiful girl. Scarcely 30. How was she murdered? She was beaten. Ah, by whom? Well, that's not known. Suspicion falls upon her husband. Stephen? Why? Well, they'd been known to be arguing very serious arguments, too. About what? According to the servants, uh, about his writing. What kind of arguments could they have been? Well, according to the testimony, uh, arguments about the... uh, uh, quality of his work. Quality? It seems she didn't think much of it. Oh. And that's why he killed oh, her? Uh, we must not say he killed her. But if everyone thinks... You still need evidence. Besides, the man had an alibi. All these murderers always have alibis. Now, Hilda, all murderers do not always have alibis. And a man is innocent until he's proven guilty. <laughs> Jenny, Jenny. Yes? Stop that for a while and come here. Why? I want you to read this. I already have. You have? Yes. And? It isn't really good. There's nothing to it. You can't say that it isn't any good. It has a certain charm. Well? And one or two ideas. So? Perhaps it's even good. There you are. You just reversed yourself. Good for an amateur. Good for a gentleman who who dabbles in literature. Poor Stephen. You're the spoiled little rich boy again. You think you can buy anything, even talent, even genius. I'll make it happen to me. You'll end up mad, the way I did. Already, you're closing yourself away in a room, the way I did. Save yourself, Stephen. I can't. It's too late. It's never too late. It is for me. I... I committed murder. No. Yes. She looked at me the way you're looking at me. She doubted me the way you're doubting me. Stephen, you can still save yourself. Oh, save myself for what? For life. You're talking the way she talked. Let me help you. Oh, the way she wanted to help me. To smother me with kindness. To drown me in pity. Oh, oh, keep away from me. Life has so much that's sweet. That's wonderful. Not for me. Stephen. That's enough. Listen. I said be quiet. I won't let you throw away your... I'll make you shut up. Oh, Stephen. I said shut up. Open up! Open up in there! Mr. Brooks! Mr. Brooks, are you okay? Sounds like they fought the Battle of the Bulge in there. Come on now, open up! What's going on in here? Mr. Brooks, what was all that noise for? I... I killed her. Killed who? Can't you see? I don't see anything. Hold it. Uh, Who did you kill, Mr. Brooks? Jenny, I... I killed Jenny. Yeah? You did? But I don't see any. I killed Jenny because... Because she foolishly destroyed the last shreds of my illusions. What's that mean? You were saying, Mr. Brooks. I've written it all down. I was too weak. Too cowardly. Too spoiled to face the truth. Why did I have to? Why did she not allow me to pursue my delusions to the end? 
Why did she insist on my facing the truth? I killed her. I killed her because she unloosed the terrible rage I have inside me. I guess I'll have to ask you to come down to the station house. But, but listen. She isn't dead. She isn't? I guess you'll want to notify the cops in London. Don't you hear? Can't you hear? Either you can hear or you can't. These old, old houses that have undergone so many metamorphoses, yet something always remains. We never completely leave a place where we have lived and loved. A part of us will always remain. A memory, a spirit, an essence. And I'm not leaving you for long either. I shall return shortly. murder did Stephen Brooks confess? It doesn't matter. He'll receive the same punishment. Ambition is a terrible master. It can devil us day and night. There is never surcease nor respite. The flame of ambition must constantly be fed. It demands unending sacrifice. And so, first, we destroy our loved ones. And in the end, we destroy ourselves. Which proves what? It isn't all that easy to be rich, either. Our cast included Lloyd Batista, Martha Greenhouse, Jada Rowland, and William Griffiths. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant... Dreams? It might occur to you that uh, since I live so much in the world of the macabre, I could become jaded. Nothing could be further from the truth. For the deeper I delve into Satanism, the occult, the mystical history of the past, the more I realize how little I know, how much is yet to be revealed. An example, this tale, a quiet and unassuming one, but filled with such brooding and haunting terror that I'm sure you will share it with me. Our mystery drama, Never in This World, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Alexander Scorby. According to legend, if a man walked with his shins about a church, he would walk right into the arms of the devil. The word withershins is of Gaelic derivation and means to walk contrary to the path of the sun or counterclockwise. 
This is the story of an American of Scottish background who, on an idle fancy, challenged the legend at the beginning of this century and stirred up old ghosts from two centuries before. Oh, there it is. There you are now. All right, Mr. Blodgett, you and Martha handle the bags. Yep, yeah, I'll take care of that, Miss Campbell. Now, take my arm, David, and step down carefully. Oh, don't be foolish, Lucy. I can manage by myself. After the siege you've been through right at death's door? <laughs> I only had the influenza. That was months ago. Followed by what amounted to a nervous breakdown. That's why we're up here again. Dr. Chambers is an old fuss pot. Oh, nervous breakdown. Just plain debilitation, dehydration. But no matter, no matter. I'm, I'm grateful to him just the same. Oh, smell that good New Hampshire air. Never mind smelling it. Feel it. Chilly as always. You get right in the house. In good time, in good time. First of all, a little walk. I think I'll uh, stroll on down and see how Ephraim weathered last winter. But that's, that's nearly a mile's walk. Oh, just a stroll. Now I'm back in the country. It's good to stretch my legs after being pent up these last years in the city. You walk slowly, you hear? And be sure to be back here for dinner on time. You know I don't like to be kept waiting. Yes, dear, I know. Married 24 years to a good woman. No doubt about Lucy being that. She reminds me of it often enough. A placid, uneventful life. Successful business. One child, the delight of my life. The rest of it, floating along in a rut like an autumn leaf on the muddy waters in a wheel track. Fifty-ish, fat-ish, and feeblish after my first brush with death. Yes, I found I didn't have to be told to walk slowly. I had to. On my way to see my old friend, the Reverend Ephraim Bean. I'm coming! Come in! And behold, I come quickly. Revelations chapter 22, verse 11, I believe. <laughs> the right Reverend Ephraim Bean at your service. <laughs> Don't tell me I've changed that much. I'm bless my soul, my sight is getting to be a caution. Now, where are my spectacles? Uh, try your forehead. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. David Campbell by Toffet. Is it not? It is indeed. Well, come in, come in, come in, man. Oh, hey, I see. You look in the pink. Sit you down, and I'll refresh you with a glass of cider. And and you must tell me all. Uh, not much to tell. A long bout with influenza. Ah, uh, tis a plague on the whole country this year. Uh, here now. You'll uh, have a glass. It looks just the ticket. <laughs> Tell me about your illness. The influenza epidemic this year, the good Lord knows, has been widespread and virulent. Virulent enough in my case. I'd like to have carried me off. But for some some last moment's strength, I gathered somewhere and so got my reprieve. Oh, tell me, when when was its onset? The day after New Year's. Good heavens. Mm -hmm. And it's lasted all the way now into August? Well... The germ itself was brought under control months ago and finally washed from my system. But a curious aftermath, a, a kind of disease, or if you want, unease of the mind afflicted me. The medical term of choice, I suppose, would be a nervous breakdown. Well, my good friend, I'm glad you returned. We must shake these shadows from the corner of your soul. Uh, if they still persist... Well, I put as good a face on it as I can, but... Yes, Ephraim, they do persist. But something even more than that. Something, some inner voice called me back here. Eh? Hey, for what? I don't know. Sh shall I tell you what haunts and tortures me? And why I was so glad that Lisbeth was not to come... Because I don't know whether it is for good or evil. I only know it must be. Remember Isaiah. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. No, that, that, that's not what I said. Not in so many words. But look deep in your heart, David, and ask yourself if somewhere, somehow, 
The thought is not there. Walking back from the Reverend Beans on that early August afternoon, I thought long and deeply, trying to find with his suggested key some door to unlock my long depression. But neither then nor on succeeding walks, longer and longer as I grew stronger, could I find an answer to the strange call which tugged at me but gave me no intimation which way to follow and find the answer. But where do you go on these long rambles of yours? Oh, nowhere in particular. I just like to walk, to listen to the drowse of the bees and feel the wind in my face. The wind. Oh, yes, first thing we know, you'll be back with the influenza again if you don't stop exposing yourself to the chill. I doubt it. That's past. You're still determined to go off on this jaunt today? Well, yes. Now I feel strong enough. I've always wanted to go back up to the Devil's Glen. Oh, so many happy times there with Lisbeth when she was a child. Well, you have your lunch all packed up that Martha made for you. Yes, Lucy. Now, don't dilly-dally till too late. Martha says her rheumatism is acting up, and that means a thunderstorm is on the way. It was a glorious Sunday afternoon. And after lunching at the Devil's Glen and basking a while in happy, old memories, I was tempted to walk just a little farther up a trail I'd never taken before. I followed the stream a little, and then the trail bent into the woods. All of a sudden, I broke from the trees into a clearing, in the center of which stood the ruins of an old church and a weed-covered graveyard beside it. After pottering around, reading some of the weathered headstones, this cursed whim struck me. I'd not been to church that morning, and on an impulse, as if obeying some order from beyond imagining, before heading for home, I was driven to circle the church twice with the shins perhaps recalling some ancient dare as a boy that I'd refused to take because of legend. No danger befell me, except that I was suddenly swept by a wave of exhaustion. With a sigh, I, I sat on a little bench, stretching out my legs, and I found that my feet were resting on the edge of a flat tombstone. I could barely make out the legend. Jose Ribeiro. These bones lie here in an alien land. The life struck down by mine own hand. With heavy-lidded eyes, I tried to trace the date etched in Roman numerals. But a great crack across the stone obscured some of the characters. And besides, by that time, I, I found myself asleep. Dear Jose, I cannot. Never. You, you must. You love me. I love you. But we, we are of different faith. To the devil with faith and church. I will still make you mine. You never can. Never in this world. Then in the next. If I cannot have you alive, no one shall. Dios, forgive me for what I do. Oh, oh no. No, don't, don't. No, it's too late. It's not you. That God of neither faith will ever forgive. No, my... I was literally galvanized awake by a bolt of lightning which must have hit the tree. It was dark. And the thunder continued to grumble menacingly, so with what wits were left to me, I fled the dream and the storm and ran pell-mell for home. <laughs> Letting myself in, I could hear my wife hectoring poor Martha in the kitchen about something. Gratefully, I stole upstairs, leaving my dripping greatcoat in the hall. I shut my bedroom door behind me, locking it with some strange reflex. I found a match not too wet to strike and fired.
fumbled with cold fingers to light the lamp. I trimmed the wick, and I put the chimney back. Then I turned up the lamp and checked my pocket watch. Still time for dinner. At least Lucy could not complain of that. Now, holding the lamp, I crossed to the mirror and... God in heaven! Who was that? That dark, fierce, lean and saturnine face of a stranger whose eyes burned into mine as he looked back at me from the mirror. Who indeed... Dark, lean, certainly not the reflection of red-haired, melancholy, but gentle David Campbell. Who else, then? And why? And how? Can a childish superstition about rounding a church the wrong way really raise up the devil? I'll return shortly with Act Two. As fascinated as a moth might be, held by the lamp he holds in his hand, David Campbell is transfixed by the reflection in the mirror. The reflection of a man he has never seen before, who differs from him in every respect. Dark brown eyes for blue, a great beaked nose for his straight one, dark curling hair instead of the familiar soft straight reddish hair already receding from his brow. Other things, too, he is conscious of. Clothes hang loosely on him, too short in the sleeve length, and the elastic bands on his trousers stretch to the breaking point to accommodate his extra height. But far more than the physical shock is the profound terror of finding himself someone other than himself. David? David, are you in there? David, why have you locked this door? Why indeed, Lucy. Only thank God I did. Time. Precious time to figure out... What? What What am I going to say? What can I say? Really, David, this is too mortifying of you. You must be in there. Why don't you answer? I'm, I'm not feeling myself right now. Let me in. I want to help. The only way you can help is... Oh, all right, I, I'll let you in if you do something for me first. What? Now, please, don't think I'm being unreasonable. It's terribly important. I'm pushing a key under the door. You see it? Yes. It's the key to the old roll-top desk in my study. I want you to open it on the left-hand side, the first row of pigeonholes. Pull them to you, and they'll slide out. There's a secret compartment there. Inside it is a letter. Get the letter and bring it back to me here. But I don't... Uh, please, do as I ask. There's no other way. No other way for what? When you bring it back, you'll see. Or maybe by some miracle all this won't be necessary. It took some more urging, but finally Lucy left on her errand. For myself, I returned, hoping against hope, to the mirror. No question. To outward view and sound, I was a different man. But that different man was only a prison which still held David Campbell. The inner man was still the same. But how to convince anyone else of that? David, David, I'm back. Yes, Lucy, did you find it? There's no stamp. Instead... Two Cupid hearts drawn by pen with an arrow piercing them together, right? Yes, when I was young and foolish, I used to do that. One heart has the letters LCM in it, the other DMC. Of course, but David, this is absurd. We both know... But nobody else knows about this letter. I hope not. It begins... David, I know you want to, but I'm tired of waiting for you to ask me. If we are to be in love, why shouldn't we be married? If you won't ask me, I'll ask you. David, hush. Martha might hear. Really? These family secrets shouldn't be spoken out loud. They have to be. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to... to, to... David, I can't stand this nonsense anymore. Open this door immediately or I'll have to send for a doctor. Very well. Only... Only wait. Just a moment. 
Before you come in. Oh, do stop it. Open the door. Come in, Lucy. Oh. Well, well, turn up the lamp, David. I can, I can scarcely see. That's quite deliberate on my part. Come in. And close the door. Oh, very well. Now, would you mind telling me what all this fiddle-faddle is about? Keys, secret drawers, old letters? A matter of proof. I want to be sure you know who I am. What's... What's the matter with your voice? Have you caught cold in the rain? I might say I've caught a devil by the tail. Or perhaps the other way around. I think I'd better get the doctor. I think you'd better wait first. For what? For what I'm about to show you. When I turn up the lamp, just remember that I am David as I turn up the lamp and let you see. David, no, no, no. Who, who? Oh, no, David, what... What can I say? I don't know. Whatever you feel would be best. Talk to me as honestly as you can. But... Well, really, how can I? Why not? Because I... Because now that you face the actuality... <sighs> you're not sure, are you? You're not sure it's me. Well, how can you blame me? I mean... Hold, don't, don't leave this room. Stay where you are. Don't you dare make a move toward me or I'll scream the house down. We're not alone, you know. Your brother George and his friends are all downstairs. And Mr. Blodgett, the Look, gamekeeper, with a gun... it's all right, Lucy. I don't blame you for being scared and very brave at the same time. But the lies are not necessary. They're not lies. The house is full of... Besides us, there is only poor old Martha... My brother George has been dead for five years. Blodgett runs the general goods store and lives well over half a mile from us. And I am no stranger, no matter how I look. I'm your husband of 24 years. 25 come this November 23rd, no matter how I look. Oh, what are we going, what are we going to do? Now, darling, don't worry too much about me. Some way we'll find a way to straighten things out. I'm not worried about you. Somehow you brought this on yourself. I mean, what are we going to do, Elizabeth and I? What, what on earth can we say to people? How can we live this down? I think there are more serious problems here to be considered first. I'm not capable of solving them. You need a doctor or a... Or, or perhaps a minister... I'm going to make up the spare room where you can sleep tonight, whoever or whatever you are. Then I'll bring your dinner up to you. And tomorrow, first thing tomorrow, I'm going to the Reverend Bean and tell him everything. Maybe he can make heads or tails of it. I can't. Lucy spoke about you suffering some sort of change that... Oh. Oh, I... Uh, bless my soul. Yes, 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 indeed. You do find me changed, oh, then? Oh, without a doubt. I'm rather sorry. I thought to bring my spectacles for once. I... Do you recognize me by any chance? Uh, not while I wear these. They, uh, I, I think I shall remove them, and the shock will be less profound, David. Then you, you do believe I am David? I am a man of faith. But my looks, my, my voice... A shock. I admit, when seeing all too clearly. Yes, David, I... I accept you for who you are. But how can you? Because you ask me to. Tell me, how have you suffered this change? I could feel the sting of tears behind my stranger's eyes at the simple kindness of this good man's faith and his friendly trust. I told him what little I could of my walk that day of my discovering the ruined church, of my sudden weariness, my sitting by the grave of the man named Jose Ribeiro, my falling asleep, and the waking to the lightning striking the tree. And all the while I told him, the hope in my heart was sinking slowly, 
As I watched the expression on that open face, too ingenuous to hide any emotion or thought. Jose Ribeiro? Yes. Never heard of him or any such family here. You don't believe me after all. Did I say that? You didn't have to. I believe the transformation. I believe that no matter how you look or sound, you are my dear friend, David Campbell. Now, other things are something else again. What other things? I've lived here all my life in Tamilworth, man and boy. I know this country like the back of my hand. I've no doubt no one knows it better, Ephraim. But just... Just what are you getting at? The church, ruined or otherwise, the clearing in the forest, the graveyard. A man named Jose Ribeiro. I tell you this solemnly, since I know every tree and trace of all that area. David, my old friend, there simply is no such place. Would any protestation of mine sway him from that stand? And I must admit, he had shaken me. There was no recourse. I must return there and see for myself. Easier decided than accomplished. These days, Lucy watched me like a hawk. And of course, I dared not show myself in front of Martha, to whom I would be an unexplained stranger in the house. But finally, a day came. David, I... What's the matter, Lucy? Nothing. I... It's just so so difficult to call you by name when looking at you, I cannot recognize the man I married. And yet... What? Come to the light a moment. Yes. I do believe... I think perhaps you're starting to change back. Oh, don't hope too much. I suppose it's just an illusion that I'm growing used to. No, no, no. I, I will never get used to it. No, I, I have to go marketing. Don't leave the room. Martha is in the house. Just don't lock me in. I can't stand that. Give me the key. Promise you won't do anything foolish. That I can promise with all my heart. As soon as I saw Silas Blodgett drive Lucy off, I stole down the stairs past Martha, busy in the kitchen, and fled down the street. By the time I reached the Devil's Glen, it was late afternoon. A hazy day with the sun trying to burn through a low cloud cover. I hastened up the path I remembered, holding my breath. And suddenly, there I was, back in the familiar clearing. The ruined church, the graveyard, the shade tree part blackened by the lightning bolt that had hit it. The tortured, broken tombstone twisted with the huge crack beside the seat I had sat in. Only one thing was different as I approached. On the seat, still as death, leaning on a stick as though waiting, was the figure of a woman whose pose suggested incredible age, but at one and the same moment, a timeless beauty. Her head was shrouded in a veil, so this was only an impression as I approached her. Uh, am I intruding? Of course not. I hope you will forgive me, but I've been ill and I, I... I would like to sit down. May I join you? Need you ask? <laughs> sit, my darling, by me. It is so long that I've waited for you, but I knew that somehow... At the last, you would come back. Fantasy or reality? An actual meeting in an actual place? Or some strange fixation of the mind? And if so, on whose part? David? Or the woman who turns, casting the veil aside, a face that is at once as lovely as it is ancient. A woman who, with eyes half shut, might appear to the beholder, as she does to David, the loveliest and most desirable thing in the world. I'll return shortly with Act Three.
the sun suddenly drops behind the horizon. And in the half-light of twilight, the age is washed away from the woman's face. Her gray eyes, fastened on David, are wide and shining with love. But to him, lovely as it is, it is a stranger's face. Search his memory as he will, he cannot remember ever having seen it before. Although the voice stirs some vagrant chord of memory. You know me? How can you ask such a question, Jose? No, uh, my name is not Jose. Not yet, perhaps, but it will be. You, you think I look like someone you once knew? I know you do. But looks are unimportant. I know you are. You called me Jose, the man you think I am. Do you mean Jose Ribeiro? I mean Jose Ribeiro. The man who's buried in this grave? Who says he took his life with his own hand? Who took his life with his own hand, but who is no longer in that grave. Where is he then? Sitting beside me on this bench. Me? The living image. But only an image. Not the man, the being himself. Not yet. It takes time. No, you don't understand. I'm not the way I look. I'm someone else. My name is David Campbell. I don't look this way at all. If you don't want to look yourself, that can happen too. In time. Oh, it all takes time. But the moon is not yet at the full, and I cannot stay any longer. No, no, wait, wait. There are so many questions I need to ask you. You mean David Campbell is the one who wants to ask the question? Of course, that's who I am. This other, this Jose Rivera, I, I can't read the date on his tombstone, but he must have died a long time ago. Long. And not so long. Two hundred years, to be exact. And he looked like me? Me as I am now? You could be one and the same. How can you be so sure? Because we loved. Because I should have been his wife. Uh, what? But, but that means that you... You have to be. I must go now. It's almost dark. I can tell you more, if you wish. As much as you can comprehend. Come to tea. Thursday, but not before twilight. Past the church, take the path to the left, down to the waterfall. It's the second house, white clapboard. You can't miss it. It's almost underneath the waterfall itself. Oh, wait a minute. I, I don't even know your name. Teach you to remember all. Prudence. Remember. Prudence. Penny Packer. Till Thursday. conscious that the night was pitch black. Flecks of light floated behind my eyes as they might when closing the lids after watching a shooting star. A sudden idea crossed my mind, but in the dark, it wasn't feasible. Besides, I would be in enough bad odor with Lucy being late to dinner as it was. It could wait till Thursday. I was convinced I knew the answer anyway to that one question. The others I could hardly wait to pose. I thought I had enough problems on my hands. I didn't reckon on the others that were about to rise. I just can't stand it any longer, David. If you are, David, going on with this charade, so I've made all the arrangements... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. What charade? What do you mean? I can't make up any more lies or half-truths or excuses about you. Martha can't understand why, if you're ill, she can't bring a tray up to you. Cy Blodgett and the others in the village can't imagine, if you don't need a doctor, why you stay cooped up. Oh, I could go on and on, but I don't intend to. 
I've spent the day packing us up. We're going back to Boston to take you to Dr. Chambers or whoever he recommends and get you the treatment you need. I'm not leaving here before the end of the week. You go to Boston and get a good look at the world you think is turned right side up. Then come back. I have a feeling that within the week I'll know where the future lies. Or if there is any at all for me. Oh, really, Reverend Bean? You, you didn't have to have me over for meals all the time like this. Uh, the idea was for your housekeeper to drop them off at my place. Well, she did. A couple of times. But it's easier this way and provides me companionship. Besides... I had to see you today in order to write a shocking piece of information I gave you. Oh, about what? Your ruined church and graveyard. Huh? Yeah, I... I've been searching through our church records. Unfortunately, very scanty and full of gaps. But I find I was wrong. There was indeed a church, and I have no doubt a graveyard, on or about just such a site as you mentioned. How I could ever have missed its ruins myself, well, I... Probably so overgrown you could never find them. Well, then how could you? Because I was intended to find them. Hey, why you? If for no better reason than I walked about the church with the shins. With the shins? With yes. The... Ah, yes. Ancient Gaelic Tom. Uh -huh. Who with a devil his first compact begins, he first must traverse uh, the church uh, with the shins. Eh? Anonymous. Uh, do you uh, believe in the devil, David? Do we believe in God? If there is one, there has to be the other. I believe I've made an unwitting pact with the second. Now, 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 even granting that, you can still be saved. If you were indeed a kind of uh, reincarnation of saint Ribeiro, if I remember his name correctly... You do, you do. Then more and more you are thrown off his influence and returning to yourself. Oh, 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 David, I declare, the sun makes your hair seem full red again. And you're getting back your own nice, comfortable, roundy look. So there's still hope for me? Always has been. You say there was such a church, though, as I have described. Oh, dear me, yes. Built and established in 1695 by one Hiram Pennypacker. <laughs> Pennypacker? That's <laughs> a curious old name. Very common about these parts once. Still, for that matter. Oh, now, you'll join me for dinner. No, Ephraim, good old friend. I think I will make out for myself this evening. Will I see you later? I'm not sure. I may decide to take a long, long sleep tonight. Uh, Lucy's due back in the morning. Ah, uh, then I'll be trotting along. I have a feeling of something undone. Uh, have I forgotten anything? You've forgotten nothing. Not even me who little deserve to be remembered. Goodbye, old friend. This was the Thursday. And for my own reasons, I must be early. As soon as Ephraim was gone, I headed for the Devil's Glen and beyond. I went first straight to the graveyard in the glare of the sinking afternoon sun. It took me some time to find it. A simple headstone with a simple legend. Prudence Pennypacker, 1765-1789. But she is in her grave and oh, the difference to me. That quotation from Wordsworth shocked me beyond belief. For the subject of his lament over a lost love was for a girl named not Prudence... But do you see? From the grave, with a sense of urgency, I found my way down the path to the house beneath the waterfall and to the girl who had been buried 200 years ago and to the end of it all, I hoped, at last. You are late. Things have come up. There won't be time for tea. Not too late for some explanations. 
Uh, that depends on what you consider an explanation. Who was or is Prudence Pennypacker and Jose Ribeiro? What were they to each other? And where do we fit in? Well, that's asking quite a lot. No, not in my mind. As far as I can discover, both you and Jose have been buried for 200 years. I'm still alive, even if I'm locked like a hermit crab in another man's shell. Where do I go from here? Or you? Or us? Or all of us? I can answer some questions. Jose was a very romantic Portuguese who fled a dictator king who was slaughtering the nobility. With his knowledge of languages and education, he became my father's secretary. Your father was the minister of the ruined church up the hill? Yes. Jose fell in love with me and we wanted to be married, but we were of different faiths. Oh, my, the dream. What? The dream I first dreamt. Sitting on the bench by your lover's grave. Before the tree... And for all I know, I was struck by lightning. Did, did he really murder you and kill himself? If I could not have him, I wanted to die for him, just as he wanted to die for me. Because of my father and my faith, I was buried in consecrated ground. But because he took his own life and was an apostate, Jose was buried in unhallowed ground he was forced to wander forever until he could find some other body not owned by the devil I chose to share his exile waiting for the moment when he could and when I risked an old superstition and went about the church the wrong way he entered into my life my body he took your body not your soul that is still yours to command. <laughs> but is it so much to hold on to? Would you not rather come with me at last and forever to love and be loved no matter who you are or what your name is? I want to. And yet I don't. I'm afraid. Maybe I can still find my way back to what I was. Well, go ahead. Try. Perhaps you can, if that's really what you want. But just remember, you can have it for only a brief moment. With me, it could be all eternity. David. Oh, God, I've been so worried. Where have you been? To the edge of beyond. What does that mean? It doesn't matter. Uh, what brought you home so soon? Elizabeth, she was so worried about you. And I'm so glad now I came. Are you? Well, yes. You look wonderful. Your old self again, aren't you? Oh? Y yes, Lucy. We must start building you up with right food and rest, right? Yes, Lucy. It's a positive miracle. Well, you look exactly like yourself again. It's all over, isn't it, whatever it was? You're David Campbell again. Yes, Lucy. Just the way you always were. Yes, Lucy. Oh, I could look in the mirror. And there I was. Day by day, my looks had returned to exactly what I had been to begin with. What I had neither the heart to tell Lucy, or, or perhaps even face myself, was that as my physical form remade itself outside, so inside, my soul, my character, my personality, name it what you want, was bewitched out of itself. The passion, the anger and violent emotion that ran within me was almost more than I could restrain. And I knew it would never be satisfied till I had and owned prudence. I would destroy everything for that. You see, Lisbeth, 
even myself. I was possessed. Damned forever. When David Campbell suddenly disappeared, it was the Reverend Ephraim Bean who led the search. A deep instinct told the old man David had returned to the graveyard and the ruined church, but was never found. What was found was David's body, floating in a pool underneath a small waterfall not far above the Devil's Glen. The body lies buried now in one of Boston's most exclusive cemeteries. The body, where the soul has gone, is another question entirely. I'll be back shortly. So let us end this tale, as the Reverend Ephraim Bean might, with a quotation from Shakespeare out of a play named The Tempest. Our revels now are ended. We are such stuff as dreams are made on. And our little life is rounded with a sleep. Our cast included Alexander Scorby, Laurie March, Ian Martin, and Marion Seldes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Many tales have been told of strange happenings which take place in castles. What more appropriate setting than an enormous edifice with hidden chambers, unexplored turrets, and dangerous balconies? Usually, the setting is England or Scotland, where castles abound. But the setting for our drama is much closer to home. The castle we're about to visit is in New England on the Connecticut River. It contains all the mystery and more than many of its antecedents. Our mystery drama, Nightmare in Gillette Castle, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elizabeth Pennell and stars Kevin McCarthy and Jada Rowland. Many New Yorkers, Jim and Pamela Watson, enjoy getting out on weekends to explore the countryside. It's amazing how quickly you can get from the big city to rural communities, rolling hills, wooded forests, or discover unexpected places of historic interest. Jim is a Sherlock Holmes buff, and he has heard that a certain state park in Connecticut houses treasures which attract devotees of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle from all over the world. We begin with an ordinary Saturday excursion. Jim and Pamela Watson are totally...
totally unprepared for the bizarre events which are about to take place. Jim, slow down. You're driving too fast. Honey, we've already wasted too much time. Well, what's the hurry? The park, Pam. I'd planned on spending several hours there. I'd rather go antiquing. Yeah, but you... Oh, hey, here, here's the turnout. You see the sign? Gillette Castle State Park. Beautiful grounds. And... Oh, look! Look! Uh, yeah, I see it. There is a castle. I thought it would be just a model, but it's a real one. Hey, what a pile of stone. Do you think we can go inside? Ah, that's what we're here for. Now, uh, why don't you go see if we need tickets to get in? I'll park the car. I'm here, Jim. Please hurry. This place is spooky. Did you uh, get the tickets? No. I came through that big gate and up this passageway. The door's open, see? It goes into a huge, dark room, but nobody's here. Oh, that's strange. Hello? Hello in there? Jim, is there a Mr. Gillette who lives in this castle? There was. He died back in 1937. Is someone down there? Uh, yes, uh, we, we want to see the castle. Well, I'm afraid you're too late. I, I was just coming to close the door. We're shorthanded today, and I'm conducting the last tour. Uh, you'd better come back some other time. Oh, please, can't we join the tour, even if it's already started? Well, I suppose so. I, I left the group up in the library, but come along, follow me. Jim, who was Mr. Gillette? <laughs> Honey, don't let the guide know how dumb you are. He was just the greatest American actor who ever played the role of Sherlock Holmes. Well, Mr. Gillette was much more than an actor. He was also a playwright and an inventor. He designed everything in this castle himself, inside and out. It's so gloomy. Now, we dim the lights after demonstrations in the Great Hall to save energy. It's too bad you missed the stained glass. But come along, and we'll join the others. Way, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have time to see everything. There are 24 rooms of varying shapes and sizes. Look, Jim, the hallways have street names. Mr. Gillette's bedroom opens off this gallery. He could observe whoever was down below by looking toward those mirrors I showed you over the French doors. His bedroom's not exactly what you'd call cozy. It would give me claustrophobia. Oh, say, that could be a sliding panel over there. Oh, you're very observant. Behind it are switches whereby Mr. Gillette could control all the electric lights. He was also able to cut off the telephones when he wanted to. <laughs> ah, and over here is a panel you could never find unless you knew exactly where to look. Now watch what happens. Oh, it's a secret staircase. Where does it go? Well, this one leads to the tower where Mr. Gillette enjoyed his magnificent view of the river and surrounding hills. But we must hurry along. Now, follow me, and I will show you the best room of all. Oh, hold on, Sam. I, I want to see that museum room and library where they've already been. It, it's uh, back this way. Photographs everywhere. Oh, there's one of John Barrymore. Hmm. These playbills. Oh, and a glass case filled with letters. Oh, here's one from Conan Doyle. And the books. Take a look at the title. <laughs> I could spend days in here. We better catch up with the tour. I don't care if we don't see anything else. I do. I'm going uh, to... Uh-oh. Oh, the lights. They're going out. Yeah, it must be a warning to leave. Uh, quick, we better catch up with the others. Jim, I'm scared. Steady, Pam. There's still some daylight left. Now, we'll find our way to the front door. Come on. Oh, thank goodness I hear them. Yeah, yeah, we're going in the right direction. Where is everybody? Wait for us. Let's run for it, Pam. They can't have gone far. If we bang on the door and yell as loud as we can. This door is made of steel. And these stone walls must be two or three feet thick. What are we going to do? I can't imagine anything worse than spending the night in this scary place. Besides, I'm hungry. There has to be a guard on duty. Well, he's being awfully quiet. No, no, I mean outside, patrolling the grounds. If I could just find a light switch and attract his attention. I saw candles on a table in that place the guide called the Great Hall. Oh, but I'd be afraid to go in there. Well, here, uh, take my hand and show me. There. Do you have a match? Uh... Yeah, right here. No need to light a candle when I can flood the room with colorful illumination. Oh! oh. It's like a stage set. Oh, where, where did that 
voice come from? Uh, uh, over there by the stairs. Uh, he must be a guard. Oh, thank, thank goodness you're here. Uh, we were afraid we'd been locked in. I am not in the habit of entertaining uninvited guests. Who are you? Uh, oh, uh, this is my wife, Pamela, and I'm James Watson. Your last name appeals to me. Need I introduce myself? You... Well, we thought you were a guard. But you're not dressed like one. I should think not. I'm rather fond of this dressing gown. Uh, then you must be the son of Mr. William Gillette. No, I have no son. My name is Gillette. And I alone am master of this castle. Well, then, then please, Mr. Gillette, will you unbar the door and let us go home? Certainly not. Certainly not. First of all, I want to know how you got in here. Well, it was the uh, last tour of the day, and we were late, and... and then uh, we became so interested in all those marvelous things in your library. Well, it's preposterous. I do not allow tours through my castle, ever. But... There, there, there was... Oh, never a... mind, never mind. You're talking nonsense. But this is one of those evenings when companionship would be quite pleasant. Oh, we, we must be on our way. We didn't have much lunch, and I'm... If you have the proper qualifications, you are welcome to partake of my dinner and spend the night. Oh, uh, no, we uh, couldn't do that. Well, I uh, like the idea of dinner. <laughs> well, we wouldn't want to impose. Uh... Young lady seems to admire my light fixtures. Oh, yes, such pretty bits of stained glass. All supplied by my visitors. What you might call a ticket of admission to my hospitality. I don't understand. These lampshades are my own handiwork, but the bits and pieces were all contributed by my guests. Oh, if we'd known when we were back in that antique store, which... I'll wager that you have something with you which will suffice. I'm afraid not. Well, it's up to you. Either you stay as my guest, or I will have you apprehended for housebreaking. You wouldn't dare. Watch your language, young man. I'll leave you alone for three minutes to think it over. <coughs> ah, Miss Stapleton. Oh, that, that cat startled me. Come along, Miss Stapleton. <coughs> He meant it, Pam. Now, look through your purse. See if there's something. That man is mad. You heard what he called his cat. Sure. Miss Stapleton, straight from the Hound of the Baskervilles. <laughs> I'm beginning to enjoy myself. Oh, and say... What is it in, now? In, in my pocket. Look, my sunglasses. Colored glass. Now, you think this will do for our ticket of admission? I see oh. you are making progress. May I hold those spectacles up to the light? Oh, sure. Hmm. A rather pleasant blue color. Yes, these will be quite usable. Now, what does your wife have to offer? Oh, couldn't a pair of glasses be from both of us? No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. Look in your purse, Pam. you got to have something. Compact lipstick. Oh, here's my key ring with this pendant. Ah, ah, a ruby. It's only glass. Exactly. So now you are welcome. Before our repast, we'll climb to the tower and enjoy the last glimmer of fading light. <laughs> Oh, I wish we could have seen it in the daytime. Why, well, you will. Tomorrow morning. Oh, really? We must leave after dinner. No one ever leaves here after nightfall. Jim, we have to get home. Tell him that. Oh, relax, Pam. Tomorrow's Sunday. We don't have anywhere to go. <laughs> and there's so many things I'd like to ask Mr. Gillette. That's more like it. Mrs. Hudson is a very efficient housekeeper, and I'm sure she has everything ready now. Uh, uh, is her name really Mrs. Hudson? I'm pleased that you're acquainted with Mr. Sherlock Holmes' landlady. When I advertised for a housekeeper, I specified that her name be Hudson. I suppose if this admirable woman's name had been anything else, I should have called her that anyway. Well, this should rouse her. a long, long hallway. Mm. Yeah. I think you'll find this room satisfactory. Please note that every door except the steel entrance to the castle opens without a sound. And the light switch works this way. Oh, look at all those books. Mm. <laughs> no sleep for me tonight. Ah, uh, oh dear me. They're even taking over in here. That makes 11? No, no. 13 cats on the premises. I suppose you'd object to his staying under your bed. Well, he's so... so big. Oh, no, 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 no. Simmer down, simmer down. That's it. Climb up. Uh, climb up on Daddy. I'll take you along. Now, 
Should you need them? There are candles over there. But it's such a, a brightly lighted room. One never knows. And if you feel uneasy in a strange house, you'd better take this. A revolver? An old-fashioned pistol. No, please, Mr. Gillette. I, I'm terrified of guns. Here. Yeah. You take it, Mr. Watson. Uh, I'd rather not. This pistol's carved of wood. Made it myself. Couldn't fire even a blank cartridge. When it was used in a stage play, the sound effects had to come from off stage. Hmm. <laughs> Certainly looks like the genuine article. It's yours. To keep. And now, I'll bid you good night and be off to Europe. <laughs> to, to Europe? That's what I call my special hideaway. A room where no one can follow and the rest of the world disappears. Pleasant dreams. Jim, won't you please turn off those blinding lights and come to bed? Ooh, much sleepier than I thought. Oh, all that food and drink. Can't focus on the books. Uh, uh, yeah. Bed's more comfortable than it looks. It's shivery in the dark. Hold my hand. Mm. Ah, sleep well. Jim, did you hear something? Ah, go to sleep. Shh, listen. Stop! Oh. Don't come in here! Stop, I say! That sounds like the housekeeper, Mrs. Hudson. Stop! Stop! Something terrible is happening. If this is one of Mr. Gillette's games. He's really gone too far this time. can be very real, and the effect may be much like that of a psychosomatic illness. Not only does the patient have all the symptoms, but he truly feels the pain and the fear. From the time Gillette Castle was under construction in 1914 until today, strange things have happened there. In a few minutes, I'll be back with Act Two, and we'll continue with what has started off as a very eventful night. Shakespeare said about all the world being a stage. Well, William Gillette began play acting and writing when he was a small boy in Hartford. First, it was comedies, but later, his favorite character was Sherlock Holmes, a cool and resourceful man of action. When he decided to retire, his home became a stage, and his famous castle is haunted by the memories he stored up there. At the moment, Jim and Pam Watson are caught in the web of his spell, and they've just heard some chilling sounds in the night. Help me! Help me! Jim, what are we going to do? We are going to try to get some sleep. Well, how can we? You heard it. That woman is in trouble. Help me! Help me! We've got to do something. <sighs> Look, let Mr. Gillette handle but this. But he's gone to... Yeah, I know, I know. His secret hideaway. What time is it? Well, how should I know? Well, turn on the light and find out. <sighs> Pam, the light switch doesn't work. Uh, uh, here, I'll, I'll try to reach that floor lamp. Oh, oh, it's black as pitch in here. Well, get the candles. Um, over there on the dresser. Uh, oh, yeah, I found them. Oh, but it's so dark, I'll never find a match. On the bedside table? No, no, they're in my pants pocket. Now, where... Oh, in my purse. Oh, no, no, you never have any matches. Oh, no, I'll get it. In here somewhere, a pocket flashlight. Oh, good girl. Give it to me. Uh, not much of a beam, but it's better than nothing. Oh, you made a mess of that lamp. Watch out for broken glass. Mm. I'm putting my shoes on. In fact, I'm getting dressed. Well, then I will, too. No, no, you stay in bed. Help me! Oh, that does it. I am going to find out what's going on. You're not going anywhere without me. Hang on to me. Oh, this cold, dark hallway and all those doors. Now, which direction were the sounds coming from? This way. No, no, this way. Come this way, over here. Oh, Jim, I, I don't want to go. I'm afraid. We can't stop now. Oh, will you come to my room? But what if you... Uh, uh, Mrs. Hudson? Oh. Mrs. Hudson? Oh. I don't want to know what's happening in there. We have to find out. <laughs> Mrs. Hudson? What's the meaning of this? We've come to help you. 
help me. I was sound asleep and it's two o'clock in the morning. But uh, you were crying out for help. I was what? Yeah, well, we thought you were in trouble. You were screaming and pounding on the wall and calling for someone to come. I assure you I was fast asleep and I don't take it kindly to be aroused. Well, how could we have been mistaken? You led us right to your door. No one disturbs me in the middle of the night. Not even Mr. Gillette. Well, we would have tried to find him, except... Except he said he was going to... Oh, to Europe, huh? That's where he goes when when there are people he wants to get away from. Uh, by now, he'd be safely in his own bed. And if you know what's good for you, you won't do any more snooping around. Now, you're sure you're all right? Well, I'll be much better if I can get some sleep. And I'll thank you to go back to your room and to stay there. <laughs> Where is our room? Some of the hallways were labeled with street names. Now, what's the name of ours? I haven't the slightest idea. Uh, let's try this. Another of those noiseless doors. Oh, close it quickly. I can't stand those cats. Uh, uh, oh, and how about this door? Piles hmm. of furniture all shrouded. Uh, no one's been in here for a long time. Look at the cobwebs. Come away. Those lumpy sheets are like ghosts. Uh, well, we've made a wrong turn. Uh, I, I'm going to try this door. There's something flashing. Huh. Some kind of lamp. Smells like coal oil. Red lantern. It, look what it spells out on the wall. Danger. Oh, stay back, Pam. The floor drops away. There's nothing left but a big black hole. Let's get out of here. <laughs> Please, oh, please, Jim, don't open any more doors. Now, look, Pam, there's one over there. It's halfway open. And, and, and a bright light inside. Oh, no, we couldn't be back at Mrs. Hudson's, could we? Not possibly. Anything's possible around here. I wouldn't dare knock. I'm not going to. I'm just going to pull the door wide. Oh, Jim, that ceiling floodlight has come back on. This is our room. <laughs> Who'd ever think that a room in this place would look like a home? Be careful, Jim. Yeah, I know, I know, the broken glass. No, I mean, someone may be hiding. Someone who came in while we were gone. Well, you can see for yourself. There's no one here. What about the closet? Yeah, I'll soon find out. Uh, hand me that cane. Oh, there's a skull engraved on the handle. Huh. I barely touched the wall and the door glides open. There is someone in there. Hold tight to the cane. Ah. Uh, 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 Nothing but a dusty old cape on a hanger. Are you sure? It looked just Let's like... for yourself. These clothes and hats. They're all black as if... As if... Yeah. As if they'd been worn at a funeral. Well, we're going to be worn at one. Uh, come on, Pam. We're getting more, but I'll... I bet they're just costumes for a play. I wouldn't count on it. Yeah, I'm not counting on anything. First off, I'm going to lock our door. But there isn't any key. No, no, but there's an ingenious wooden arm that comes down like this. There. Now, I defy anyone to break through a barrier as solid as that. <laughs> well, I do feel better. But believe me, I am not going back to bed. Yeah, neither am I. So now's your chance to tackle those books. Hmm. Not a bad idea. Maybe if you'd read to me, it would settle my nerves. While I gazed, a feeling of intense cold seized me. I had an impression of an immense and overwhelming power and sensed my utter inadequacy. Oh, stop reading, please. I've had more than enough. Honey, this is a classic. Those murders in the Rue Morgue, and it scares me every time. Mm -hmm. There's a copy of that on the table. <laughs> I know. Please, Jim, find something more cheerful. Okay. Uh, Crimes of Passion? No. This one sounds better. The Minister and the Choir Singer. <laughs> That's the bloodiest of all. True story. Took place in New Jersey. What's on the next shelf? Uh... How the Medicis did it. <laughs> Heavens, it's a recipe book. Yeah, a whole row of volumes on poisons, including uh, the Poisoner's Handbook, uh, the Poisoner's Dictionary. And this shelf is all witchcraft. Mm, maybe that would be more soothing. 
No, thank you. <laughs> I think I'll just lie down after all and try to think my own thoughts. <gasps> Did you hear it, Jim? Hear what? Starting all over, that awful screaming. No! Oh, not again. Sounds as though she means it this time. Yeah, so... Wooden brace off the door. No, don't go out there. Uh, you stay here. Not on your life. But I'm not going to give that mad woman the satisfaction it's of... all right. Though. This time the hall lights are on. Well, then let Mrs. Hudson take care of herself. I'm not going to her room. I'm going to find Mr. Gillette. And I'm going with you. The guide showed us, remember? His room is right here in the middle of the balcony. Yes, there's something about mirrors. Uh, I hate to do this, but here goes. Come in. His light's on. Uh... Um, uh, Mr. Gillette, uh, we're, we're sorry to disturb you, well, but... We hope uh, you weren't asleep. Not at all. I was reading. Come in. Come in and sit down. Why are you still wearing your city clothes? Uh, yeah, we uh, put them on in rather a hurry. Mm, I thought you'd like the pajamas and dressing gowns I provide for my guests. Well, we didn't see any. Did you look in the closets? Well, not those terrible black capes and... Oh, good heavens, my error. I thought those things were in another room. Is that why you came to see me? No, no, it wasn't that. It was uh, the screams. Hmm? What are you talking about? Well, we heard cries for help. And the lights went out. Ah, our electrical system is not always dependable. But the urgent cries for help, didn't you hear them? Didn't hear a thing. Well, we were sure it was Mrs. Hudson, and she sounded in agony. Ah, uh, I'm beginning to understand. She was begging for someone to come to her rescue. And you went to her door and frightened the poor lady out of her wits. No, on the contrary, we were the ones who were scared. Well, she sounded so desperate only when we got there. Occasionally, the dear lady suffers from nightmares. They should be over by now. You mean... She was asleep all the time? Exactly. It happens often. I fear that, well, dark shadows lurk somewhere in Mrs. Hudson's past. But she suits me so admirably, I've never probed into her psyche. I just leave her alone. <laughs> and you're making us feel quite foolish. Huh? I guess we should apologize for behaving like this, but... Oh, we're not used to spending the night in the castle. Well, all the more reason I should make you feel at home. Well, I have a hot plate here and all the fixings over here. How about a cup of nice warm chocolate? Oh, no, thank you. You, Mr. Watson? Uh, thank you, just the same. I, I think we'd uh, better go back to our room and uh, <laughs> make up for some lost sleep. try to get some sleep, but I'm going to keep my clothes on, uh, including my shoes. It's all right now, Pam. We've just had a bad case of jitters. More than that. I feel so strange. Nothing's going to be right until it's daylight and we can get out of here. <laughs> Could anyone have made you drink that cup of chocolate? <laughs> no way. You heard it, didn't you? Of course I heard it. A gunshot. But we're both going to pretend that we didn't. Put that bar back on the door. Watch him. Oh. Watch him. Come to my room and come quickly. No, Jim. Pay no attention. When Mr. Gillette gives a command like that, I've got to go. You mean we do? No, no, no. Not this time, Pam. You'd have to knock me out to make me stay behind. All right. Well, hand me the pistol. It's only a fake. It wouldn't do any good against a real one, but I'd feel a lot better with a gun in my hand. <laughs> Bedroom door's open. Now stay behind me. Uh, Mr. Gillette? He's in bed. All covered up. Mr. Gillette? Uh, Mr. Gillette, you, you called me. What, what is it? He can't be asleep. But he... He's so still. Mr. Gillette, wake up. Uh, Mr. Gillette? Oh, Jim. He's so pale. No signs of violence. But no... No heartbeat. Is... is he? Yes, Pam. No faking it this time. Mr. William Gillette is dead. How's that for a turn of events? Even the best of actors can go too far in attempting to create an illusion of reality. But what is reality, really? We're not even sure what we mean when we talk about real people. Back in 1800, 
Schiller, the poet, said that in stagecraft, appearance should never attain reality. And he felt that art would be ruined if nature took over. Well, drama thrives upon surprise. And I assure you that more surprises are coming up shortly in Act Three. It is nearly dawn, with a glimmer of light catching the small paned windows of Gillette Castle. Not only are James and Pamela Watson literally prisoners inside the walls, but their host is lying quite dead in his bed. They tried frantically to find Mrs. Hudson. Their hopes were raised when they found a telephone, but you guessed it. Oh, of course it's not working. Ah, that does it. Now, all we can do is wait. Oh, what if no one comes? Well, they have to sooner or later. Maybe hours yet. Let's get as far away from that, that room as possible. I wish you could think of something. Nothing but doors. Wouldn't you think one of them would lead to the outside? Look, Jim. The sign on this hallway says Baker Street. Huh. It would. I bet there's even a number 221B. There is. Hmm. No harm in trying that door. <gasps> Unbelievable. Straight out of the books. The fireplace, his slippers, and pipe. The violin? Huh. And all those papers and bottles that look like chemicals. What a stage set. Good morning. Oh, oh thank God. Oh. Mr. Gillette, you've done it again. I beg your pardon. <laughs> You're alive. Well, of course I'm alive. Although I'm not in the habit of rising this early in the morning. <laughs> you are truly remarkable. <laughs> and this is worth everything that's happened. What a performance. Young man, could it be possible that you don't know who I am? <laughs> of course we know. You're Sherlock Holmes. Uh, uh, that is, you're Mr. Gillette pretending to be Sherlock Holmes. No one pretends to be Sherlock Holmes. Your name could be Watson, that's common enough. But I am the sole individual who has the combined first and last names of Sherlock. And home. Uh, come on now, Mr. Gillette. You've had your fun with it. It's been a long night. Now, let's just, uh, have a good laugh over the way you fooled us. Well, this becomes more interesting by the moment. Sit down. Sit down, both of you, and tell me more about this Mr. Gillette. Well, he is you, sir, Mr. William Gillette, and there can be no question in anyone's mind that you are a great actor. My profession is not acting, although there are times when I am called upon to use the actor's skills. <laughs> Your makeup is simply terrific. Every single detail. Young lady, you've never seen me in disguise. But you look so different when you're Mr. Gillette. I am losing my patience. If there is an actor masquerading as Sherlock Holmes, he is an imposter and must be brought to justice. Where did you meet this man? And then, sir, as we came down the long hallway, we saw the sign Baker Street and the number on the door. Mr. Watson, you are presently inside my landlady's house. Draw the curtains over there, and you will look out on one of the most famous streets in London. Jim, look. Just like a London street. Only it can't be. I'd open the window, but that's dangerous for a man in my position. You... You don't believe what we've just told you, do you? Well, indeed, it may have elements of truth. But I don't accept this fantasy about a castle and screams in the night. We explained that Mrs. Hudson was having a nightmare. That's another thing which makes your case more serious. Mrs. Hudson never has nightmares. How do you know? Elementary, my dear sir. There appear, however, to be two imposters involved. I suppose you will claim that this Mrs. Hudson is an actress who shares a castle with your Mr. Gillette. Oh, no. Well, she's the housekeeper. Never fear. Never fear. I'll get to the bottom of this. And if I'm not mistaken, here comes the answer to our puzzle. It, it's an old-fashioned carriage. Stopping right in front of the house. Kindly step back from the window. Enemies of mine waste hours across the street peering in this direction. Come in, Mrs. Hudson. But sorry to break in on you so early, Mr. Holmes. You know I'll never bother you uh, until you're ready for breakfast. Yes, yes, but this is an emergency. Oh, indeed it is. Oh, oh, excuse me. 
I, I didn't know there'd be people here at this time of day. They appear to have an emergency, too. I'm told that they spent the night in a castle, but you spent the night at your sister's... You knew. Call it a logical conclusion. Uh, Mr. Holmes, I, I must go down to the kitchen and get the fire started, but then, I if you could spare me a few moments... Come right back. I'm sure what you have to say concerns everyone in this room. Oh, Mr. Holmes, the most terrible thing has happened at my sister's house. But your sister is unharmed. Oh, no, it's not her. But you know she takes in boarders, same as I do. Uh, and this man hadn't been here very long. What sort of man? Oh, a proper gentleman. Very thin, uh, dark hair. But he, he was almost as tall as you. You speak in the past tense. Mm. I assume there has been an accident. Well, that's it. We don't rightly know what happened. Come now, Mrs. Hudson. You were there. Well, in the middle of the night, he called out for my sister and told her he was not feeling well. He said he'd sent for the doctor and he asked her to let him in when he came. Ah, go on. Well, I heard the doorbell ring. It woke me up. And then your sister took the doctor into the boarder's room? But there were two of them. Two doctors? The doctor had a woman with him said she was his nurse. Very interesting. My sister left him in the sick man's room, and then she and I were talking in the back hall when we... Heard a gunshot? Well, I, I don't think it was a gunshot. More like a, a, a shutter banging. Mm. But right afterward, the doctor and nurse came running down the stairs and rushed out the front door into the street. Well, of course, you didn't follow them. It was still dark, and you were in your nightclothes. Oh, we went straight to Mr... You see, I'm so rattled, I've forgotten the poor man's name. Well, we went right to his room, and he was in bed, all covered up. We called. We, we tried to wake him. But it was all so horrible, Mr. Holmes, because... Because he was dead. Here, yeah, here, yeah, Mrs. Hudson, now drink this. It'll make you feel much better. Poor lady nearly passed out. Do you blame her? Now, tell me, Mrs. Hudson, what was this boarder's occupation? Well, he seemed to be a gentleman of leisure. Stayed home every day, he did. Oh, that is every day but Saturdays. But he went out every evening. Is that right? Well, it seemed so odd. Every night of the week. Around theater time, I imagine. And his name was Mr. Gillette? Of course. Oh, I remember now. But how did you know? Mm, call it deduction. Not Mr. William Gillette. Oh, well, I wouldn't know his first name. But my sister could tell you. It, it couldn't be. Oh, yes, it could. Now, Mrs. Hudson, did you or your sister send for the police? Oh, no, not yet. It only just happened. My sister runs a very respectable house. She don't want any crowds coming around or any scandal. Were there any signs of violence? Well, Mr. Gillette's room was neat as a pin. No blood, no weapons, no injury to the body. Oh, I couldn't bear to look. But my sister said he didn't have a mark on him. Well, then it isn't it possible that he died in his sleep. Oh, he was wide awake when my sister saw him. And then that doctor and nurse, were there, they were in such a hurry. Mm -hmm. What did this man and woman look like? Well, I didn't see them. But my sister said they were both quite young. Well, I would guess about the age of this lady and gentleman here. Just as I thought. Oh, and, and they wouldn't have gone running off like that unless something was wrong. I, well, would they? I mean, that's why I came right away to you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, if you could just find them. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I already have. Oh, you must be joking, Mr. Holmes. Well, I know you're a great detective, but how could you possibly... Run along now, run along. Go back to your sister's house. Tell her to keep the door to that room closed tight and to go about her business as if nothing had happened. But you will help us. Yes, yes. I'll be along just as soon as I finish my business here. Well, it seems that we have more than one actor in this play. Well, just what do you mean? Your whereabouts this past night has shifted to a different stage. Well, you aren't connecting us with this, this murder at Mrs. Hudson's sister. You do assume, then, that Mr. Gillette was murdered. Which Mr. Gillette are you talking about? My dear Mrs. Watson, you can't believe that all of this is sheer coincidence. Well, what else could it be? Item one, a sound like a shot was heard. She said it was a banging shutter. Very similar to the clap made by certain pistols. We were nowhere near a house in London. Item two, 
A talented actor is found dead in his bed, and his name is William Gillette. Pardon me, sir, but I believe it was you who put that idea in Mrs. Hudson's head. Watson, would you dare impugn my methods of deduction? Uh, of course not, Mr. Holmes. But in this case... Item three. Two young people, male and female, discover the body and leave the victim's room in great haste. But Jim is not a doctor, and I'm not a nurse. More likely you than another couple. After all, the Watsons come from a distinguished medical family. Sir, I assure you, I am not... Never a... mind, never mind. Item by item, there is but one case, not two. No signs of struggle, no visible injury. Oh, it's all very clear. I must now keep my promise to Mrs. Hudson. It may seem clear to you, Mr. but... Mr. Holmes, we came to you first. You must help us. The body we found was right here in Mr. Gillette's castle. My dear young lady, in the castles of the mind, many things can happen. You don't believe us, do you? I believe that when you wanted your Mr. Gillette to be there, he was and you placed him in a romantic setting. But we were in the castle. Call it what you will. You were prisoners and obviously wanted your jailer out of the way. We went to Mr. Gillette for help. Fiendishly clever, that man. He was trying to trick you. <laughs> I don't doubt that. Well, then let me have the incriminating evidence. I don't know what you're talking about. The pistol. You have it in your pocket? Well, this is nothing but a harmless piece of wood. I, I, I want to keep it as a souvenir. The last thing in the world to be found on your person. Give it to me. Never mind the doorbell. There's no one inside, and I have the key. Well, it seems to be a commotion at the front door, and I must be on my way. Well, will you take us with you? Not where I'm going, but don't worry about being apprehended. All we want to do is go home. Scotland Yard would like to know your whereabouts, but I'll put them off the scent. Any imposter who masquerades as Sherlock Holmes deserves to be put out of the way. But what will become of us? You two go out that door, and I'll just slip down the passageway behind the fireplace. Believe me, this has been a most refreshing encounter. You're a new man, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. First day on the job. We've been short-handed, and we closed up early last evening. There's lots to be done before the first visitors arrive. Now, come this way. Big, isn't it? First, we check the Great Hall. Oh, wouldn't you know? These tourists always leave something behind. Oh, here's a pair of dark glasses and a key ring. Hmm, some sort of jewel on it. Oh, I, I don't think it's valuable. However, I'll show you where we keep these things with the rest of the lost and found. Mr. Holmes said we should leave by this door. Uh. I'm not sure I want to. We can't stay here. If you won't open the door, I will. Oh. Oh, Jim. It's all right. After it opens into the hallway of the castle. I'll show you the library. And, and listen. Holmes room. That's We're all right, Jim. That's the guide. We We're safe. I'm going to yell. No, 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 Pam, Pam. No, keep, keep quiet. Well, I'm going to let them know we're here. Now come back. Back into the Sherlock Holmes room. Don't make a sound. Have you lost your mind? I think I'm just finding it. Uh, uh, quick, come over here. I don't want to spend another minute in this room. But I found another way out. Mr. Gillette must have used it often. Here, here. Behind the fireplace. Jim, all we have to do is Honey, call the guy. I can't be found in I'm here. I'm going... Just wait. There. You see? <gasps> It's a secret staircase. <laughs> and no cobwebs on this one. I don't ever want to see another secret staircase. You're going down this one. Oh, no, I'm not. Pam, we've got to. Now, uh, come on, take my hand. But the guide now, is coming. Hurry, it's our only way out. No one in the world would believe us if we told them what happened here last night. <laughs> for one, am a believer, with reservations, of course. I do believe that a sense of wonder helps keep healthy minds in balance. Playwright Christopher Fry wrote an article on that subject in which he said, the first of our senses, which we should take care never to let rust through disuse, is that sixth sense, the imagination. That's what we're up to in presenting these dramas. Our way of keeping the wheels of your imagination from rusting. 
I'll be back with a further comment. There is a Gillette Castle towering above the Connecticut River near the town of East Haddam. The secret stairways are there, the intricate wood paneling and colored glass, fascinating memorabilia everywhere, and, of course, the Sherlock Holmes room, a replica of the Baker Street lodgings as described by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Tours of the castle are conducted daily throughout the summer. I assure you, it's a haunting experience. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Jada Rowland, Russell Horton, and Carol Titel. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. From time to time, we come across a story so unexplainable, so incredible, that we just cannot pass it by. So today, no mystery to challenge your powers of deduction, for there is no rational explanation of what happened. However, if you care to accompany me into the land of the uncharted and unknown, I think it will be well worth your while. Certain things that occur have no explanation, but that makes them no less worthy of repeating on Mystery Theater. Our mystery drama, Second Sight, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Michael Tolan. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Put you in a receptive frame of mind for today's mystery theater, let me ask you this. Suppose you looked into the mirror but didn't see your own reflection. Or suppose you opened a newspaper and there was your own obituary. Or suppose you saw in a flash something that had not yet happened. Would you feel you were responsible if the following day it did come to pass? And it was a murder? Questions like these are not answered easily, if at all, by scientist, doctor, or psychiatrist. Certainly not by Dr. Marvin Kingsley. Dr. Kingsley, it's good of you to see me on such short notice. Well, I'm happy to work with your Air Pilots Association. Your full name, please. Alan Harvey. And you're an airline pilot, correct? I was an airline pilot, but you don't have to say any more. I'm aware of your problem. But I want to say more. If you're going to help me, Dr. Kingsley, I've got to tell you everything as I see it, not as my airline sees it. Go ahead. I've been on international flights for ten years. I've flown around the world I don't know how many times. I'm a million-mile pilot several times over. And then, one day on my flight to the Caribbean, it happened. I'll never forget it. We were making good time, in spite of headwinds and visibility zero. Are you still on automatic, Alan? What'd you say, Charlie? I said, are Charlie, you still... Charlie, look out there. Do you see what I see? No. Nothing. No, that object flying across at 3 o'clock. Come on, Alan. There's nothing out Check there. Check the scope, will you? 
Nothing. Nothing's on the scope. Not a blip? Not a blip. It's gone. Alan, are you all right? Of course I'm all right. I don't know. You're seeing things I don't see. That was the first time, Dr. Kingsley. You thought you saw an object in the sky? I didn't think I saw it. I know I saw it. Uh, during the month of September, you reported sighting various objects in mid-flight, which made no impression on the electronic monitoring gear. That's why I was grounded. I was just as glad. You know, Doctor, you can take just so much kidding about seeing unidentifiable flying objects. The UFOs? I never saw any UFOs. I saw men in the sky, standing upright, holding flags, national colors, which I couldn't identify. I saw mountaintops with cows grazing on them. A skyscraper a hundred stories high in black marble. I saw... I saw too much. What do you think, Doctor? Well, what you saw in the skies is obviously very real to you. Now, for starters, I'm going to recommend a complete rest. But I mean complete rest. I'll go crazy doing nothing. Oh, I neglected to ask you, Alan. Are you married? No, I'm not. I was once, but... That was a long time ago. I live by myself. Here in Greenfield? Right on North Chatham Street. Oh, I'm not suggesting you just sit and vegetate. Do you have any hobbies or uh, interests other than your job? <sighs> well, let me see. Years ago, I was interested in becoming a painter. Even now, I've sort of kept up. Sometimes I'll, I'll take a sketch pad and draw. Oh, good. Uh, what kind of things? Lately, I've been drawing the objects I've observed from the cockpit. Well, why not enroll in some art class? That would occupy you, challenge you. You know, the university I teach at has a very fine art department. Would that appeal to you? What good would it do me? I'm a flyer. I'm never going to make it as an artist. Well, it would give you another outlet for your energies. Let me put in a call to Jacob Greer, who runs the department. He teaches a few classes also. See, I know Jacob personally, and I'm sure he'd take you in. I don't know. How how long should I do it? Well, let's not set any limits for the present. See, there's one thing you need more than anything else, and perhaps drawing in a class with other people will help you achieve it. What one thing? What do I need? Peace of mind, Alan. <laughs> I'm happy to meet you, Mr. Harvey. I'm Jacob Greer. Marvin Kingsley tells me you'd like to join one of our art classes. Have you ever drawn a live model before? No, I haven't, Mr. Greer. I, I've brought along the kind of sketches I've done, mostly in my spare time, you understand. Uh-huh. Wow. Well, extraordinary. Most imaginative. Uh, these... People standing about in the clouds. Oh, it's very imaginative. Most of what I do is what I've seen. You have a good feeling for... I hope this wasn't drawn from life. What is it? It looks like the fuselage of a big airliner with a lot of bodies strewn about. Yes, that's what it is. I, I did that one yesterday. That's gruesome. Well, I think you have some talent, and if you'd like to join our class, it's Tuesdays and Fridays from 1 o'clock until 4 in this studio. I'd, I'd like to. Uh, let me uh, hang on to some of these drawings of yours, may I? Sure. This airplane crash, it's certainly powerful. Now, I'll be seeing Marvin Kingsley tonight. We have a running chess game on Monday evenings. I've for years. I'll tell him you're joining us. Checkmate, Marvin, old boy. <laughs> I saw it coming, Jacob. <laughs> you know, you're going to qualify as a grandmaster one of these days. Ah, you're off your game. I know you, Marv. Uh, you're right, you're right. I wasn't concentrating. Marv, that fellow Alan Harvey you sent me, a strange sort of man, quite gifted. I've seen his portfolio. Have you uh, known him for long? Well, as a matter of fact, I haven't. See, he came to me because he was having some problems in uh, in relaxing. Oh, I didn't ask you what his problem was. Uh, you know, I don't discuss my patients, Jacob. Let's say he may have some guilds, and I prescribe your art course as a vacation from those guilds. Well, I'll say this. He has a lot of talent. There was one drawing he showed me that... Hey, do you mind if I turn this up? 
I'd like to catch the evening news. No, no, I'll go make us some coffee. Oh, I forgot to get cream, darn it. Uh, don't worry, I can take it black. A jet airliner carrying 200 people crashed into a corporate plane at 6 o'clock tonight after traffic controllers radioed conflicting instructions. This is the scene behind me. One of the worst air disasters to strike this area in the history of aviation. According to... What is it? What happened? Oh, something with the TV set. They've still got the picture, but there's no sound. Do... Do you see that shot of the field? Wait. Hey, it can't be. Good Lord. Oh, turn it off if it upsets you. It's all those bodies. No, no, that's not what I mean. Turn it off. No, 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 they'll get the sound back in a minute. They, they still got the picture. Turn it off, please. Okay, okay. I want to show you something. Here. This is one of the drawings your Alan Harvey left with me. Mm hmm What do you see? Mm hmm grisly, almost photographically detailed drawing of a smashed airliner. And smashed people. Well? Well, what are you trying to tell me, Jacob? Doesn't this drawing look exactly like what we just saw on the tube? But exactly... Uh, yes, I suppose there is a similarity. Oh, oh, I forgot to tell you. You see, Alan Harvey was an airline pilot, so I suppose he drew that from some experience he had. Marvin, my mind deals in pictures. I would say there's not just a similarity, the real accident and what this man has drawn are identical. Oh, but how could they be? You said you saw him this morning. He couldn't have drawn it at the airport. It just happened at 6 o'clock tonight. He said he did it yesterday. Well, I'll bet if you went through the files and matched the photographs, there's a sameness about most air crashes. Mm, I hope you're right. I don't understand why you're so upset, Jacob. What else could it be? It got me to thinking, that's all. Well, what's your problem? If Alan Harvey can draw a future occurrence before it happens, I'd say we all have a problem. We welcome today a new member to our life class, Alan Harvey. Uh, Miss Johnson, we'll have two minutes of warm-up poses, and then we'll begin the longer poses. Arthur, uh... Why don't you put your easel beside Alan so that if there's anything he doesn't know, you can fill him in. All right, Miss Johnson. I'm uh, I'm new to this. W what are warm-up poses? Uh, you'll see. Those are the action poses Miss Johnson does up there. You know, poses that, that no model could hold very long. Uh, that one, see? One leg up and hand extended, sort of, uh, sort of like a dance pose. I'm supposed to draw that? W what's she doing? You certainly are, Alan. That's it. Use your charcoal. Fine. Good, good. Just a few action lines. Helen, that's very good. Contour is excellent. Well, what oh, the, fine. What I did like he that. say your name was? Uh, Arthur Lewis. I'm Alan Harvey. Say, hey, you're not bad. That's good. How can she hold that pose, leaning over one hand way down and the other way up? Because Miss Johnson is a professional model, Alan. And I suppose we have less talk and more drawing, Okay. Good. Yeah. Just a couple of contour lines, Alan. We're not projecting the model's complete form. Do you uh, mind if I stand behind you, Alan? Oh, no. <laughs> no, not at all, Professor Greer. Uh, wait a minute. Let me see that one you just turned over. Oh, it's nothing, really. I, I didn't even know what I was drawing. Alan, one of the things you've got to learn about our work, no one can afford to be shy or modest. Looking, appraising... It's the only way for me to gauge your progress. Well, it isn't anything. Let me be the judge of that. Now pull that page back. You just sketched this? It took me all of two minutes. I told you it wasn't any good. It's very good. It's just that uh, I'm a little taken aback at what you drew. Taken aback? Isn't that a drawing of our model, Miss Johnson? Lying across that bed, bruises on her neck, eyes staring open as if she'd just been strangled to death.
I warned you, didn't I? This would be a story hard to explain. If you like, let's begin by believing some events are coincidence. Or, as the phrase goes, a strange coincidence. However, the model Miss Johnson isn't dead yet, and as we know, Alan Harvey's wings were clipped for seeing things that weren't there. Did I say foreseeing? Just a coincidence. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Remember the old story of the three blind men who were asked to describe an elephant? One felt the big wide body and said, it's a wall of leather. The second put his arms around one of the animal's legs and said, it's the trunk of a tree. And the third blind man felt the elephant's tail and said, it's a snake. All were mistaken, for none could really see the elephant. Are we perhaps also limited in our vision? And what we think exists may not. Is Alan Harvey able to see what really is with a special second sight that is not ours? I'll be frank with you. It disturbed me to discover I'd been drawing our model, Miss Johnson, as a victim of a murder. I'd never given it a second look. The truth is I didn't even remember drawing it. Professor Greer kept looking at what I'd done with this horrified expression... So I was pretty shaken when I came back to class on Friday and set up my easel next to Arthur Lewis. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, today Miss Johnson will skip the warm-up poses. The pose she will now assume will be the one held for the entire session. Twenty-minute poses in the first hour and a half with the usual five-minute rest periods. All right, any questions? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Professor Greer. Miss Johnson? It's a little chilly in the studio this morning. Could I have a heater placed near me? Of course. Arthur, would you be good enough to get the electric heater out of my office? Can't afford to have our Miss Johnson catch cold. My progress that day was as halting as the first days had been speedy. I, I didn't know what to make of it. Miss Johnson was the model as before, but somehow I could not get her down on paper. For the first time since I'd begun the classes, I was relieved when Jacob Greer pointed to the clock. That'll be all for today. Class dismissed. Oh, uh, Alan, would you uh, stay on a bit? Yes, Professor Greer. I noticed you're having a little trouble today. Some of those lines are just not forceful enough. I was aware of that, too. Something seems to be holding me up now. May I have a look at what you've been doing? Of course. What? Is this all you've done today? I'm afraid so. I, I tried. I couldn't even get the simplest action line. Uh, what's that supposed to be? Where? In the corner of that page. A table set for two people at the... I know where that is. Yes, it is. That's the Chinese restaurant right here in town. <laughs> I hope by next Tuesday you'll be taking a more serious approach to your work. I am serious, Professor Greer. I just don't seem to be able to concentrate on what I see. What's in my mind's eye is so much clearer to me than what's in front of my real eye. I can't think how you happen to know I just love Chinese food. I just guessed, Miss Johnson. I wasn't doing anything particular this evening, so I took a chance you might be free. It so happens this is my one night off in the week. You mean you've got a regular job as well as modeling? Well, I just model for extra money. I'm studying piano at the music school. You're a musician? Well, I hope to be. Every day but today and Sundays, I go to class from 4 to 7. Then I have a little supper at my place and then back to the school where they let me practice as late as I like. That's quite a schedule. Is, uh, is painting all you do, Mr. Harvey? Right now it is, Miss Johnson. <laughs> What's your first name? Peggy. Mine's Alan. It's a funny thing, but I I don't associate the girl who stands up in class and poses uh, with you. <laughs> well, I'm a little more formally dressed now. <laughs> it, you're, you're not married, are you? I was a long time ago, but my wife didn't like my being married to an airline. I'm a pilot. I don't believe it. I was married to a pilot, too. Oh, but it didn't take. Take? Take us long to discover it was a big mistake. I'm sorry. I'm not. Anyway, 
Seeing Jacob is much better. No strings and outside of the classroom. He's he's very amusing. Jacob? You're, you're dating Professor Greer? Yes. Why well, is that so crazy? There's not that much difference in our ages. No, I'm not saying there is. It's just so uh, <laughs> unexpected. Oh, I see younger men, too. Like Arthur. Arthur Lewis, who sits next to you in class with, with the red beard. Yeah, sure, sure, I know. He's awfully nice, too. Not nearly as possessive. In fact, in many ways, I think he's more mature than Jacob. Say, aren't you getting hungry? Oh, famished. I tell you what. You order from column A, and I'll order from column B. Ladies and gentlemen, it seems our Miss Johnson isn't going to be with us today. And Arthur has volunteered to model for us, so we shan't be losing any time. You all ready, Arthur? Uh, ready when you are, J.G. All right, please begin. Now, I want you all to loosely suggest the action of the pose before you actually sketch the form. Very good, Alan. <laughs> you don't seem to have any block when it comes to drawing the male form. <laughs> it was only that one time, Professor Greer. I'm, I'm sure I could do Miss Johnson next time. Keep drawing. Good. Uh, what are you doing now? Putting in a face. Well, that's not Arthur's face. It's more like mine. And, Alan, what's that you're drawing in the subject's right hand? Right hand? I, I don't know. I wish you'd stick to what's before you and not try to dramatize things as though you were doing an illustration for a mystery magazine. You've got me holding a pistol. Now I see a doorway and some other body crumpled up against it as though he'd just been shot. Dr. Kingsley, I really appreciate you seeing me on a Sunday. What I want to say is... How can I say it? I... I don't think these life classes are doing me any good. Uh, well, why do you say that, Alan? I went nearly crazy yesterday, Saturday. I, I tried to get out of the house, take a walk, but I, I found myself always coming back to my drawing board. Well, I think that's a good sign. But it's not. Nothing's changed. It's, it's all as it was before. I, I'm seeing things that nobody else sees, only now I'm drawing them. Hey, look at these, please. Some I've done in class and, and, and some at home. Hmm. Yes, I see what you mean. Do you? Do you really? I, I'm terrified. Oh, no, no, you, you draw very well, Alan. It's what I draw. Here, this, this one, for instance. Now, hello. You, you will work your way out of this. Um, don't worry. It's the mind's way of healing itself. Doctor, I think you've got it all wrong. Here, look here. I, I drew this just this morning before I came to see you. I, I sat myself down, and this happened, like. Like automatic writing. Well, the drawings are for Jacob Greer to criticize. Now, what do you expect from me? Just just tell me what you see. All right. It's a young man, about uh, 25, I'd say, stretched out on a slab in the morgue. Uh, when were you at the morgue last? Never. I've never been there. But, well, you've seen pictures. I tell you, I haven't. But you must have. And you've forgotten. That happens to be the morgue attached to our hospital, exactly the way you've colored it. You don't understand. You simply do not understand, do you, Doctor? I don't know what or how I draw. Uh, my, my dear Alan, you must have been there. The detail, the glare of that green shade, the hexagonal tiles, uh, that one broken tile near the door. Now, now, face reality, Alan. Forget it. Do you know the young man you've drawn? That corpse with the red beard? That's the horrible part. Yes, I, I know him. His name is Arthur Lewis. He's another student in my class. What what shall I do? Uh, when do you go again? To your art class? Day after tomorrow. All right. Now, right after class, come back here to my office and bring what you've drawn that day, and we will try again. Now, we'll sit down quietly, calmly, and talk about it. Uh, this sort of thing happens more often than not, Alan. We transfer and transpose people we know into the most unlikely situations. See, most of us do it in dreams, but you're doing it on paper. You, you don't think it's any more than that, Dr. Kingsley? Just bear in mind, Alan, you and I are mortal. We can do no more, see no more, know no more than our five senses tell us. You mean there's no such thing as a sixth sense or a second sight? 
Well, arithmetically, perhaps. But in fact, no. Marvin. Well, come in, come in. What are you doing here in the afternoon? You haven't stopped in to see me on a Sunday for I don't know how long. Well, I hope this isn't a bad time for you, Jake. No, no, not at all. Only if I'd known, I... Well, you see, I have a standing date with the young lady Sunday evenings, but, well, that gives us an hour. Yes, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get right to the point. That young pilot I sent over to you, Alan Harvey, well, he came to see me today and he brought some sketches. Oh, macabre, aren't they? But splendid. He has a flair. As well, he's done it again. Well, at least I hope he hasn't. What has he done? It seems he's drawn one of your students, a chap with a red beard, lying on a slab in the morgue. And he showed me another he'd done of a girl, your life model, strangled. He's also drawn me, holding a pistol. Claims he doesn't know what he's doing, has no control. I've put it down to a wild imagination. Well... I've also told him it was ridiculous to attach any significance to it. Well, I certainly won't. The very young lady he strangled on paper, I've been seeing quite a lot of for almost three months now. I'm taking her to dinner tonight. You're not serious. Oh, I am, Marv. Very serious. I know she's been seeing a younger man, but I don't know who he is. But so what? Jacob Greer, you... I just may ask Peggy to marry me. What? Imagine keeping this from me. I really didn't <laughs> feel that serious about Peggy until, I don't know, it just grew on me. <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> I, I, I'd better go. It, it was only about Alan that I dropped in. You know, one of these days I'll figure out why he is so preoccupied with death. But I'll give it a thought, Jacob. I'll keep tabs on him. So will I. I'm very interested in that young man. He has an enormous talent. Alan, I feel so wicked. I can't begin to tell you. Why, Peggy? Half of America goes to the movies on a Sunday night and has a soda afterwards. Oh, it's not that I'm having a soda in a drugstore at ten at night with a man I've only known for a few days. It's because I've stood up the two guys I usually date. Who, Jacob? And Arthur. I generally see Jacob for dinner Sunday nights. He gets me home about this time, and then half an hour later, Arthur stops by, and we go listen to music somewhere. <laughs> You're going to get yourself into trouble. They enjoy themselves. So why did you go out with me? Because I love going to movies, and nobody ever asks me. Well, you'd better beat it home. At least you can keep one of your two dates. <laughs> That's our weather for tonight. Here now is the Midnight News. We have just received word of a triple tragedy on the north side, involving a young music student who had been doing part-time modeling, a young man who is an art student, and an art teacher. All are dead in what appears to be a double murder and suicide. For a report from the scene of the tragedy, here now is... Oh, my Lord, I can't be hearing this. It can't be true. Did Alan Harvey unconsciously set into motion these extraordinary events, or is he cursed with second sight? More often than not, when our second act curtain rings down on Mystery Theater, all of the clues are in, all the evidence presented, and you have an equal chance to solve the mystery. Not this time, for we appear to be dealing in an enigma wrapped in a secret contained in a sealed book written about a strange, uncharted land. Come back with your compass when I return shortly with Act Three. Until I began to host Mystery Theater, I thought of myself as pretty realistic. I believed what I saw and drew conclusions from known facts. Well, I've come quite a ways since then, and now I suspect there's an awful lot to be said for the unknown. What we thought was impossible yesterday is possible today. 
Couldn't the same be true of tomorrow? In our world, anything can happen and probably will. It's that same evening. Fearfully, Dr. Marvin Kingsley keeps listening to the news. We repeat the first bulletin. Police are investigating three deaths on the north side in the apartment of a part-time model found strangled. Also dead, apparently shot, is a male art student and a male art teacher. The woman has been identified as Peggy Johnson and the young man as Arthur Lewis. The police have not yet released the name of the art teacher other than to say... It can't be. It can't be. Not him. Jacob, please. Be home. Please, please, answer the phone. Please. Please. Today is Monday. I feel peculiar. I keep trying not to think of tomorrow in another life class. I sit at my table and look out the window. All the little houses. Ours is not a big town. All the capitals of the world I've flown to. Rome, Paris, Amsterdam, London. It, it all seems like another lifetime. I look down at my drawing pad. I've drawn a heavy set man standing in a courtroom before a judge. I better call Dr. Kingsley right away. Alan. Alan, I'm glad to hear your voice. I've done another one of those mysterious drawings. Have you sketched someone you know? Not this time. Someone I've never seen before, I know that. A big hulk of a man standing in front of a judge. From the look I've drawn on the man's face and the look on the judge's, I'd say the judge was about to pass a sentence of death. Uh, I'll tell you what you do, Alan. Why don't you walk over here? It'll take you no more than three quarters of an hour, and uh, by the time you get here, I will have cleared the decks. Bring that drawing of yours, Alan, and we'll talk. I've lived in Greenfield all my life. Every time I'd come back from some round trips for my week off, I'd find the town pretty much the same. So why I got confused going across town to Dr. Kingsley's, I can't imagine. But I did. Turned up the wrong street, and before I knew it, I was lost. So I cut through an unfamiliar alley, and there it was. A fence about nine feet high. I couldn't see over it. Over the gate was written J. Murty, Tombstones, Monuments. I opened the gate and looked inside. A yard full of gravestones. Come on in, young fellow. Don't stand out there. Oh, thanks. And may I? I'm glad to see you. You're very expert chipping words into that stone. Marble. I also do granite. This is quite a large place you've got here. I bet you keep busy. Well, the world gets kind of lonely. Not many people like to be around gravestones. Makes them think. Oh, let me introduce myself. Julian Merte. Oh, yes, I saw your sign. I, I'm Alan Harvey. You looking for someone? I'll tell you the truth. I turned down the wrong street. D did you say your name was Merte? Yes. Why do you know me from somewhere? I don't know. M Mr. Merte, have we, have we ever met before? I don't think so. Of course, I have seen a lot of people in my day. Why? You think we have met? Well, everything about you, I... I don't know how to say it. It's... It, it's uncanny. Hey, look at this, will you? A, a drawing I did today. Ah, that is quite good. You did that? This morning. I have always admired the man who could sit down and draw straight off like that... Now, uh, why did you want me to see this, Mr. Harvey? The man in the drawing, it, it just came to me. He looks just like you, Mr. Murty. Oh, that man there standing in front of the judge looks like me, you say? Ah, why, oh, so he does, Mr. Harvey. So he does. Julian? Julian, where are you? Here, my dear. Oh, you have company. Uh, Mr. Harvey, Mrs. Merte, my wife. Oh, please. Did you? Uh, Mr. Harvey is an artist, Mary. Uh, Julian, go along and wash your hands. It will be time for supper shortly. Supper? I had no idea it was that late. I, 
I must be going. Ah, no, sir. Please don't go. I've got something to show you. Or perhaps some other time. I I'll come back. No, no, it wouldn't take long. Five minutes, I promise you. Just five. <laughs> All right. Certainly. I'll be right back. Young man, I don't know who you are, but I advise you to leave right now. There's a storm coming up. I should go. I'm late as it is. Someone's expecting me. Then go. I'll explain to my husband. But he seems so anxious to show me something. It's only those gravestones. He's so proud of them, but they won't run away. I advise you, young man, for the sake of your well-being and health, leave now. My health? And your peace of mind. Does the name Julian Murte mean anything to you? Julian Murte? Yes. Yes, I have heard that name. Arizona? No, no, California, the Rock Bridge. And the Wyoming Stone Faces. I is your husband that Julian Murty? Yes. Well, he's one of the great sculptors. What? What's he doing in this back alley making gravestones? He fell out of fashion. It's as simple as that. But, but... It he broke his heart. He has never been the same. You mean no one commissions his works anymore? For 20 years, no one. And that isn't the worst of it. You had better go. Well, can't you tell me why I should go? Because sometimes he is not responsible. Not anymore. All washed, all clean. Oh, say, we are in for a storm, Mary. I am taking Mr. Harvey into the studio. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'd better go right away. What? In all this rain, you will get soaked. Come along, follow me. Let's run for it. This is quite a place. I've never seen so many different kinds of gravestones. Well, these are mostly samples to show people what they can have to commemorate their loved ones. I like to keep my epitaphs light-hearted. You do? On a gravestone? <laughs> what better place? After all, death is the ultimate joke, isn't it? I never thought about it that way. Well, you think about it. Think about it. This headstone here is the tallest I have done. It may be more to your liking. It's a sample which I completed only this morning. He flew high, he flew low. Now to heaven may his spirit go. Alan Harvey, requiescat in pace. That's... that's my name. This is what I wanted to show you. My name? Well, you must believe me, Mr. Harvey. Pure coincidence. I don't know where the name come from. Just uh, entered my head. But the date's under my name. The first one is exactly when I was born. Really? A further coincidence. And the date of death? Today. Well, I was just making it topical. Go right ahead, Mr. Harvey, and use the telephone. Uh, supper will be on the table in a moment. Oh, thank you. I had this appointment, and I... I just better call. Hello? Uh, hello, Dr. Kingsley. Uh, this is Alan Harvey. Oh, yes, yes, I was wondering what happened to you. I, uh... I got lost, believe it or not, and, and then it started to storm, so I'm staying with some people I met. Uh, I can't quite hear you, Alan. Can you speak louder? Uh, no, no, I can't. This man insisted I stay for supper. Uh, are you all right, Alan? Alan? I hear you. Yes, I'm all right. I'll, I'll try and come by later, Dr. Kingsley. Goodbye. You know... I told you, Harvey, I don't get many visitors, especially people from the world of art. And that is why, after supper, I asked you back here in my studio. Mary, uh, Mrs. Merte, funny thing, but uh, she is not that interested in art. I really ought to be on my way. Ah, nonsense. I wouldn't hear of it. You know, when it rains like this and I can't go outside and work on the new stones, I'll spend an evening sharpening my chisels. And you see, I've got my grinding stone here. 
I put my foot on the treadle, give it a twist, and there she goes. Ah, a lot of these chisels are due for sharpening. If you will look under that table where you are sitting, Mr. Harvey, you will find some drawing paper. There are pencils and charcoal in a little box down there. Go help yourself. I know what it is like to have thoughts and ideas just screaming to be put on paper. It's a compulsion. I wonder what time it is. <laughs> Later than it was, but one always hopes not too late. Ah, I see you have begun to draw. Mr. Harvey, I cannot tell you what a pleasure it is to meet you at last. You were right about compulsion. I wish I could leave. Oh, I'm not keeping you. No, not you, Mr. Murthy. What I'm sketching. The pencil, it... It won't stop. My hand has to keep following it. Ah, uh, you have that problem, too. It's a shame that all your great works are now only tombstones. Great works. <laughs> I was great once... And now nothing but a letterer and a numberer in stone. I wish you had not said that, Mr. Harvey. You are like all the rest. Yeah. This is the sharpest I have ever honed the chisel. Do you know that, Mr. Harvey? Hmm? We're all failures. That is why we die. I wish you would not keep saying that, Mr. Harvey. I am still sketching at this table. And Julian Merte keeps turning his grindstone. All I can hear is the whirring and buzzing of the wheel and the drumming of the rain. The air is close in the studio. I'm rooted to this chair, to what I'm drawing... It's almost finished now. I can see out of the corner of my eye Julian Merte sharpening his chisels and watching me. He's staring at me. Staring. They found the sketch Alan Harvey was making. It depicted the supreme moment of agony the final gasp of a man in the last throes of life. The figure in his picture lay sprawled across a table where it had been drawn on a sheet of paper. On that sheet of paper was a sketch of still another man, identical. Then another picture within a picture. Each successive figure had been stabbed in the back with a long bladed chisel embedded to the hilt killed exactly the way they found Alan Harvey himself. I'll return in a moment. We accept certain rules of existence on our planet. The pull of gravity, the rising sun and moon, that rain is wet and snow is cold, we feel wind, which we cannot see. You accept the sound of my voice, although you know I am speaking from miles away. We accept from experience and habit. But there are other facts of life and death for which we have no explanation. Yet, can we disregard them? They, too, must be faced. And perhaps you, too, will experience them. All you need is a little second sight. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Joan Shea, Robert Dryden, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. We call a concept fantasy when it fails to fall within the pattern experience has led us to expect. Fantasy, then, is unnatural, supernatural, if you like, because the road it takes is heretofore untraveled. Considered in that light, this adventure of Ralph and Wilma Albertson's is fantasy. Ralph and Wilma have had their fill of the city's turmoil. Some years ahead of the customary retirement age, Ralph is leaving his post at the university as professor of American history to write a book on the development of the New England states. He and his wife are about to depart on a meandering tour of New England in search of a home in which he may work congenially. Ralph, will you come and sit on this suitcase so I can get it close? Well, if you didn't feel you had to take a lifetime supply of everything... A little harder... Uh... Oh, phew. Oh, if you'd make up your mind where you want to go, I'd know what to pack. Don't you have any idea where you want to end up? Well, we'll travel the back roads, move and when and where whimsy directs. We'll... That's all very well, but where are we going to get to? Some backwater town where they still think the world is flat if I have my way. What you're looking for is a ghost town. Well, if the ghosts are quiet and mind their own business, why not? <laughs> Our mystery drama, Sleepy Village, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Fielden Farrington and stars Norman Rose and Martha Greenhouse. There are few places in the world better designed to encourage wanderlust than the northeastern section of the United States especially in early autumn. Ralph and Wilma, half forgetting the real object of their quest, find themselves at mid-morning in the mountainous wonderland of Vermont. I can taste the color, Ralph. Yeah. Can you imagine this country before the white man got his gadget-building hands on it? Well, there haven't been any gadget-building hands messing around with this section much. If they hadn't put a little black top on this road, I'd still call it a wagon track. Mm, cow path before that, more than likely. Do you expect to find a town on this road? I don't know, but if I do, I... Hey, st- hey, we just passed the sign. Stop the car. If there's a town around here, we don't want to miss it. But uh, I'll back up. Now, what's it say? It's half hidden behind that bush. Sleepy Village. Population 364. I'd call that small well, enough, at least. Well, if there's anything at all in a name, you found what you're looking for. Can't call it a ghost town. It's got people in it. I saw at least three men hanging around outside the barbershop. Oh, yes, and they saw us, too. I think it's just about the most beautiful little town I've ever seen. Well, now, I'll remind you that you said that. Wow, that must be the town hall. You know, I don't see a real estate office. Are you serious? It's a perfect little gem of a town, Ralph. Let's park and ask somebody. The town's only about four blocks long. I'll wait here. You go ask one of those men in front of the barbershop. Okay. You know, you look like an awful city slicker. I am a city slicker. Uh, excuse me. I, I, I wonder if you might tell me where to find a real estate dealer. Uh, fella sells houses and all? That's right. Uh, a man you'd want to see, I expect, would be Ellis Perkins. He's the mayor. Oh, uh, where would I find him? Ellis, uh, right over yonder in the village hall. It might be there. It might not. Well, I'll have a look. Thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, we have to see the mayor. The mayor? Mm-hmm. He must sell real estate on the side. <laughs> Mr. Perkins? Yeah? 
Yes, yes, come right in. Oh, thank you. Uh, there wasn't any receptionist outside. <coughs> oh, 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 never felt the need for one, really. People just walk in and out. My name's Ellis Perkins. Oh, I'm Ralph Albertson, Mr. Perkins, and this is Mrs. Albertson. How do you do? How do you do? I am pleased to meet you. Sit down, please sit down. You wouldn't believe how rare a stranger is. Yeah, well, uh, I'll get right to the point, Mr. Perkins. We've, uh, well, we've been looking for a place like this, a quiet little place, you know, to, well, to settle down in uh, permanently. Have you now? Well, there is a house available, just one. You're quite sure that you want to be this far removed from worldly things? Well, that's exactly <laughs> what we do want. Yes. Peace and quiet. I find the city lately just... Well, it's just too much for me. I see. Do you feel the same way about it, Mrs. Elberson? Oh, why, yes. Not as strongly as my husband, perhaps. But now I've seen your town. Yeah, oh. good, good. Well, it's just about lunchtime. Oh, well, if you have an engagement... Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Nothing of the sort. You can come to my house and have lunch with me, of course. Oh, no, really? We, we couldn't impose no, on you. No, no, no. We'll, we'll get a bite somewhere and meet you later. No, I won't hear of it. You're coming home with me. We'll enjoy a good country lunch. As we call it, dinner, you know. Oh. And then we'll proceed to a discussion of whether or not our sleepy village is the place you're looking for. Oh, dear. <laughs> I may not eat again for days. <laughs> <laughs> Do you always eat like this at lunchtime? Ham steak, home fried potatoes, green beans. Well, it's really the main meal. Supper isn't quite as elaborate, oh. except on occasion. Well, it, it certainly was delicious. Yes. I'd be fat as a pig if I had a lunch like this every day. <laughs> Everybody ready for the apple pie? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Too much? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, no, Lucas. I uh, guess you better save the pie for supper. Want me to bring the coffee in here, Mr. Perkins, or in the sitting room? In the sitting room, I think, Lucas. Where should we go in? Oh. More comfortable talking in there than around the table. Now, if Lucas does everything else as well as he cooks, he's really a, a gem, Mr. Perkins. Does he live in? Oh, yes, yes. Has for ten years or more now. Uh, take that chair, won't you, Mrs. Arbison? Thank you. Yes, used to be my dear wife's favorite. Oh. Want me to pour, Mr. Perkins, or just leave the tray? I put it on the coffee table here. I'll pour. You go have your dinner now, Lucas. Want anything? Just holler. Yes. Uh, Lucas is the only family I have since my wife passed over. He gets restless sometimes, talks about leaving me, but I, I don't think he ever will. I don't know what I'd do if he did. Uh, cream and sugar, both of you? Real cream? No, thanks. We'd both take it black. Ah, uh, what a pity. Well, now, let's get down to the business of finding out whether or not you and Sleepy Village would suit each other. Well, the town suits me fine. We'll have to look at the house, of course. Oh, yes, of course. Um, what is your profession, Mr. Alperson? I'm, well, I was a college professor, American history. Oh. But I decided to leave that and, well, work on a book I've had in mind. Good, very good. Hey, the village could use a good historian. <laughs> Interesting history this place has. You'd be fascinated. Yes, I can imagine. Mm, Lucas makes good coffee, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, I, I, I don't mean to pry, but uh, are you people... Uh, people who have a great many friends? That is, uh, to whom old friends are terribly important? Oh, well, we... We have an average number of friends, I suppose, although I, I can't see what... Well, living in an isolated place like this might be... Well, uh... if we miss them, we'll, we'll ask them to come and see us. Uh, yes. Uh, but you are looking for a, a place where you can get away from people, and I assume that includes friends as well as strangers. Uh, Mr. Perkins, I, I don't understand what difference all this makes to you. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope I haven't offended you. It's a very small village, Mr. Alberson, and, uh, well, the relationships are very close. Intimate, you might say. We find we have to make sure we're getting the sort of people who will uh, blend. Oh, I see. A sort of uh, 
gentleman's agreement. Is that what you mean? Oh, no, 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 no. Nothing like that at all, no. Nothing whatever. It's just... Uh, well, now, how can I make you understand? It, it, it's just that comings and goings upset our people terribly. We can't have people moving in and then just packing up and moving out again. It's... Uh, well, that's, that's quite impossible. I think perhaps the best plan would be not to move in in the first place. Oh, dear. Uh, I've done this very badly. I, I've given you the wrong impression altogether. Ralph, don't you think... Well, it, it's such a sweet little place, and, and maybe the reason we like it so much is that Mr. Perkins does make sure he has the right people before... Well, you know, before going on with it. Not just anybody would fit in here. You have to admit that. Would it help, Mr. Albertson, if I said I'd be very happy, very happy indeed to have you and Mrs. Albertson come and live in our community? There. You see, Ralph? Well, all right. At least we'll look at the house. Splendid. Well, I I'll go and make the arrangements right now. <laughs> Before you have a chance to change your minds, I'd just like to make a phone call, if you'll excuse me. I mean, please help yourself to more coffee. Wilma, Wilma, didn't you think that was a bit much? Well, except you know he's right. Uh, a little village like this is quite a, a different proposition from a big city. It wouldn't be a good thing for either the villages or us if we moved in and, and then all hated each other. Well, I suppose not, but it's very strange all the same. <clears throat> oh, Lucas. I was just telling Mr. Perkins the coffee's up to your standard. Very good. May I speak to you in confidence? What? Oh, well, yes, of course. Have you, uh, uh, have you decided to stay? Well, nothing's been settled yet. Mr. Perkins is making arrangements now for us to see the house. Oh, but uh, that don't mean, does it, that uh, you're dead set on staying? Oh, no, of course not. The house may not be suitable at all. Although I'll be surprised if it isn't. Well, if it does work out so that you can't stay, I'd like to ask... Oh, uh, wait, wait just a minute. Can't stay? Well, I mean to say, if it works out so as you don't, I'd be most beholden to you if you'd let me come with you when you go. Oh, oh, well, of course, if you want to ride, we'd be perfectly willing to take you along. But Mr. Perkins was just saying... Oh, he don't want me to go. I know that. But uh, it's not fair, is it, uh, to keep a man against his wishing? Um, I'll talk to you again after you've... Uh, I'll talk to you later on. All right. Uh, uh, don't tell Mr. Perkins we spoke. Oh. Well, that was pretty spooky, wasn't it? Yeah. I, I think Lucas has been watching too many late movies. You know, this this whole setup seems... I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see the house, at least. Oh, we're going to like it, Ralph. It's going to be just what we're looking for. Well, splendid. Couldn't have worked out better. Oh, I know you're going to love it here. Uh, Mr. Perkins, when can we see the house? In due time. What do you mean, in due time? Uh, well, what I arranged for just now on the phone was for you to meet the village fathers. It was a lucky thing. They're having a meeting anyway this afternoon on another matter, and... Uh... Why should we meet the village fathers? Oh, didn't I mention it? Well, you'll have to appear before the village fathers before you can consider settling in Sleepy Village. Uh, you'll have to be approved. If a man wants to buy a house in a town that he finds attractive, if he has the money to pay for it, even if one house comprises the entire market, doesn't it seem odd to ask him to appear before the town's governing body and establish his worthiness? But Sleepy Village is a place of many, many odd characteristics. We'll encounter more of them when I return shortly with Act Two. Wishing to escape the overcrowding, the noise, the pollution, the tension of the big city is quite common these days. But perhaps there is such a thing as going too far in the other direction. Ralph Elberson is beginning to think that's just what he and his wife have done. 
They found a place aptly named Sleepy Village. But the mayor, Ellis Perkins, has told them that they must appear before the village fathers and be found acceptable before they may consider settling down. Of all the nonsense I have ever been subjected to, this has got to be the most ridiculous. Unusual, perhaps, Mr. Albertson, but not ridiculous. There are elements involved here that I'm not free to explain to you at this time. Wilma, let's get out of here. Oh, Ralph, not before we see... Before we what? Appear in supplication before a a bunch of small town... No, no, I won't do it, Wilma. You'll be treated with the utmost dignity, Mr. Albertson. Please believe me. What have you got going on here, Mr. Perkins, that you're so careful about? I mean, you don't screen people like this unless there's something going on that you can't afford to let become generally known. Well, you're quite wrong about that, Mr. Albertson. We're very proud. I don't see why you have to be so suspicious, Ralph. They just want to make sure we're compatible. Exactly. As she said it exactly, Mr. Albertson. And we have nothing to lose. Well, now... Are you really so taken with this place? I guess I really am. (sighs) All right. All right, for that reason and no other, I'll talk to your village fathers. But don't either of you expect me to get down on my knees. Meeting starts promptly at 3.30. Oh, Ralph, surely you don't think... I think we're damn fools for having any part of this if you really want to know what I think. Miss Perkins. Yes, Lucas. Tell her on the telephone wants to talk to you. I didn't hear the phone ring. Who is it? Uh, wouldn't tell me his name. Just said it was almighty important. I told him I'd tell you that. Oh, dear. I mustn't be late for the meeting. Well, I won't be a minute. Wasn't no call on the telephone, you know. I just told him there was. Lucas, why did you do that? I want to have a word with you. You ain't, uh... Really figuring to stay in Sleepy Village, are you? Well, we're going to see the village fathers. We don't know yet whether we're going to stay or not. Why, I wouldn't. Indeed, I wouldn't, Mr. Albertson, if I was you. Why not, Lucas? Lots of reasons. Well, if it turns out you don't have to stay, you promised to take me away with you, remember? What do you mean, if we don't have to stay? Well, the way it works out sometimes... Oh, here he comes. I better get... Lucas, there wasn't anybody on that phone. There wasn't? No, there wasn't. Was when I talked to him. That's all I know. Well, no time to worry about that now. Are you ready to go? As ready as I'll get, I guess. Uh, Mr. Albertson is an historian of considerable repute. Now, as you all know... The village records have been gathering dust in the archives for too long. Sleepy Village has a proud past. I have no doubt whatever that Miss Robertson could be prevailed upon to go through those records and put them in order and set them down in readable form for all to enjoy. I feel no hesitation whatever in recommending them wholeheartedly as future citizens of Sleepy Village. I never heard of such a thing. I I, I just never in my whole life heard of such a crazy thing. Well, it did seem... Well, I I thought it was sort of funny. Funny? (laughs) Ralph, why don't you just sit down and relax, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, Wilma. No reason why I should take it out on you. Well, it is sort of... Out of proportion. I admit that. But but then there can't be many places like this left in the whole world, do you think? The way things are today. And to keep it this way, I guess they'd have to protect themselves. Otherwise, it would be just like any other small town. Well, I don't like to be interrogated. Congratulations. Oh, oh, oh I am so pleased. They've accepted you. Unanimously, not one single objection. Well, I I can't remember the last time that happened. Okay. So can we go and see the house now and get that over with? What? Oh, the house. Well, now, don't worry about that. I think this calls for a celebration first, don't you? No, I I honestly don't, if you want my opinion. Now, what we better do is take a look at the house and then do something about finding a place to spend the night. Now, 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 now. I'm not going to listen to any arguments about it. You're just going to have to leave everything to me. Well, you have to say one thing for this town. It's not short on hospitality. (laughs) 
Mr. Albertson, I know that today has been an upsetting experience for you, appearing before the village fathers and all, but that's all in the past now, don't you see? You're one of us now, or same as. You and Mrs. Albertson belong here. It's been decided. Oh, decided. Now, look, you and your village fathers have spent the day checking us out. Has it occurred to you at all to wonder how you look to us? I'm as fussy about who lives next door to me as my next door neighbor is. Ralph, please, don't, don't you think... And I don't like people prying into my business. I, I don't like people sitting in judgment, deciding whether or not I'm good enough to mingle with. You use the word neighbor, Mr. Albertson. That's not quite the right word. We're closer than neighbors here. We're more in the nature of a family. Let's say... Let's say you were considering adopting a child. Now, you'd want to know something about him, wouldn't you? His background. What it would be like living in the same house with him. Mr. Perkins, I did not come here to be adopted. I came here thinking that maybe, just maybe, I, I might want to buy a house and settle down here. And, but at this moment, it doesn't seem like a very good idea. Oh, dear, dear. Uh, Mrs. Albertson, you don't feel the same way your husband does, do you? Not as strongly, I guess, but I... Well, I can see his point. Well, oh, it'll, it'll work itself out. Would you two care for another sip of brandy before bedtime? No, no, thank you. If we're going to find a motel with a vacancy, I think we'd better start looking right now. Oh, oh, oh no, no. That won't be necessary. The nearest motel that I know of, uh, oh, well, it's just the other side of Morbury anyway, and that's close on to a 50-mile drive. All the more reason for starting now. And my guest room upstairs is a good deal more comfortable than any motel room you're apt to find around these parts. Uh, Mr. Perkins, I, I really do appreciate your hospitality. I don't want you to think that I don't, but... <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is nonsense. This just isn't the way things are done. Uh, you, you'll find that things are not done in Sleepy Village the way they're done outside. Really, Mr. Albertson, we're exactly what you came looking for. And now you're resisting it. Why? If you can believe that such a place might exist, believe it strongly enough to set out on a journey looking for it, why do you find it so difficult to believe that it does exist once you found your way to it? You know he's right, Ralph. It's well, it's, there's just something creepy about it. All right, we'll we'll spend the night here, Mr. Perkins. I'm sorry if I've seemed rude, but. No, it's very kind of you, I'm sure. Yes, thank you. We'll stay. Lucas? Oh, Lucas? Yes, Mr. Perkins. I was just about to go on upstairs to uh, Come in here for a minute, please, will you? I want to talk to you. Oh, sit down, will you? You don't have to act like a servant. Well, as long as I am one. Reckon I might as well act like one. Lucas, you're not planning to do anything foolish, are you? I don't know what you mean, Mr. Perkins. You remember the Collinses? The night they spent here before they moved into the old Bradley place? Oh. And I wouldn't want a repetition of that. The Albertsons have seen the village fathers and been accepted. It's all settled. You'd be very unwise to interfere. Well, no, I wouldn't do that, Mr. Perkins. Uh, <laughs> that there with the Collinses, that was a long time ago. Before I'd got rightly settled in, you might say. You don't have to worry. Good. Because it wouldn't work anyway. I give you my word. It wouldn't work at all. Wilma, I suppose you think I've overreacted, but this is the damnedest thing I ever heard of. Yes, but it, it's kind of sweet, don't you think? Ralph? I might think so, yes, if it weren't for the village fathers and their interrogation. I didn't like that, Wilma. 
No, but once we're part of the village... I still won't like it. I'm not at all sure yet that we're going to be part of the village. I have a feeling, though. No, there's more to this than old Perkins has told us. This, I don't know, there's some kind of a catch. I, I get a wrong feeling. What was that? <laughs> How settling. Or somebody knocking at the door. Somebody knocking? I'll see who it is. Oh, oh yes, Lucas. Uh, I, uh, I have to talk to you. Well, we're all ready for bed. Can't I wait until morning? Oh, I got to get it settled tonight, Mr. Albertson. If I can, I got to. Can I come in and shut the door? It's okay, Ralph. Okay. All right. Uh, what is it, Lucas? You folks don't really want to stay in this place, do you? Well, we haven't decided yet. We haven't seen the house. We like the town all right. But, of course, we, we can't decide anything definite until we've seen the house. House ain't got nothing to do with it, Mrs. Albertson. Nothing whatsoever. Of course it has. We'd be living there. Lucas, Lucas, do you have something to tell us? Is there something about this place that we ought to know before we make up our minds? There sure as shooting is. But I don't know if you're going to believe me when I tell you. The Collinses didn't. Collinses? Last folks come looking for a house to live in here before you. Been, oh, eight, ten years now. Eight or ten years since anybody's been here asking about a house? Out of the way place, this. More than you know. You don't just stumble onto Sleepy Village. You got to be, uh, well, I don't know, led, I guess. I told the Collinses that, but they wouldn't believe me. No, wait a minute, Lucas. Led by whom? Well, I couldn't say. I asked the Collinses to take me away with them, too, but they didn't go. They stayed. Still here. Always will be now, of course. I can't understand why you keep asking people to take you away with them, Lucas. I mean, if you want to leave Sleepy Village, why don't you just leave? Oh, no. Well, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't if I tried it all by myself. I think you ought to make up your mind to get out of here, Mr. Albertson. Not just so as you can take me with you, but for your own good. Maybe they'll still let you go. Let us go? Well, damn well let us go if we want to go. I sure hope so. We could still leave tonight. Better chance to get away after dark than in the daytime. Now, look, you, you're going to have to explain that, Lucas. If you want us to take you away with us in case we go, well, you're going to have to tell us what is going on here. Well, they're all dead, you know. Uh, not me. I don't think. But all the rest of them's dead as dead can be. Been dead for years. A village full of dead people? People who walk the streets, speak with a Down East accent, overeat at dinner time, quarrel, behave in other words as we expect living people to behave? Well, to clear that one up, it would be necessary to define death which would involve defining life. Would you care to try? Perhaps the definitions will be forthcoming when I return shortly with Act Three. One of man's major preoccupations ever since he became man has been with life after death and the form it will take. That it will take some form he must believe, for the mortal span is too brief to be acceptable as the entire package. He delves, seeks, and pries, and sometimes, at strange moments snatched from the commonplace, he seems to get a glimpse. Oh, but you can't possibly go. It's never happened before. Then this will be the first time, Mr. Perkins, because we are going. Well, no, no, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go and have a look at your house and then come back here and discuss it over a good, hearty breakfast. How does that strike you? Well, frankly, it leaves me cold. We'll get our breakfast along the road somewhere. Oh, dear. Uh, Mrs. Albertson... I have to agree with my husband. It, it seems a shame, but I... I don't see how we could possibly be happy here. 
Not that I believe what Lucas says for a minute, but... What does Lucas say? Oh. Oh, that's, that's not important. We're grateful for your hospitality, Mr. Perkins, and we both agree that you have a beautiful little village here, but, well, it's just not for us. Now, we're all packed. We'll be out of here in a few minutes. <laughs> be hard. Hard to find another place we like as much. You'll never find one as spooky, if that's what you mean. Ralph? Yes? Do you believe what Lucas says? Well, that everybody in town is dead? What's that up ahead? Hmm? I, I can't tell. It looks like a, uh, like a tree across the road or a telephone pole, maybe. There's a man there. See? Uh, off to the right. Oh, good. That the two of us ought to be able to clear that thing off the road without too much trouble. Ralph? He's got a gun. What the hell? Can't get through this way, mister. Sure we can. The two of us can move that log. Ain't nobody moving the log. Or driving through. Better just turn back. Only thing you can do. Let's turn around, Ralph. The way he's holding that gun... Hey, what he... is this? A roadblock? Are you trying to force us to turn back? Got this shotgun here, Mr. Alberton. Sure hope I don't have to use it. I was waiting for you to come back. When I do sit down, I know you're angry. Angry? But... You don't know the half of it. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Well, I intend to explain everything. You mentioned earlier that Lucas told you something, Mrs. Albertson. Do you mind telling me what it was? What did he say? He... He said you're all dead. He said everybody in the village is dead, except him. Yes. Well, he is too, of course. What are you talking about? Oh, it's quite true. We're all changed over. We're all dead, if you want to use that word, although, as you can see, it isn't accurate. We've finished with the life you're experiencing now... And gone on to the next. Oh, cut it out, Perkins. Ralph, you wanted him to explain? Thank you, Mrs. Albertson. It isn't an easy thing to give credence to in the beginning, I know. Continued existence after what you think of as death is as natural as your having been born in the first place. People are not simply extinguished when they... Finish the first phase. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Perkins, but I, I, I just don't buy it. Why would you want us to settle in your village? We're not dead. Two living persons in a village full of dead people. Why? A sleepy village is not the place you drive to. It's a place you think yourself into when you're sufficiently repelled by the society, the circumstances which is to say the life in which you find yourself trapped. Then you find your way to Sleepy Village. And once you've done that, you become candidates for residence. Then what you mean is... Candidates that... for death. Is that what you're trying to tell us? Well, now, it isn't death as you think of it, Mr. Albertson. You'll have to change over, yes, but you'll hardly notice it. Dead is dead as I see it, no matter what comes after. The very fact that you found us, found your way to our village, implies a natural readiness for the change. It's... Uh, well, don't you understand that it's more than half done already? You're here... That says all that needs to be said. Mm. Uh, Mr. Perkins, I think I'd like to be alone with my wife for, for a while, if you don't mind. Uh, will you come with me, Wilma? A remarkable thing is about to happen to us, and we need to make ourselves ready. Yes, yes, that's very good. Well, I'm not ready. I won't be ready. You know, I don't understand you at all, Ralph. Why do you suddenly... No, no, please, please, Wilma. We want to make the change gracefully, don't we? 
We need to prepare ourselves. Wilma, do you think for a minute that I'm going Are to... Are you sick? No way. I just realized that they have to be humored, that's all. Uh, look, we've, we've somehow found our way into a village full of nuts. That's what's happened. Now, look, we, we, we've got to play it their way if we hope to get out of here in one piece. Because that idiot downstairs means what he says. Lucas. Where's Lucas? He must know how to get away. I don't know. I think he expected to ride out of town with us in the car. All the same, I think we ought to see if we can find him. Well, let's give him a little time. I have a feeling he'll come to us. <laughs> There, that'll be Lucas. Uh, 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 Lucas, come in. Where is Perkins? Uh, went out a while back. I waited a few minutes before I come up just to make sure he wasn't still snooping around. I expect he's making the arrangements about you folks right this minute. Arrangements? Well, you know, they won't want to waste any more time than they have to. Well, you folks been cutting up. Lucas, Lucas, can you get us out of here? I think I can sneak us out all right. It's going to be easy, though. Lucas, if you knew the roads would be blocked, then you weren't expecting just a ride out of town with us in the car, were you? I uh, might have yesterday. Hid in the trunk or somewheres. Well, if it's just a matter of walking out, not going by car, why haven't you done it long ago? Why wait for somebody to take you? Well, it's a funny thing. I've gone as far as the village line a hundred times or more. But I just don't seem to be able to push my way across it somehow, standing there all by myself. I can't say why. Well, what makes you think it would be any easier if we were with you? I always figured if I had somebody there with me, holding my hand, as you might say, I could make a... Never do it without, I know that. All right. Uh, can we leave now? Have to leave your car behind and your suitcases and them things. Well, we'll come back for them. I intend to come back here with the police and clean this place out. Uh, yep. Well, I wouldn't count on it if I were you. Now, just walk along natural, talking and uh, going on like I was uh, showing you around. Here's how we'll do it. We'll go over and cross the line right in back of the church. Village ends right there in back of the church. Yeah, won't they be patrolling there? I wouldn't think so, no, no. The village folk don't go in back of the church. Never. Why not? Something back there scares them off, seems like. Lucas, you say everybody in the village is dead. Everybody but you. Uh, yep. How does it happen you're not? Wondered about that a good deal myself. Come to the conclusion, it just slipped their minds. I wasn't important enough for folks to take much notice of when I showed up. How did you happen to come here in the first place? I can't hardly recall anymore. I was hitching at the time. Hitchhiking? Uh, yep. Mr. Perkins put me right to work as soon as the village father said it was all right. His wife had just made the second change and he needed somebody. The second change? Oh, well, they die. Well, they don't live forever here in the village. Second changeover, they call it, and I reckon that's what it is. Oh, they're dead, all right. Everybody but us. That's the line. Right there at the foot of that old oak tree. Other side of the oaks, out of the village. Well, why do we have to hide here? Can't we just walk across the line and be out of the village? Not and be sure somebody won't take a pot at us as we can't. Ain't nobody ever got out of this village, to my knowledge, once they've been accepted by the village fathers. I ain't sure I can make it. What? What do you mean? Well, if I get to hold him back, now you just take my hands and pull. You hear me? No matter what I say, you drag me on across that line, past that old oak. But if you ask us not... Don't pay me no mind. Drag me over by the heels if you have to. Well, time to go, I reckon. Here, take me by the hands, both of you. What, were well, you shaking like a leaf? I ain't never been so scared in my whole life. And you two just walk on up to that tree and across. Come on, huh? 
come on, don't hang well, back. I'll just stay on here, see that you two get across all right, but I'll just stay on here. Oh, come on, let's go. Change my mind, Mr. Alberton. I reckon I'll just stay on here. No. Now, we're taking you with us whether you like it or not. That's what you asked us to do, and that's what we're doing. Well, that was a while back, Mr. Albertson. <laughs> well, I can change his mind. I'm sorry. Let's let go. Let me go. You let go of me, you hear? I'll, I'll yell for Eric Grafton if you don't. What I said before don't make no difference. You let go of me. You come on, uh, will you? Now, I ain't a going. Eddie, Eddie, down here, back in the church. Shut up. You shut up, you damn fool. Up. We'll push him. Push him. Get behind him. Help. Push him. Help. Oh. He doesn't want to. All he's been talking about for the last 24 hours is trying to get away. Now, come on, you. Oh, help me. Oh, no, there. There. Ah, we're, oh. we're out of their miserable village. Oh. We're across the line, Lucas. Lucas. Ralph. Huh? He's not here. Of, of course he's here. Lucas! Ralph! Look around you! For heaven's sake, look around you! I am! Where the devil did the idiot get to? I don't mean that! Look what this is we're standing in! Just a minute ago, it was a vacant field, and now, look! It's, it's just a... Oh! It's a graveyard! Oh. I didn't notice it before. Oh. It wasn't here before. Ralph. Hmm? Read that. On the headstone. Go ahead, read it. Ellis. It's almost worn away. Ellis. Perkins. 1834 to 1904. And, and this one, uh, over here. Uh, Lucas Madison, 1897 to, to 1963. Ellis Perkins died in 1904, and Lucas Madison in 1963... Well, that's what it said on the headstones. And when Ralph and Wilma looked for it, the village wasn't there. They found nothing but wasteland and an old church, crumbling from age and disrepair. I'll be back shortly. and Ralph Albertson found a fine old colonial house eventually in a lovely little town in Connecticut. And Wilma says dreamily sometimes as they sit down to lunch, I wonder what Ellis Perkins is having for dinner today and who's fixing it for him. Well, sleepy villages may come and go, but Mystery Theater will be back with another account of the improbable but not the impossible our cast included Norman Rose, Martha Greenhouse, Kurt Benson, and Ken Harvey. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Archie Marshall. The world is composed of many different kinds of beliefs and believers. Depending on who you are and where you're from, certain beliefs will seem quite natural and others will not. The world, by and large, has become a more tolerant place than it used to be. But even so, or perhaps for this very reason, there are people who possess beliefs of such fantastical magnitude we can scarcely think they are serious. And yet they are. Deadly serious. Our mystery drama, The Believers, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Percy Granger and stars Christopher Tabori. Someone once said that people believe only in the commonplace, that which they are accustomed to see. But Emerson maintained that we are born believing and that we bear beliefs as trees bear apples. Some feel that you can even measure the depth of a person's soul by the magnitude of his beliefs. But belief is like most other things. Too much of it can be a dangerous thing. We're in a modest country house on the outskirts of a town in the Midwest. Mother, I'm home. Mother, are you in the kitchen? Oh. Mom, where are you? Oh, there you are. You've been in the parlor the whole time. You were sitting so still, I, I didn't even see you. Well, why didn't you answer me? Mom, what's the matter? Uh, be quiet. I'm waiting. Waiting for what? Get away from that window. He, he might see you. Who? Oh, will. What's going on? Something very strange. Oh, I, I, I don't see anyone out there. I know. That's just it. Oh, no, no, Mom. Uh, it's that neighbor of ours, that Mr. Boulevard. Oh, now, Mom, not that again. I tell you, Alan... Something very immoral is happening over there. Now, Mr. Bolivar is a perfectly harmless old guy. How does he make his living? Well, that's none of our business. But we don't know, do we? At least you have an honest job. You leave the house at a decent hour each morning and come home from the factory at a decent hour each evening with a decent day sweat on your brow. Mr. Bolivar never leaves his house at all. Well, maybe he works at home. I mean, we, we see him out in the garden a lot. You do not make a living with a garden. Maybe not. But I sure wish I could get our lawn to grow like his does. Look how green and thick he gets his grass to come in. Yes, just like a cemetery. He's probably got people buried in it. Oh, Mom, you've got to stop spending so much time peeping down the road at his house. I'm not peeping. Something is going on, Alan, and if something is going on, it isn't peeping to try to find out what. You spend your whole day at this window. It's not good for you, Mom. Son, listen to me. It's happened again. What? A woman came to Mr. Bolivar's house. She went in, and she hasn't come out. Is that her car in his driveway? Alan, it's begun to happen more and more often. People drive up to Mr. Bolivar's house, they go in, and that's the last they are seen. They probably leave at night. That's what we thought. But I found out this morning that's not true. But their cars are gone. We've heard them drive away, or you've seen them. Do you remember those people who came yesterday? Well, early this morning, the car left. I heard it. It woke me up just like it always does. But this was the first time it hadn't been pitch dark. It was just after dawn. You'd already gone to work. I rushed to the window, and you know who was driving the car? Even Bolivar himself. And he was all alone. He returned about two hours later on foot. Now you tell me there's nothing wrong going on. Are, are you sure there wasn't anyone else in the car? I'm absolutely positive. And now he's got some fresh victims in there at this very moment. It may already be too late to save them. What do you think we should do? Well, I think you ought to go over there and find out what's happening. Me? 
Well, you two have always had a friendly way for each other. Mama, I had a long day in the factory. I'm tired. Ellen, he always comes out about this time of day to tend his garden. Now, you go wash yourself up and I'll keep watch. What about our supper? Oh, look, there he is now. Hurry, dear. Now's your chance. What am I supposed to say? But I don't know, but... You're a clever boy. Just don't let him know you suspect anything. And don't worry, dear. I'll be watching you. Hello, Mr. Boulevard. Oh, good evening, Alan. How are you? Why, uh, I'm just out for a walk. Oh, really? I've never noticed you were in the habit of taking an evening constitutional. Oh, it's my mother. I, 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 I mean, uh, she, she thought it, it would be good for me. <laughs> she doesn't think you get enough exercise on that assembly line, huh? I guess not. How is your mother these days? Oh, she always seems to find something to do. <laughs> oh, my mother was the same way. Yet I suspected she wasn't really happy. In fact, when I began to look around me, I discovered that to be true about a great number of people. We find a hundred different ways to distract ourselves from the simple fact that we are discontented. And do you know why we're discontented, Alan? No, no, why? Because our lives are in the hands of other people. Our employers, our parents, and most of all, the government. People in positions of authority, ready to bend our lives to their whims. I think I'm pretty happy. Are you? Really? I don't think so. Why not? Well, you seem, um, uh, well, preoccupied, bothered by something. Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm not at all. Well, so you say. And yet you aren't looking at me as you speak. Why, well, I, 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 I was just looking at your lawn. I've always admired how you get your grass to grow in so thick, and... Well, I've, I've tried receding our yard several times. It just never comes out like this. I think you're evading the issue, Alan. Well, sure, I... I could be happier. Who couldn't? I mean, I'd like to find a girlfriend. Like to get a raise in my salary so I could afford some of the things I've always wanted... Like a motorboat, a camper bus. <laughs> Alan, these aren't things that make a person happy. They're simply further distractions. You seem pretty happy. Oh, I'm even more discontented than most. But I am doing something about it. Really? What's that? Well, let's say I have a belief, an abiding faith. In God? Oh, of course, in God, but in something else as well. What? That we can improve upon the life we've all been forced to lead. I sometimes wonder how. I guess I could use a little belief, too. Could you? If I thought it would help. Well, not everybody is capable of belief. Why not? Well, a great belief requires a great man. Well, there are those who would ridicule you. There are those who would ostracize you for what you believe. Could you uh, abide such things? Yeah, I, I mean, if I really had something to believe in, I guess I could. But uh, can you believe, Alan? Can you really believe in something almost beyond comprehension and yet so wonderful, so joyous, that the mere thought of it makes you determined to take control of your own life and free yourself from your discontent once and for all, huh? Well, yeah, if, if that's what it would do, I, I mean, why not? And for such a reward, would you even be willing to run the risk of death? Death? Huh. There may be those who would kill you for your belief. Well, uh, that's a whole new ballgame. I, I don't know. Well, how great is your capacity for belief? Is it as strong as the desires of your heart? That's the truly happy person, Alan. The one who has the courage to follow his vision. Just what is the vision? Nothing less than the chance of a new life. I like you, Alan, and I trust you. You're young, you're strong... And like so many of us, you have a native intelligence that 
is wasted in your present situation. Well, thank you. Can you come over to my house this evening? I'm holding a meeting. What kind of a meeting? That I will tell you when you come. I think when you hear what I have to say, you'll have no qualms at all. Okay, Mr. Bolivar. Well, I'll see. Fine. Oh, about your lawn. I think the reason you're having difficulty is that you're underestimating the properties of the soil. If one will only appreciate its potential, there's no limit to what the earth can yield. Well, what was he saying? He invited me to his house tonight for a meeting. Oh, dear. I don't think I'd better go. Oh, no, absolutely not. Alan, you're all I've got. I could never forgive myself if you disappeared. What did he say the meeting was about? Belief. Belief? In, in what? Some kind of new life. He said he'd explain it all at the meeting. Oh, but you're right. I don't think I should go. Uh, what time is the meeting? Eight o'clock. If I make you your dinner right away, you can be finished by then. What? Now, I think you've got to go. Oh, not a moment. Well, we've got to find out what is happening, don't we? I mean, all those poor people. Maybe we should just call the police. No. What if they didn't find anything? Then Mr. Bolivar would be after us. But I'd be putting my life in danger, Mom. Uh, well, yes. Yeah, but forewarned is forearmed. You'll be prepared. And, Alan, you're much bigger than he is. What can he possibly do to you? Yeah, but... Uh... Anyway, it's a meeting, isn't it? I mean, there will be other people there, so you outnumber him. No, you have to go, son. I want to know what's going on. <laughs> Oh, Alan, good. You decided to come. I'm sorry if I'm late. We just finished supper. Oh, that's perfectly understandable. You're not late at all. Come into the parlor. That's about to begin. I'll introduce you to the other person. The, the other? You mean there's only one? Hello. Joan Larkin, this is Alan Pearson. Alan's a neighbor of mine. How do you do? Oh, hello. Well, I guess we can begin. No one else is coming? I don't think so. Not not tonight. But as we tend to forget in this day and age of mass conformity, even two individuals can make a quorum. And now, Alan, if you'll have a seat next to Joan, I'll welcome you to our society and tell you exactly why you're here. A precipice is something villains traditionally leave heroes verging on at the end of an act. But no matter how high the precipice, one can always see where he will fall if he fails to hang on. A precipice of the mind is an altogether different matter, for it affords no view of the abyss that awaits the hapless victim. We'll find out what kind of a precipice Alan's mother's curiosity has landed him on when I return with Act Two. Secret society is as old as mankind. Small groups of people who consider themselves the elect have always formed clandestine groups and flattered themselves with secret codes and rituals, and sometimes with secret knowledge. Knowledge that they feel gives them insight to the mysteries of life and death. Evan Bolivar has spoken cryptically of the chance of a new life, the chance to escape this world. Let us rejoin him to find out more. Are you sure we shouldn't wait until more people show up? Oh, there won't be any more people tonight, Alan. It's just you and Joan. What kind of society is this? Doesn't he know, Mr. Bolivar? Not yet, Joan. You mean you do? Of course. Joan has traveled a great distance to be here tonight. All the way from Lipitsky, Ohio. I don't ever want to hear that name again. You mean you know what's going to happen? Of course I do. 
That's why I'm here. Now I'm going to have to wait. I'm sorry, Joan. Your intended partner's had a last-minute change of heart. That happens frequently under the circumstances it's to be expected. They can't be blamed, and there's nothing to be done about it. But you'll have to give Alan time to think about it, and I'm all ready to make the journey now. Well, that'll be up to Alan. What kind of journey are you talking about? Uh, what, what's the name of this society? We call ourselves the Hollow Earth Club. The Hollow Earth Club? Mm hmm You... You mean you think the Earth is hollow? We don't think so, Alan. We know it is. We have proof. This is the other world I was speaking of. It's not somewhere off in space or in the heavens. It exists right here, inside our own. It's a civilization of people superior to us in every way, technically and culturally. They live deep inside the Earth, in towering cities of... Shimmering crystal. <laughs> oh, Mr. Boulevard, excuse me. <laughs> but, I, I mean, are you serious? Well, where did you ever get a notion like this? The notion has been around for centuries. There are references to the civilization of Hollow Earth in texts dating back to ancient times. The ancient Hebrews and Greeks knew of its existence. Oh, but those were just myths. Many governments have mounted expeditions to try to go into Hollow Earth. During World War II, the Germans sent a specially outfitted U-boat into the Arctic. The boat never returned. Every government-sponsored expedition has met with disaster. Why? Because governments are only interested in interfering and taking over. The Hollow Earth people do not approve of the mess we've made of surface Earth and want no part of it. That's why they've chosen to stay underground. If these people... Don't let government expeditions into their, um, their, their domain. Well, what makes you think they'll let you go down there? That, Alan, is the chance we take. That is the risk I spoke of this afternoon. It's very important that we make the journey with compassion and understanding. They must know that we respect them and have no desire other than to flee the same world they once did. You still look skeptical. Why, it's a pretty fantastic theory. No, Alan, you're wrong. Oh, but everyone knows the Earth is solid as a rock. Joan, I guess we're going to have to show Alan our proof, aren't we? You mean you have proof? Thirty years ago, modern man came into actual contact with these wondrous people. Someone's actually seen them? Yes. How? There are large openings at the North and South Poles that lead into hollow Earth. These openings are normally obscured by snow and ice, but Alexander Hobbs, an Arctic explorer, discovered one of them in 1946. He left an account of his visit in a secret diary. It gave me the proof I'd been looking for, and that's when I moved here. Why here? We'll get to that in a moment. If you'll excuse me, I'll fetch Hobbs's diary, and you can hear for yourself what he discovered. Um, Miss Larkin? I, you can call me Joan. Are you seriously planning to go look for this place? Yes. Why? Oh, it doesn't really matter why. Mr. Bolivar said you drove all the way here from Ohio. No, I'd rather not talk about it. Right now, my concern is where I'm going, not where I've been. But you don't really believe you're going to find a civilization of advanced people in the middle of the earth, do you? I believe there's got to be a better world than this one. Was it a man? What? Was it a man? Is that why you're so unhappy? That, that's none of your business. Ah, uh, here we are. Uh, this is Admiral Hobbs' secret diary. Just give me a minute to find the relevant entry. Ah, uh, here we are. The date is May 24th, 1946. My ensign and I were taken from our sled, which we'd used to make the first part of our descent into the crevasse. We were then boarded on a small platform-like conveyance with no wheels. It moved us 
deeper into the earth, and finally toward the glowing city with great swiftness. Soon we arrived at the large building of a type I'd never seen before. It was constructed of a crystal-like material. Our hosts were, for the most part, blonde and extremely pale-complected. They received us cordially because they knew we came with no malice. That sounds like something out of Buck Rogers. <laughs> it does indeed. Well, where'd you get that diary from, anyway? It was entrusted to me by a survivor of the expedition. It goes on to describe in detail the, the nature of the life there. In all respects, an ideal existence. Are we going to have to go all the way to the North Pole? No. No, as I mentioned, I moved to this part of the country for a reason. Beneath the fields around our houses here, there is an extensive cave system. I spent three years digging a tunnel to those caves, the entrance to which is in this very room. Where? Oh, you may see for yourself. If you'll just give me a hand with this rug, yeah? Huh? Now, if you'll look carefully, you'll notice the floorboards have been cut to create a trap door. Look! There it is, the entrance to Hollow Earth. Huh. I have hard hats, lights, and boots, everything you'll need for the descent. Why do you keep the entrance hidden? Uh, I may be paranoid, but I am convinced that the people of Hollow Earth have their eye on us at all times. Our success depends on their goodwill. And that, in turn, depends on our discretion. And you, you think this cave system will lead you to Hollow Earth? Just, just, just like those holes in the Arctic? I know it will. A great many members of our society have already made their descent. And not a single one has returned. Oh, there could be another explanation for that. I don't think it was a good idea to try bringing Alan into our club, Mr. Bolivar. He's not taking any of this seriously. Mr. Bolivar, just what is in this for you? Nothing. What's the catch? The members of your club have to pay some enormous sum of money or sign over all their worldly possessions to you before they can go for a ride in your magic tunnel? My only intention is to help people to a chance for a better life. I don't ask for anything in return. Well, what would you do if I decided not to go? Nothing. But I know your secret. It's no secret, Alan. It's true we don't seek publicity. But the reasons for that should be obvious. Naturally, people would think we were crackpots. And if I say no? Well, that's up to you. You mean I could leave? All I would ask is that you be discreet about what you've learned this evening. Well, oh, okay then. Uh, I, I think I think I'll just go home. All right. Uh, but what's going to happen to Miss Larkin? I'm going down. Alone? But doesn't it bother you that all those other people have just vanished down there? No. Mr. Boulevard, you're not going to let her go down there by herself, are you? Oh, I'd feel much better about it if she were accompanied, of course. But she won't stop her? No. What's the matter, Alan? You having second thoughts? I don't think it's right she should go down there alone. I can take care of myself. Oh, Joan, Alan's right. But he doesn't believe. Well, perhaps not yet. But his concern for your safety shows a charitable nature, of which I'm sure the Hollow Earth people will approve. Besides, unless I'm very much mistaken, I think I detect just a glimmer of curiosity in him. And curiosity is the beginning of belief. How you doing? I'm all right. This is something, isn't it? I've lived here all my life and never, never knew about these caves. I bet we're passing into my house at this very minute. Be quiet. The less they hear of your inane chit-chat, the better. You think they're listening to us, too, huh? I wish you hadn't decided to come. I feel very unsafe with you. I'm as curious as the next guy. I've always liked Mr. Bolivar. And I think his theory is, um, 
kind of neat. Oh, please don't talk like that. They're not going to let anyone enter who just thinks it's all a big joke. Oh, now, you're not one of those people who's determined to be unhappy no matter what happens, are you? Shh. Because, you know, you're not bad looking, you know. How'd you ever get some boy to leave you in the lurch? How do you know that's what happened? I don't. Joan, stop. Stop and listen to me. My mother's seen a lot of people come into Mr. Boulevard's house. And she's never seen anyone leave it. Mr. Boulevard drives their cars away and comes home on foot. Your precious mother. Now, Joan, I'm being serious. You don't really think those people didn't return because they found some underground El Dorado, do you? Why not? A hundred things could have happened to them. They could have fallen off a ledge or gotten lost or starved to death. Or maybe they just walked right out the other end somewhere into a cornfield and were so embarrassed they just went home. This is still all a big joke to you, isn't it? I'll get serious when you do. I am. I don't believe it. No one could get hurt so badly that they'd have to buy this crazy story supported by nothing but a fake diary. And I think we've let this whole thing go on long enough. Now let's just turn around and go back to reality. You have no right to give me orders. You can do whatever you want to, Alan. But I am going on. Chauncey Depew once declared that it hurt more to have a tooth pulled than a belief destroyed. Because there is no such thing as Novocaine for the mind. Clearly, Joan Larkin is determined not to have Alan Pearson play dentist to her belief that the answer to the ills of the world is to escape to some legendary underground kingdom. On the other hand, I may have used the word legendary with ill-advised haste, for as fantastic as the Hollow Earth Club may seem, can we be certain that their journey will come to naught? I'll return with our concluding act in a few moments. Curiosity killed the cat, and it's probably been responsible for a lot of other misdemeanors as well. As for the two people whose separate stories have brought them together under the bizarre circumstances we have been following, only one is motivated by curiosity. The other is driven by a desire to escape, and we can only speculate as to how deep that desire must be. Curiosity and desperation, not Ideal traveling companions, I should say. Especially when the journey is as unusual and possibly dangerous as the one they are on. Joan, Joan, stop for a minute. Uh, what, what's the matter now? Now, don't you think we've gone far enough? We haven't found the hollow earth civilization yet. I mean, haven't we carried this whole crazy adventure far enough? Alan, you can turn around any time you want now, to. I told you... I'm not going to leave you down here alone. Go ahead. It wouldn't be the first time. Oh, what does that mean? I've been left alone before. At least down here, nothing can hurt me. Uh, I wouldn't be real sure about that. Are you getting scared? Frankly, yes. I don't have the same stake in this venture that you do. Oh, that's right. For you, it's just a lark. Have you thought this whole thing out? I mean, just... How do you think you're going to make contact with this so-called civilization? They know we're coming. When we've gone far enough to satisfy them that our intentions are serious, they'll make themselves known to us and take us the rest of the way. How do you suppose these crystal cities function, huh? I don't know. I mean, what do they eat? Plants can't grow without sunlight. Life can't exist in total darkness. Please stop talking like this. If you sneer at them, they may not let us in. Suppose I don't stop. What do you mean? Suppose I don't stop sneering. Hey, you Hollow Earth people, here we come, ready or not. Stop it. They'll hear you. <laughs> well, that's the idea. I mean, what if I get them really riled up? Will you turn around and come back then? No. You have no right to do this. Oh, they may decide to get nasty on... Joan, wait a minute. I'm going on. Joan, oh, okay, okay, okay. Wait up. 
You all right? Oh, I just tripped, that's all. Ooh. Oh. Oh, almost got me, too. Hey, there's... There's something here. What is it, anyway? Shine your light over. Oh! Oh, my gosh. It's a body. Stay back. Uh, let, let me see if I... Is... Is, is he... Yes. He's dead. Oh. Are you all right? Shine the light on his face. Uh, John. Please. Oh, it's Mr. Franklin. You know him? I met him at one of our meetings. He was a member of the Hollow Earth Club? Yes. I wonder what happened. Oh, he must have slipped and struck his head. Yeah, look, we've got to get back up and report this. No. No, I'm going on. Now, Joan. I've come this far. I can't turn back now. He needs to be given a decent burial. He is buried. And as for decent, this is as decent a burial as he would ever get. He was all alone in the world, too. I'm, I'm going on. Joan. I want to get away from you. Okay, you win. I'm not going any further. That's fine with me. I'm sorry I laughed at you. Oh, skip it. So long. Goodbye, Joan. Joan? Joan, what's the matter? Oh, no. What? The others. All the others. They're here. Look at that. There must be two dozen bodies. Are they all members of the club? Yes. yes. <laughs> now, Joan, look. Oh. I, I don't want to become a nag. But I, I think we'd better turn back. Oh. No. Now, now, listen, it's ridiculous to continue. Look at this. They're all dead. Miss, I, I know you're right. What's that noise? What? Shh, shh. I hear something. Someone's coming. Yes. But from which direction? It's hard to tell. Turn off your light. It, it sounds like they're behind us. Look, there's a light. Hello? Somebody there? Mr. Bolivar? Alan? Joan? Uh, oh, hello. I didn't expect to catch up with you so quickly. Well, why are you coming down now? I thought you were going to wait until the last of our members came. I was, but I'm afraid I had no choice. I just had a visit from the police. The police? What did they want? I didn't wait around to find out. Why not, Mr. Boulevard? Well, I'm sorry for those members who will not be able to make the journey with us, but my top priority must be to protect the people of Hollow Earth from the authorities. The government must not be allowed to interfere. Mr. Boulevard, we were just about to turn around. You mean go back to surface Earth? Yes. Why? Look. Shine your light on the passageway in front of us. Oh, what's happened? We don't know. But they're all dead. But, but these are, these are all of us. Oh, the fools. I told them over and over that... Purity of intent was absolutely necessary. Oh, you don't think that... Well, clearly, the people of Hollow Earth did not want them to go any further. You think they were killed by your super-civilized underground people? Well, even civilized people have the right to defend themselves. Well, Alan, if you had any lingering doubts about the existence of the world into which we are descending, this should certainly dispel them. Is Joan all right? Yes, I, I think so. Good. Then let's push on. Push on? You intend to keep going? Of course. I'm sorry, Mr. Boulevard, but Joan and I have changed our minds. You have? Joan, is that true? Uh, yes. Someone has to be notified about these bodies. I see. Well, this does present a problem. Why? As I said, my first priority must be to protect the people of Hollow Earth from government intrusion. What would my chances be of gaining admittance to their world if I let you go back to surface Earth and you told the authorities about this secret entrance? 
I'm afraid we'll have to, Mr. Bolivar, because of all these bodies. I'm afraid you won't. Alan, he's got a gun. That's right. Oh, um, if you two will just walk along in front of me, we will proceed. Do you suppose the people of Hollow Earth are going to want someone in their midst who carries a pistol? They'll understand that it was in their best interest, Alan. Tell me, Mr. Boulevard, what are you going to do when we come to the bottom of this cave and there's still no sign of a crystal city? Mr. Boulevard? Alan, look behind us. He isn't there. What? Mr. Bolivar! Mr. Bolivar! Bolivar! What happened to him? Where did he go? He must have slipped and fallen over this ledge and into that chasm. Oh, he's gone for good then. Look! Our lights don't even reach the bottom. Alan, let's get out of here. <laughs> Give me your hand. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, well, the police must have left. We better call them back right wait, away. Wait, before you do, Alan. I want to go. Why? I don't want to talk to the police. I don't want to have to give them a statement. Joan, you're not in some kind of trouble, are you, with the law? No, it's not that. I just don't want to talk about why I was here. Where are you going? Home. You know, Joan, if you wanted to stick around here for a while, I, I you know, I mean... Uh... No. Thank you, Alan. But I think I'd better go. Well, maybe I could come and visit you sometime. It's a long drive. Well, I wouldn't mind. You wouldn't? No. Well... <laughs> I like that. Pitsky, Ohio, right? Yes. I'll give you a 15-minute head start before I'll call the police. Thank you, Alan. Mother, I'm home. Thank goodness. Oh, Helen, I've been so worried. Where did you go? I called the police, but when they went to Mr. Bolivar's house, they said no one was there. Oh, so it was you who called them. Are you all right? Oh, look at you. You're all covered with dirt. What happened? I'll explain in a minute, Mom. I have to call the police. Why? Alan, where's Mr. Bolivar? He's dead. Dead? Alan, you didn't... No, no, no. You said you wanted to know what was going on. But I don't think you're going to believe it. Mr. Bolivar was president of something called the Hollow Earth Club. How? What in heaven's name is that? Well, it was a group of people who believed the Earth is hollow and that an advanced civilization lived down there. How ridiculous. Oh, I always suspected Mr. Bolivar was pixelated. The reason you never saw anyone leave the house is because they're all going down through a tunnel into a cave system to try to find this place. Really? And that's where you were when the police came by? Yeah. Well, did you find it? Oh, Mother, of course not. What we found were the dead bodies of all the club members. Oh, how did they die? I don't know. Mr. Boulevard tried to force us to continue at gunpoint, but then he slipped and... And what? What? Why? Didn't we hear anything? Alan! I was going to say he fell into a chasm. But we should have heard something. We? Who was this we? There was a girl there, too. Oh, was she pretty? Mother, something's wrong. Was she pretty? And those dead people, those dead people, how did they die? There weren't any marks on them. Alan, what are you talking about? Alan, where are you going? I thought you were going to call the police. Not yet. Hey, uh, I, I just want to check some things out first. Uh, don't leave me alone. I, I'll come with you. Alan, I 
I don't think we should just go into Mr. Bolivar's house like this. There's no need to lower your voice, Mother. Mr. Bolivar's dead, remember? Now, how can you be sure? You said you didn't hear anything. You come through here. What are you going to do? I want to go back down in that cave and have a closer look at those bodies. Help me move back this rug. Oh, Alan, why don't you just let the police take care of this? I want to see for myself. There we are. What? There's a trap door. It leads to the tunnel that takes you into the cave. Now, Mr. Bolivar said it took him three years to dig it. What? What's the matter? Mother. The tunnel. It's gone. You mean someone filled it in? The earth. It's packed solid. It's like there was never a tunnel here at all. Are you sure you have the right trap door? Of course I do. Well, looks to me like someone doesn't want you going back down there. Ooh. Well, gracious, dear, I don't know. But we just came up through that tunnel ten minutes ago. How could anyone have filled it in so quickly? Don't look at me, Alan. I've been at home all night. Mother. What if Mr. Bolivar was right? I do not believe today everything I believed yesterday. And I wonder, will I believe tomorrow everything I believed today? So pondered Mark Twain, and so might the rest of us in the sobering afterglow of our story. For even today, it is true that what exists at the center of our planet is as much a mystery as what exists in galaxies millions of light years away. There is one other loose end to our story, but that I can tie up for you when I return shortly. Is it possible that a race of creatures exists and thrives far beneath the Earth's surface? The possibility is a slim one. There is tremendous heat and pressure exerted on the Earth's core. There is radioactivity. And there are all kinds of practical questions. On the other hand, the Earth's diameter is nearly 8,000 miles. That's a lot of territory. As far as from New York to Siberia. A lot could be going on down there. Our cast included Christopher Tabori, John Beale, and Joan Shea. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. 
And this is the doorway to a world of mysterious entertainment. Actually, of course, your ear is the doorway. That marvelous sensitive organ that turns sound into pictures inside your head. But for some, the sightless people of this world, the ear is even more important and more sensitive. The blind can learn to do astonishing things and to cope with many situations. But can a sightless man stand up against someone who has not only eyes and ears, but a gun? That's the challenge facing Joe Traeger, ex-cop, whose desire for revenge may be stronger than his common sense. Our mystery drama, The Bluff was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Larry Haynes. Meet Richard Pearson, known to his friends as Rick. At the moment, however, Rick doesn't have many friends, only clients. He's a private detective specializing in steady, if unglamorous, corporate cases with an occasional divorce action thrown in for spice. There are days when Rick Pearson regrets ever leaving the police force for private work. And perhaps it was pure nostalgia that led him to the front door of a small white house in Sausalito. Yes? Hello. I'm, uh, I'm looking for Joe Traeger. He lives here, doesn't he? Yes, he lives here. He's my father. Oh, no kidding. And you live here, too? Yes, I'm his daughter. It's a nice arrangement. <laughs> Very nice. I always knew Joe had a daughter, but I guess I visualized something in pigtails and braces about 10, 11 years old. Sorry. I was 10 years old once, but I never had pigtails. <laughs> or braces, for that matter. Now, why don't you tell me who you are? Well, I'm an old friend of your father's. My name is Rick Pearson. I did call. Oh, yes. He said something about an old friend coming over. Only I thought it would be somebody, well, older. Is it all right to come inside now? Of course. Were you one of his officers? Yes, five years ago. San Francisco PD. And how long has it been since you've seen him? Oh, must be five years. I was here on business, so I thought I'd get in touch with him. Well, maybe there's something you don't know about my father. <laughs> yes, I'm blind, Rick. Uh, that's what she's going to tell you. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't look so surprised. I've uh, been blind for two years. Uh, I'm used to it by now. Yeah, you'll get used to it, too. Joe, you didn't say anything when I called. Uh, when I said I'd be glad to see you, uh, that was only a figure of speech. If you'll excuse me. Well... Oh. What do you think of my little girl, Rick? She is a beauty, isn't she? Yeah. Yeah, that was an even bigger surprise. <laughs> well, are you married, Rick? Some gal got you yet? Hmm? Oh, one of them caught me, but she threw me back. I'm divorced. Hey, that's great. I'm glad to hear it. You know, I've been looking for some smart single guy to come along and take this woman off my hands. Uh, hey, Abby, did you hear that? Joe, uh, she left. Your daughter just left. Huh? That's funny. I didn't hear her go. I can usually tell. Yeah, well, she's gone, Joe. Yeah. Well, never mind. Uh, come on, let's go in the study and have a drink. I want to hear all about the last five years. Yeah, sure. And I'd like to hear about last year. Well, come on, tell me about it, Rick. How do you like the private detective racket? Oh, I'm doing okay, Joe. I work for some corporations, industrial spies, stuff like that. That's why I'm here in California tracking down an embezzler. But I just heard this morning they arrested him in Alden. Well, I'm glad you decided to drop by. I don't get to see the old gang much anymore. I don't get to see anybody. Joe. Joe, what happened? I meant what I said about Evie. Propose to her, Rick. Do me a favor and marry her. That's that's the worst part of being blind. Evie clucks around me all day like a mother hen. No, they don't come any more beautiful than Evie. Now, you saw that, didn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. She's a dish, all right. Yeah, just like her mother. 
The image of her mother. Uh, here. Okay, here, look at this. Hmm? It's my wife, Rick. You never met Sylvia. Just look at that picture. Yeah, you're right, Joe. She's beautiful. Isn't she? I know it's crazy, isn't it? A mug like me marrying a woman that beautiful. It's the real curse of this blindness, not being able to see that beautiful face anymore. Yeah, Joe, tell me what happened. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 you don't want to hear long, boring stories. Here, uh, uh, hand me those darts over there, okay? Darts? Yeah, yeah, uh, on the desk. Uh, and uh, why don't you sit down, Rick? Make yourself comfortable. Joe, how did you know I wasn't sitting down? Now, here, uh, let's see if I can get close to that bullseye. <clears throat> How'd I do? That's fantastic. <laughs> well, you just missed the ring next to the bullseye. Oh, wait, well, I can do better than that. <clears throat> yeah, it's a little closer this time. Yeah, oh, no, hey, uh, don't sit on that chair, Rick. Uh, take this one. It's more comfortable. Okay, okay, I give up. How did you know I was standing, and how did you know which chair I was uh, in? <laughs> Not bad for a blind guy, huh? Come on, Joe. Uh, well, okay, okay. It's uh, simple enough. I knew you were standing because I could hear the floor creaking where you were at. And I knew you were in that chair because of where your voice came from. And the darts? Oh, <laughs> can't give away all my secrets, Rick. Come back for dinner tonight. Maybe I'll show you a few more tricks. Mr. Pearson? Hmm? Uh, Mr. Pearson, wait. Oh, hi, Evie. Listen, why don't you call me Rick? Could I talk to you a minute? Sure, I'd be delighted. In here, please. Good. Listen, uh, maybe you can tell me a few things I don't know. I can show you something you don't know. Come over here, by the window. Yeah, okay. Look out into the garden. Do you see her? Well, I see somebody. Who is it? My mother. Sylvia? I never met her, you know. How's she taking all this? Look closely, Mr. Pearson. Rick. Look very closely at her face. Okay. Good Lord. Not many people see her looking like that. She wears a mask when she's indoors. A mask that they made especially to hide her disfigurement. Well, what in heaven's name happened to her? The same thing that happened to my father. And what was that Joe didn't tell me? It isn't just my mother's face that was destroyed. A part of her mind was, too. She doesn't speak anymore. But it's the only change my father is aware of. Do you understand? No. No, I don't understand a thing. Why don't you tell me right from the beginning? All right. I will. It was because of Wolf Lang. The Wolf Lang? That's right. I'm sure you remember him. Oh, yeah, sure. He's in the Gangster Hall of Fame by now. I don't even know if he's still alive. Oh, yes. He's alive. Sick, but alive. They keep him in an iron lung at some private hospital. Funny, isn't it? All those state and federal efforts to put him in prison, and polio does it. Who says there isn't any justice? I never said it. I do. It started about four years ago when Wolf Lang moved his operation to the West Coast. Daddy headed up a police task force to keep him in line. They weren't out to get him. The most they wanted to do was contain him. But you know Daddy. He wanted all or nothing. Daddy was putting together a case against Lang that would have guaranteed his indictment. He kept very quiet about it, of course, but not quiet enough. In my opinion, he told one cop too many. And what happened? It was a night in June. A beautiful spring night. Daddy was in the study when the doorbell rang. Evening, Mrs. Traeger. Who is it, Sylvia? I've got something for you, Mrs. Traeger. Sylvia! <laughs> Daddy rushed out into the hallway when he heard Mother scream. She was holding her face in both hands. The body was 
twisted with pain, and the man who threw the acid was still in the doorway, almost as if he was enjoying watching her. He had a glass in his hand. Daddy went for him, of course, and that's what he wanted, because he threw what was left of the acid straight into Daddy's eyes. Good Lord. He was blinded, Rick. Mother's sight was spared because he only splashed the lower part of her face. But so heavily that she was burned terribly. Even the bone was eaten by the corrosive. Were they alone? Yes. I was out. You can imagine what it was like to come home and find them both. My father blinded and helpless. And my mother unconscious from the pain. Disfigured. I never heard about this, Evie. Why didn't it hit the papers big? They didn't let it. They were hoping to make the assailant careless. It didn't work. But you said that Wolf Lang was the guy. There wasn't any proof, Rick. Daddy's case was only half completed. And he couldn't identify the acid thrower, could he? He was blind. Yeah. And your mother? She might have seen his face. We don't know. But she never spoke again, Rick. She still hasn't. They say she may never speak. She was a beautiful woman, Evie. Yes, and vain, too. At the beginning, they tried plastic surgery, but there was something about her skin. It wouldn't heal. If anything, it made things worse. Can I say something stupid? I'm sorry, Evie, for all of you. But just tell me if there's anything I can do. <laughs> yes. You can come to dinner tomorrow. I still don't understand, Daddy. Who is this man you saw this morning? Uh, it uh, wasn't a man. Uh, it was a doctor. Not feeling well, Joe? No, no, no. Never felt better in my life. Then why the doctor? Yeah, who took you there? Oh, a young cop named Turk Waddell. He uh, used to work for me in the good old days, just like you. Uh, as a matter of fact, the doctor is an uncle of his. You know, he's a really brilliant eye surgeon. Eye surgeon? Well, oh, what the heck, Evie. I've seen a dozen eye doctors already. I might as well see one more, huh? Well, I figured, what could it hurt? <laughs> yes, I, I suppose so. Joe? Hmm? Did this, uh... Does Doctor have anything interesting to say? Oh, yes. Yes, very interesting. He, he uh, he said I could see you again. What? Joe. Joe, are you serious? <laughs> well, I, that's just what I said to him. Are you serious, Doc? Yeah, you think you can give me my eyes back? And he said, sure, no problem. Daddy, I just can't believe this. Every doctor you saw said it was impossible that the retina was destroyed. Oh, forget what those clowns said, Abby. Now I found me a man who knows what he's doing, and what he's doing is operating on me next week. The week after, it uh, depends upon his uh, schedule. Oh, Joe, this is incredible. It's terrific. Oh. It's, it's just fantastic. I've got to speak to this doctor. Uh, 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 you stay out of it, Abby. This is my deal, and I'll take care of it. As a uh, matter of fact, you know, maybe Rick here can help me. Me? How? Yeah, yeah. I've got one more appointment with a doctor tomorrow, and Turk is on duty. Uh, hey, how about picking me up and delivering me there? Sure, Joe. It's a date. And here's the building, Joe, Medical Arts Center. Now, look, why don't I park here and take you right upstairs, huh? Yeah. Forget it, Rick. I'm not going in there. What? I don't have an appointment, Rick. The truth is, I don't have a doctor. Joe, what's this all about? What was all that talk at dinner last night? That was for Evie's benefit. What I said last night, that's what I want Evie to believe. In fact, I want the whole world to believe it, Rick. But I need one guy who knows the truth. What truth? That it was a lie, Rick. There's no doctor, no operation, and no hope for me ever seeing again. Is this your idea of a... Oh, wait a minute. 
Wait a minute now, I'm beginning to see. You're trying to fool Wolf Lang. I, yes, that is almost the bullseye, Rick. I don't expect to trap Lang himself with this trick. Lang is too busy breathing. But his acid-throwing boy is going to be very, very upset when he hears that I'll soon be able to make visual identification. But, Joe, you won't be. He won't know that. Nobody will. Not even my own family. Only you and me, Rick. Now, look, Joe. I'm going to send the news out to all the papers and, and the TV reporters. And how I'm looking forward to the opportunity of seeing a mug book and identifying the guy who threw that stuff at me and my wife. And you know what he'll do, don't you, Joe? He'll try to knock you over before the operation. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, he probably will. You think you can trap this guy by setting yourself up as a target, huh? A game of blind man's bluff, huh? That's the game, Rick. And I don't intend to lose. Blind Man's Bluff is a children's game, of course. But Captain Joe Traeger is planning to play it with the big boys. And the stakes will be life or death. But when you're it in Blind Man's Bluff, you can always remove your blindfold when the game becomes serious. Joe Traeger can't. Will that difference cost him his life? We'll find out when we return with Act Two shortly. Now Private Detective Rick Pearson knows why the carpets were removed from all the floors in the little White House in Sausalito. He realizes why Captain Joe Traeger cherishes every squeaking floorboard, every noise-producing element in his home that might give him warning of approaching danger. He knows that Joe Traeger is relying solely on his ears and his instincts to protect himself from the threat that is almost certain to come. But Rick Pearson doesn't have Joe Traeger's face. Joe, you can't go through with this. You're still blind, and you can't stop a killer without your eye. Uh, it's, uh, it's too late to back down now, Rick. I've already sent out the word. It's in all the papers. It'll be on the 6 o'clock TV news tonight and all the radio stations in this town. Well, you can always retract it. Never. You better not get any ideas about doing it for me. All right. All right, Joe. But just make sure you're protected. Leave town. Go someplace where Wolf Lang and his boys can't get to you. Until when, Rick? Until the operation, huh? You really want to be a decoy, Joe. That's all there is to it. A sitting duck. It is the only thing that is going to work. I can't make it too tough for this guy to get at me or he'll never make his play. But I have got to handle this my way, Rick. Joe, you won't have a chance. He'll get to you one way or another. A long-distance rifle. Maybe. I'll stick to the house. He'll have to come in after me, and he will. Maybe in disguise, you know, a, a messenger or a pair man, something like that. Now, oh, he's going to try, Rick. Don't worry. And when he does, I will nail him. We'll nail him. We? Well, you're a private eye now, right? Your services are for hire, aren't they? Yeah, I'm for hire. Okay, then. You got a job. But I am worried, Daddy. Didn't you hear that man on the news program? He said that the local police were concerned about... about possible danger to you. Oh, no, relax, Evie. They're, you know, just trying to sell newspapers. It was television, Joe. Okay, they were trying to sell soap or used cars or something. But there is nothing to worry about. Now, for one thing, well, you know where Wolf Lang is. But the man who threw the acid, he isn't in an iron lung. He's out there, walking the street. Oh, and you think I should get protection, huh? See? Oh, well, okay. I got it. That's why Rick is here. What? I've hired him. He is going to stay with us, Evie. So, fix up the guest room and find out what he likes for breakfast. Hey, what is this thing, Joe? It looks like an obstacle course. Well... I guess that's what it is. My backyard obstacle, of course. Uh, the boys down the station house built it for me. Well, what's it for? Well, I told you that I went to school for the blind. Well, uh, this is my postgraduate course now. Okay, yeah, watch. Hmm? 
Uh, oh, be careful, Joe. Don't worry. Now, you're going to walk right into that wall. Uh, 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 I said don't worry, because I'm going to stop right here. Okay, where am I, Rick? Hmm? <sighs> That's pretty good. Your nose is six inches away from that thing. Another step, you would have had a broken nose. <laughs> well, it's really something, Rick. How you can actually uh, sense things in front of you. You know, you start feeling the uh, uh, vibrations from solid objects. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, all right. See, my instructor at school said he never saw anybody learn to use that cane as fast as I did. Yeah, I can stop right at any curb. I can tell you which way the traffic is going and when the light changes. Yeah, good for you. You know, see, you, you, learn, to, uh, you learn to hear things differently. Now, most people can't tell, you know, where sound is coming from. A bell rings to the left, so they turn to the right. But not me. A bell or a floorboard, right? That's it, Rick. Or a floorboard. Anybody gets into a room with me, I will know it. And I'll know exactly where he is. And whether or not he's got a gun? Oh, no, 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 that won't matter. I've got a gun, too, Rick. Joe, you're crazy, you know that. And I'm crazy to let you go ahead with this. This is important to me. Not because of my eyes. That's bad enough. But because of Sylvia. Because of what he did to my wife. Come in. Is it all right? You weren't about to go to bed? No, no. I was just reading. I just want to talk to you a minute about Daddy. That's all we ever talk about, isn't it? It's been almost two weeks now since Dad made the announcement about the operation. Yeah, that's right. But he never goes to see that doctor anymore. Why, Rick? Well, uh, the doctor's busy. You see, that's why there's all this delay. I'd feel so much better if I could see this doctor. Talk to him. Evie. Evie, you have to be prepared for, uh... Well, you see, these things don't come with money-back guarantees. You think the operation may fail? Well, I think you have to be ready for that. But Daddy's so sure. Well, you know your father. He's an optimist if I ever met one. The only thing that ever depressed him was what happened to my mother. John, how about you, Evie? How are your spirits? I do my best. You're kind of buried in this house, though, aren't you? You don't have any life of your own. Now you sound like Daddy. Well, maybe Daddy's right. I mean, you're one heck of a beautiful girl, Levy. I'll bet there are 40 dozen guys out there who would like to do something about that. No, there aren't. Well, there's one in here who does. Oh, oh, good Lord. Oh, Rick, what was that? Sounded like a gun to oh. me. Joe? Joe, where are you? Oh, Daddy! All right, Evie, in here. Oh, no. No, Rick, he's being shot. Joe. No, I'm, 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 I'm okay, oh, Rick. I'm Daddy. all right. I'm okay. It came through the window. Evie, I'm all right. Evie, get on the phone. Call for an ambulance. Yes, yes. Take it easy, Joe. Oh, Take boy. It hey, no, it's not serious, Rick. It, it is. And they just got me in the arm. It <laughs> bounced oh. right off me. Yeah, sure, I know. You're yeah. Superman. Yeah, that is... Only a flesh wound, Rick. Now, uh, uh, look. Look, you can even see where the bullet ricocheted off the wall. <laughs> it was one lousy Please shot. Hurry. Oh. Please. They said they'd be here in ten minutes. <laughs> Daddy, you're in pain. Yeah, I made a tourniquet Sorry. for him. You know, he's right about the wound. The bullet just grazed him. Listen, I am okay, Evie. I swear I am. Now, look. You, you go look after your mother. And will you stop worrying about me? Then it's really true. Oh. Someone is out to kill you, Daddy. Just because you told people about the operation. Nobody is going to kill me, sweetheart. Now go to your mother, huh? You want company, Joe? Yeah, yeah, come in, Rick. Everybody's left downstairs, but I heard something about the bullet they dug out of the wall. Huh? What about it? It was a thirty-eight slug, Joe. Oh, not a long-distance rifle, huh? <laughs> well, you were wrong about that, Rick. Well, I hope I'm wrong about my next theory. What's that? That bullet could have come from a police special. Oh, God, now you have got crooked cops on the brain, Rick. Look, Wolf Lang didn't have that many friends. So will you stop guessing? No, I'm only making one guess, Joe, that if you keep up this hoax, you're going to get killed. Rick, 
please. I don't care what you have to do to get him to listen to reason. Abby, I've tried. He's the stubbornest man in the world. He'll be the deadest man soon. You know that hoodlum is trying to get him. Maybe not. Maybe if he failed the first time, he won't... Do you know what I think? I think Daddy wants him to try again. Now, that is silly. I really believe it. I think that Daddy would like him to come around again and maybe get caught the next time. He wants that man so much, Rick. He hates him for what he did. Well, Abby, we can't blame him for that. But there's nothing he can do about the man. The advantage is all his. Yeah, I know. That's what I've told your father. If only he could be taken into protective custody until the operation. Isn't that only logical? Rick, I asked you a question. I heard you. Then why don't you answer me? Why can't Daddy be protected by the police until the day of the operation? Because... Because that might be a long, long time, Abby. What are you saying? Abby... Abby, your father would kill me if he knew I was telling you this. And you mustn't tell anyone else. Do you understand? Not your mother, your father, any of your father's friends, nobody. What is it? There isn't going to be any operation. What? There never was an operation. There is no brilliant eye surgeon who can restore your father's sight. The whole thing is a hoax. It's a phony right from the beginning. But you went with him. Yeah, I went with him, all right. I played along with Joe because he asked me to, because it meant so much to him. What did? Oh, oh no, Rick. You don't mean... The whole thing was just to catch that man? It was a lousy idea, Evie. I didn't like it then, and I'd like it even less now. He was just... setting himself up. Forcing that man out into the open. The man that Wolf Lang sent. Yeah, yeah. That's what he's doing. And there's no way to stop it now. But there has to be a way. We can get a retraction printed. No, no, Evie. Wolf Lang would never believe it, especially after the shooting. They'll think we're just trying to save his neck. But there must be something we can do. Yeah. I thought of one thing. I don't know if it'll work or not, but maybe it's the only thing to do. What's that? I'm going to see Mr. Wolf Lang. <laughs> Rick Pearson has a tough job on his hands. He must convince a man who has to breathe mechanically to let another man go on breathing. But will Wolf Lang be sympathetic? Will he believe that Joe Traeger's lie is actually a lie? Or has Joe Traeger started something that can only be stopped by tragedy? We'll find out when we return to Act Three. Tobac Memorial Hospital. Rick Pearson is pulling into its well-paved parking lot and looking admiringly at its white-stoned magnificence. In one of those expensive rooms, Wolf Lang, retired gangster, lives in an iron prison from which he escapes only for a few minutes a day. But there was one thing in Rick Pearson's favor. Mr. Lang had no objection to seeing him. Mr. Lang was very glad of the company. Nobody comes around anymore. Nobody. Not even my so-called loving wife. Sorry to hear that, Mr. Lang. You're a cop, right? No, not a cop. Private investigator. Same thing. I'm also a friend of Joe Traeger's. Traeger. Yeah, I know that name, all right. A lot of cops have come here asking me questions about him. And what were your answers? I gave them all one answer. I'll give it to you if you're interested. I didn't have nothing to do with what happened to the guy. I see. Is that all you wanted to know? Because that's old news, Buster. Very old news. No, it's not all. I'm also interested in what's happening to Traeger right now. Like what? There's been an attempt on his life. I don't think it's the last one either. That's too bad. 
But like you said, mister, I got my own trouble. Traeger told everybody he was going to have an operation, get his eyesight back again. Now that means he'd be able to identify the man who threw the acid in his face and his wife's. I wish him luck. Well, that was a foolish thing to do, of course, making a big public announcement about the operation. That was asking for trouble. Cops always ask for trouble. Killing Joe Traeger isn't going to cure you, Wolf. I'm telling you it isn't true. I got no contract on the guy. Now get out of here. I don't want company that bad. I'm not saying you got a contract. What I'm suggesting is maybe your boy is doing this on his own. What boy? Your acid-throwing friend. I told you... Look, I'm not here to get a confession out of you. Enough people tried that and didn't succeed. All I wanted to tell you is this. If Joe Traeger gets killed, a lot of people will be sore at you, Wolf. The whole police department's going to be angry. They might even forget their manners. They might just come around here and kick the plug out of your machine. Who knows? I... I don't want that kind of talk. Uh, you don't have the kind of protection you used to have, Wolf. Your friends don't think of you anymore. You're an easy mark. This iron lung of yours could make a nice coffin. Get out of here, I say. Yeah, I'll go. I'll go as soon as you tell me about your boy. Uh, okay. His name was Jake. Something like that. I didn't send him with that acid. It was his own idea. He thought he'd be doing me a favor, that I'd be grateful. I threw the punk out on his ear. You ask anybody. All right, all right. What happened to him then? Who knows? Last I heard of Jake, he was picked up on a narcotics rap. Go ask the cops. All right. I will. And thanks, Wolf. I'm telling you the truth, Pearson. I never sent that kid to Traeger's door. If I'd wanted to stop Traeger, I'd have done something final. Yeah, sure, Wolf. I hope you'll find that punk. I really do. Cowardly dog, said Prince John. Sarah Loxley, do thou shoot. But if thou hittest such a mark, I will say thou art the first man ever did so. Hey, that sounds pretty good. <sighs> oh, is that you, Rick? Yeah, it's me. What's going on here? I'm reading Ivanhoe to Daddy. <laughs> it's about all those knights, Rick. You know, they uh, weren't that much different from the cops. I don't see the resemblance. Except they were pretty thick in the head, too. Joe, I've got to talk to you. We're almost at the end of the chapter. Yeah, well, i got a story to tell Joe, too. Can't I listen? Please, Eddie. Just give me ten minutes, huh? Uh, Go on, Evie, will you? That's the way these private eyes are. You know, they like privacy. All right. But if it's anything I should know, I want to hear it. Okay, I'll close the door on your way out. Okay, Rick. Well, what's up? You look pretty grim. How would you know? (laughs) You sound grim, so I figured you looked it, too. Joe, I've been out talking to people. Yeah? What kind of people? Joe, did you see the guy who threw the acid? Now, look, I... Tell me again, huh? Did you actually see his face? Oh. So that's what's bugging you. All right. No. No, all I got was a flash. I I couldn't pick him out of a mug file, even if I did have one. But do you remember anything about him, the slightest detail? Well, he had dirty blonde hair and a long sideburns. How uh, about his eyes? Uh, no, nothing. Height, nothing. build. Medium height, you know, on the thin side. Nothing else? No, no. Joe. No. Hmm? Joe, have you ever heard of a hood named Fred Jekyll, sometimes known as Duke Jekyll? No. He worked for Wolf Lang for a while, then he quit or got fired, went to work as a pusher. Uh, No, no, don't know him. He was uh, about five feet nine, weighed 150 maybe, dirty blonde hair, long sideburns. So? So, he might have been the acid thrower, Joe. Oh, Rick, if you know that, then let's nail this guy. No, there's only one problem. He's been nailed. Into his coffin. Uh, well, all right. Okay, who said he's the acid thrower? Wolf Lang said so. Lang? Yes, I went to see him today. I went to the hospital and I told him the truth, that he won't do himself any good by getting you killed, that it's all a bluff. You did that to me? I did that for you, Joe. John, 
Get out of here, Rick. What? I don't want you in my house anymore. Now, wait a minute, Joe. You heard me. I don't like Judas's. I asked you to help me because I thought you were my friend. I am your friend. And that's why I don't want to see you kill yourself. And that's what you're doing. Wu Flang lied to you. He gave you the name of some dead punk to throw you off the trail. Maybe. I just don't know. All I know is you won't have a chance against anyone who wants you dead. You're not going to win this war, Joe. You might as well know it. Let him come around and we'll see. I'll, I'll be ready for him. Yeah, without eyes? Yes. Hey, hey, what are you doing? I just turned off the lights, Rick. Now, what is the matter? Are you afraid of the dark? Oh, come hmm? on, now, stop playing games, oh, no, Joe. No, 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 you better not move too quick. You don't know your way around this room. Now you're liable to trip over something and break your neck. Put the lights on, huh? <laughs> hey, will you stop <laughs> that? Hey, see, I got you, Rick. Hey, now, try to get out of this. I, I, you're... Choking me, Joe. Go on, fight back. Go ahead, Joe. Cut it out. I don't feel like wrestling. Okay, then let's see how good your punch is. Ah. Okay, Rick, come on, get up. Go on, get up. Take a slug at me, if you can hit me. How do you expect me to fight you in, uh, in the dark, Rick? Or the dark? Yeah. But don't forget, I'm in the dark all the time. And when that punk comes around here, he'll be in the dark too. Now, get out of here. You don't mean that, Joe. I mean it. I don't need you anymore. You are fired as of now. Hello? Rick, it's Evie. Oh. How'd you know where to find me? You left those hotel matches all over this house when you moved in. I thought you'd move back there. Rick, you've got to come back. I can't. Your old man fired me. Joe thinks he can take care of anything, you but know. he can't. I know he can't. Eddie. Eddie, call the cops. Joe has dozens of friends on the force. He won't let me. He'd throw them all out the minute they arrived. Rick, you're the only person he'll listen to. Well, he didn't listen to me tonight. I told him to quit playing this game, but he threw me out. Or he did more than that. He knocked me down. Yes, he told me about that, too boasting about it. How he turned off the lights and got the better of you. Yeah, well, there was one thing he didn't know, Eddie. When I was on the floor, I lit one of those matches. If I had a gun, I could have killed him. You're scaring me even more. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Listen, what's he doing right now? Sitting in his study. Just sitting there with a rifle on his lap. Yeah. He really thinks something is going to happen tonight, huh? He said something about... Wolf Lang making a move because of your visit to the hospital. All right, Evie. I'm coming back. Come on, Evie. Answer it. Oh, no. Abby! Abby! Open up! Rick! Thank heaven you're here. I heard a shot. It was Dad. He thought he hurt someone. All right, let's get in there. Hey, what happened to the lights? He turned them off, all of them, from the main switch. I've got a flashlight. Eddie, is that you? Yes, Dad. And me, Joe. What the devil are you doing here? Just a social call, Joe. No charge. He's in the house, Rick. Now, listen, I heard him moving around in the cellar, and I went after him. I took a shot, but I didn't get him. All right, let me go look. I can take care of this myself. Abby, give me the flashlight. Oh, what was that? Kitchen door. Every door in this house slams different. Joe, for Pete's sake, will you stay where you are? If he's in here, he is mine. Let me go first, please, huh? Daddy, let him. Let him. Just be careful, Rick. Okay, friend. If you're in there, I just want you to know I've got more than a flashlight. I've got a gun. Hold it. Don't move. Hold it, I said. Hey. Good Lord. Mrs. Traeger. Now, now, will you stop? Now, look, I don't want to hurt you. I thought... Now, wait a minute, Mrs. Traeger, please. Now, Mrs. Traeger, put the gun down. Rick? Stand back, Abby. Daddy went to turn the lights on. Abby. Abby, it's your mother. Mother? Oh, I thought you were in bed asleep. Rick, what's going on? She has a gun, Abby. That's a 38 police special she's got there. Mother, mother, please, put the gun down. There go the lights. Mother, what's the matter? Will you be careful, Evie? 
It's Daddy's gun. She must have taken it from his closet. She must have heard the noise and, and been frightened. No. No, Abby. I'm afraid it's more than that. What? What's going on here? Abby, can I come in? Yes, Rick. You all right? Yes. Are the police still here? They're just leaving. Abby, nothing's going to happen to your mother. Thank heaven she didn't hurt Daddy again. That was because of you, Rick. Because you saved him. Now, all I did was push him. Besides, I had to earn that fee he paid me. I still can't accept what happened. That Mother was the one who tried to kill him. Well, you see, Abby, she believed your father's story, too. She believed he was going to have that operation and get his sight back. And that meant that uh, he would have seen her. And in her mind, she would rather have had him dead. I heard him tell her the truth. I heard him say he'd never be able to see her face. That he'd just have to remember how beautiful she was. There were no charges brought against Sylvia Traeger for the attempted murder of her husband. Nor did Joe Traeger ever feel the need for revenge again. In case you're wondering about Evie Traeger and Rick Pearson, well, this is the Radio Mystery Theater, not the theater of romance. But we'll tell you this much. Rick now calls Joe Traeger Pop. I'll be back with another word shortly. Weekdays on CBS Daytime Television. Search for Tomorrow follows the joys and sorrows of people caught up in a world that sometimes moves too fast and is often cruelly unfair. And the young and the restless, where one man's love may be another man's wife, and where trust, friendship, and deception are separated by a fine line, a line that is forever being crossed. Search for Tomorrow and the Young and the Restless, an hour and a half of the hottest drama weekdays on CBS Television. Check local listings for times. It was revenge that motivated the life of Joe Traeger during the years of his suffering. But he learned a lesson we could all take to heart, that revenge is just a way of keeping our wounds from healing. And he learned something else, too. As some wise man once said, living well is the best revenge. Joe Traeger is living well now. He's accepting what has to be accepted, finding the contentment that many people with all five senses intact never learn. Especially if they lack that sixth sense, the sense of humor. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Earl Hammond, and Roberta Maxwell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. What beckoning ghost along the moonlight shade invites my steps and points to yonder glade 
Evidently, Mr. Alexander Pope sees his ghosts at night in a garden. However, each of us has his own private ghost, and every now and then it beckons us. To what unknown place shall your ghost summon you? Our mystery drama, The Forever Alley, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes and Marion Seldes. It is not as chic as tennis, nor yet as stylish as golf, but they say it has more adherence than both those games combined. I refer here, of course, to the ancient sport of skittles, which has evolved into the modern sport of bowling. Who can fail to be fascinated by the heavy ball as it careens swiftly down the glassy, smooth, and gleaming wooden lane and smashes into the head pin? Just a trifle off-center, and in the blink of an eye, none are standing. All ten are lying on their sides, some still spinning from the violence at impact. Well, bowling, as you know, is a sport. And like all such pastimes, there are those who can take it and those who can leave it alone. Then there are those to whom it's a religion. Please sit down, Lieutenant Mulvaney. Okay. Now then. Hold it, Doc. Now, before we go into now then, can we go over the ground rules? The ground rules. Well, you're the official psychiatrist. You're working for the police department. I'm paid by the department. I'm working for you. For me. Well, I just suppose after we go round and round a little bit with this thing, you should come to the conclusion that I'm... that I'm nuts. Do you report that? That's a very complicated question. All I want is a simple answer. I understand your problem. But I'm a doctor. I have an obligation to my patient... But as a public official, I have an equally important duty. Perhaps it might be best if you consulted a private psychiatrist. I did. Oh? But I can't afford it anymore. I've already been there ten times. We still haven't got past what happened to me when I was five years old. But sometimes it's vital... Now, look, Doc, what's bothering me right now has nothing to do with what happened when I was five. Can you be sure of that? Yes, Doc, I'm sure. What's your departmental assignment? Missing persons. Is the problem, as far as you know, job-related? Oh, yes. Yes, but it's also personal. You see, I'm trying to find a man who's reported missing. He's also my brother-in-law, my sister's husband. Yes? And he's been gone a month. Well, have you been able to make any progress at all? This is where it gets difficult. Why? Well, you see, the fact is, I know where he is. You know where he is? Yeah. Then he isn't missing. Oh, no, no. He's missing, all right. He's just as missing as he he ever was. You'll have to explain. (sighs) Henrietta, uh, my sister, she marries a fellow named Bobby Clover. He's got a job, sells stocks and bonds. They live good, no kids, so they got plenty to spend on themselves. He's okay with money, so she's got no complaints in that department. However... Yes? He's got a sickness. What is it? Bowling. Bowling? Do you call bowling a sickness? Well, in his case... Bowling? What other game calls for such coordination, such timing? I'm only repeating what my sister tells me. It is a game of consummate skill, completely devoid of all pretension. Excuse me, doctor, I didn't know you were a fan. Yes, I'm a fan. In the literally derived sense of the word, fan, a a shortening for fanatic. (laughs) Let me understand. You say your brother-in-law is missing. Then you say you know where he is. Is that correct? Yeah. Then you add that despite the fact that you know where he is, he's still missing. You were about to expand on that. Yeah. I know things weren't all that smooth between Bobby and Henrietta, but I had no idea how bad it was until... One night, somebody rings my bell. And who's standing there but my sister, Henrietta? I have to talk to you, Joe. All right. Can I get you something? No. 
No, Joe, you've got to do something. About what? About Bobby. Now, Bobby's your problem, Henrietta. I never see him. Never? All day long, he's out working. Well, you can't hate him for that. But he isn't home at night either. Oh? Is there, uh, someone else? Not someone, something. Something? Some women have to worry about a blonde. My rival is a bowling ball and ten sticks of wood. Now, look, you knew he liked bowling before you married him. To like it is one thing. To worship it is something else. Hey, that's a pretty strong word. I never see him. You still love him? Yes. Well, there's only one sure way you'll keep him. Become involved. Go bowling with him. I tried that. It doesn't work. I only embarrass him half the time the ball rolls into the gutter. Well... When it doesn't, it kind of teeters along the edge... And then maybe it knocks over one single solitary pin. Maybe, if I'm lucky, too. My highest score is 23. 23? And I cheated. Please, Joe, talk to him. All right. What do you want me to tell him? You always know the right thing to say at the right time. I have every confidence in you. And did you go to see your brother-in-law, Lieutenant? Yes, Doctor. And what did you say to him? I went to the lanes where he hangs out. It must have been two in the morning. The place was practically empty. I think they were getting ready to close. He was the only customer left. He was all by himself. And he was still bowling. Bobby? Oh, Joe. What are you doing here? Looking for you. I didn't know you bowled. A little, now and then. Oh, you want to roll a few frames? Uh... I think it's too late for this place, but uh, they've got some all-night alleys a little ways from here. No, uh, some other time, Bobby. Oh. Well, what can I do for you? Uh, want to stop off somewhere and have some coffee? Sure. And talk? Now, she asked you to see me, didn't she? Sure. But she's got a pretty good case, you have to admit that. I'm never home. She never sees me. We never spend time together. You don't get married to live this kind of life. Marriage is companionship. Marriage is doing things together. Marriage is sharing. Marriage is caring. Joe, I know what I'm doing isn't right. Well, if you know it isn't right, why do you keep on doing it? Because I can't help myself. Oh, come on. Come on, Bobby. I'm hooked. Do you understand? No. No. How could you understand? Here. You see this ball? This is what I live for. Watch me aim it. Watch me approach the line. Watch me release it and send it down the lane. Now, look. See it? It's a strike. You see them scatter? Look, that's what I live for. Sounds crazy, huh? Well, right now, this is the only time I feel alive. Oh, sure, I can, I can go through the motions, I can do my job, and I do it well. But everything else is just killing time. This right here, this is living. I just want to spend the rest of my life bowling. Yeah. Uh, what do you say we have that cup of coffee anyhow, huh? Sure. Uh, you got your car? I came down with some other guys, but they had to leave early. No, I'm parked right in front. Okay, uh, let me change my shoes and stuff and settle my bill. Uh, I'll meet you outside. Yeah, okay. And that's when he disappeared, Doctor. Is he a good bowler, your brother-in-law? Yeah, I suppose. Would you happen to know his average? No, I don't know. I think I heard him say something like 220. 220? Mm-hmm. That's... Tournament caliber 220? If I could bowl 220, I'd shut up shop and... I'm about 180 myself. I think I'm getting better all the... Oh, yes. No, no. You said... That's when he disappeared. Please explain. Well, all he was going to do, as I said, was uh, change his shoes, pay his bill, and meet me in the car. How long does that take? It doesn't take me more than three minutes. Yeah, sure. So, uh... I go out the door, get into the car, even start up the motor. I turn on the radio, find one of those nice, easy music stations. I figure he's excited, it'll help calm him down. Maybe we can talk sensibly. So I'm uh, sitting there and sitting there. It's a couple of minutes, then five minutes, ten minutes. Then I see a guy. He turns out to be the manager. He comes out, starts to lock the door. Hey, hey, hold it a second. Uh, wait a minute. Now, you can't lock up. Who says I can't lock up? 
I gotta go home and go to sleep, too. Now, just wait a minute, huh? You want a bowl? You get here at a decent hour. First, you make a reservation. Sometimes we got leads. I don't know. want a bowl. And what are you doing here? There's still somebody inside. Oh, there ain't nobody inside. I make sure I'm the last one out. My brother-in-law is still in there. I'm trying to tell you. My brother-in-law, no one... Bobby Clover. Do you know Bobby Clover? <laughs> Do I know Bobby Clover? Bobby Clover is sending my kids through college. Well, he's still in well, there. Well, it's an exaggeration, but you just give me some more customers like Bobby Clover. I tell you, Bobby's still in there. He is, huh? Oh, Look, pal. Yeah, maybe a little bit of a load on you. No, huh? but I'll tell you what I do have. I made this badge. Oh, well, you're a cop. Look, uh, is Bobby in a jam? Come on, open up. Sure, sure. Turn on the lights. Well, you can see. The joint's empty. Bobby? Bobby? Where could he have gone? What do you mean, where could he have gone? This is it. Over there beside that uh, glass wall. You know, right behind it, we got the coffee shop. Those two doors are the restrooms. That door is my office. All right, let's look. Look, look where? Before, before I close, I always double check everything out. Well, let's do it again. Well, you satisfied? There's nobody here. There's no way out except through the front doors, right? This is it. Yeah, you win, and I remember he said to me, I'll change shoes and settle up. Wait for me in the car. Now, there was nobody else in the place. Everyone had already gone. I remember you were sitting there at the counter reading a paper. A magazine. And I went out. Now, what did you see? What did you hear? Bobby sings out, hey, Fred, what do I owe you? Let's settle up. So I told him to tab. And I see I don't have any more receipts left in the book. Hey, Bobby, I say, I got to go in an office for a second and get a new receipt book. Yeah. Well, that's what I do. I go into the office. I pick up a receipt book, and I'm on my way out again when the phone rings. It's the wife. Hey, Fred, she says, bring me home a quart of chocolate ice cream. And I says, hey, Ruthie, how are you going to lose weight, huh? How long were you on the phone? With Ruthie? That's my wife. It's one, two, three. Oh, how long go by? How long would you estimate? 30 seconds, maybe 45 seconds. A minute top. All right, all right. And then? Well, then I pick up the receipt book and come out, and he's gone. Bobby's gone. How could he be gone? He's gone. G-O-N-E, gone. Look, didn't it strike you as strange? He said he wanted to settle up, and then when you came out, he was gone. So what? I figure he's in a hurry. It can wait till tomorrow. I assume he just left. Well, it's impossible for him to just walk out of this place without my seeing him. There's only one exit, right? Right. And I'm parked directly in front of your door. You are? So you tell me, how could he leave without my seeing him? How could he? Come on, answer my question. Hey, Lieutenant. What do you want from me? It's a question we hear quite often. And what can we want from poor Fred, the manager? At any rate, let us review. Do we have all the elements? There is only one way out of the bowling alley, and Lieutenant Joe Mulvaney had it covered. There's no place to hide in the bowling alley, and the place has been thoroughly searched. So, what are we to assume? Well, we can safely assume that we shall all meet here for the second act. find me. Cleave the wood, and there I am. Yes, if only it were that simple. Bobby Clover was sitting in a large, bright bowling alley, and suddenly, mysteriously, unaccountably, he just disappeared. There is absolutely no place to hide. And even if there were, there's no way he could get there without being seen. What's to be done? Right now, all we can do is support that arm of our local police department that's concerned with it. Lieutenant Mulvaney, a man cannot simply vanish into thin air. Oh, come on, Doctor. You have to do better than that. A man obviously did. I'm not a police detective, but... Yeah? It would seem to me that somehow the man, this brother-in-law of yours 
was able to make his way out of the building undetected. Now, Doctor, I explained to you there was only one exit and I was watching it. A rear window? All the windows were locked from the inside. The cellar? There is no cellar, no basement. The place rests on a concrete slab. The room for utilities, the heat, the air conditioning? All that is in a metal shed attached to the outside of the building. Very well, Lieutenant. Then there must be some secret door or panel or passageway. No, 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 no. We played that game, too. I got guys in from loft and burglary. You couldn't hide a mouse in the floor, the walls, the ceiling. These guys would spot it. No, they checked out every square, or I ought to say every cubic inch of the premises. But suppose... <laughs> I'm not trying to do your work for you, but... Suppose the manager, Fred... Suppose he had wanted to... Murder your brother-in-law. No, homicide's already been there. First, he would need a motive, and they couldn't find one. Besides, why would Fred kill his best customer? We are exploring possibilities. Sure, we're also clutching at straws, Doctor, but go on, go on with it. Now, say Fred killed him. How did Fred dispose of the body? Huh? Now, Bobby Clover is six feet tall, weighs 190. What do you do with him? There's no place to hide him, no way to make him disappear. I mean, you might think of ways to reduce Bobby's body to nothing, but they'd all require two things. A, Fred did not have time, and B, various kinds of equipment. Then there can be only one explanation. Yes, Doctor? He walked through the door. You failed to see him. <laughs> all right, just for the sake of argument, we'll say that's possible. Where could he go? He was ten miles from home. He didn't have a car. That's what he told you, but he may have had one parked now, why, why, why? Why would he do Perhaps that? Perhaps he felt he had to disappear. All right, once again, why? You're a missing persons detective. Why do people disappear? A variety of reasons. A situation at home or on the job becomes intolerable. Now, I checked that out. Yes? I said to myself, Joe, it's a blow to your pride, but face it like a man. Somehow, he managed to sneak past you, all right? And once you faced it? I decided to forget that Bobby Clover was my sister's husband. Even that Henrietta was my sister. So, I went back. To her house. Joe, come in. Do you have something to tell me? No. No, I'm here to find out if you have something to tell me. What do you mean? Henrietta, why would Bobby want to disappear? Well, I don't know. How were things at home here? I told you. There was very little doing at home. He was hardly ever here. Now, look, Henrietta, I want to help you, but I'm not doing you any good... Unless I asked the right questions. It wasn't going well here, was it? I told he you... He walked we... out on you, didn't No. He? he had to. He wasn't kidnapped. He wasn't murdered. The guy leaves his wife. Why? He didn't leave me. He would never leave then me. Then why isn't he here now? He's got another woman, hasn't he? Another woman? Why would he... Wa what would he do with another woman? He didn't even have time for me. All right, come on now. Tell me the truth. There was no other woman. Is that your pride talking? How could there be another woman? All day he's working. All night he's at the bowling alley. Maybe a wife has to hold still for that, but a girlfriend wouldn't tolerate it. Henrietta, I want to help you. Then don't ask stupid questions. A woman knows she consents when her husband's got someone on the string. I'd stake my life on it. He had the bowling. That was his other woman. Okay, okay. If it isn't love, it has to be money. Money? Yeah, sometimes a man gets into debt. Not over Bobby. Over his head, he can't see a way out. Bobby had no money troubles. He has all the money he needs. He gives me all I want. I'll even show you the bank books. He didn't behave like a man who was pressed for money. Oh, maybe we're not talking about the same kind of money, Henrietta. Now, Bobby has access to... Uh, a lot of cash at the office. What are you trying to say? Maybe he was tempted. Joe, you're talking about my husband. What if he's in so deeply? Never. What are you trying to do to me? I'm trying to find Bobby. Are Mr. Clover's accounts in order? Yes, Mrs. Soames. That's what I asked you. And why would you think that they might not be in order? Well, you could answer that question with one word. Yes or no. The answer, Lieutenant, is yes. They are in perfect order. And now, sir, I trust that since that question was the object of your visit, there is nothing else... But have you answered the question, Mrs. Soames? Please explain yourself. A trusted employee of a brokerage firm appropriates... 
a sum of money. The theft is discovered or about to be discovered, so that person leaves. Are you implying... I'm not, I haven't finished. His employers are in a dilemma. If they report it to the police, if they prosecute, the thing becomes public. Unfortunately, that harms their image and hurts their reputation. And could cost them more in the long run than the money they're out of pocket. So they bite the bullet and eat the loss. Is that what happened here? Mr. Clover's accounts were in perfect order. Now, Mr. Soames, I'm not saying Bobby Clover ran away from here because of money, but if he did... And if you're letting him get away with it, what you're doing is telling all your other employees that the cash box is open. Mr. Clover's accounts were in perfect order, and we have no idea why he should have disappeared. And now, sir, if you will be kind enough to excuse me. Do you believe her? Yes, I believe her. Very well, then we may assume there was no irregularity at the office. Did you believe his wife when she claimed there was no other woman? Yes. Then at this point, you're a city detective on a routine investigation. You're having problems. And that's to be expected. Why do you think you need a psychiatrist? Do you remember I told you I know where Bobby is? Yes. And I'm waiting for you to get to it. That's crazy. Where is he? I, uh... I started at the beginning. I asked myself, what really happened? I got to the bowling alley just as they were closing. That's what I told you, right? Yes. And there were three of us in the place. Me, Bobby, and the manager, Fred. I remember. And Bobby says, go out and start the car. All I have to do is change my shoes and pay the bill, okay? Very well. So I go out and sit in the car and wait. And finally, the manager, Fred, he comes out and starts to lock the place up. Now, so far, this is it. You agree? So far. So, we go back in. No Bobby anywhere inside. And no way for him to get out without my seeing him. And most important, no reason for him to even want to sneak out. Do you follow this? I think so. All right. There can only be one answer. And what's that? He's still in there. But... We've established beyond the shadow of a doubt that there's no place where he could be inside that bowling alley. You know, it's funny. You should have used that word. What word? Shadow. And why did you say that? Why did you just say the word shadow? Why do you make an issue of it? Because I've been given to understand that no word is ever used idly. Subconsciously, every word we say, even the most offhanded remark, is deliberate. And what does this have to do with the fact that I happen to use the word shadow? Because I know now that maybe shadow is what this whole thing is about. Shadow? Did you also figure it out? Figure out what, Lieutenant? Now maybe, maybe you're not aware of it. Suppose you tell me what I'm supposed to have figured out. Well, since the answer has to be in that bowling alley, I went back there about 2 a.m. And Fred, the manager, is about to close up. So I say to him, Fred? Yeah? Is it okay if I look around? I'm closing up. Can you come back tomorrow? No, I want to be here when the place is empty. I promised the wife I'd come right home. Look, um, I can give you a spare key. All you got to do is turn the lock as you leave, huh? I walk inside. I sit down on one of the benches behind the alleys. The empty lanes looked just like a part of some huge underground cavern with tiny lights twinkling in the ceiling. And then I hear it. Someone is bowling. But where? Who? And then I see him. He's standing right in front of me. He's about to bowl again. Bobby! Hey, Bobby! Don't... Do that, Joe. Don't ever do that again. Yeah, but Bobby... You can't do that to a man when he's about to bowl. You can't yell and break his concentration. Now, listen, Bobby. No, you listen, Joe. Look at what you made me do. I hit the head pin too fast, and now I got a split. I got a 7-10 split. Okay, okay, Bobby. I'm sorry. Well, you should be. Bobby. Bobby, are you... Are you real? What do you mean, am I real? That, that night, that night, what happened? Wait a minute. I got something more important to do. 
Oh, too much outside spin, so she goes into the gutter. I got to work on that, Joe. Hey, Terry, we're down by two. It can cost us a match. Bobby, Bobby. Bobby, who are you talking to? Oh, a guy by the name of Terry. He's my partner tonight. We're bowling against two guys who are really great. Bobby, listen to me. The truth is, I'm even better than either of those two guys. But Terry's a little weak, you know? I'd give anything for a new partner. Uh, wait a minute. Hey, Joe? Hmm? Is that why you're here? What are you saying? Is it what you wanted? More than anything in the world? No, 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 no. I'm just... I'm just here because I'm looking for you. That means... Y you can leave, huh? I guess so. Are you sure? Could you just get up from that bench and walk to the door? Uh, could you? T try it. Sure. Look, I can do it. Oh. Do you mean you can't? No. I can't. Why not, Bobby? Because maybe I really don't want to. We seem to have a rather strange bowling alley here. Or maybe it's only strange because it's closed for the night. Maybe all bowling alleys are strange when they're closed for the night. Which should open up a whole new line of conjecture. What happens on golf courses... In ballparks, concert halls, and theaters when they're closed for the night and theoretically empty. Well, we can't close until we bring you Act Three, and we shall shortly. Where lies the land to which our ship must go? Far ahead. Far ahead, that's all we ever know. Whither are we drifting? Where are we bound? There is a place of heart's desire. Call it paradise, call it heaven, and perhaps some of us will make it there. Evidently, a gentleman named Bobby Clover has already arrived. Bobby, what happened? Wait, I have to roll. That should put us back in the lead. You know, that partner of mine's a lot of dead wood to carry Bobby, around. Bobby, Bobby, wait a minute now. You say you have a partner? And he's bowling in number seven right next to us. Well, I don't see him. I, I don't hear him. You don't? Well, I see you. I hear you. I hear your ball when it rolls down the alley, but that's all. That's all? This place is so crowded, so noisy, I can hardly hear myself think. Now, Bobby, what's going on? What's going on? With what? With everything. I, re I remember the last time I saw you, just before the guy closed up for the night. You know, Fred? Fred? Fred. Fred, the manager. I don't know any Fred. I guess I lost him. You lost him? Oh, you start losing people from the other place. What What other place, Bobby? The other place where you used to be. They, they start dropping out of your mind. I guess the more unimportant people fall away first. Are you... Do remember me, though. Oh, you? Joe? Oh, sure. Yeah, and, uh... Henrietta? Henrietta. Yeah, well, I'll remember her longest of all. That sounds as if you're going to forget her. After a while. After a while, you have to forget everybody. Hey, Bobby, Bobby, wait a minute. Am I dreaming? What's happening? I don't know if you'll be able to understand it, but... You remember that night you came here and wanted to talk to me? Yeah. I was bowling, right? Right. And we talked about it. I said to you... This is what I live for. Yeah, I remember. And I said, what I really want, I could never have. And you asked, why not? And I answered, I, I said, I just want to spend the rest of my life bowling. Just bowling. Yeah. Yeah, so? So I meant it. Did you ever get to say anything that just expressed everything that mattered to you? It's like... You reduced your whole life to one complete statement. Did you? No. I did. And no sooner had I done it... when I felt something happen inside me. Like what? It was like a sudden warm current that 
runs through your blood. <laughs> Maybe I kind of blacked out for a minute, but then suddenly I was bowling again. Here. Right here. And I've been bowling ever since. Bobby, I I'm going to ask you what might sound like a crazy question. Are you dead? Well, to tell you the truth, Joe, I don't know. All I know is I'm doing what I always wanted to do. Bowl. You don't want to go home to Henrietta? Henrietta? Your wife. Oh, I know she's my wife, but I can't make her happy. Bobby, she loves you. She misses you. After a while, she'll forget me, and it'll be for the best. But you had a great job. You could go places. A job? Did I have a job? Now, you know you had a job. Yeah, I guess I did. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm forgetting. Uh, help me remember. Do, do you remember you worked for Morley and Soames? Oh, yeah. yeah right. Millicent Soames. Yeah, she took it over when her husband died. <laughs> Frosty dame, too. Well, when I first came there, something bothered me. Y you see, we have some old dead files nobody ever looks through. And by mistake, I guess I put an envelope with $40,000 worth of bearer bonds in those dead files. $40,000? I was afraid that old lady Soames would think I stole them. I wanted to come back and tell her, but it was too late. Why? Why do you say it's too late? Everything fades away except what you really want to do. How, how does it happen? I'm able to see you, Bobby, and hear you. How, how was I able to find you? Because, well, I guess you wanted to find me more than anything else in the whole world. After all, you love your sister and you want her to be happy, but the only way you can make her happy is to tell her to forget me. Now, listen, Bobby. And you forget me, too. Goodbye, Joe. No, Bob, Bobby. Bobby? Bobby, where are you? Where did you go? And then? He was gone, Doctor. I see. What? What, what do you see? You told me a story that consists of several separate, distinct elements. First, you went to see your brother-in-law at your sister's urging. Yeah, that's true. Second, you met him late at night at a bowling alley. Talked to him. Fred, the managers, told us you were there. You mean you've been checking my story? Now, bear with me, please. From here on, every element rests on your own say-so. You say you'd arranged to wait outside in your car for your brother-in-law. Yes, that's true. You say you waited and waited and he never came out of the bowling alley. He never did. Perhaps. Perhaps. Let me tell you what could have happened. He was going to pay Fred, but Fred had to go into the office. Instead of waiting for Fred to return, Bobby decided to leave. He walked out... And got into your car. Now, wait a minute. You haven't been listening. He never came out of that place. That is what you say. Suppose he did. Suppose he did get into your car. And suppose you killed him. Okay. Why? Why would I want to kill him? Because you love your sister more than anyone or anything else in the world. And that's why I would kill the man she's crazy about? Yes, because he was not going to be good enough for her. He didn't love her, or at least not as much as she loved him. After a while, he would have broken her heart, destroyed her. Well? Therefore, I killed Bobby. And when Fred, the manager, began to lock up, you pretended that Bobby hadn't come out yet. Thus, you set in motion... The entire charade that has been going on for almost a month. And this is what you infer from what I've been telling you? Yes. Well, it isn't so. I've stated the truth. I'm sure that by now you believe it is the truth. Have you reported any of this to my superior officers? No. Do you intend to? 
I have a clear-cut duty. You intend to accuse me of murder? I think you have told me a story which points very strongly in that direction. Well, suppose you're wrong. What happens to my reputation? Now, Doctor, I've been watching you while I was talking about how Bobby Clover was bowling. And you have the same look in your eyes he has in his. I think you're just as hooked as he is. What does this have to do I with... I would think I'm crazy. That is an extremely dangerous and misleading word. I think you're not quite sane. Oh, yeah? Why? Consider your basic premise. Bobby Clover expresses a desire to spend the rest of his life bowling. Therefore, suddenly, somehow, he's transplanted or transmuted into another world where he may indulge this passion forever. And that is why I'm nuts, huh? That's another unfortunate word. Yeah, but it tells a story. You know, I learned something from Bobby. You didn't. And what was that? I knew how badly I wanted to find him, and I realized how badly he wanted to just bowl for the rest of his life. So I learned that if you want something badly enough, you get it. Oh, if that were true, there would be no frustration in the world. Well, wanting it badly means wanting it completely. It's the kind of want that exists in very few people. It's just too strong, too overpowering. Is that how you feel about bowling, Doctor? I said before I could see it in your eyes. It's my weakness. Yes. I love to bowl. I, I can lose myself. Are you game can... for a test? <laughs> what sort of test? Let's go down to the bowling alley tonight. Oh? Why? I'll tell you when we get there. Hey there, Lieutenant. Hello, Fred. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Underhill. Dr. Fred, the manager. How do you do? Hey, Doc. How are you? Uh, the doctor would like to bowl a few frames. Go right ahead. Hey, those are some shoes. And that ball. Doc, uh, you one of the pros on the tour? I wish I were. Oh, uh, you're on number seven. Best lane in the house. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, that was uh, beautiful, Doctor. Thank you. You know something? You're beautiful, too. Probably. Well, that's a funny way to accept a compliment. But it's true. You know, I never noticed it before. You are beautiful. Yes, when I bowl. You know, I looked at you before. This is a kind of quiet... Pale. Nondescript middle-aged oh, lady. No, no, no. I wouldn't say middle-aged exactly, but now, here, your eyes are sparkling, your cheeks are bright, you kind of vibrate with excitement. Now I'm living. When I'm doing this, uh, I don't know what this game does to me, but it's the only time I'm completely alive. Don't, don't, don't say anymore. I go through the motions of a job and a career. Now stop. I do what I do to get paid. I even do it well. Now stop, but stop right I... now. Stop unless you want to do it forever. But this is all I want. No, it isn't. It isn't. Believe me. I live to do this, to aim the ball, approach the line, swing and release and down the lane. <laughs> Yes. Just this. No, no. If I could only spend the rest of my life doing this. A doctor. <gasps> hey, Lieutenant. How's it going? Hey. Where, where's the doctor? Uh, the doctor. Yeah. What happened to the doctor? Oh, uh, I, I guess she left. Well, didn't she come in here with you? Yeah, yeah, but that, uh, that doesn't mean she was gonna leave here with me. Oh, oh I get it. Well, you know how dames are. You win some, you lose some. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. All right, Fred. Yeah. Good night, Lieutenant. Missing persons, Lieutenant Mulvaney. Oh, yes, Inspector. Who? The police department psychiatrist. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm taking the time. Martha Underhill. Age 46. Uh-huh. Miss 
missing. So, yeah, yeah, I'm getting it. You say her hobby was bowling. Well, we'll certainly check all the alleys. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir, you can depend on me to make a most thorough and intensive search. And because he's a most conscientious detective, we know he did. But where she had gone, there was no following her. Only a comparatively few dedicated people could arrive at the place, and then they couldn't get back. Well, we hope she teamed up with Bobby Clover, who certainly needed a new partner. I'll be back shortly. Is it possible that a person whose entire being can focus and concentrate on a desired result can actually harness a unique cosmic force and simply make it happen? Whether or not you approve of or even believe in it, the fact remains that millions of people devoutly do. On the other hand, Lieutenant Mulvaney might have murdered his brother-in-law and then discovered that he would also have to kill the doctor to cover his tracks. Which version is true? It's not for us to say. Our job is to provide you with choices, options, and food for thought. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Marion Seldes, Catherine Byers, and Bob Caliban. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Enter our mansion of mystery... And it's mystery we have in store for you today, in a house nestled in the pleasant English countryside. The house we are to visit is not a brooding castle, nor is it set on one of those windy and cheerless moors that Britain is so famous for. It's a modest two-story cottage, high on a rise that overlooks the tiny hamlet of Salford below. The residents of the town give it a wide berth, even though no one has lived in it for more than two years. And two young men who rented it discovered why. What the devil is that noise, Mark? Well, it sounds as though it's coming from up there. <gasps> Look! I see it, but I don't believe it. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Judge's House is based on a story by Bram Stoker and was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Bob Juran. It stars Gordon Gould and Lloyd Batista. I'll return shortly with Act One. Picturesque English country houses have been immortalized in paintings and photographs, particularly in travel posters, luring visitors to jolly old England. Often, though, a house that looks so quaint from the outside 
can harbor strange vibrations inside, particularly when they take on the characteristics of the owner. Such was the judge's house. But we'll arrive there shortly. Let Mark Mason, a young American in England, tell us what happened. I often wonder how things might have turned out if I hadn't gone to England that spring of 69. I wouldn't have these nightmares that have haunted me over the years. I went to England at the invitation of Brian Stokes, a fellow I'd met when we were both doing graduate work at Stanford University in California. We planned to write a monograph together on abnormal psychology, and he suggested I join him in England for the two months we thought it would take to write it. We were both filled with excitement the day I arrived at his tiny flat in Liverpool. Mark, it's great to see you again. What a time we'll have. Oh, I can't wait to see the Liverpool sights. Oh, we won't be working here, Mark. Too many distractions. I rented a cottage at Salford. Complete privacy, the agent said. Hasn't been lived in for two years. But he said he'd clean it up a bit. Got it for a song. You look disappointed. Where is the Salford? About a hundred kilometers east of the city. Lovely village. Quiet and remote. Just what we need to work. Well, when do we start? We'll motor up Saturday. So that leaves us two days here to make a tourist out of you. Freshen up, and we'll take in some of the nightlife you've always been chasing after. There'll be precious little in Salford, I'm afraid. This is it. Charming little place, don't you think? Oh, it's like every picture of an English cottage I've ever seen. <laughs> All it needs is the hollyhocks. A bit early for those yet. I'm dying to see inside. You mean you haven't seen inside? The front was enough to convince me. Besides, the agent assured me it was just what we'd want. Hello. I think that's him coming out the front door. Hello. I see you made it all right. Come on, Mark. Let's go in. You made good time from Liverpool. Didn't expect you till after four. Roads were good. This is my friend from the USA, Mark Mason. Mr. Sheffield. How do you do? <laughs> nice to meet you. Place is all tight and tidy. I had a woman in straightening up the past two days, and I lit a fire for you. Makes things a bit cheery. Very thoughtful. What is that on the roof? <laughs> a bell tower? Oh, yes. Yes, the bell's still there, as a matter of fact. Here we go now. Furniture's a bit stodgy, but serviceable. Ooh, that's some fireplace. Oh, it must be eight feet across. Uh, nine, to be exact. I had a good supply of wood put round back. You'll need it. It couldn't be better. When look, this must be the bell rope. That's what it is. It's attached through that hole in the ceiling and up to the tower. Well, let's give it a tug. Uh, no, no, don't. Something the matter? It, uh... Might startle the village. Oh, is that bad? They're a bit superstitious, you know. The villagers are afraid of this house. At one time, it belonged to a Judge Harrison Schelling. Uh, there he is, in that portrait over the fireplace. Ever heard of him? Schelling. Schelling. No. Was he famous? Uh, infamous is the word. Oh? He was known as the Hanging Judge. He sent more people to the gallows than any other ten judges put together. Oh, nice guy. He was really hated and feared. The reason I asked you not to ring the bell was because the judge, so the story goes, would ring it on the day of every hanging he ordered. Ugh. He must have been a fiend to take such delight in such a macabre custom. Well, he's not still around, is he? Oh, no, no, no. He died 30 years ago. His son was living here until he died, and now the grandson wants to be rid of the place. Oh, but why are the villagers still on edge? I think very few of them were around when the old boy was <laughs> handing out his hanging orders. Well, that's true, but in these small villages, Mr. Mason, legend dies hard. They all believe the judge's spirit is still here in Salford. If that bell were to ring, well... They might think someone was going to die. Precisely. Now, we won't do anything to increase their fears, like ringing the bell. 
He's a rather handsome man, don't you think? Hmm. In a stern sort of way, yes. Yeah, it's a good portrait. Done in his robes, seated in a high-backed chair. Oh, every inch the judge. And those eyes. Well, they pierce right through you. Uh, there's no phone, I'm afraid, but if you want one... You... Not on your life. There's no one we'd want to call, and we don't want to be disturbed. Oh, then I guess that's that. I have your check for the rent, and if there's anything you need, just pop round to my cottage. Yes, thanks very much. We'll freshen up, then walk into the village tonight for a bite. We passed a nice-looking pub on the way up. Oh, yes, Andy Maughan's place. Nothing better between Liverpool and Manchester. Decent-looking place. It's terrific. Looks exactly like my idea of an English pub. <laughs> and so it should. That's precisely what it is. Uh, welcome, gents. Uh, that table for two right here. Thanks. Bit of a chill tonight. Indeed. Brandy for me. Mm, the same. Uh, will you be wanting to eat? Yes, later. Traveling through, are you? Oh, no. We'll be staying here for a while. We've rented the judge's house. You what? My friend and I are working on a paper together. We'll be living in the judge's house. You are not serious. Oh, we know. The agent told us about... Oh, McKenna. Uh, what does he know? Judge, you mustn't stay up there. Not on your life. Well, the place suits us just fine. What uh, did McKenna tell you? That you all think the judge's spirit haunts the town. Aye, we don't think. We know. I'll be back with your brandy and a jiff and a bit of advice along with it. Mm -mm. <laughs> Everyone's looking at us. Always that way when strangers come in. But I guarantee they'll be staring harder when old Andy tells them what we're up to. Makes it more of an adventure. Flaunting superstition right in their faces. Oh, there you are, boys. Two brandies. Now, if I might just sit down a moment. Uh, listen, I know you don't want to hear this, but... Uh, On the contrary. It makes our position all the more exciting. I wouldn't make light of it, sir. Oh, go ahead. It's true. The old fiend spirit still haunts the hills of self, and we've got proof. Really? It's been no coincidence... That every time there's been a death in Salford for the past two years, since the house was empty, the bell in the tower rang. Rang on the day the person died, before they died. But who'd ring the bell? The judge, lad. The judge. He's still up there. Mark me. Suppose it was the wind. Swinging the bell. Oh, come on now. What you take me for? There was no wind the first time and any other time. That first day, we all remember it. I'll tell you. One clear morning, the bell starts ringing and ringing. Well, what makes you think it was the judge's ghost? We all ran up to see who was pulling the bell rope. Thought it might be kids on a prank, you know. And you saw the judge? No, 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 no. We peered in the window, and the rope was swinging like mad, and the bell was ringing. But there was nobody in the room. Who else but the ghost of the judge could have been pulling that rope? I tell you, there was no one there. And then someone died? Aye. Oh, oh, Tally. Been sick with pneumonia for two days. Died that night. And then there was Mrs. Allen. Next time the bell rang, she tripped over a cat, hit her head, and uh, that was that. Well, I guess you'd have no reason to lie about it. I suppose this did happen. Four times. Did anyone die without the bell ringing? Not in the past two years. Hmm. Since the judge's son died and left the house empty? Right. Then the bell ringing doesn't really cause the deaths. Of course not. But how does the old monster know when to ring it? Always when someone is going to die. Have you thought about going up and dismantling the bell? 
Oh, that would put an end to it. <laughs> if you could get a man to go near that place. Well, we'll be living there. We'll have a look. You're still going to stay there after what I just told you? Of course. I can't believe it. Well, it won't hang on my conscience whatever happens to you. You don't want to believe me. It's your business. <laughs> Mark, do you think he was pulling our leg about the house? No, he seems serious enough. But it's so far-fetched. Ghosts don't pull bell ropes. And I rather think your theory about the wind might have some substance. Perhaps. But there's a wind tonight and not a sound from the bell. Let's have a look at it from inside. Now? Why not? We have a flash. There must be a way up from the upper floor. All right, why not? That small ladder going up to the trap door. That's got to be it. You want to go first? Here goes. The thing's probably rusted shut by now. Hope I can budge it. Any luck? Yes. There it goes. Can you see it? Ah, oh, the bell's enclosed in a housing. Wind couldn't get at it. Not a big one either. Looks like the dinner bell they used to ring at prep school. Want to take off the rope and give the villagers a break? Should I? Well, maybe not. That we better not. Brian, what are you doing? Stop that thing. I didn't touch it. I didn't touch it, Mark. I'm coming down. The damn thing just started clanging. Then someone is down there in the living room, pulling that bell rope. Someone or something is pulling the bell rope. Certainly not one of the villagers who hear the judge's house. Certainly not the judge who sits in his high-backed chair, staring out from his portrait. We'll go downstairs with Mark and Brian to learn just what's going on when I return shortly with Act Two. judge used to ring on execution day of victims he had sentenced begins to ring of its own accord, or so it seems, for Brian, who was inspecting it, never touched it. But two educated young men aren't taken in by myths, superstitions, or ghosts. There's a practical explanation for everything. Someone's down there pulling on that bell rope. Come on! How did anyone get in? We'll find out. This is as crazy as the story that innkeeper told us. What? The bell stopped. Look! The rope's still swinging. Well, someone did that, Brian. He's got to be in the house. But where could he go? It only took us moments to come down the stairs. There's no place for anyone to hide. Well, have you got any ideas? No. But the villagers must be having kittens down there. <laughs> you said it. They're wondering who's next. What the devil is that noise? It sounds as though it's coming from up there. Mark, look. That's a hole in the ceiling for the bell rope. I see it, but I don't believe it. A rat. As big as my grandmother's tabby cat. Look at the eyes, Brian. The eyes. It's the fire light hitting them. Could the rat have run up the bell rope? Yes. That's what rang the bell. <laughs> Wait till old Andy and the villagers learn the ghostly bell ringer is nothing but a rat. <laughs> well, I hate the thought of sharing a cottage with that. We shan't. We'll get some poison or a trap in the village tomorrow. You'll need a beaver trap to catch that thing. Oh, it keeps staring at us. Poison will do the trick. Oh, whew. Well, backed away from the hole. <laughs> but it's still up there in the eaves somewhere. Maybe we ought to drive down tonight for the poison. The innkeeper probably has some. We'll do it in the morning. Well, I'm not going to sleep too well with that thing scratching around in the walls. Tomorrow, it'll be dead. That rat just rang its own death knell. <laughs> Shall we get some work done first? No, let's get into town and get that poison. 
I'll work a lot better when we bury that rat. Another drizzly morning. I'll go for the poison. You stay here by the fire. No need for us both to ride down. Well, okay, if you don't mind. I'll put on another pot of coffee. Now bring some fresh eggs from the village. We'll have ourselves a good breakfast and give Mr. Rat his last meal. I watched Brian get into his convertible and swing down the curving road toward the village. I threw another log on the fire. And as I headed for the kitchen to start the coffee, I had the feeling that I was being watched. And I was. I looked up into the eyes of the judge in the portrait. The sensation was incredible. Up to now, I'd only given the portrait a passing glance. But now, the eyes seemed to burn right through me. There was animation in them. They were watching every move I made. I moved closer to the mantle to study the canvas. Here was hate. Revenge and madness rolled into one face. But the eyes, those incredible eyes, I had to turn away. And when I did, it was only to meet another pair of eyes. The rat was looking down at me from the hole in the ceiling. It sat there, unmoving. As unmoving as the judge in the portrait. Uh, I, I picked up a small log from the hearth and threw it up at the rat. Oh, I missed but the rat disappeared into the eaves. And I busied myself in the kitchen until I heard Brian coming in the front door. Hello, Ma? I'm back. In the kitchen. Coffee's ready. I got the rat poison and a lecture to boot. A lecture? Seems the shopkeeper's as queer about this house as Andy down at the pub. A rat, he says. Fat chance. It's the old judge ringing that bell. Did he say anything about the bell ringing last night? Of course. They're all in an uproar. Brian, I want to tell you something. While you were gone, I, I saw the rat again. It looked down at me from that hole up there. Well, this stuff will soon take care of him. As I looked back at it, I saw... I saw the eyes of the judge. What? The eyes of the judge in the portrait. They looked at me with the same intensity as the eyes of the rat. Well, we'll take the portrait down if it bothers you. And as for the rat, he's about to have his last meal. Oh, maybe it was being here alone. My imagination worked overtime. We'll spread this poison around and get some work done today. May as well start laying out the structure. Where should we put that stuff? Oh, it always seems to appear up by the bell rope. Must have his nest there. We'll put some up there... And some in the pantry, just in case. I sure hope it works. The chap in the village guaranteed it. Get me that stepladder from the kitchen, and I'll sprinkle these pellets in the rafters around the bell rope hole. You better be careful, Brian. Those rats can be vicious. I hope you've got enough of that stuff. We'll soon see. Better take the flash. Yes. Uh, Any sign of Brother Rat? Not so far. No. It's not up here now. What is up there? Just a cramped space between the ceiling and the bedroom floor. Yeah, that does it. Uh, hello, what's this? What did you find? A big book of some kind. Like a scrapbook. Bring it down. I intend to. Must have been up there for years. I'm surprised the rat hasn't chewed it to bits and made a nest out of it. Well, it's almost falling apart. Look, we'll lay it out on a long table. Belong to the old judge without a doubt. Looks like a lot of newspaper articles. The judge's press clippings? Yes. From papers 40 and 50 years old. Look at this. Hanging judge. Sentences 200th to die. He was actually proud of it. So it seems. Here's a picture of him. Dated June 19th, 1920. Well, same face as the portrait. Only a lot younger. Hello? Here's an odd one. Look at this. The British Society of Sorcery 
will hold its monthly meeting at Society Headquarters, 31 Pembroke Place, on Thursday, October 1st at 8 p.m. Featured speaker of the evening will be the Honorable Judge Harrison Schelling of Salford, whose topic will be witchcraft and the changing form. The public is invited. Well, now we know his hobby. He gets more fascinating all the time. I might make a hobby of him. What about our monograph? It might tie in nicely. Perfectly. We're doing abnormal psychology. A judge into witchcraft. What a case history. <laughs> Well, Mark, I think we've done enough work for one day. You want to go into the village for supper? I'd just as soon heat up some soup here. It's drizzly and cold out there. Suits me. It's almost dark, too. This fire's too good to leave. What was that? What? You didn't hear it? There. Yeah. Well, something hit the floor. There it is. It's one of the poison pellets. He's pushing them down the hole. But Devil! Some guarantee that guy in the village gave you. Look at the fiend. He's throwing the stuff back at us. That's one smart rat. <laughs> he knows what's not good for him. Well, look at it this way. He was here before we were. Maybe we're intruding on him. Why don't we just leave him alone? Let him scrounge around as he pleases. It's been his home for we don't know how long. I don't like that idea at all. But at the moment, I... I don't have a better one. Brian and I had a light supper, did some work, let the fire go to embers and went to bed. I don't know how long I'd been asleep when I heard Brian yelling at me and dragging me out of bed. Mark, the house is on fire. Hurry! What? The downstairs is ablaze. Look! Look! I couldn't see flames, but firelight flickered around the stairwell. I grabbed my pants and we hurried downstairs. What? It's the fireplace. I, I thought the whole house was ablaze. Yes, it's the fireplace, but how come? They were just dying embers when we went up to bed. But how did this start up? I don't know. Fascinating, isn't it? It's downright weird. Someone started that fire up again. Curious, all right. But I'll be darned if I'll detach a supernatural significance to it. Some charcoal just flared up. I didn't say it was supernatural. I said someone started the fire up. Are you accusing me of playing tricks on you? Don't be ridiculous. But you picked a dilly of a house for us to try to concentrate in. Brian's upbeat nature kept me from taking things too seriously. But I should have realized we were in a danger far greater than Brian would admit. For the next two days, we worked without incident. And no sign of the rat, thank heaven. We didn't go into the village at all. And we were surprised when we saw Andy, the tavern keeper, approach the house somewhat cautiously. Come in, Andy. How'd you know it was me? Our crystal ball. What? We saw you through the window. <laughs> I hope I'm not intruding. No, of course not. Help yourself to Sherry. We never thought we'd see you set foot in here. None of us thought I would either. We was getting concerned about you too. Haven't seen you in two days. I was elected to come see you. She was all right. Rather, I lost the draw. And you see, we're fine. Did you get rid of the rat? Well, we don't know. We haven't seen it for two days. I, I knew those pellets would do the trick. We're not sure it ate any of them. How? It kept pushing them down at us from its nest, up there. You don't believe me? I believe anything that might happen in this house. Uh, so that's him, staring down from the wall. The old hanging judge himself, eh? That's him. Evil as evil can be, he is. You can tell it to look at him. Curious you should put it that way. What way? You said he is, not he was. Of course he is. 
You won't believe his spirits here ringing that bell, but we know it. And mark me, you're in for a hard lesson, don't I know it? We appreciate your concern for our well-being. I mean that. Well, if you was about to come to harm, we wouldn't ignore you. Things are awfully tense in the village. About us? About you. About all of us. That blasted bell rang three nights ago. We know. We're waiting. Wondering. Who's going to be next? <laughs> Do not send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for the judge's next victim. But it's merely a gutter rat that rings the bell when it occasionally runs up and down the bell rope to its nest in the eaves. That's what Brian would have the villagers believe, and perhaps he's right. But that's a big perhaps. And we'll find out what really goes on in the judge's house when I return shortly with Act Three. silence of the night, how we shiver at the melancholy menace of their tone. The people of Salford certainly shiver every time the bell in the judge's house rings. According to them, it means someone is going to die. But it's been several days now since the bell rang last, and the village is still wondering. Who's going to be next? That's your trouble, Andy. You let superstition color your whole life. No one is going to be next just because a rat happened to swing on a bell rope. Ah, you can talk, lad. You haven't lived in Salford. We know. Well, I better be getting back. Well, thanks for coming, Andy. We appreciate your concern. Like I said, we hadn't seen you in two days. Just wanted to make sure you was all right. We still think you're loony. Perhaps. But it will take more than a rat and superstition to get us to leave. Well, I hope for your sake there is nothing more. Good day now. So long, Andy. We'll be down for a beer. And thanks again for thinking of us. You be careful now. <laughs> Decent chap. They all are, I suppose. Yeah. Want to get back to work? We'd better... Thus, then, the psyche is turned inward on itself, with no other outlet. Something the matter, Mark? Uh, I just can't concentrate. I know I'm acting like one of the villagers, but I can't stand that portrait staring down at us. It really bothers you. Yes, and I'm going to take it down. All right, if you'll feel better. But he is sort of an inspiration, now that we're ready to include him in the paper. Well, give me a hand, will you? Sure. Heavy, is it? Well, it's not that. It, it seems to be nailed to something. It won't budge. So it is. Let's both lift from the bottom. Oh, no, no use. I'm afraid it's there to stay. Unless we destroy the thing. Oh, no, we can't do that. Well, let's get back to work. I want to go over the scrapbook, item by item. It'll give us a good start on... Hello. Did you move the book? No. It's gone. I mean, I distinctly remember leaving it on the corner table here. Oh, well, it's got to be around here. I never touched it. Nor I. Not since we looked at it the first time. It's absolutely gone. Well, maybe the judge stepped down from the portrait and hid it somewhere. Uh, to keep us from prying. <laughs> now you're treating the whole situation the way you should. But where could it have gone? Let's call it a day. It's getting dark. Want to pop down to Andy's for a pint? I'd like nothing better. Anything more, boys? Oh, no, thanks. I'm falling asleep from all that ale. I'll finish this and we'll go. Uh, you know, uh, the people have been talking. Oh? Yeah. Yeah, thinking maybe you lads 
loony as you are, and maybe driven the old thing away. Nothing's happened in the village. You know what I mean? I think we do. You're going to be here for two months, and it's good. Just your being there has done something. This is the first time nothing's happened after the bell rang. And we hope it stays that way. We'd better get back. Let's have the tab, Andy. Uh, good night, boys. It's all on me. Oh, I wish we'd left the light on. Take the flash. I'll pop round back for some firewood. You go in and stir the embers. Okay. I went into the living room. And before I could turn on a light, I knew I was being watched. I flicked on the light and... The rat was back. It looked over the rim of the hole. Its eyes aglow with reflected light. Oh, the chill that ran up the back of my neck was indescribable. The rat stared, unmoving... And then it leaped to the bell rope, swinging back and forth, setting off the clanging, twisting and writhing on the rope as it chewed, chewed right through the rope. It fell to the floor with a thud and turned toward me. I raced for the kitchen and slammed the door. I had to get out of the house. I ran through the kitchen to the back door. Mark, what the hell's going on? Why was the bell ringing? I, I can't open the door, Brian. The rat's in the living room. It's crazed. Open the door. I'll push from this side. Now, now what's happened? Oh, the, the rat's loose in the living room. It, it's, it's gone mad or something. It, it attacked me. Now, now, calm down. Why did the bell ring? The rat chewed through the bell rope. Brian, we, we've got to leave here. The rat clawed at the door. Let's take a look. No. Don't don't open the door to the living room. It's there, waiting. Uh, I don't hear anything. Well, it, it's clever. It's waiting for us to come out. I'm going to see. Can you see him? No. L look. Look at the bottom of the door. Scratch marks. Yes, you're right. I could almost put up with the supernatural aspects you find so exciting. But we can't stay with a crazed rat. There's no sign of it now. Come on, let's take a look. Mark. What's the matter? Am I dreaming? Look at the portrait. The port... The judge is gone. He's no longer in it. Everything else is there. The chair, the table his arm rested on. Well, this is extraordinary. The painting's completely intact. No smudge, no tears, and no judge. We're getting out of here. I can't leave now. We're experiencing an unbelievable supernatural event. Have you lost your mind? We have both seen with our own eyes a figure disappear from a painting. We both know it's impossible, but it's happened. There's an incredible supernatural force at work in this house. Do you mean the judge is roaming around the house? The image of the judge. <gasps> of course. The lecture in the newspaper advertisement. Witchcraft. And the changing form. Mark, this adds up. The spirit of the judge never left the house. It stayed here in the form of the rat. Probably several rats over the years. And the body of the judge was preserved in the portrait. It was there for him to claim whenever he wanted. Dressed in his robes. Remember? The eyes of the rat looked like the eyes of the judge in the painting. What an experience we've stumbled on. You mean you're going to stay here? With that crazy judge on the loose? We can't miss out on this. I want to see what he does next. Do you actually think we're going to meet up with him? He's gone from the portrait. 
He's got to turn up somewhere. Brian, listen to me. That rat attacked me. That means the judge has murder in mind, too. Look, we have got to get out of here. Look. There he is. At the top of the stairs. Looming above us. Like some colossus. Stood the judge. His black robes swirled around him. His long, white hair had a luminous glow. And his eyes. Those eyes. Over his arm hung the bell rope. And in his hand, a black cap. As we stood transfixed, slowly he placed the black cap on his head. A cap British judges always put on when passing a sentence of death. The death cap. Incredible. What a manifestation. It, he's beckoning to us. I'm going up. No, Brian, you can't. It's only an ectoplasmic manifestation, a spirit. I want to see what it does. It can't hurt us. Let's just leave. Never. See, it's motioning us to follow. I'm going to follow it. Don't. I'm going to see this through. It's moving away. Down the hall. I must see where it goes. And what it does. Brian, please, don't go up there. It's heading for the bell tower. I'm close enough to touch it. Brian. Brian. Answer me, Brian. I raced up the stairs. There was no sign of Brian. I searched every room, every corner of the second floor. Brian and the judge had vanished. I ran back outside, jumped into Brian's car, and headed for help in the village. What is he, Dad? The, the judge. He's... The judge? He's up at the house. Brian followed him. Followed him? Up where? Stairs. But they've both disappeared. Can you get some of the men to come back with me? We have got to find Brian. I don't know. There's none but me who dare sit foot within that place. Listen. The bell. Why? It couldn't ring. The rat chewed the rope clear through. I'm crazy to do it. But I can't leave you alone to face it. Come on. I'll go back up there with you. Rory, Alec, come with us and don't ask questions. You say you saw the judge? He disappeared from the portrait. And then we saw him standing at the top of the stairs. That's when Brian went up to follow him. We'd better approach cautiously. Peer in the windows first to see what's going on. I'm going in to find Brian. Oh, lad. Through the window. I can see it. Brian. Hurry up, man. Quick. Brian. Brian. I looked with horror and then covered my eyes. Brian was hanging by the neck from the bell rope, swinging in slow rhythm to the tolling of the bell. Before I passed out and everything went black, I caught a glimpse of the portrait. The judge was back, seated in the high back chair, as though he had never moved. Two on the lawn with Andy standing over me. Uh, uh, are you all right, Lane? Uh, yes, but Brian. Oh, Brian. Uh, he'll be all right, too. We got him down in time. The men have taken him to the pub. He's. He's alive? Indeed. A nasty scar he'll have on his neck, but he'll be all right. The doctor's with him now. 
Well, what are the men doing over there? Ending this once and for all. We're burning the place to the ground. It'll go up like a tinderbox. Aye. Judge, rat, and all. And if the grandson complains we burned down his house, so be it. We have to protect ourselves from the judge's house. That was the end of it for us. Brian recovered. And we finished our work back at his flat in Liverpool. But I can still remember watching the judge's house collapse into fiery ashes. And the small, furry figure that emerged from the inferno. Its eyes glistening in the light of the flames. Before it scampered off into the woods beyond. The bell will toll no more over the judge's house. No longer will the villagers of Salford have to live in fear and dread. We know the rat deserted the sinking ship, or fiery house to be exact, but without the portrait and the bell and the house, he'll probably end up as just another homeless gutter rat. I'll be back shortly. in witchcraft staunchly maintain that certain evil spirits, the devil most notably, can survive for years, sometimes centuries, by taking on various other life forms. One way of living forever, I suppose. But I don't think I'd like it. I mean, what's the good of living forever if your friends can never recognize you? Our cast included Gordon Gould, Lloyd Batista, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the universe. We have wonderful things for you to see. We have stars being born and galaxies exploding. We have spaceships plunging into the void and mysterious planets beckoning their crews to adventure. We have alien creatures, pitiless and pitiful, monsters, fierce and friendly, scientists, mad and sane. We have them all because you have your imagination and you can see wonders more wonderful than any movie screen can show. In fact... The story you're about to hear is about a movie screen, the strangest anyone has ever seen. Our mystery drama, The Movie Makers, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Marion Seldes and Norman Rose. story begins where some stories end, because a life has ended, the life of Dr. John Savile, a world-renowned physicist. 
The Savile theory of dual entropy will become standard among scientific principles, and for the next century, scientists will debate whether or not Dr. Savile's theory of space heat would have been proved valid if the great man had lived. But Dr. Savile is dead. His work lives on, his memory, and his widow. Please come in, Martin. Oh, thank you, Vera. But I really think you should go up and rest now. Funerals are very hard on the living. I must talk to you. Maybe you'll finally tell me the truth. About why I went to a funeral this morning. About why my husband shot himself. Oh, Vera. Don't give me that suffering look, Martin. Save it for your students. I know you'd like the whole world to believe it was nothing but a, an aberration on John's part. A momentary act of madness. He was overworked. John has been overworked all his life. But he loved being alive, and now suddenly he's dead. <laughs> oh, Vera. Why trouble yourself? Death is too solid a fact to question. I question this fact. Dear, uh, your husband was approaching the end of one of the most significant theorems in physics. And when he realized what it was he found, what terrible Pandora's box he was about to open... Yes, I've heard the stories that John felt guilty about his work when he realized its implication that his guilt drove him mad. And you don't believe that? No. No, I was married to him. I don't have to believe theories, Martin. I knew the man. But you know nothing about his theory, this space heat hypothesis. Do you realize what kind of military end could have evolved from it? Did you see the interview in Science? In News Weekly with General Fletcher? A planet wrapped in flame. That's a horrifying thought, isn't it, Vera? And that was the thought John had with him for months now. I just don't believe it. You told me he'd leave the house frequently. But yes, every day, for hours. I don't know where he went. I still don't know. Uh, never mind. We have more practical things to talk about. Practical? Mm, legal things, Vera. We have to probate the will... Get John's papers together. We'll go over them tomorrow. You know where he kept everything? Yes. His wall safe. I have the combination. I'll open it tonight. Mm, you do that. And, um, Vera, don't think of the way John died. Think how he lived. <laughs> Right, 13. There. Oh. Oh, so many papers. Well, it'll have to be sorted out. Let's see. Oh, here are the insurance policies. These must be his work notes. I have to give them to Martin. What's this? Another notebook with a rubber band around it. I wonder if John could have kept a diary. Something wrapped around this. A letter? I remember when this arrived. It was a Saturday morning. John always shared the mail with me, but this letter... he kept silent about, and I never did know why. Let me see. Dear... Dr. Savile, your interest is kindly solicited in a unique proposition we would like to offer you. <laughs> what a funny sort of sales letter. Unknown to you and by means of a process hitherto thought impossible, our organization has been photographing your life since the date of your birth on October 2nd, 1921. As a scientist, you are certain to realize the enormous complexity of such a photographic undertaking and the amount of research it required to unearth the radical new concepts involved. 
We are offering private screenings of these films to the selected group of individuals upon whom we have been experimenting. We plan to limit these showings to one hour daily and are forced to charge a minimum fee of $100 per visit. The films will be projected at our own offices at 420 Oak Road, Carrington, Massachusetts, which is 18 miles north of Boston. If you are interested in a trial session, we would be pleased to have you call at our offices on Thursday of this week at 10 a.m. Good Lord, I wonder if John actually... Oh, wait, now there's more. There is one other consideration. We ask that you maintain complete secrecy about our organization. We are not yet ready to make our process public, and for this reason, we request that no one, not even your closest kin, be informed about the contents of this letter. Failure to comply will result in a withdrawal of this offer. Yours very truly, Howard Frank, Vice President, Life Films Incorporated. It has to have been some kind of hoax. How could such a thing be possible? I wonder if... If John's notebook... Let me see. The letter was dated the 5th. Thursday of that week would be... Here's the entry, yes. June the 9th. The first entry. The very first... This has this been, has been an, extraordinary an extraordinary day for me, day for me. and worthy of being and recorded being in a special recorded. journal. One hour ago, I returned from a small town called Carrington, some 18 miles from the city of Boston. I have spent this morning in a ramshackle frame house at the outskirts of town, whose interior has been converted into a modern office-like arrangement of some four rooms. And in one of those rooms... I have been watching myself as a youth of 27 attending a small gathering at the home of a man who has been dead for 10 years. I realize that I am writing this with unscientific detachment, but this experience has shaken my soul like dice in a gambler's cuff. I will try to start at the beginning. Yes? Uh, hello, my name is Saville. Would that be Dr. Saville of the university? That's right. Uh, am I talking to Mr. Frank? Uh, no, doctor. Uh, my name is David Morrison. Uh, Mr. Frank is in his office. He's been expecting you. Ah, Dr. Saville. How nice of you to be so prompt. Please, sit down. Uh, thank you. Well, what did you think of my letter? Well, let's say I found it very intriguing. Ah, uh, yes, but of course... You're all so skeptical. I'll have to admit that I am. I really cannot see how it's possible to... to photograph a man's life without being observed. Well, I can think of only one way to prove that our offer was genuine. We'll have to demonstrate. This way, Doctor? Oh, yes. Now, this is our... Uh, our projection room. If you'll just take a seat... Oh, I'm sorry about the darkness. Oh, thank you. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm afraid I don't see any screen. Oh, you'll see it on the facing wall, Doctor, just as soon as we leave. Now, just make yourself at home. All we need to know is what period of your life you'd be most interested in seeing. Are you... Are you telling me seriously that you have movies of my life? Yes, Dr. Saville. Movies of your life. Your whole life. Would you like to start in childhood? Oh, but that's impossible. Watch the screen, Dr. Saville. Great heavens. It can't be. It's my father, but so young. It just can't be. Please, please. Now, try to think of some specific event you'd like to see. The more specific, the better. All right, but well, I don't know the exact day. It was around the middle of May in the year 1946. 
It was the day I first met my wife, Vera. Do you think that you could locate that exact film? Of course. It won't be any trouble. It was a small party at the home of a Mr. Hugh Donato, a colleague of mine at the university. Dead now. Well, it will take just a few minutes. Now, just relax. I'm sure we'll have no trouble finding the exact film. me alone then. I still was not certain that I wasn't the victim of some elaborate student prank. And yet, I could have sworn that for one moment I saw my father's face on that screen before me. And then the screen started to glow once more, a brilliant whiteness painful to my eyes. But then, the colors began to appear. The screen held a picture of a room I hadn't seen in 30 years. It was Hugh Donato's living room, beyond any doubt, the same room. I couldn't fail to recognize that big, ugly square room with its incongruous walls of wood paneling and flowered wallpaper. There were people in the room. Old Hugh himself, looking not a day over 30. And his wife, Deborah. And Professor Mills, the old windbag. And Jane Anderson. What a handsome woman she was before. And then I, I realized I could actually hear their voices. I leaned forward eagerly to hear them. But I heard nothing. Because suddenly I saw her standing by the bay window, standing there quietly in isolation. A young girl in a gray cashmere sweater looking lost and lovely and supremely wonderful. My eyes filled with tears when I saw Vera, my wife, unchanged by time's treachery. And then I saw myself. I was speaking to her and she was replying. I know. You're Professor Seville. <laughs> No, hardly. I'm just a teacher, not even an associate professor. Oh, I'm sorry. I... It's all right. I decided that I'd rather be called doctor. Who ever heard of an absent-minded doctor? <laughs> doctor as in MD? No, no, as in physics, actually. Uh, by the way, did you tell me your name yet? It's Peterson. Vera Peterson. I'm in vocational guidance. Do you know that you're squinting, Vera Peterson? What? You are definitely squinting at me. Well... I don't know what you mean. Look, I've seen you around the university, and I happen to remember that you wear glasses. Where are they now? Well, they're in my purse, if you really want to know. Well, I think you ought to wear them. You do? Certainly. How else can you know what I look like? I might be a veritable Mr. Hyde, for all you know. Instead of Dr. Jekyll. <laughs> Go on. Put your glasses on. I might have just the impudent charm you like. All right, I will. There. You know something, Miss Peterson? You should never worry about wearing those glasses. I mean, all the time. Nothing in the world could hide the beauty of your, of your eyes. Can it really be true? Did John really see these things? Let's see what's on the next page. It wasn't until I was back on the highway, heading for home, that the full impact of what had occurred struck me. I knew that I had just witnessed a great scientific mystery, a secret which my scientist's mind should have coveted. Yet all I could think about was the personal side of my discovery, and even as I write these words, I am trembling with impatience for my next visit to Life Films Incorporated. Everybody loves the movies. But can you imagine what it would be like to star in your own life story? Would you see yourself as hero or villain? Your life as a comedy or tragedy? How did Dr. John Savile see himself? And what was the effect of his strange movie-going habits? We'll find out when we return shortly with Act Two. Savile, widow of the renowned scientist Dr. John Savile, sits in the dim study in which her husband had spent long hours studying the mysteries of the universe and ponders another mystery, a strange journal left to her as a legacy from her husband, a journal which tells the incredible story John Savile had kept secret from her. June the 22nd. Shall I tell Vera what I have seen? Shall I jeopardize this opportunity to relive my life 
in the strangest of all possible ways. I am caught up in an inner conflict that cries out for resolution. How have they performed this miracle? What wizardry has allowed them to put on film my every living deed without my knowledge? How can I, a scientist, not demand to know the answer? And, and yet, yet, I cannot. I am so deeply entangled in the net they have cast that I lack the will to do anything. Every hour I have spent in the Carrington projection room has been infinitely precious to me. The past has become more real and more important to me than the present. Today, for instance, I, I spent an hour on a train with my father. I was on a transcontinental phone sitting in the dining car, watching the towns and farms of America flash by the window. My father had some interesting tale or legend to recount about everything we saw. For his engineering work had given him the opportunity to know every state in the Union with a hometown familiarity. I remember how fascinated I had been by his stories when I was 14. That was the age of my trip. And how sad I was to realize now what a terrible old bore my father was. What a stuffy, pompous, wonderful old bore. How could I surrender such delights, even in the name of science? Well, come in, Dr. Seville. How are you today? I'm, I'm very well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Frank, Dr. Seville is here. Well, hello, Doctor. Come right inside. We've been waiting for you. Yes, yes, thank you. I've located those films you asked for. The dinner at the Waldorf Astoria. You did say the award date was September the 10th? Yes, yes, that was the date. Now, I, I admit I feel a bit foolish about wanting to see myself uh, given tributes. I didn't realize I had so much ego. Well, but it's perfectly natural, Doctor, to receive such an honored prize. You must have been very proud. Oh, no, no, I, I didn't feel pride at the time. I felt uh, embarrassed having all that attention showered on me. I would have much rather been at home in my study or in a classroom. But uh, for some reason, now I would like to see it all again. It must be old age. You are not an old man, Dr. Seville. There are many things in your life yet to come, I am sure. But you're not photographing me now, are you? The, the, the process isn't continuing. No, no, Doctor. Our experiment is over. Now all you have to do is enjoy it. did enjoy it. I have to admit the truth. I sat in the darkness of that projection room and watched the world pay me tribute. And Lord help me, how I relished it all. How Vera would have laughed to see me. Poor Vera. I know that my movie-going days are causing her great worry. My unexplained disappearances. And even worse, my diminishing interest in my work. The space heat theory is so close to completion. It would be unforgivable to allow my efforts to lag because of my need for, well, for pictures of my life. John, you must see a doctor. You haven't seen one for months. I don't need a doctor, Vera. There's nothing wrong with me. John, I talked to Dr. Khan about you. Khan? You know what kind of doctor he is, Vera. Yes. Ah, I see. You think that I'm uh, going a little funny? No, of course I don't think that. But you know yourself that well, you've changed. Your habits are different, and you're having problems at the university, aren't you? Well, yes, I suppose I am. Some problems, nothing serious. Well, Martin tells me... Well, go on. What did Martin say? Something about a disability you have. Well, it's true. Something strange has happened to me, Vera. I cannot explain it. I'm sure that it's only temporary. Please tell me, John. Vera, I, I seem to have forgotten some basics. It's very strange. Sometimes I feel like some poor C student struggling with the intricacies of calculus. In fact, there are, well, there are times when even simple arithmetic seems beyond me. Then is that why you haven't been working? Well, it may be part of it, but, but Vera... 
please don't worry. I, I'm going to start again. I have an idea about how to start again. Yes, I had an idea. You might call it an inspiration. Didn't the files of Life Films Incorporated contain every waking hour of my life? Watching the films, why couldn't I quickly reorient myself to the foundations of my work? It would be a refresher course, and I would be my own instructor. This morning, I viewed the scene in my study when I first glimpsed the secret of space heat. The blackboard covered with equations was a friendly sight, and as I studied it eagerly, a sense of elation came over me. But when I arrived home and made myself a makeshift lunch at 2 p.m., the terrible truth struck me. It had all been so clear on that screen in the projection room, but now, sitting in that quiet kitchen, the film seemed like a long-forgotten dream a hazy memory from the distant past. The cosmic sense of all I had seen on that blackboard had become... had become meaningless. I could recall nothing. Absolutely nothing. September 13th. I did not go to Carrington today. The effort was monumental. I left the house as usual not wanting the change in my routine to be noticed by Vera. Instead, I drove the car through the countryside in an effort to clear my clouded brain. The attempt was unsuccessful. I could think of nothing but that narrow room at Carrington. I craved the comfort of that armchair and screen, the way an addict must crave his narcotic. Those hours now are essential to my existence. I must have them at any cost. September the 14th. My mother was a beautiful woman. I've always thought so, and now I'm sure of it. She was like some golden angel with long blonde hair and gentle hands. She died when I was only five, but I've spent an unforgettable hour with her on this, my birthday. Even now, locked in my study, while Vera pleads with me on the other side of the door, my eyes are full of tears. Why can't they leave me alone, my so-called friends? Martin, it's the only way. I asked Dr. Khan to come to the house tonight just to observe John, to tell me what he thinks. Well, it won't work, Vera. You can't treat an unwilling patient. Oh, I don't want him to start treating him. I want him to tell me what's wrong. No, Vera, no doctor will make a diagnosis on this basis. Well, I'm surprised Dr. Khan agreed to all this. Oh, he, he doesn't really know. I just asked him for dinner. He's met John before, you know. He's met him at least a dozen times at those award dinners. And... I still say it's the wrong way to solve the problem. You must convince John to see someone, convince him that there's a need. But I've tried that, and I've failed. I've got to try something else. Well, what are you two conspiring about? Uh, evening, John. Uh, how are you feeling tonight? I feel fine. Shall I take my temperature for your benefit? Oh, really, John? I'm sorry, Martin. It's just that I've become so sick and tired of people asking me how I am. Martin, you can stay for dinner, can't you? Well, I uh, really don't think I can. Please, please. You've got to stay. Well, of course, Martin. Why not? I'm not really good company at dinner, as Vera will tell you. It'll be much nicer if we're a threesome. It will be a foursome, John. Four? I invited someone else, another old friend. There he is now. Excuse me. Uh, but, uh, Vera. Please come in, doctor. Did, did she say doctor? Well, it's starting to rain a bit, I'm sorry to say. Let me take your coat. <laughs> well, I never did learn the art of remembering my umbrella. Well, <clears throat> good evening. Oh, hello, Victor. Yes, Martin, how nice to see you. And you, John? John, you remember Dr. Victor Kahn, of course. No. No, I'm afraid I don't. Well, something tells me you're surprised to see me here, John. I uh, heard my wife say that you're a doctor. Well, you know Dr. Khan is a psychiatrist. Well, in fact, the uh, two of you shared the same award last year, remember? No. 
No, I don't. I don't remember anything about it. And frankly, I don't see why I should share my dinner table with a stranger. John, how can you say that? I'm sure that you have regular consulting hours, Doctor. I don't intend to consult you on my dinner hour. Now, if you'll excuse me. Uh, 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 John, uh, wait. I uh, think there's a misunderstanding. I, I thought we'd become friends. Friends? I never saw you before in my life. October the 6th. It's the last entry. The last page. October the 6th. My hand is shaking. I can barely write these words. Today I have had terrible news. I cannot believe it. I'm sorry, Dr. Seville, but I'm afraid we cannot show you a film today. Mm -hmm. Not show me... But, but why? I, I had the money. I, I am really very sorry. You see, the projection room has been dismantled. What? But, but why? Is there some problem, something that has to be repaired? It's been dismantled, Doctor. What does that mean? I am afraid that you will not be able to continue your visits here. This business has become, well, unprofitable for us. Oh, but I'll, I'll pay you more. It doesn't have to be only a hundred dollars. I can raise more money, I promise you. It isn't that simple. But why are you doing this? Tell me. We were very grateful for your patronage, Dr. Seville. Believe me. But our experiment is over. It isn't fair. It's just not fair. There are a thousand things I want to see. Please, I beg you not to do this. I beg you. Hello? Vera, it's Martin. How are you? Oh, I'm all right, Martin. Thank you. Uh, I'm just uh, <clears throat> calling to find out if you located all of John's papers. Yes, I... I have them. Everything we discussed was in his wall safe. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, now, uh, what time would you like me to come over tomorrow? Tomorrow? Well, I have classes in the afternoon. C can we make it in the morning? No, uh, no Martin. It won't be possible. Oh, why not? I... I won't be here tomorrow. I'm going somewhere. Where? Well, not to your sister. You, you, you said you wouldn't leave for at least a month. We'll just have to make it another time, Martin. I'm, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Very well, Vera. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now, what was that address again? Oh, here it is. Life Films Incorporated, 420 Oak Road, Carrington, Massachusetts. Mrs. John Savile has decided to follow the same trail her husband followed. What will she find there? An answer? Or perhaps more tragedy? We'll find out exactly what happens at 420 Oak Road when we return shortly with Act Three. It's a cold, crisp day in autumn. A day for visiting the countryside to see the blazing colors of the leaves before their fall. But the eyes of Vera Savile behind the wheel of her car seem to see nothing but the road ahead. Even as she drives, her mind is full of doubts that she will find anything at all at 420 Oak Road, either because its occupants have moved on or because those occupants had never been there. Yes? Pardon me, I... I'm looking for a place called Life Films Incorporated. Oh, I'm sorry. You must have the wrong address. No, um, I'm sure it's the right place, but perhaps the firm is no longer located huh. here. I'm sorry. I, I really can't help you. Oh, wait, please. I, I'm Mrs. Seville. My husband was Dr. John Seville. You know his name, don't you? I am afraid not. Please don't shut the door. Uh, what is it, David? Is there a Mr. Frank here? Mr. Thomas Frank? Uh, yes. Yes, my name is Frank, Mrs. Saville. Let the lady in, David. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, come this way, Mrs. Saville. And please, sit down. Uh, no. I prefer to stand, thank you. I really think you would be better off. This chair is quite comfortable. Very well. Now, tell me... 
What we can do for you, Mrs. Saville? I know what you're thinking. Pardon? You're thinking that John disobeyed your instructions, but you're wrong. He never told me about you or about this place. He, he kept a journal, a record of his visits here, and I found it after his death. You have our deepest sympathies, Mrs. Seville. Your, your husband was a great man. Thank you. You should know, of course. You should know everything about John. Mrs. Seville... I've read about your movies. It's difficult to believe that such a thing can be done. But as the wife of a scientist, I have more liberal ideas, perhaps, concerning what is possible. Yes, yes. Many things are possible, Mrs. Seville. No one knew that better than your husband. He was a brilliant man. But what he accomplished in his lifetime was no greater than your own achievement. Oh, we, we did not invent the life film process, ma'am. We are merely, um, salesmen. Ah, well, you have an amazing product to sell. Truly amazing. A filmed record of one's own life. Very ingenious. But in this case, your ingenuity killed my husband. Oh, we cannot believe that, Mrs. Seville. You did. Read his journal. Read it and you'll see. These films of yours destroyed him. They destroyed his will. They were like a drug to him, like an addictive drug. And then you... You cut them off. You stopped them and he couldn't bear it and he killed himself. That wasn't the case. It's the truth. Read the last entry. The pain he felt. Knowing that he could no longer... Visit his past. See his life relived. Mrs. Seville... You must hear our side of the story. I know you're overwrought, but we deserve a hearing. Yes, that's why I've come. I want to know how you can justify what you've done. Very well. The first thing you have to know is that there are no films. What did you say? We are not movie makers. There has been no photographic record of your husband's life. But his journal... Things are not always what they seem. Our people have learned many things, but this is not one of them. Your people? Who are they? It is true that your husband saw his past, Mrs. Seville. Just as he says in his journal. But the method was something different from what he thought. It had to be. And we couldn't tell him the truth for fear uh, that he would reveal our purpose. What purpose? The purpose of life, Mrs. Seville. Your husband was on the verge of an important discovery. A discovery that the people of our world have been aware of for many centuries. Your world. Oh, no. I'm not going to believe this. You're going to sit there and tell me that... you're from some other planet. That you're aliens. It will be the truth. But that's not possible. I want the real truth. Not some idiotic fairy tale. It is only the truth. We are from a planet of a sun. Not too distant from yours. Someday, perhaps, your people will reach us just as we have reached you. And when that day comes, if you come in peace, we will greet you in peace. But what has this to do with my husband? We are given to the long view of things, Mrs. Seville. That's why we were sent here. To prevent your husband's theory from being born before its time. Before the people of your world were able to cope with its... its dangers. We had to stop him. You mean to kill him? Is that what you were planning to do? Kill my husband? No, 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 Mrs. Seville. We are forbidden to take life. There are laws in your world which also forbid it, but those laws are only in your preachings... Our law is integrated in our minds and bodies and, and souls. Oh, I see. So you arranged for him to 
kill himself. No, no, that was not our intention. We deeply regret this tragic outcome. Please, please believe us, Mrs. Saville. All we wanted to do was to make your husband forget. But how? By destroying his mind? We hoped to have him forget only enough to make completion of his work impossible. Ah, yes, come with me, Mrs. Saville. I want... I want to show you our projection room. Come in. Come in, Mr. Seville. Well, it's... It's just as he described it. Uh, yes, yes. This is where your husband watched scenes from his past. But not on films, Mrs. Seville. We have evolved a method for producing from one's own mind the stored images of memory. I can assure you, the principles involved are more complex than your husband's space heat theory. Memory. Then John only remembered what he saw. Oh, the mind forgets nothing. There is a storehouse in our brains that keeps its treasures until some outside force brings them to light once again. We have discovered that force, that light, if you will. And through it, Dr. Saville rediscovered his past. It was a wondrous experience for him. But we expected to be repaid. And you don't mean money? No. We were repaid in another kind of coin. The coin of forgetfulness. The effort of extracting the past is a great one. The price is memory itself. Each hour your husband viewed in this room would later be forgotten by him in its entirety, no matter how hard he tried to recall it. Then you did destroy his mind. In the interests of peace, Mrs. Saville. And then when you were through with him, you tossed the empty shell aside. We did what had to be done. And what will you do now? We will return home. Our task on Earth is ended. For now. And what will I do now? John was everything to me. To you, he was nothing more than an assignment. Something you had to attack and destroy. <laughs> but he was my husband in my life. Oh, believe me, Mrs. Saville. We wish there was something we could do. Well, there is. There is. Anything, Mrs. Saville. Just tell us what you wish. I want... to see a film. <laughs> that you're squinting, Vera Peterson? What? You are definitely squinting at me. I don't know what you mean. Look, I've seen you around the university, and I happen to remember that you wear glasses. Where are they now? Oh, well, they're in my purse, if you really want to know. I think you ought to wear them. You do? Certainly. How else can you know what I look like? I might be a veritable Mr. Hyde, for all you know. Instead of Dr. Jekyll? <laughs> Go on. Put your glasses on. I might have just the impudent charm you like. All right, I will. There. Well, what do you think? Well, you're not Mr. Hyde. But I don't know about the impudent charm. You know something, Miss Peterson? You should never worry about wearing those glasses. I mean, all the time. Nothing in the world could hide the beauty of your eyes. Yes, you've guessed it. You've just heard a love story. But why not? Is there anything more wonderful, marvelous, or mysterious than love? We suspect that it is one earthly phenomenon that man will take with him and her to the outer planets. That romance will follow the rocket ships. That valentines will be sent on Venus. That wedding rings will be worn on the rings of Saturn. I'll be back shortly. Delta Airlines. Say, does Delta fly to Atlanta? Yes, sir. Delta has the most non-stops to Atlanta. Nine every day, plus eight one-stop through jets. Well, 
You'd better give them all to me. Yes, sir. Here goes. 7.20 a.m., rise and shine. The 8.20 flight is next in line. There's another breakfast flight at 9. Then come flights at 11.05, 11.30, and 12.25. The next flight takes off at 1.10, and close behind the 2 p.m. There's a 2.40 flight and a 3.30, too. Or maybe the 4 is just right for you. The 4.40 jet is a big tri-star, and the 6.25 is popular. At half past 6, another flight, then the 7.25 comes into sight. A TriStar night coach at 9 p.m. and another at 2.45 a.m. And then we do it all again. Wow, that was terrific. You're sure to have a good time on Delta. To Atlanta, Jacksonville, Daytona Beach, all the south. Hey, I had a good time just calling. Delta is ready when you are. This is WBBM Chicago. Speaking of love and science fiction, have you ever heard about the Hollywood producer who plotted his first science fiction movie? Boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy builds girl. Well, that might not be the next story you will hear on Mystery Theater, but we do promise you an earful of wonders, marvels, and mysteries that will bring the future as close as the speaker on your radio. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Norman Rose, Russell Horton, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. I hope you're ready for a journey into the bizarre, into the very, very strange, for that's where we're going. A round trip journey, of course, but one we promise you won't forget. Sarah and David Hughes have just finished dinner and have taken their coffee out to the patio, where dusk is coming in behind a lovely sunset, and the world seems bathed in serenity. But beware of peaceful places at peaceful times. Things change. Sometimes, suddenly. David! Hmm. You know, I was almost asleep. David, what is that up there? What's what? Up where? Up there, in, in the sky, those, those funny lights. There's a jet, I guess. We'll be hearing it in a few seconds. A jet making a circle of light? They don't come in from that direction. Oh, that fast either. David, it's, it, it looks as if it's heading straight for us. Nonsense. Of course it isn't heading straight for us. David! A flying saucer. Oh, come off it, Sarah. An unidentified flying object. We actually saw it. Sarah, it was nothing of a sort. It was simply... Well, it, it was... It, it... Can you identify... Well, no, no, not offhand. An it... unidentified flying object. David, we've made a sighting. Our mystery drama, The Sighting, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Field and Farrington and stars Kim Hunter. UFO sightings 
although they are remarkable, are not uncommon. There have been, who's to say, thousands of them, maybe tens of thousands, if you include those that have gone unreported. Of course, some people poo-poo them as optical illusions or weather balloons or light reflections on clouds or even just plain imagination. But others, many others, take them quite seriously and would like very much to know what and why and possibly even who they are. Sarah and David have certainly seen something, though they don't agree about what it was. You know the trouble with you, honey. You let your imagination run away with you. You see a funny light in the sky and wham, it's a flying saucer. Well, you can't say it wasn't a flying saucer. <laughs> You don't know what it was any more than I but do. But, Sarah, when you can't explain something a little, well, little out of the ordinary, you don't pounce on the most unlikely explanation you can find and close your mind to all the others? Now look who's talking about closed minds. Oh, okay, okay. Maybe I'm a little bit conservative. Bankers get that way, I'm told. And, man, are you ever a banker. Well, don't knock it. It buys a lot of goodies. No contest. Uh, I think I'll go next door and ask B and Harry if they saw it. Want to come along? So What? Oh, oh, yeah, the, the thing. Sarah, I, I really wish you wouldn't do that. Why not, for heaven's sake? Well, I just as soon it didn't get around. I mean, that we saw... Well, the first vice president of a bank doesn't see flying saucers. He just doesn't, Sarah. <laughs> okay. The first vice president didn't see it. He's as blind as a bat. Yeah. But his wife saw it. Sarah. Look. I don't want you to talk about it. How do we know what they are? How do we know what they're doing here? What the purpose is? How can we be sure that they don't mean us some kind of harm, David? I think we ought to report it. No. You're not to say a word about this to anyone. Now, look, honey. Old man Ellsworth is talking about retiring again, and this time J.D. thinks he means it. And if he does go, J.D. will almost certainly move up to chairman of the board, and that leaves the presidency open. I'm the first vice president. But can't you see, Sarah? Look, I, I think that's wonderful, David. You know I do, but I can't see what it has to do well, with... I what... just told you. I'll have to ask you to take my word for it. I want you to promise not to say a word about this, this, this thing we saw, and not to anybody. Anybody home? Oh, hi, Bee. You got any shopping to do this morning? I don't think so, no. Uh, how about a cup of coffee? Okay. They're supposed to have some fresh whiting at Avery's today. Doesn't David have a big thing about whiting? Yes, David has a big thing about whiting, but he's more likely to get cold stew and leftover parsnips. Oh? Garnished with arsenic. Bad one, huh? Honestly, B. You ought to thank your lucky stars you're not married to a banker. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you ever try living with a man who was in wholesale pharmaceuticals? Give him whiting. That's my advice. He can't eat and quarrel at the same time. Uh -huh. Um, did you and David see that thing come over last night? Come over? Fly over, you know. It looked like a flying saucer to me. But Harry said it was a jet with some fancy new kind of lights or something. I never heard a jet sound like that. Oh, uh, no, I, I guess we must have missed it. All right. Doesn't Harry believe in flying saucers? Wouldn't believe in one if it landed smack on top of him. We still playing bridge tonight? As far as I know, it's your house. Want me to bring anything? Money. It's our turn to win. You want me to get some whiting for you, if Avers has it? Oh, would you mind? I'm not much of Sure, old. I'll bring it over later. I'll tell you one thing. I don't ever want to fly in a jet that sounds the way that thing last night sounded. Morning, David. Oh, morning, J.D. Are you busy right now? Nothing top priority, no. Well, come on into my office. I've got some news for you. Sure thing. You, uh, read this thing this morning? Mm hmm? Oh, Times. Mm -hmm. I glanced through it before I left the house. A couple of people out your way claim they saw a flying saucer. Oh, I read that, yes. One of the fellows belongs to my club, as a matter of fact. I wouldn't want to be in his shoes next time he goes into that locker room. You know, I don't understand people... I just can't figure them out. 
Fellow sees something up there he never saw before, and he goes running around like a chicken with its head off, yelling, Flying saucer! <laughs> what do you think he is, some kind of aeronautics expert or something? Sit down, David. Thanks. What would you say if I told you old Ellsworth finally made up his mind? Well, I'd say congratulations, J.D. It's retiring the end of the year. Made up his mind yesterday afternoon, apparently. Plans to announce it sometime later today. Congratulations, J.D. Oh, no, no, no. It's premature, my boy. Premature. Board has to vote on the new chairman. There's no guarantee they'll pick me. I can be pretty crusty sometimes, you know. Made some enemies. <laughs> That's your year's salary. Oh, <laughs> your <laughs> bankers don't gamble now. <laughs> Had to vote on the new president, too, of course. But uh, you've got me in there lobbying for you. Thanks, J.D. Ah, oh, nonsense. Best man for the job. Would be anyway if he didn't sit around loafing all day in the boss's office. Well, I guess I'd better get back to work. <laughs> I guess you had. And, uh, David. Yes, J.D. Try not to see any flying saucers. <laughs> Wouldn't help a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you do that? Do what, Sarah? When you talk, your lips don't move. Or anyway, I, I couldn't see them move. It, it sounded as if you were talking through that little black box strapped on your chest. Yes, you are quite right. You see, we don't have any vocal equipment. We? Who's we? We come from a very long way off. Like Mars? No. Much farther, another galaxy altogether. I told David, I told him. Yes, we sensed that you were sympathetic. Then, then, then what do you use? Mental telepathy? That's what you would call it, yes. And the box? I think into the box, you might say. It comes out English. Other languages, too, of course, depending upon the setting. I'm glad you are not frightened. If I were, I wouldn't let you know. Look, where you come from, do you, do you just walk into strangers' houses? I am very sorry, but I had to speak to you. It's really quite urgent. About what? We need your help. To do what? Take over the earth? You mustn't say that. You mustn't think it. We're on a friendly mission. My colleagues and I, we're what you might call a scouting party. We must know more about your planet before we can be sure that it is safe to... We want to help you. We're, we're doing all right. Are you? Really, Sarah? What, what's your name? You keep using mine. Don't you think I should know yours? I have no... We do not use names in the sense you mean. I have a designation, of course, but there is no way to convey it to you. It's pretty weird. Well, how did you find out what my name is? We were able to pick it up. We get very dim readings from your minds. Actually... Yours is the clearest we've been able to pick up so far. We need someone to, uh, to cooperate with us so that we can learn more. And that's what you want me to do? Yes, Sarah, it is. Uh, well, come back tomorrow. I don't understand. I'll have to talk to my husband about that it. That is exactly what you must not do. Do you understand me? You must not consult your husband. You're not to tell him even that you have spoken with me. I want you to understand that very clearly. He is not to know that we have contacted you. 
then you'd better just go back onto your flying saucer and fly away. I'm not sure I want to speak to you again. You will, though, Sarah. You will. You don't believe me, do you? Of course I believe you, honey. Have I ever accused you of lying to me? All the same, you don't believe me. Uh, what? What did he look like, this man you saw? Well, he wasn't green, if that's what you mean. He didn't have tentacles or flippers or any of that. His, uh, his hair was kind of coppery and funny. More like chicken down than hair. I, I didn't notice the color of his eyes. His face seemed all right, except that his ears were flat against his head. He was tall and too skinny to look healthy. By our standards, that is. Mm-hmm. How was he dressed? Ordinary. Except for a box he had sort of taped onto his chest. Like brown slacks and a kind of yellow shirt open at the throat. But the, the clothes didn't look right on him. You don't believe one word of this, do now, you? Now, Sarah, I haven't said I don't believe you. All I'm saying is that you're, you're tired and overwrought. And... and seeing things. Look, I'm not sure I want to play bridge tonight. Sit there all evening being humored. And... Well, I'm not at all sure I want to do it. Uh, look, uh, I'll tell you what. You trot upstairs and take a little rest. Now, wait, then, uh, just let me finish. You are tired. You are overwrought. You don't deny that, do you? Well... So why shouldn't you take a little rest? Now, what's wrong with that? And when you get up, if you don't feel like playing bridge, we won't play bridge, okay? Doesn't that sound fair enough? Well, all right. Fine. Right now. We'll close the bedroom door and see if you can't actually get a little sleep. Will you do that for me? Okay. But if I should go to sleep, don't let me sleep long, will you? And David. Yes? I did see that man and talk to him. I really did. The whole thing an hallucination? Let's not be too sure it wasn't just because we heard it ourselves. After all... We were primarily interested in what Sarah heard, weren't we? Or thought she heard. Let's not rule out the possibility that we were hallucinating along with her. Perhaps we'll learn the truth about that when I return shortly with Act Two. David and Sarah have spent the evening playing bridge with B and Harry Vincent. But their minds haven't been on the game. Sarah's is more on the events of the day just ending. How often do you speak with a man from outer space? Now the game and the evening have finally come to an end. <laughs> David, my friend, we ought to do this more often. Yeah. You owe us now. You can check my arithmetic if you want to. You owe us three dollars and seventy-six cents. With the cards you two held, how could you lose? <laughs> oh, come on, don't grouse, David. About ten more nights like this, and maybe we could get even. <laughs> oh, it was all my fault. I told you I didn't feel like playing bridge tonight, Dave. Oh, forget it. You were no worse than I was. Well, after all, it's only a game. Yeah, said he, tucking away his winnings. <laughs> I wonder if I drank $3.76 worth of beer. Well, there's more out in the kitchen. Come on out. Maybe you can break even. Now, what are those two cooking up? Oh, I don't know. Is the fight still going on? With you and David, I mean? Left over from last night? Mm. You haven't been acting like yourselves at all tonight. Either of you. Oh, it's one of those things. I guess it happens to everybody. Mm. David! Don't you think we ought to go now? You have to work tomorrow. Okay, honey. He's a good man, you're David. You don't have to worry about that. David? Hmm? What did Harry mean when we were leaving? Who's a good man? Oh, honey. Turn the light off, will you? I'm dead. It's something to do with me, isn't it? Okay. You'll have to know anyway. I, uh, I asked Harry for the name of a good psychiatrist. A psychiatrist? Yes, earlier. I called the doctor before we left, too. 
Told him it was an emergency. I got an appointment for you for tomorrow morning. Well, it is an emergency. You don't realize how... Well, I knew you were going to be angry. Sarah? I'm not angry. If he's any good, maybe he'll be able to convince you I'm not seeing things. Sarah, I've got to get to the office on time this morning, today of all days, but I'll meet you at the doctor's office. Now, your appointment is for 11 o'clock. You won't forget it, will you? Look, you, you don't have to be there if you have a busy day. I can handle no, it alone. No, no, nothing of the sort. And afterward, I mean, after the, uh, the uh, session, we'll have some lunch. Someplace fancy, huh? It'll be all right, Sarah. You'll see. again. Sarah, I must speak to you. Do you know that you may very well be nothing but a figment of my imagination? I think that you are tired. Did you sleep well last night? What do you think? And wouldn't a figment of my imagination at least move his lips a little when he talks? I can see that you are very sleepy. Oh, yes, very sleepy. Well, I, I didn't ask you in. You are almost too sleepy to stand, aren't you? Here. Why don't you sit here? You'll be much more comfortable. Well. Eh, that's better, isn't it? You're able to relax now. Relax and rest. Relax and rest. Float and sleep. You are asleep now, aren't you? Yes. Fast asleep. You will do as I tell you. Yes, I will do as you tell me. Good. Pinch your arm, Sarah. With your right hand, pinch your left arm. No, harder than that. You can feel nothing. You feel no pain. No pain. Very well. I am going to perform a minor surgical operation now. You will feel no pain, of course. A simple incision at the base of the skull. There will be no bleeding. Meh. Now... What I am inserting, Sarah, is a very small device which your body will in no way reject. It is in every way compatible. By means of this device, it is better you know this, Sarah, although you will not be aware of it later. Through this device, we shall be able to read your thoughts and participate in them, guide them. This will be possible at great distances, light years, actually. You are now sutured, what you would call sutured. There is no wound, no scar. You felt no pain, did you, Sarah? No, no pain. And yet your own doctors would find this type of surgery very difficult, if indeed at all possible to perform. Now, do you know what I have just done Yes. Tell me. You've planted a device at the base of my skull so that you can read my thoughts and and guide them. Yes. You must listen carefully to what I tell you now. Do you understand, Sarah? I must listen carefully. You will emerge from your hypnotic state when you hear the sound of my vehicle leaving. Is that clear? Yes, when I hear your spaceship fly away. You will not remember having seen me today at all. Please repeat that for me. I will not remember having seen you at all today. And all you will remember about my visit yesterday is that you made it up as a joke. It did not really happen. I didn't see you yesterday. It was a joke I made up. Very well. 
When I leave the room, you will fall into a deep sleep. When you hear our vehicle moving away, you will awaken, feeling as though you have a long, healing night's rest. Is all that clear? It's all clear. You busy, Dave? Terry! No, come on in. Aren't you a little out of your territory? Uh, well, yeah, I am. I knocked off and came over here because, uh... B called me a few minutes ago to say she's seen the damn thing, too. Seen what? The saucer, the flying saucer. Oh, B saw it? Yeah, says she did. Says it was hovering there right over your backyard with a door open, like practically the whole side of a ship, she said. A kind of stairway coming right down onto your lawn. Oh, come on, not B2. What are they trying to do to us? Well, to tell you the truth, Dave, I don't think B was putting it on. She can't lie worth a nickel. And she sounded scared, really scared. And uh, anyway, that's not oh, all. Oh, for Pete's sake. She'd started out shopping, see, and forgot to take a list with her, so that's why she went back. I mean, that's how she happened to see the thing in the first place. All right, all right, all right. So, she went back in the house and was watching through the window, and I swear, Dave, this is what she said. A tall, skinny man came walking out of your back door and went up the stairway and into the saucer. Then it made that crazy whooshing noise like we heard the other night. I did hear that, Dave. I honestly did. And it didn't really sound much like a jet. Well, anyway, it made that noise and took off. Like a thousand miles a minute, B says. You think it's true? Well, unless B's blown her mind, too. She said she wanted to go right over to your place and see if Sarah was all right, but she was afraid to. Yeah. Yeah, I... I think it might be true, Dave. I think... Anyway, we... ought to go out there and see. <laughs> There's B. She must be waiting at our front door. Oh, I thought you'd never get here, you Is two. Is Sarah all right, B? I haven't seen her. I was... Well, I can't help it. I was scared. You didn't see that awful-looking thing just hanging up there over your backyard. Or the weirdo that came out of your house. Can we go in now? I don't mind as long as I'm with your Yeah, two. yeah, okay. I don't suppose... While I'm still in there, I mean, since the thing took off, it wouldn't go away and leave one of them behind, would it? I'm still not ready to believe it. You'd this. believe it if you'd seen it. Sarah? Yes, David? Oh, I, I thought you were going to meet me at the doctor's office. I, well, what's this, a delegation? Are you all right, Sarah? Why wouldn't I be all right? Sarah, did that, uh, did anything happen this morning? Not a thing. <laughs> Not unless you count me falling asleep, sitting bolt upright in a straight kitchen chair. I, I really must have been dead on my feet. The, uh, uh, the man from the flying saucer didn't show up? <laughs> oh, come on. Don't you think we've had about enough of that nonsense? Nonsense? Sarah, I saw him. I saw him come walking right out your back door, plain as day. And get into his saucer and go. I saw that, Sarah. I really did. Oh, please. Let's not anymore. So, so I made up a silly story. Now, I'm sorry I did. I never dreamed you'd all take me so seriously. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's, there's something wrong here. You were taking it seriously enough last night. Now, don't try to tell me you weren't. It was just a joke, David. A joke? <laughs> I wish you could all see yourselves. You look as if you'd just come in from a funeral or something. Sarah, if it was just a joke, why didn't you say so when I told you about the psychiatrist? Oh, I'm all mixed up. I swear I saw a tall, skinny man with funny hair get into a flying saucer and fly away. If it was just a joke you made up, Sarah, maybe I'm the one who needs a psychiatrist because I saw that. I know I did. All right. Sarah's going to keep her appointment, aren't you, Sarah? I don't see any point, David. You'd just be throwing your money well, away. Well, still, still, if I ask you to, you will, won't you? 
Well, if you, if you want me to, why not? I can't see what good it's going to do, but I guess it can't do any harm. No, Sarah. What? What? I didn't say anything. You are not to see the psychiatrist. Is that clear, Sarah? You will not see the psychiatrist. Who said that? What? Nobody said anything. Didn't... Didn't you hear it? B... B. I didn't hear anything. You will do as you are told. You will refuse to see the psychiatrist. Who are you? Sarah. I can cause you pain, Sarah. I can cause you great pain. I'm... David, what is it? Somebody keeps... Don't you hear that voice? I don't hear anything, Sarah. I do not want to cause you pain, Sarah. But I will if I must. You are not to see the psychiatrist. So come on. We better go, honey. The appointment's for 11 o'clock. All right, I'm coming. I'm sorry, Sarah. Truly, I am. David. Oh, oh, God, David. David, make it stop. Sarah. Make it stop. Ah. <laughs> I hope you didn't feel the pain along with Sarah. It would have convinced you, of course, as I'm sure it has convinced the people in our story, that the man from outer space is real and not altogether friendly. If there is any doubt lingering in your mind, however, I believe it will be dispelled when I return shortly with Act Three. of the open mind to accept the new and seemingly miraculous, at least as an hypothesis, has always faced opposition from the less flexible mind which finds the status quo easier to live with. David, however, as well as B and Harry, has had a convincing demonstration that the new is only the as yet unknown. B and Harry are waiting in Dr. Freuling's reception room. David has taken Sarah into the doctor's office. Now, just lie down here and rest. And help me with her, will you, Mr. Yes, Hughes? Please, please, make it stop. Sarah, honey, do what the doctor says. Now lie down and try to take it easy. And just, just, just do as the doctor says. She seems to be in a great deal of pain, doctor. Oh, she is in pain. There's no doubt whatever about that. What causes the pain, this is what we must learn first of all. Well, can't you, can't you give her something? Uh, I think best not to do that until I have learned what has happened to her. Sarah, refuse to speak with this doctor, this psychiatrist. Tell him only what you have been ordered to say. You have seen no man from a flying saucer. It was only a silly joke. Leave his office. Nobody can force you to stay. And go home. Do only this and there will be no more pain. You are asleep now, Sarah. You are in a deep, restful sleep. You are resting in a quiet, lovely place where there is no pain. No pain, only rest. You will not sleep. You are uncomfortable. There is no severe pain now, but you know there will be if you listen to this man. Now, Sarah, I want you to tell me exactly what happened this morning before David came back from his office. I... I, I can't. Dr. Freuling. Uh-huh. Well, it is not yet. We try again. Oh. Dr. Freuling, you... if it's going to keep on like this, I think we'd better just quit. Stop! Stop it! Stop it! We are on the right track. He was there this morning. She told me that much before he got through to her again. We are going to win, Mr. Hughes. Win or lose, what's going to be left of Sarah? All of her, Mr. Hughes. More than there is of her now. Uh, Sarah, shall we try again? I can't. 
Freiling, you won't let me. You don't know how it hurts. It's no good, Sarah. You know it is no good. Now, try to relax and clear your mind of everything but what I say to you. I'll try. Sarah, what did the man do when he came to see you this morning? He said he, he, he asked me... Oh, no! No, He asked me to help him. Stop it! Stop it, please! Sarah... You are under my control, not his. Pain will never stop until you do as I say. You must do as I tell you. Bear it, Sarah. You can bear it if you try. Help me, and it will all be finished sooner than you think. How did he want you to help him? It will be worth. The pain will be worth. He, 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 he wanted me to... He, he, he wanted me to go and make it stop. He wanted you to what? He, he beat his contact. He, he couldn't... Oh, God. He, 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 he said he couldn't read our, our, our thoughts. I, I was... Oh, oh. No, no, pain can't kill, Sarah. Yeah. What if I decide to kill you? I don't care. I don't care. I don't... Dr. Freiling, that's enough. You were to what, Sarah? What did he want you to do? He, he, he put a thing in my head and he knows what I'm thinking. He can... Uh, no! He, he can hurt me with it. Oh, God! Let's make it. Doctor, is Wait, she... wait, wait. Her pulse is strong. That's good. Good. Is she... She will be all right. He cannot hurt her while she is unconscious. He, he put a thing into her head. Is that what she said? Is yes. that what you heard her say? Yes, yes. Isn't there something you can do? Uh, Miss Jamison, I want an ambulance at once. Emergency entrance, physician's hospital. May get Dr. Carter for me. Tell him physician's hospital at once. <laughs> It was good of you to come, Dr. Carter. Yes, yes. What have we got? A device has been implanted in a young lady's skull, I believe. I cannot be certain. Implanted by whom? How long ago? Only this morning, as I believe it. By whom? No, it's a long story, and the patient is in intermittent pain. All right, all right. We'll have to have x-rays. I have already made x-rays. They are here. All right. Have you read them? Have you found anything? Well, I am a psychiatrist. I think there is something, but I do not wish to prejudice your judgment. Oh, very well. Well, is everything clear here? It's all right. Nothing here. And that... Wait a minute. That little particle. Is that what you mean? How does it look to you? It's like a pinhead. Oh, yes. It's foreign, all right. Must be. But implanted? It's very small. Large enough. I am afraid for my patient's reason... Perhaps her life, I do not know. I have to see her before you operate, Dr. Carter. Oh, she's already been sedated. Believe me, Dr. Carter, it's imperative. Well, if you feel so strongly about it. Sarah? Oh, I said to you, David. Yes. Feel better now? Oh, yes, I feel fine. Just sleepy. He isn't bothering me right now. I, I, I mean, there, there isn't any pain. Do, uh, do you think you could contact him, Sarah? Oh, I expect he's around. <laughs> Why? I want to get a message to him. What message? David, I, I don't want no, you No, 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 I, I just want to talk to him, Sarah. I just want to meet him. Is he... 
listening now? Oh, I can't tell, but I, I imagine he is. Uh, David, you must... I just want him to meet me and talk to me. It's as important to him as it is to me. I'll, I'll go back to the house. There's nothing I can do here anyway. I'll go back to the house and meet him there. I have something important to tell him. Important to him. Well, if he's listening, you could you could just tell him now. No, 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 not now. I'll meet him at our house as soon as I can get there. I'm afraid, David. You sound as though... Just, just give me a kiss, Sarah. I love you. I have taken more trouble than you realize, Mr. Hughes, to meet you here. What is it you wish to tell me? I have a proposition for you. I am willing to listen for a short time, though. The surgery is about to begin. You aren't going to interfere, are you? Hmm. Your wife is a danger to us. I am sure you can understand that. We're reluctant to take a life, of course, but our mission is of greater importance. Listen. Now, just listen. Why does it have to be Sarah? What's the matter with me? What do you mean? I mean, put your gadget, whatever it is, in me. Why couldn't you do that? I, I cooperate, don't you see? You wouldn't have any of this resistance you get from Sarah. Why? Why would you turn against your own people to help us? Aliens, as you call us. Why would you be willing to do that? Willing? I'd be doing it to save Sarah's life. W wouldn't you do as much for your wife? We do not have wives. Oh. Well, my wife is very dear to me. There is... There's nothing, I guess, that I wouldn't do for her. So you see... Be quiet. What? Please, do not speak. I am in communication with my colleagues. Oh. Tell them... Be quiet. Oh, God, please. All right. You'll do it? No. We have decided against using you. Huh? We have learned a great deal from you. This... Love is your word. This is an unfamiliar factor. This love must be taken into consideration. We are not sure that anyone so afflicted would be sufficiently stable for our purposes. And what about Sarah? It is a risk to release her, of course, for we cannot erase her memory, but we have taken greater risks. Then you won't interfere with the operation? Not interfere, no. Not the way you mean. We shall help. Your surgeon will need our help. Oh, thank God. How is she, Doctor? Ah, fine, fine. I have never seen anything like it. Would you ask her yourself? Sarah? Oh, David, it feels... I feel so much better. I feel, I feel perfectly well, as if... as if nothing ever happened. Thank God for that. I have never seen such surgery. A motion picture at fast speed. His hands move so quickly, I would never have believed it. Did you see him? The, the man from the saucer? Yes, honey. He's real. You'll be glad to know that. Oh, I do. <laughs> Believe me, I know. Is she really all right, Dr. Frehley? Quite, yes. She is free now. Yes, I'm free. But I, I don't think they've finished. They're too strong. They're too vulnerable. I'm safe, yes, for the time being at least, but I don't know if the world will ever be really safe again. Maybe it will. They've uh, discovered a new factor. Maybe it's stronger than they are. Well, how strong is love? The new factor on this old earth of ours. Stronger than hatred? I like to think so. 
Hatred makes the headlines, I know, but love, in its unassuming way, has been making the world go round for a good many years now. I'll be back shortly. David is president of his bank now, and doing a very good job of it, too. He and Sarah are even happier, have an even more secure marriage than before their adventure. The near loss of something dear often underscores the dearness of it. Well, whether you come by UFO or some more conventional method of travel, be here to join us for our next chilling story. Our cast included Kim Hunter, Nat Poland, Ralph Bell, Joe Silver, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall, your landlord in this mansion of terror. And often there's no terror quite like those nameless terrors, those undercurrents we can't put our finger on. We know something's not quite right, but we don't know why. It nags at those dark corners of our mind. And such is the story we have for you now. All seems to be sweetness and light. But watch out for those dark corners. Those things left unsaid. Jane and Mike Slater are young city dwellers spending their vacation in a quiet village called Granville. They thought it was the perfect spot to get away from it all. That's what they thought until they got there and tried to get away from it. mystery drama, The Summer People, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Bob Jurek and stars Tony Roberts. Two weeks in another town, a summer place. They all add up to a change of scene, something everyone enjoys. And for Jane and Mike Slater, a summer in the country was not only desired, but almost necessary. Jane is a serious painter, and Mike's a young reporter with a novel burning in his brain. A couple ripe for spending their vacation away from it all and working on their respective art. So it was no wonder that when Mike picked up the paper one evening, he enthused... Hey, Jane, listen to this. Mm, what? I think it's just what we've been looking for. For our vacation, I mean. Private rooms with bath in lovely private home. Quiet village on beautiful river. Complete peace and quiet. All meals, $50 a week per person. $50 a week? What's the date on that paper, 1910? It says 50, unless it's a misprint. Restricted to persons 23 years or younger. Well, at least we qualify there. Interested parties may phone for interview. 814 on the number. Interview? 
Oh, sounds too snobbish. <laughs> it sounds intriguing to me. Well, doesn't the ad say where it is? No, nothing more. It's a perfect place to spend the summer and start the draft on my book. Oh, it's okay with me if you want it. But phoning for an interview, isn't that strange? Well, whoever put the ad in had his reasons. We won't know unless we call. Coming. Uh, Mr. Slater? Yes. You are Mrs. Williams. That's right. Oh, we've been expecting you. Oh, from our chat on the phone, you sounded like the right kind of people. Come in. Thank you. Oh, what a cozy place. Jane, it's Mrs. Williams. Uh, that Dutch clock must be an heirloom. It's my great-grandmother's. Mrs. Williams, hello. Oh, Mrs. Slater? Uh, sit down, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, you may think this a bit unusual that we request an interview. Yeah, frankly, yes. <laughs> well, you see, Mr. Slater, we in Granville are... Well, we do invite the summer people into our homes. There are no hotels, and we want to be careful. I mean, we want to be sure our summer people will fit in. Your ad said only people under 23 years old. I think that's curing one, so you should. But we're a young town, Mrs. Slater. Oh, Granville's been a village for 230 years, but the people are young. We stay young. And we want our summer visitors to be the same way. Uh, how old would you say I was, Mr. Slater? Oh, no, no, no. Don't, don't put me on the spot. Oh, would you want to guess, Mrs. Slater? Well, since you asked, uh, 40? 42? Oh, I'm 79. 79? Oh, you can't be. Well, that's the way it is in Granville. We've found the secret for keeping young. And we want our summer people to enjoy us just as much as we'll enjoy them. It all sounds great to me. We're quite self-supporting, but we do depend on the summer people. That's why we're willing to take the trouble to meet our prospective visitors personally. Um, you're both in good health? Oh, yes. Uh, no recent illnesses or operations? Would you like a blood sample? Oh, come on, Jane. Well, this is ridiculous, oh, Mike. Mrs. Slater, I understand your reaction. Many people feel the same way, but... If you're willing to cooperate with us, just these few questions, you won't regret it. Just where is Granville, Mrs. Williams? Well, I'll give you the directions when we decide on your visit. Uh, what do you do, Mr. Slater? Well, I'm a writer. I'm, I'm a uh, news writer for the Post. Jane goes to art school. She's working on her master's. Oh, you're both artists. Oh, well, thanks for the compliment. <laughs> Uh, the reason I was interested in your ad is uh, I want to spend the summer blocking a book and Jane wants to paint. It sounded like just the place. Oh, I'm sure it will be. I can tell from meeting you both. So attractive, healthy, young. You'll fit in with Granville just perfectly. If we choose to come. Oh, but why wouldn't you? You haven't told us enough about the town or your home. You've been concerned in making sure we'd fit in. Well, maybe we couldn't, from our point of view. Oh, well, you, you do have a point, Mrs. Slater. Uh, but I'm afraid there's not much more to tell. Granville is a pleasant little village on the banks of the Sakoni River upstate. I can offer you my second-floor suite and the friendship and attention of all the residents of Granville. We'll think it over. Uh, I'll call you in a day or two, but I'm pretty certain we'll be there. Uh, very well, Mr. Slater, Mrs. Slater. It's been a pleasure meeting you, and I do hope you'll decide to come to Granville. You're just the kind of people we want. Thank you. Forgive my reservations, Mrs. Williams. We'll let you know. I'll be waiting. Good night. Good night. What's the big deal, Jane? It sounds perfect. I don't know, Mike. There's something strange. The things she didn't or wouldn't say. Yeah, well, that's all the more interesting. I'm dying to see the place. <laughs> and we're okay on her list. Oh, yes. She seemed eager to have us. I'm not against it, Mike. Let's sleep on it. I'll probably feel different in the morning. <laughs> You in there, Martha? 
Come on in there. How's Elizabeth? Oh, she's okay. Uh, Dr. Teal said it was indigestion. Hmm. The way she was carrying on, I thought it was a heart attack. <laughs> uh, how'd you make out with the uh, summer people in the city? The uh, Slaters? <sighs> They're perfect. Two of the best I'll ever have. I hope they decide to come. Oh, they're, uh, not firmed up yet? Uh, the wife was a little leery of my questions. They're mm. going to call me. Well, what about the basketball player? Oh, he's all set. He didn't seem to mind at all all the questions and restrictions. Said he couldn't wait to soak the basketball season out of his bones in peace and quiet. I sure hope the Slaters come. I hate to start looking again. I think they will. I impressed them with the age thing. Mm. What'd they say? Oh, like everyone else, they guessed around 40 and were amazed when I said 79. <laughs> Imagine what the summer people would say if they knew how old we really are. They wouldn't believe it, so um, why tell them? <laughs> can't be much further. We passed the lily pond two miles ago. Oh, she said two miles past the lily pond. Look for wooden sign on right and take road to the left. Well, it's been two miles unless my odometer's wrong. There. There it is up ahead. Oh, yeah. The arrow sign. Granville, four miles. Well, where's the road? Well, it's supposed to be on the left. Well... The sign points left, all right. Granville, four miles, but there's no road. Unless they mean those two ruts through the field over there. This is crazy. But I guess we'll have to see where they go. Okay. But talk about being off the beaten track. <laughs> We're getting just what we bargained for. Well, it looks as though it gets better up ahead. Yeah, yeah, there's at least some paving up there. You know, if it weren't for that sign back on the highway, you could go right past this place and never even know it was here. Well, this looks more like it. There is a town back in here. Welcome to Granville, population 210. <laughs> How can they be so accurate? After meeting Mrs. Williams, I can believe anything. Why, Mike, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's clean, all right. Nice-looking houses, too. It's almost unreal. It's so perfect. Uh, where do we head next? Oh, uh, continue along Thimble Street, that's what we're on, to the greenhouse on Maple Avenue. Well, that can't be too far. Hey, look at that, Jane. A little church. There's something to paint. My first subject. I wonder where the river is. Well, we got plenty of time to find it. Oh, Mike, this really is paradise. We made the right decision coming here. I think so, too. I, I can't wait to... What's the matter? But where do we go from here? I mean, we're at the end of Thimble Street, and so far there's been no Maple Avenue and no greenhouse. We must have passed it. We were talking too much. I've been watching every street. We didn't come to Maple Avenue. Well, we'll have to ask... I'll go in that little store. Uh, ask the fellow coming out. Uh, excuse me, sir. Oh, uh, hello there. Uh, could you tell me how to get to Mrs. Williams? Oh, sure. You're the uh, summer people. She's expecting you. Yeah, the direction said uh, straight on Thimble to Maple Avenue. Oh, you passed Maple one block back. Go back, left on Maple, by the greenhouse. Then about a quarter of a mile, you find Mrs. Williams on the right big yellow house with a green porch. Oh, thanks so much. I can't see how we missed Maple Avenue, though. My name's Ned Broker. Glad to have you with us. I'm uh, Mike Slater. It's my wife, Jane. Mm. See you later. Thanks for the direction. What a pleasant man. It proves Mrs. Williams' point, I guess. Granville stays young. Well, it's nice to know we're not staying with a bunch of old fogies. Hey, they seem to be anything but that. Uh, Mrs. Williams and that guy back there, at least. Oh, there's the greenhouse. Maple Avenue. I don't see how we passed it before. Well, go left like the man said. A quarter of a mile and we'll be at Mrs. Williams. Hello, 
I've been waiting for you. Here we are. Well, I wasn't sure when you'd arrive. You know, we only made one bad turn. Not bad for newcomers. Mr. Broker in the village told us how to get here. Oh. Well, uh, come on in and get settled. Your rooms are all ready, and I've got a pot of hot coffee and homemade apple pie all waiting. Like I said, this is paradise. Your rooms are on the second floor. I'm expecting another guest toward the end of the week. He'll have the third. Your place is just charming, Mrs. Williams. That's exactly what we wanted. Well, I'm sure you'll enjoy it here. The whole town seems so fresh and clean. The people look so well. We're very careful about how we live here. We grow all our own vegetables. Meat's imported. Oh, you love our food. Well, here you are. Two rooms with connecting baths. It's lovely. Now, this is great. Well, you get settled in and then come down to the kitchen. I want to introduce you to some real Granville cooking. You in there, Martha? Come on in, Ned. Ah, you're, uh... Your folks settled in? Hmm, just about. Well, you were right about them. They seem like the right type to me. Mm -hmm. I know how to pick them. When's the next one arriving? At the end of the week. I told the Slaters I'd drop around and see them settled. Oh, stay for pie and coffee, Ned. They'll be down in a couple of minutes. I'll show them around town tomorrow. Are the girls a painter? Uh, That's what they said. Well, she'll be looking for subjects. I'll know what to show her. Yes. And what to keep her away from? Charming people in Granville. Hospitable, friendly, attentive. But I can't help feeling... Oh, no, it's just my overly active imagination. There's nothing wrong, nothing sinister. How could there be with such lovely, youthful, healthy people? And yet... uh, Well, we'll return to Granville... When I return with Act Two. I did say we'd return to Granville, where Jane and Mike Slater have decided to spend some time in late summer. He to start a book, and she to pursue her painting. But, uh, frankly, that town gives me the willies. If you don't mind, I'll just stay here and meet you later. You go on ahead and join Jane and Mike in the kitchen of that friendly Mrs. Williams. You might even get a piece of that apple pie. Another slice, Mr. Slater. Oh, no thanks, Mrs. Williams. It's delicious, but two is my limit. Oh, now, come on. A young fellow like you ought to be able to put away a whole pie. (laughs) He's being polite. I'll, uh... I'll take another one, Martha. Help yourself. I understand you paint, Mrs. Slater. There's plenty of subject matter here in Granville. Well, that's what I was hoping. I'm dying to look around the village. I'd be glad to show you around. Well, I'll be glued to my typewriter most of the time. I'm glad Jane has a painting to keep her busy. Well, you, you want to rest up today. Why don't we start out tomorrow? Fine with me. From what I've seen already, I know we couldn't have found a lovelier place. I've never seen such immaculate farmland. Mm. We grow everything we eat. Uh, Let's walk on down to the riverfront. The view there is something. What's that low brown building over there? A factory? No. No factories in Granville. That's our freezer. We freeze the harvest for the winter months. One of our few concessions to modern gadgets. Oh, you have such an idyllic place here. I'm surprised you want outsiders at all. Oh, living too closed up isn't good either. We like the right kind of summer people visiting us. Gives us perspective. Mrs. Williams is so warm and friendly. You'll find everyone in Granville's that way. So, how is the Grand Tour? Beautiful. 
It's a beautiful spot. Almost too perfect. Everything's laid out just so. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Oh, nothing really. It's just curious. I don't remember seeing any children. Not a single child. Well, maybe they're all grown up. Uh, everyone seems to be proud of how old they are here and how well they look. But a whole village without any children? Yeah, that's unusual, yeah. But what's the difference? Well, none, I guess. To us, anyway. I'm going to start on Mr. Broker's barn. It's so unique. Mrs. Slater, lunch is ready. Thank you. We'll be right down. Oh, I don't really feel like any lunch. Hey, that breakfast she poured into us would last me a week. Oh, the food's fantastic. But we can't hurt her feelings. I know you're going to like it here, Mr. Egan. Oh, I can see that already. Peace and quiet's all I want. Oh, well, you're on the third floor. A nice young couple has the second. Oh, Oh, uh, Mr. Slater, hello. Hello. This is Mr. Egan, and Mr. Slater, our new resident. Hi. Hi. Uh, Mr. Egan's a professional basketball player. Right, recovering from the season. And Mr. Slater's a writer, his wife's a painter. We're sort of on a work vacation. Well, you won't see much of me. I'm just going to sleep and eat. Oh, that's what I like to hear. I'm afraid the Slaters aren't used to my big meals. Yeah, the food's great. There's just, uh, there's just so much of it. Well, it's my duty to keep our summer people well fed. Uh -huh. You won't have any trouble with me, Miss Williams. Well, now, come along. We'll, uh, we'll get you settled. Uh, see you later, Mr. Slater. Oh, hey, I didn't mean that the way it sounds. <laughs> Call me Mike. Okay, I'm Tim. See you later. The, uh, basketball player all settled in? Uh, yes. Eh. Guess I'd better get out to the main road and take the sign down. We won't be expecting any more for a while. Not for a while. Well, how's the painting coming along, Jane? Oh, I don't know, Tim. I started out with a bang, but lately I haven't been able to concentrate. Can I look? Sure. Oh, that's two weeks of work. Mm-hmm. Looks good to me. Oh, it's all there. The barn and the sky and the field. But it's just there. There's no spark. I don't know. I've been so lazy lately. I, I can't get up steam. <laughs> I'm the same way. And enjoying every minute. <laughs> it must be Mrs. Williams cooking. And this country air. Oh, hi there. I didn't know you were back. You finished for the day? Yeah, I can't work up any enthusiasm. Yeah, you know, that's my problem. Talk about writer's block. I've been staring at that typewriter for a week. I'm beginning to wonder if we came to the right place after all. We wanted peace and quiet to work, but between the food and the climate, we're growing fat and lazy. Oh, uh, well, it suits me fine, but I'm going to have to take off ten pounds before the new season starts. How did you happen to find this place, Tim? Oh, uh, just an ad in the paper. Yeah, same as we did. Did uh, Mrs. Williams give you a personal interview? Sort of. She came to my apartment, took one look at me, and gave me directions to Granville. Didn't you think it was funny they made such a fuss about meeting us? Well, yeah, I did, but she was so nice, and this Granville sounded so great, I didn't care. I just wanted to get away. You know, I didn't even tell my fiancé where I was going. Oh. Have you looked around the town, Tim? No, I've done what I said I'd do. Just sit, eat, and sleep. Hey, Jane, there's no need to bring that up. What's that? Well, Jane thinks that uh, there's something unusual here. Tim, um, there's not a single pet in town. Everyone in Granville is a youthful senior citizen. Oh, well, there's nothing odd about that. I was in Florida one time, and there were these old this people. This isn't an old people's retirement community. It's a plastic village. Everyone's very charming and gracious, like mannequins. Hmm. Well, I still don't see anything wrong in that. It just bothers me. Why are they so anxious to have us come for the summer? They say they need their summer folk. For what? Well, the money. I mean, they don't have any industry here. They just, uh, they just need cash for some things. The money? Fifty dollars a week for the two of us? What are you paying, Tim? Twenty-five. It's not the money. But this lethargy. We all have it. I think they're draining our strength in some way. Oh, come on. Don't make such a big deal out of nothing. <laughs> I'll see you two at supper, okay? 
Uh, how about some homemade ice cream? It's already in the kitchen. Oh, thanks, no. Uh, no, no thanks, Mrs. Williams. Yeah, I was just going to take a snooze. Maybe later, Miss oh. Williams. Well, whatever you wish. Is there when you want it? She was listening. She heard what we said. Oh, I doubt it, Jane. Look, if she thought we suspected her of something, she would have said so. Not necessarily. Not if there was a good reason for us not to know. What's up, Martha? I don't think the Slaters will be staying the whole summer. Mrs. Slater's particularly nervous. Hmm. What you going to do? I've advertised the rooms, Mr. Egan's too. Oh, he was due to leave the end of the month anyway. Well, okay, if, uh, if you're sure you can get replacements. Three summer people aren't enough. I know, but I won't have trouble filling the rooms. Hello there. Hi, Mr. Egan. Out for stroll? Well, I just like to watch other people work. Getting ready for the barbecue tomorrow? Yep. Real great time, our July barbecue. It's a lot of work, but we think it's worth it. Well, I'm glad I'm going to be around for it. Say, Mr. Egan, I wonder if you could help me later on? Sure. A couple of chores that could use your muscle power. Oh, any time. Tell me where and when. Well, I'll come by for you at Mrs. Williams'. This evening. Well, don't make it too late, though. I've been hitting the sack earlier and earlier. I never slept so good in my life. Oh, we'll all be bedding down early tonight. With the barbecue and dance, nobody will be going to bed tomorrow night. More corn, Mrs. Slater? Oh, yes, maybe just one more. Another round of steaks are on the grill, too. What a shame Tim had to miss this. Yes, too bad. I'm so surprised he didn't say anything to us before he left. Well, when Mr. Egan got the phone call last night, he said it was an emergency at home. He just grabbed his things and ran. He seemed very upset. That's so curious because he... Uh, I thought... What, Jane? Martha, want to give me a hand with these? Oh, I'll be right there. Uh, help yourself to salad, Mr. Slater. What were you going to say? I'm wondering who could have called him. I remember him saying he didn't even tell his fiance where he was going. May, uh, may I have the honor of a dance, uh, Mrs. Slater? Oh, I thank you, no. No, please, I couldn't. Go on, Jane. I'm too full. Maybe later. Well, Martha, it looks like us, uh, old folks. Have to show the youngsters how to have fun, huh? <laughs> My arm, Mrs. Williams. Delighted, Mr. Broker. Excuse us. Just one dance and I'll be back for you, Mrs. Slater. Hey, Jane, we might as well pack up and go back to town tomorrow if you're going to act like this. I'm sorry, Mike. I... There's no reason for these suspicions. But do you want to leave? No, no. You have your work to do. Well, I'm not getting anything done. I mean, maybe we'd better pack it in. No. I won't say anything more about it, Mike. I'll get back to my painting tomorrow and try to enjoy the rest of the summer. You ought to be back writing instead of watching me paint. I don't see why you're unhappy with this painting, Jane. You know, it's Mr. Broker's barn to a T. I have a new idea for it. This morning I hit on what's wrong. What? Well, all you see is the outside. You don't feel a whole barn in the picture. It's because I've never bothered to look inside. What do you mean? Come on. Mr. Broker won't mind. Even though I'm not going to show the interior, if I know in my mind what it looks like, I'll give the whole painting more character. That makes sense. <laughs> it's the first barn I've ever seen with no dust on the windows. Door's not locked. Not surprising. Mrs. Williams never locks her house. I don't think any of them do. Yeah, well, let's go get that mood you're after. It's as clean as a you-know-what. Yes. What's the matter? It's too clean. Whoever saw a barn without any hay or harnesses or just plain junk? Oh, well, there's a loft. Maybe there's some junk up here. Oh, hey, be careful climbing that ladder. It's steady. 
You see anything? <laughs> Sorry. No plain junk, but... Hey, wait a minute. What is it? I'll be darned. For heaven's sake. Look at this. It's the sign. It's the sign we saw out on the main road. Oh, maybe it's one like it, an old one. No, no, no. It's the same sign. It's the one that pointed to the two ruts through the field. Well, why would Mr. Broker have it in here? Hey, without this sign out there, you could go right past that field. Go right past Granville and never know it was here. Is that what they want? <laughs> maybe your suspicions weren't so wrong, Jane. Oh, Mike. What does it mean? I want to ask some questions. Look, don't let on we found this, huh? Come on, let's get out of here fast before Broker gets back. Let's leave this town right away. Yeah, I only hope we can. Tim Egan did. Oh, did he? You were suspicious about that sudden departure. Now I'm beginning to wonder. He departed, but I'd like to know where. <laughs> things in Granville. Uh, you'll forgive me for not going along with you, but maybe now you know why. I much prefer to stay here and let you tell me what's going on there. I'm dying to know what happens next to our friends Mike and Jane Slater. You'll be able to fill me in after you return to Granville shortly in Act Three. feel you want to return to the odd little village? Well, if you insist. And don't say I didn't warn you. Mike and Jane Slater have finally awakened to the fact that Granville isn't all it's cracked up to be. Jane felt it first. And now Mike, having found that Granville can shut itself off from the world with them in it, decides Jane wasn't so wrong after all. The thing that makes me curious and perhaps you too, is why. Why do these sweet townsfolk of Granville appear to be increasingly sinister? I hope you'll be able to tell me when you get back. That is, if you get back. What kind of danger are we in? I don't know. It's so damn maddening, I don't know. Do you think it's even safe to go back into the house? Oh, well, we've got to get our things from the car. Well, tell Mrs. Williams that we've got to leave sooner than we thought. Won't she be suspicious after Tim Egan's disappearance? Hey, I'd like to find out if that guy really went home. Oh, forget about him. Let's get ourselves home. Now, there's Ned Broker just leaving Mrs. Williams. He probably knows we've been to his barn. Don't let on about anything. Well, good morning, you two. Rested up from last night? Oh, yes. Yeah, still stuffed, though. <laughs> Been putting the finishing touches on that painting, Mrs. Slater? Yes, it's finished, as a matter of fact, and uh, it's a present for you. Oh, now, Mrs. Slater. Oh, please, take it. Well, thank you. That's real special. Uh, put it over my mantle. Uh, sorry to run off. Got the chores at home. Uh, that's okay. See you around. Bye now. I don't know why I did that. Oh. You didn't like it anyway. Listen, the phone. Maybe we can sneak up the stairs while she's on the phone. Hello? Who? Oh, oh, Slater. Oh, yes. It's for us. Shh. No, no, they never arrived. I was expecting them the 1st of July. That's right. They were taking the second floor for the summer. I called their apartment in the city twice and didn't get an answer. I... I assumed they changed their plans. My... I wish they'd let me know. I could have gotten other tenants. And you haven't heard from them since they left the city? Oh, dear. Well, I wish there was something I could tell you. Yes. Yes, perhaps you'd better. All right, goodbye. Mike! Shh. She's gone into the kitchen. Mike, this is unbelievable. Mark, we are in danger. I don't know what or why. We have to get out of here. Don't let on we heard that conversation. Don't do anything to make them think we're suspicious. We've got to give ourselves time to... Time to make an escape. 
Why would she say we weren't here? That we'd never arrived? So they can do whatever they intend to do with us. That, that, that call had to be from Stu Hendry. He's the only one I told where we'd be. He must be frantic. Well, I've got to call him. How can you? There's got to be a public phone in the village. Uh, Mr. Slater, Mr. Slater, lunch is ready. I couldn't eat a thing. Try when I slip into town and call Stu. <laughs> Mrs. Williams, could I use your phone? Well, of course. <laughs> I couldn't find a public phone in town. Oh, so that's where you were when I had lunch ready. You didn't have to go all that way. All you had to do was ask. My phone's right here in the parlor. I only want to call my publisher about my book. I'll reverse the charges. All right, just help yourself. I'm going to a friend's for the afternoon. It's our backgammon day. And uh, help yourself to the refrigerator. Mrs. Slater hardly touched a thing for lunch. Henry here. Stu. It's Mike. Mike, where the hell are you? In Granville. Listen. What? Why, I just phoned there, and some dame told me you never arrived. I know. Listen, Stu, we're in danger here. Danger? What? I don't know what it is, but Stu, listen. This is important. Jane and I are leaving here in a couple of minutes. We'll call you as soon as we're out. If you don't hear from us in one hour, I want you to get all the police you can and get up here to Granville. Well, how do I find the place? Take Route 47 north to Minerville, then Route 11 west two miles, and look for... Oh, no, 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 no. The sign won't be there. Look. Ah, you look for two ruts across a... F Stu. Do you hear me? Stu. Stu. Damn, they know. Jane. Jane. What is it? Is everything packed? Yes, I just finished. Oh, we're leaving now. Mrs. Williams went to a friend's. Hurry. What did Stu say? We were cut off, and it wasn't any accident. Grab those cases. I'll take the trunk and the typewriter. Oh, we're so glad to get out of here. I'll kiss those hot city sidewalks. But this is our only chance. Someone was listening in on my talk with Stu. I just hope we can make it in time. I'll get the door. Wait. Anybody out there? Not a soul. Okay. Let's go. Do you think they're watching us? I don't know. Just keep walking and we'll, we'll load the car. There's nothing they can do to stop us here. They don't seem to have any guns. None that you know of. All right, uh, help me with the trunk. That's it. Now the case. Okay. Get in. Still not a soul on the street. So much the better. Where are you going? You should have turned right. No, no, we've got to get back to Thimble Street. We came in through Thimble to Maple. It's it's left on Thimble. Oh, I guess that's right. You know, the greenhouse, remember? Yes, there it is. Only, what's that sign say? Well, that was Broad Street. Well, there wasn't any Broad Street when we came in. Well, it's probably the next one. Uh, keep going. I can't. We're coming to a dead end. We'll have to go back. Try turning right on Broad Street. Oh, gee, this is getting crazy. We turned left coming in. Turn right here. Okay. Well, this looks right. This takes us right out onto the main road. Oh, thank God. Mike, we should have turned left back there. No, no, no. We're still on the main road out of the village. No, we're not. Look, look up there. It's another dead end. Can't be. We've got to go back and take the road to the left. Oh, this doesn't add up, Jane. Look, we've been driving for a half hour trying to get out of this town. Every road's either a dead end or it takes us right back into the middle of the village. But we came in on the main road. Where is it? Why can't we find it? They don't want us to find it, Jane. We're trapped. We're trapped in this town, and I don't know why. I don't know why, but they don't want us to get out. <laughs> We're back at Mrs. Williams. Oh, all roads lead to Mrs. Williams. I don't know what to do anymore. Driving around is useless. I'm going to confront that woman. I'm going to find out what's going on. Then we'll never get out of here. <laughs> Again, I have to say, I don't know. Come on. We're going to wait for Mrs. Williams to get back from her backgammon. Uh, 
Mr. Sater, uh, uh, Mrs. Sater, something wrong? Uh, very, Mrs. Williams, very wrong. I, I don't understand. I saw all your things in your car as I came in. We're leaving, Mrs. Williams. That is, we're trying to leave. But why? Well, you, you ought to know. You listened in on my phone conversation. You know now that we're on to you, all, all you lovely people in Granville. On to us? Oh, come on, Mrs. Williams. We're prisoners here. We know it. You know it. Why? That's what I want to know. Why? Uh, Mr. Slater, if you want to leave, I think you'd better. I've never had guests act as strangely as you. All right. What happened to Tim Egan? And why was the road marker hidden in Broker's Barn? And why? Why can't we find our way out? Every street's changed since we came in. For a half an hour, we drove in circles trying to find the road we came in on. Mr. Slater, if you want to leave Granville, I'll have Ned show you the right way. It's no secret. Uh, Ned will be over in two minutes. Have your coffee. You've nothing to worry about, Mr. Slater. Mrs. Williams, I guess we've seemed awfully strange... But things have happened here that we don't understand. Oh, I know. Mr. Slater enumerated them. I have some more coffee. All right. I guess I'm feeling better. Uh, Mrs. Williams, you know, we, we enjoyed your hospitality. Maybe we're making a big deal out of nothing. Of course you are. I can't see a thing we've done to make you think we want to harm you. Well, I was, was trying was trying to get out of town and the road marker like uh, you you were trying to hide us oh, we uh, well maybe our imaginations got the best of us yeah maybe we, we, maybe we ought to stay the rest of the summer Jane we've we've chased away the boogeyman no I'm afraid it's time for you to leave I'm sorry too I don't think you've got enough of my good home cooking. Martha, you in there? Come on in there. I think they're uh, about ready. Mm -hmm. They each had two cups. I do hope you got some replacements coming. A new couple tomorrow, two more on the weekend. Good. Uh, Mr. Slater? Uh huh. Mrs. Slater? Mm -hmm. When do we go home? Uh. I'd uh, better get them over to the freezer. Oh, dear, I wish I'd had more time to fatten them up a bit. Oh, you did fine, Martha. Same as always. Oh, I hope so. It's my job. Well, I'll get them packed down. and Then I'd better get that sign out again. Don't want to miss the folks tomorrow. <laughs> Hello. Uh, hello, uh, Mrs. Williams. We are the Reynolds. Oh, well, of course. I've been expecting you all morning. You didn't have any trouble finding the place? Oh, no. Oh, well, come on in. Rooms are all ready. You're on the second floor. Lovely couple just moved out. Well, I know now why you're so particular about your guests. This home is so beautiful. Well, yes, we have to be. Oh, my, the, the whole town is just a picture. I just know we're going to enjoy it here. And we're going to enjoy you. We stopped at that little store in town to ask directions, and everyone seems so happy and healthy. It's so, so youthful. Like you. We just can't believe you're 79. Oh, well, we keep young in Granville. The secret's in our diet. We're very particular about what we eat. It's all in the diet. Oh, your health food fattest. Well, we do raise everything we eat. I I hope you brought good appetites with you. It's my job to fatten up my summer people. <laughs> I warned you not to go back there, but you went anyway. You can spare me the details. I know what went on there in Granville. Suffice it to say, a trip to Granville is a one-way trip. But I'm glad you got back safely. Relax and order anything on the menu. I'll be back shortly. Hi, 
I do hope you won't make the mistake of ever returning to Granville again. You're lucky to have gotten out with your skin. I can tell you one thing. You wouldn't catch me dead in the place. But you will find me in this same place tomorrow with another menu of suspense, mystery, and horror. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Jennifer Harmon, Grace Matthews, Leon Janney, and William Redfield. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. to have you with us again here in this vault of vampires, this haven of horrors, this mansion of mystery. For within these halls today, we're going to share an experience of chilling proportions, that of babysitting. Now, I don't really mean babysitting since our young charge is 12 years old, hardly a baby, but you know what I mean. Taking care of a 12-year-old can be more trying than taking care of an infant particularly such a child as this. Our mystery drama, You're Going to Like Rodney, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars Tony Roberts and Patricia Elliott. It's sometimes difficult for childless couples to put up with the activity of youth. They lead a life where everything is orderly and comfortable. The intrusion of a child, even for a visit, can upset the harmony of their settled lives. So it was with a certain amount of concern and yet a feeling of compassion that June and Ed Carpenter in San Diego, California, read the letter that arrived from Edgar's brother, George, a New York attorney. Uh, Helen and I are asking a favor. Uh, for the past two weeks, we've been caring for a young boy of 12. A tragic case. His parents were killed in an automobile crash last month. He's been living with his grandmother, a neighbor of ours, and only two weeks ago, she died from a fall. We're taking care of him until I can settle things. He seems to have no one else. Oh, what a trial for the child. It certainly is. Uh, we're asking if you and June could possibly take care of him for us the second week in July. Uh, we're committed to attending the International Bar Association Convention in Switzerland and can't take him with us. I realize you've not had much experience with children, but being my blood brother does create a bond of sympathy. <laughs> Rodney is a special child, and I think you and June could give him the care he needs while we're away. It's only for a week. I wonder what he means by special. Hmm. Bright, probably. He finishes, uh, it will be a great personal favor to Helen and me, and I know the best for Rodney. Let's hear from you. Affectionately, George. Well, what do you think? Well, there's no one around you for Rodney to play with. He'll be terribly bored. Well, July's our slowest month at the office. I mean, I could take more time off. I could take him to some Padres games, uh, the zoo, the beach. I really feel we should help. Of course. We can keep him amused. I don't think it'll be too bad. Agreed? Yes. 
And Mrs. Nathanson will probably come in to sit when we go to the club. She's always talking about her grandchildren. Well, then I'll tell George we'll take Rodney. We may even get to like him. Oh, you're going to like Rodney, Ed. You can't imagine how much Helen and I appreciate it. Well, we're glad to do it, George. Uh... Listen, you said Rodney was a special child. What's he like? What does he like to do? Well, he's sort of the quiet type, you know. Hasn't been much trouble for us. We'll keep him indefinitely until I can settle things with the estate. Uh, there don't seem to be any other relatives. It's strange. You said his parents died in a car accident. Yeah, and I've tried to locate other family members, but there just don't seem to be any. His grandmother was apparently the only one. Who took him to her when the parents died? I can't learn that either. I was in touch with some of the neighbors in New Hampshire where his parents lived, but apparently they'd moved in only a few weeks before the accident, and no one knew anything about them. Well, the poor kid has had a time of it. We'll take good care of him here. We'll put Rodney on a plane to San Diego, and you can meet him at the airport, okay? Okay. We'll be ready. Thanks a million, Ed. I know you're going to like Rodney. Oh, I wish we'd left earlier. The plane's in already. Oh, so the kid will wait. It may upset him not to find us there. Look, look we're in time. Uh, they haven't opened the gate yet. I'm glad George sent a picture of him. At least we know who to look for. <laughs> well, there probably aren't many 12-year-olds traveling alone on this flight. We'll spot them. Oh, here they come now. Hey, there he is. Rodney? Rodney? <laughs> here we are. Oh, he sees us. <laughs> Over here. He, he's a lot smaller than I expected. He looks awfully frail. Hi, Rodney. I'm uh, Uncle Edgar, and this is Aunt June. How was the flight? Fun? Would you like a cold drink or, or something before we start home? Well, at least he shook his head no. He's probably terrified from the long trip alone, and we're total strangers to him. Well, when he sees his room and the swimming pool, he'll brighten up, won't you, Rodney? Well, shall we go home? He's uh, still in his room? Yes. I'm really uneasy, Ed. He, he just won't say a word. While I was unpacking his things, I chatted and asked him questions, but he doesn't speak. And there was one suitcase he, he wouldn't let me touch. Well, I, I wouldn't worry yet. I, he's only been here a few hours. George said he's the quiet type. Give him a chance to get used to us. Quiet is right. <laughs> Completely quiet. Listen, there can't be anything serious. I mean, George would have told us if he had a problem. He's certainly not autistic. No, he responds all right. He nodded yes and no. He shrugged. <laughs> he just won't speak. I, I think I hear him in the kitchen. I'll get him out here and into the pool. Hey, Rodney. Come on out. Oh, you've got your suit on already. W would you like to swim? <laughs> Last one in is a rotten egg. <laughs> <laughs> come, on, come on in. Go on in, Rodney. You you can swim, can't you? Yeah, had a boy. Come on. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> Get up on my shoulders now. I'll toss you. Oh. That's it. <clears throat> You're a strong little devil, aren't you? Here we go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ed, Ed, are you all right? <laughs> Ed, Ed, what's the matter? Get off! Ed! Get off! Ed! Help! Help! I, I'm throwing you the life ring, darling. You have to catch it! Hold on! Hold on! Rodney, help me pull him in. Hold on, Ed. You're, all, you're almost to the side. There. Here, darling. Here, gr grab my arm. I'm okay. I'm okay. I gotta get my breath. Stretch, stretch out, darling. Face down. What was it? Uh, a uh, cramp? Lord, that kid is strong. I couldn't get out from under him. What do you mean? Oh, I know it wasn't your fault, Rodney. I, 
I put you up on my shoulders. But, Edgar, he slipped off your shoulders. No, he didn't. He was pressing down on me. Well, there was so much splashing. I, I couldn't tell what was going on, except that you looked like you were drowning. I, I think I almost did. But he's not that heavy. Almost scrawny, and you're 200 pounds. I, cu I couldn't get up. Edgar, he's gone into the house. He, he probably feels guilty. I, I tried to tell him it was my idea. Hello? A anything the matter? Oh, uh, Mrs. Nathanson. Oh, please, come in. Oh. Well, I was in my garden. I heard a commotion. Nothing serious, I hope. Well, yes, almost. Here, darling, sit down. Oh. Yeah, I was playing with Rodney and nearly drowned in the pool. Oh, dear me, how awful. Well, I'm glad to see you didn't. Oh, oh, by the way, who, who is uh, Rodney? He's a, a youngster my brother in New York took in. He, he's 12. We're looking after him for the week. Ed's brother and his wife are in Switzerland for a lawyer's conference. Oh, yes. I, I was in Switzerland in 1903 with Mr. Nathanson. Mm. How did you almost drown, Mr. Carpenter? I don't know. I was playing with the boy and, uh, and I couldn't get my breath. I couldn't get to the surface. Oh, that's curious. Your pool isn't that deep. And Rodney's not that big. Well, all's well that ends well. I'll get... Back to my roses. Oh, um, Mrs. Nathanson, mm -hmm. since you're here, I, I wonder, could we call on you to sit with Rodney well, one or two nights a week when we go to the club? Oh, but of course. I'd be delighted. You know, my grandson, Arthur, he's a 14-year-old. He called me the other day, all on his own, and it was Would just... you like some iced tea, Mrs. Nathanson? Oh, no, dear, thanks. I must get back. I'm glad it was nothing serious. Just call any time. I'll be glad to sit with Rodney. Thanks so much. Well, I'd better go in and see him. Yeah, yeah he probably feels that it was his fault. No, I'll talk to him. We've got to make him understand. He's not to blame. I uh, brought you some lemonade, Rodney. I know you feel strange here, and... That's understandable. You've never met us before, but please, we're your friends. Rodney, let me ask you, can you talk and just don't want to, or are we trying to make you talk when you can't? You, you can shake your head, yes or no. Oh, you don't want to answer. All right, Rodney. I'll tell you what. While you're with us, you can do just as you want. We won't press you. And if you feel like talking, we'll be happy to talk with you. Uh, I'm going down and start supper now. We're having steak. Outside. I'll call you when we're ready. Rodney? What is it? Oh, you want to write something. Oh, good. Wait. Um, let's see. There should be paper right here. Mm, yes, here, Rodney. A pad and a pencil. Oh, I'm so glad you want to say something. D take your time. If you want to communicate to us through notes, it's perfectly all right. Let's see. <gasps> Rodney, wh oh, what a horrible thing. To write. Your cat is going to die. Why should he write such a cruel thing? I, I thought he was going to say thank you or, or something. I, I, I was trying to be kind. Your cat is going to die. Strange, all right. Do you think he means he, he's going to try and kill her? Oh, come on. Uh, where are you going? Going back upstairs and find out what's with this kid. Ed, please, don't upset him anymore. Oh, he's getting me upset with that stony stare of his, mocking us with his silence. Look here, Ronnie. What does this mean? Ed. Why? I want to know right now why you wrote this. I mean, there's the pad. And write your answer if you won't talk. Ed, wait. He's crying. 
Well, he's going to have more to cry about if we don't get an answer from him. Rodney, what is it? You're so unhappy. You're sorry you wrote the note, is that it? Look, he's nodding his head. Okay, okay. Take it easy, Rodney. I'm sorry I lost my temper. Rodney, get into bed, put on your pajamas, and just rest. I'll bring you a light supper later. <laughs> it's been a trying day for you. We won't bother you any more today. We'll leave you now. Okay? Okay. Brother George sent us a handful. I think you should get in touch with him right away and find out if this is Rodney's usual behavior. I don't see how they could have put up with this for even a few months. No, neither do I. Uh, do you want to call him? No, let's wait. I, I can't see getting George upset on our first day. Let's give it a chance. After all, we ought to be able to deal with a 12-year-old boy. Well, maybe we were wise to wait. He's been a little better the past two days. Ah, yeah, he's getting used to us. If only he'd talk. He hasn't even written anything since that, well, that first note. Maybe he hasn't anything to say. We do the talking, and all he has to say is yes or no. Ed, have you ever looked deeply into his eyes? No. No, not really. I have. Several times. I felt as though I were staring into a deep well, an abyss, into nothingness. Oh, come on. Mr. Carpenter. Mrs. Carpenter. Oh, what's the matter, Mrs. Nathanson? You're all flushed. Here, here, sit down. Oh, no, that's all right. I, I don't know how to tell you. I'll just have to say it. Under my porch this morning, I found your cat, Sylvester. <laughs> Dead. It seems that Rodney's prophecy came true. He told the carpenters a cat would die. But was it a prophecy, I wonder? Or did Rodney have something to do with it? He's such a strange youngster. Would he go so far as to kill an innocent little cat that belonged to people he hardly knew? I hope a similar fate doesn't await the other people in our story. We'll find out when I return shortly with Act Two. Overnight company can indeed be troublesome now and then, particularly when the company is a strange child who writes threatening notes. But then, who could be afraid of a 12-year-old child? But remember, Rodney is somewhat of a special child, an orphan whose parents were killed in an auto accident. I think we ought to have some compassion for the boy. But at the moment, the carpenters and Mrs. Nathanson are lamenting the death of the carpenter's cat. There he is. I'm so sorry. Are, are there any marks on him, Ed? You don't seem to be. No. None at all. Well, he might have eaten something. He never leaves the yard. He couldn't have gotten any poisoned food. He must have died last night. I'm going to take him to the vet for an autopsy. I'm serious. I'll get a carton. I have one round back. Do you think, Rodney... Killed Sylvester. Hmm. Don't you? Uh, I don't want to think that. I'm taking Sylvester to the vet, and then I'm going to talk to that kid. I'll come with you. I don't know what to say to him now. You heard the vet. No apparent cause of death. How could Rodney be responsible for that? Ed, we've got to stop blaming him and being suspicious of him. He needs some kindness. Maybe you're right. Well, look. What's that on the coffee table? A paper. It's his handwriting. Look at this. <gasps> I told you so. That evil little devil. Rodney! Rodney! 
Come down here, right now. What are we going to say to him? Plenty. <laughs> He's going to be around here for the rest of the week. He's not going to get smart with us. This has got to stop. Rodney, come over here. Right here. Rodney, I don't know what you meant by this note. You didn't kill Sylvester. And writing a note like this is cruel. Don't let me see another note like this in this house again. You understand? Oh, he's going to write something. Oh, good. Let's see what you have to say for yourself. He's not saying much. Two words. Well, at least we're getting something out of him. Well, what did he write? What did I just get through telling you? Ed, what are you doing? You hit him. I'll teach this. Oh, what did he write? Here. You're next. You go to your room. Right now. No 12-year-old is going to intimidate me. Go on up, Rodney. He's a brat we're stuck with for the week, and he's not going to scare me with those threats. Ed, please, calm down. The, the child's just being belligerent. You're going to antagonize him even more. You're not afraid of him, are you? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> He won't open his door. We'll have to go without him, if you still want to go. Well, we'll go to the beach instead of the zoo. I got a yen for some surf fishing. If he doesn't want a good time, the heck with him. He'll be safe here alone. We'll be back in a couple of hours. Maybe I'd better stay. I don't care that much for the beach anyway, and, well, frankly, you deserve the relaxation. He'll be all right. Besides, I thought you were afraid of him. Not afraid. No. I think... I feel sorry for him. He seems a terribly disturbed boy. Okay. Okay, I'll go alone if you don't mind. No, I'll pack you lunch. Maybe alone I can get closer to Rodney. Hello? May I come over? Oh, please do, Mrs. Nathanson. Oh, well... I saw Mr. Carpenter drive off with his fishing gear. Uh, tell me, what did you learn about poor Sylvester's death? The vet couldn't say. Just no apparent cause. Oh, well, that's strange, isn't it? Oh, but it does happen, I guess. Oh, by the way, how is the young man who's staying with you? I haven't seen him at all. He's all right. He, he stays in his room a lot. Oh, Oh, it doesn't sound natural for a 12-year-old boy. Is something the matter with him? Well, we don't know. He never speaks. He, and he writes the most ghastly notes. There seems to be something disturbing the child. Oh, well, what kind of notes does he write? Well, the first said our cat would die. Oh. And then he left one saying, I told you so. Oh. Dear me. And then, right in front of us, he wrote, You're next. Oh. Well, maybe it's his way of attracting attention. We, we don't know anything about him. Uh, could he have killed Sylvester? Somehow? Oh, that doesn't seem likely. Uh, what does Mr. Carpenter think? Well, he thinks Rodney's just a brat. He doesn't take his notes seriously. Oh, well, the child's certainly not going to kill anyone. He's just going through a stage. Oh, oh, excuse me. There's the phone. Oh. Stay here. I I'll be back in a minute. Yes. Uh, hello? June? I never made the beach. I'm at the hospital. W what? W what are you talking about? What's the matter? Lost control of the car going over to Coronado. <gasps> it, it just wouldn't steer. It went into the water. Ed! For heaven's sake. I wanted you to know before you heard it from someone else. The car's in eight feet of water. I'll, I'll be right there, darling. No, no, no. You stay where you are. Uh, the cops are going to bring me home. I'm okay. I, I got out in time. Well, hurry, then. Uh, hurry. I will. Mrs. Carpenter, what is it? You're, you're shaking. That was Ed. Oh. He lost control of the car. It went into the water... 
At Coronado. Dear me. Is he all right? Yes. The, the police are bringing him home. Oh, thank heaven. I, I don't understand it. Ed had a complete annual overhaul on the station wagon last month. Well, that, that, they would have found anything wrong with the steering. Oh, you'd think so. Please, stay with me, Mrs. Nathanson. I, I, I'm so upset. I don't oh, want to be alone. Of course I will, of course. Can I get you something? Oh, yes. Th there's some aspirin in the cupboard over the sink. Uh, I could use it. Oh, all right. I'll get it. Now, you sit right there. Ah, oh, this is curious. Huh. Oh, here's your aspirin. I, I found this on the kitchen table. Oh, no. It says... Missed. Uh, just the one word, missed. It's his writing. Rodney's. What does he mean, uh, missed? On top of Ed's accident. Oh, he's a fiend. Oh, but the child couldn't possibly have had anything to do with the car. I am beginning to wonder. Uh, Mrs. Carpenter, I, I think you're letting yourself get I don't get want old. Ed to see that paper. Oh, do you still have the other note? Yes. I wonder... My sister is quite good at handwriting analysis. Now, she's helped the police department several times. Perhaps if she looked at Rodney's writing, she could tell us something about his character. It's quite revealing. That is a good idea. W would she? And how is Mr. Carpenter? That accident yesterday shook him terribly. He's staying in bed today. Ah. Uh. We have to go to the club dance tonight. He's the president. We can't miss it. Oh, I wish we could cancel. Oh, now, don't worry. Everything will be fine. And don't forget, I'll be sitting with Rodney. But I really came over to tell you what my sister says about his handwriting. Oh, yes, what? Well, she couldn't be as thorough as she usually is because the letters are printed, not written. Yes. Of course, I didn't tell her a thing about who Rodney is. Uh, she didn't even know he was a child. What did she say? Now, this is so curious. She said she got the impression, just the feeling, mind you, that the person was a very old man. An old man? Now, she admitted it was just a feeling. But, but, but an old man? What did she say when you told her Rodney is only 12? Uh, she looked rather strange and said, I'd never have guessed it. Hi, hi. Couldn't stay in bed another minute. Oh, how are you feeling, Mr. Carpenter? Uh, shaky, but okay. Hey, those look like Rodney's notes. They are, Ed. And Mrs. Nathanson's sister analyzed his handwriting. But she, she's an expert. Oh, you didn't tell me about this? Oh, well, she did it last night. I just brought them back. And what did she say? She thought that Rodney was an old man. What? Well, she couldn't tell much because the letters were printed. No. Mm -hmm. Did June uh, ask you about tonight, Mrs. Nathan? Oh, yes. Mm. I'm happy to come over. Oh, hey, I got to go downtown and see about the car. I'll be home around two. Please, drive carefully. Oh, I still feel uneasy with that child in this house. Well, he's troubled, and it's understandable. After all he's been through. But... Uh, Really, Mrs. Carpenter, I hardly think he's dangerous. Well, Mrs. Nathanson, we won't be late. That's all right. Enjoy yourselves. Heaven knows you deserve it. I wouldn't even go to this dinner dance at all with Rodney here, but as president of the club, I have to be there. Uh, you know the club number if you need us. Of course. But nothing is going to happen. If Rodney does come down, maybe he'd like a game of checkers. Don't have to talk to play that. Let's go, Joan. Well, goodbye, and relax. Everything's going to be all right here. Oh, help yourself to anything in the refrigerator. Uh, there's a fresh cream pie and coffee's in the pot. Oh, thank you. Have fun. <laughs> That pie does look... Oh. oh, you startled me. You... You're Rodney. Well, I, I... I'm glad to meet you at last. I'm Mrs. Nathanson. You're just in time for some delicious cream pie. Uh, you, you don't want any. Oh, I'm surprised. I thought all 12-year-old boys had an empty pit. I... I I wish you, you wouldn't stare at me like that. Uh, you're... 
You're going to... You're going to uh, write something? Oh, uh, uh, good. Uh, let's see. Uh, do I like butterflies? Oh, why, yes. I think they're very beautiful. Uh, oh, a another note. Would I like to see your collection? Oh, I'd love to, Rodney. How many do you have? Oh, it's upstairs. Okay. <laughs> Lead the way. So this is your room, Rodney. It's very nice. Oh, but it's my so hot and stuffy. Oh, dear me, let's open a window. It, it's midsummer and you have all the windows closed. There, that's better. Now, ah, let's see your butterflies. Well, aren't you going to show me your collection? Rodney, won't... Why are you staring like that? Rodney, don't come any closer to me. I don't like it. Rodney, what's the matter with you? Rodney! As I said at the start of our excursion into the macabre, babysitting can be an experience of chilling proportions. Rodney is indeed a handful. And he still has two more days to spend with the carpenters. Frankly, I'd take him over my knee and give him what he deserves. We'll find out what else Rodney is up to when I return shortly with Act Three. The Carpenter Household, once so quiet and serene hasn't been the same since Rodney arrived. The carpenters expected that the routine of their lives would change when they agreed to take care of the child for a week, but never in their wildest dreams did they imagine just how drastic the change would be. At the moment, they're trying to enjoy the dinner dance at the club without much success. Edgar, c can't we leave? I'll only be another hour. What's going to happen? I don't know. I... I just would feel better if we were back home. I call if it'll make you feel better. Talk to Mrs. Nathanson. I think I will. Uh, but do you think I should, well, warn her? Now, don't scare the poor woman. Rodney's certainly not going to threaten her. I'll be back in a minute. Uh, who's this? Well, who is this? Oh, excuse me. I, I must have the wrong number. Now, wait a minute, ma'am. Who, who did you want? The carpenter residence. Uh, Mrs. Nathanson. Who are you? I have to know who you are, ma'am. Well, I'm Mrs. Carpenter. Mrs. Nathanson is babysitting for me. Oh, oh. Uh, I'm police, Mrs. Carpenter. Police? Officer Dugan. What is it? Good Lord, what's happened? An accident, Mrs. Carpenter. Can you come right away? Yes, 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 right away. I can't believe it. Mrs. Nathanson. A neighbor out for a walk saw the body lying next to the house. We, we think she fell from the upper window. Rodney's room. We haven't been able to get a word out of the boy. I'm glad you're here. If only we'd stayed home. The boy doesn't talk, officer. Doesn't talk? He's your son? No, 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 no. He's he's my brother's ward, temporarily. We're taking care of him for a week. Well, you think we can get anything out of him? We'll try, but he's a strange kid. We'll need a pad and a pencil. Oh, I got it right here. Ronnie, you've got to answer some questions. What happened to Mrs. Nathanson? He's shaking his head no. Yes, you do know, Rodney. You were here with Mrs. Nathanson. She was found on the ground outside your bedroom window. Now, what happened? Answer me. Yeah, the kid's frightened, and it's getting late. Uh, put him to bed. We'll try to talk to him in the morning. Okay, okay. Go to bed, Rodney. I'll take him up. Well, there'll, there'll be an autopsy. It'll probably show she died of injuries from the fall. I... 
I hope that kid can tell us what happened. Ed. Mm. Ed, what? wake up. Huh? What is, what's the matter? Ed Rodney's just gone downstairs. What time is it? Uh, four o'clock. Well, I'll get up and see what the kid's up to. Rodney? I'll come with you. Rodney, where are you? He can't answer. We'll have to find him. I don't trust that kid wandering around the house. You know, he's liable to come at us with a butcher's knife. Ed. Oh, the front door. He went out. Turn on the light. Why would he be going outside? Rodney! Get in here. Can you see him? No. He might be running away. Huh. We should be so lucky. Uh, Ronnie, we know you're out here. Now, come on in. Right now. I don't like this. I, I'm getting frightened. You go in. You're cold. Uh, I'll find him. I, I, I don't want to be alone. She could be hiding anywhere. You... Shrubs or... Front door. The little devil tricked us. He doubled back inside. Come on. What's he trying to do to us? Ronnie! Ronnie, come here. Right here, right now. Oh, this is giving me the willies. He's deliberately trying to bait us. I'm not going back to bed until I know where he is. Well, we know he's in the house. Do we? And we heard the front door slam when we were outside. That's all we heard. How do we know he actually came in? Well, when you put it that way, how do we know he actually went out? But why is he doing this? Because he's a malicious brat. That's why. We're not playing into his hands anymore. It's ridiculous to be terrorized by a 12-year-old. I keep thinking about Mrs. Nathanson. Oh, this whole night's been one horror. Well, Rodney knows damn well what happened, but how do we get it out of him? But what can we do? We're going back upstairs. I couldn't sleep if my life depended on it. Yeah, well, it won't. <laughs> I don't know what he's up to, but there's nothing he can do to us. Look, I'm I'm not looking for him anymore. Oh, it's starting to get light. Might as well get dressed. <laughs> the police will be back later this morning. And if Rodney's not here, I don't give a damn. Ed. His door's closed. There's no way it could be. <gasps> oh, but he, he's in bed. Hello? Ed, it's George. How's it going? Huh, you should ask. Where are you? In New York. Flew in last night. Brought a visitor from England back with us. Listen, how'd you get along with Rodney? Why didn't you tell me he was a little fiend? What do you mean? Well, he never said a word the whole week. Oh, I know, I know. He writes notes to us, too. That's only half of it. Well, anything happened to you? Yeah, we had a tragedy. Our neighbor was sitting with Rodney when, uh, when we went to the club. She fell out the bedroom window. What? And our cat died. Sylvester? Hey! You have had a week. Yeah, and it all happened with Rodney here. Come on, he's just a kid. You don't think... I can't get into it now, George, but the the minute he gets off that plane, find someplace else for him. Ed, what's the matter with I'm you? I'm telling you, the minute he gets off that plane, take him to some welfare agency or whatever. Sure, Ed, sure. You put him on the plane tomorrow. It's flight 704. With the greatest pleasure. Okay. I'll meet him at this end. You're welcome to him. I'm sorry you think he caused you so much trouble. Anyway, I appreciate you taking care of him. I owe you one, Ed. Forget it. I'm trying to. Okay. I'll meet him at Kennedy tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, George. Bye. Oh. Rodney. I didn't hear you. You're going back tomorrow. You want to know something, kid? I still think you pushed Mrs. Nathanson out the window. 
And I still think you had something to do with the cat. <laughs> no response, huh? I can't prove it. I wish I could. Come here. Closer. Yeah, June's right. There isn't anything behind those eyes of yours. What are you? Well, I don't mind telling you, kid. I'll be glad to see you off tomorrow. But I can't find Rodney. We've got to leave in ten minutes. No, oh, it's another one of his tricks. Like Thursday night. If it's the last thing I do, I'll get him on that plane. Now maybe he's afraid to go back. Oh, he's not afraid of anything. I'll put his stuff in the car. We'll find him. After all that's happened, I still feel kind of sorry. He seems such a lost little boy. Lost my foot. Oh. Why, there he is. He's sitting in the car. I never thought of looking there. Good. He's as anxious to get out of here as we are to see him go. Okay, Ronnie. You're on your way. By Rodney. <laughs> I had to see that plane in the sky before I'd leave. Now let's go home. That's funny. There's a note on the back seat. I, I didn't see it when we took his stuff out. A note? I can reach it. I can't imagine when he put it there. What's it say? Goodbye. It was. Goodbye. It was? But well, he must have meant to finish the sentence like well, it was nice or, or it was awful. Just goodbye and it was? Yep, that's it. Well, that's the last of them anyway. I wish I knew what he was going to add. You know, maybe he was trying to thank us after all. <laughs> Bad chance of that. It would have been something sinister. You can bet on that. I'm still sick over Mrs. Nathanson. We have to go to her funeral this afternoon. I know. What the... Ed, you went right through that red light. The brakes are gone. I'm down to the floor. Well, what? I'll try to gear down. Stop, Ed. Stop. Stop. I... That truck's coming right on through. I can't. Ah! I'm glad you could come to the airport with me, Mrs. Parker. Helen hates the trip. Oh. Well, I'm here to see New York. I want to see as much as I can. Passengers are coming through the gate now. There, there he is. Hey, Rodney. Over here, Rodney. Oh, rather a pale young lad, isn't he? Well, I feel sorry for him. I hope they find him a good home soon. His parents were killed in a car accident. Oh. He was living with his grandmother until she died from a fall. How tragic. And it's nice of you and your wife to take him in. Rodney, I want you to meet Mrs. Parker. She's from England, and she's staying with us for a while. How do you do, Rodney? She'll be sharing your room with you. She... Oh, you don't have to be embarrassed. Mrs. Parker has grandchildren older than you. <laughs> Just think of me as a grandmother. I'm sure we'll be good friends. Won't we, Rodney? Oh, I think so, Mrs. Parker. You're going to like Rodney. Well, I certainly don't. I've been thinking over that last curious note Rodney left the carpenters, Ed and June. Just goodbye, and it was. Too bad they didn't realize in time just before their deaths in that terrible crash. Ed had said he'd get Rodney on the plane if it was the last thing he did. Now we know Rodney's cryptic reply. It was. More about Rodney when I return in just a moment. Who is Rodney? The bad seed? A bad boy who can't help himself? 
or perhaps a demon from another time, destined to spend eternity causing identical tragedies wherever he goes. The empty eyes, the extra strength, and that curious mistake of Mrs. Nathanson's sister, thinking he was very old. Or was it a mistake? We can only speculate. Our cast included Patricia Elliott, Tony Roberts, Bryna Rayburn, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Greetings of the season. I hope you like the tree. I put up a bit of holly, too. And mistletoe, of course, right there over the door. There are so many things to enjoy at this time of year. The warm, friendly spirit, that's most important. The time to be with family and friends. There'll be a lot of holiday traffic, too, as people make the rounds of visits or travelers are making their way back home. On a lonely road in Ohio, two such travelers are about to have the most harrowing experience of their lives. Snow is getting heavier, Skip. I wish you'd slow down. Our mystery drama, A Holiday Visit, was written especially for Radio Mystery Theater by Bob Juren and stars Lloyd Batista and Diana Kirkwood. What are your plans for the Christmas holidays? Entertain friends or relatives? Going home to visit parents, perhaps? This is always get-together time. A time when people go home home to the families they've left behind as they've made their own way in the world. Joan Bartram made her way from a small town in Ohio to New York, where she worked for a while as a secretary, and then married Skip Bartram, an oil company executive. She hadn't been back to her home in Ohio in 12 years, so it was a particular thrill for Joan when Skip came home one night and said, How'd you like to go home for the holidays? <sighs> See your folks. Oh, oh Skip, I I'd love it. But can we afford it? Well, the company's sending me to Toledo for a new training program right after the holidays. So the trip is on now. Oh. We'll just leave a little early and be with your folks for Christmas. Oh, what a surprise. Oh, I'm going to call Mother this minute. You don't want to just drop in on them and make it a surprise? And have them fade away? No, no. I want to give them something to look forward to. Oh, well, maybe you're right. Oh, it's been 12 years since I've been home. And you've never... Hello? Hello, Mother? Oh, Joan! How are you? Just fine, dear. Mother? Mother, are you sitting down? No. Why? Listen, Mother. Get Dad over to the phone. I want him to hear my news. Henry, come here. Joan, are you pregnant? Oh, no, Mother. All right, dear. Your father's listening. I'm coming home for Christmas. Coming home? Yes. 
Yes, Skip has to be in Toledo after the holidays, so we're leaving early. In time to be with you for Christmas. That's the best news I've had all day. Joan, I... Your mother's doing her thing. She's... She's starting to cry. And so am I. I have to hang up now. I'll let you know when we'll arrive. Okay, darling. We'll be waiting. When can we leave? Well, I'd like to get away by Saturday. We'll have to drive. I'll need the car in Toledo. Let's see, we ought to get to Runyonville by, well, the 23rd. The map uh, shows the end of the interstate. What do we do when we turn off? Um, let's see. Uh, we go north on 84, it looks like. Yes, yes, north on 84 to Hamilton, then 42A to Blue Mountain... And we keep on that to Williamsville. Oh, I don't know. It looks as though the interstate keeps on going. Well, look there. Yeah, uh, according to the map, though, there's a proposed extension. Well, it's been finished since the map came out, I guess. What if we stayed on this? Oh, well, we'd go straight to Runyonville. It looks as though we'd save about, um, about 20 miles, too. <laughs> so we're in luck. We'll stay on it. It looks as though, well... We may be at your folks a lot sooner than we thought. Oh, it's, it's starting to snow. Oh, we're going to have a white Christmas. Well, I hope it doesn't get too thick before we hit your folks' place. Hey, Skip, how far have we come on this highway? Oh, about 40 miles. Have have you noticed anything strange? Oh, uh, you're thinking the same thing I am. Hmm. There hasn't been a sign or a turn-off since we got on this road. Yeah, I noticed that. And come to think of it, I, I don't remember seeing any cars passing us in either direction. Doesn't seem natural. <laughs> well, if this road's going anywhere, they're keeping it a secret. But I'm getting a little uneasy. Maybe we ought to turn back and take Route 84 like we planned. Oh, I hate to do that after we've come this far. Now, this road's got to come out someplace. I see we've got about an hour before dark. And the snow is getting heavier. I, I wish you'd slow down. I hope we make it before dark. I don't want to get stranded in this. Oh, oh. Oh, 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 no. oh Skip, Skip, what's the matter? We're skidding. I can't control it. Oh, yeah, Skip, do something. Oh, we're sliding. I'm into doing the... all I can. <laughs> Put any more tinsel on the tree, Harriet, and it's going to topple over. <laughs> I don't see how you can sit there so relaxed. Why are you so nervous? The children said they'd be here sometime today or tomorrow. They should have been here by now. Only because you think they should be. If anything was wrong, they'd call. You know that. Oh, you're right. I'm just so excited about having our Joan home for Christmas. I, I can't relax. Well, I think I'll take a stroll in the snow. Need anything from downtown? No, dear. I've had everything in for days. I just wish they'd get here. They will, Harriet. They will. Now, you stop worrying. Worrying isn't going to get them here any sooner. <laughs> Joan. Joan, are you all right? Well, what happened? Oh, can, can you straighten up? Oh, well, my leg's caught. Oh, here, here, let me see. Uh, try, try twisting it a little bit this way. Oh, oh. oh there. Oh. There, it's free. Oh. How do you feel, huh? Dizzy. Oh, we crashed into the boulders. Oh, can we... Oh, uh, will the car move? Oh, pray. Oh. Oh, thank heaven. Oh, if I can back her off. Yep, I, be I better get out and take a look. Oh. Um, oh, that does it. What's the matter? Uh, two flat tires. Oh, no. And only one spare, naturally. Oh, dear Lord, what are we going to do? 
We're miles from anywhere. Well, at least the snow's letting up a bit. <clears throat> oh, we can't just sit here on this... this ghost road. Oh, well, where will we walk? Hey, Skip, look. A light. Oh, yeah. Oh, about half a mile away, I'd say. It must be a town. Hey, do you think you can make it on that leg? Oh, yes, yes. I'd hop on one foot to get out of here. Well, we can phone your folks. Tom will be a little delayed. We can probably get the car towed in. Well, it looks like we'll have to stay till morning. Well, maybe Dad can come pick us up. We can't be far from Runyonville. We can pick up the car tomorrow or the next day. Oh, that's Christmas Day. Oh, that's right. Hey, what are we sitting here chatting for? Come on, come on, let's move. It's so quiet. No cars on the street at all. Oh, storm must have sent them all home, I guess. Well, let's try that grocery store. They're sure to have a phone. Well, they can tell us where to find a garage, too. At least we can get the car off the road for the night. here? It's so dim. One bare bulb. Well, pretty skimpy merchandise, too. Hello? Wow. Whew, place seems deserted. Yeah. I don't see any payphone. Or any phone, for that matter. Hello? Anybody here? Oh, well, we'll, we'll go someplace else, sir. Got to be a restaurant or a tavern in this town. Hey, come on. Oh, I I know this isn't Runyonville. Oh, I hope not. Looks like a quaint little place, but awfully deserted. Boy, they must pull the sidewalks in at five in the afternoon. Oh, look, the, <sighs> the sky's clear. Oh, look at those stars. Wow, I haven't seen them that bright in a long time. There, there don't seem to be many stores. Mostly houses. Well, we're not on the main drag. Maybe we better go ask directions at that house there. No sense wandering around a strange town. Yeah, I, I guess we should. I'm sure they'll let us use their phone. I'll, I'll call Dad Collect. Hey, listen. Hear that? where everyone must be. Well, come on. Let's see if we can find them. Oh. Well, I give up. I don't know where that music's coming from. We've covered so many streets and nothing. Yeah, no one. Oh, hey, honey, you're shivering. No, I'm, I'm scared. Well, there's a hotel across the street. There. Let's go there and use the phone. There's got to be one there. This is a ghost town. There's no use wandering about anymore. It's a ghost town in the middle of Ohio. I wonder. You know, you might be right. It could be one of those um, restorations. An antique village. And if it is one, then there's got to be somebody around. A caretaker or a watchman or someone. Let's try the hotel. Yes. The hotel is just as deserted as everything else. And still no phone. Oh, I wish I had that CB radio Paul offered me. I always thought they were a nuisance, but that sure would have gotten us out of this mess. Hey, come on, come on. Uh, let's look around upstairs. Every room's empty. Not a stick of furniture anywhere. Yeah, that's about what I expected. What was that? Oh, it, it sounded like something hitting the roof. Oh, Skip, let's let's go back to the car. I'm too frightened to stay here. This 
place is just too spooky. Yeah, come on, you don't believe in ghosts. It's not ghosts I'm afraid of. There's another one. Well, you something sailed past the window and landed on the ground. I'm going down and take a look around. I'll come with you. I'm not staying in here alone. <laughs> There's nothing out here uh, except a couple of green logs. Over there, see them? Green logs? Yeah. A moss covered. Looks like they've been laying there for years. But, Skip, there's no snow on them. If they've been laying there for years, they'd be covered with snow. You think that's what hit the hotel? Well, I mean, logs this big don't just fall out of the sky. Just take me back to the car. No, no, honey, there's no sense getting panicky. We're alone in this town or amusement park or whatever it is, and at least there's shelter. We'll stay here for the night, and we'll just try to get to civilization in the morning. You want to stay here? We might be murdered in our sleep, as if I could sleep. Well, dear heart, there's nothing else we can do. I mean, sleeping in the car is foolish when we're... Uh-oh. The lights. Every light went out. Well, that settles it. We're not going anywhere now. But the whole town's out. There's not a light anywhere. Yeah. It seems to be clouded over, too. See, the stars are gone. Yeah. Come on. Come on, let's go back inside. We'll be safe in there. <laughs> we'll curl up in the lobby furniture and try to sleep. Uh, I won't shut an eye, wondering who or what turned off those lights. To paraphrase a popular joke, where were Skip and Joan when the lights went out? Not only in the dark but in a strange Midwestern village. And just two days before Christmas, a time when they should have been enjoying the warmth of a friendly fireside, the pleasure of holiday decorations, the music of a Christmas carol, things that most of us are enjoying these days. But for them, isolation in a cold and darkened hotel. We'll learn what this curious town holds in store for them when I return shortly with Act Two. from face the prospect of spending the night in a deserted hotel in a strange and darkened town. A town apparently without inhabitants. Could it be a restoration of some kind? A sort of Midwestern Williamsburg? Under normal circumstances, it might be a lovely place to spend the Christmas holiday. But Skip and Joan are anxious to get to her parents' home and friendly family warmth. They spent the night in the sparsely furnished lobby of the hotel. And now, it's morning. Skip. Skip. Huh? Wake up, honey. Oh. It's daylight. Oh. oh, my aching back. Oh, that's the hardest couch in the world. Uh, I didn't sleep all night. Come, come outside. I, I want to show you something. Oh, no. Can't you bring it in here? Oh, stop being silly. There are footprints in the snow, and they're not ours. Footprints? Yeah, look out the side window there. Yeah. Yeah, they go around the back of the hotel. Well, that means somebody's around here. Come on. Oh, they're, they're small prints. It must be a child or a woman. Well, they lead toward that barn. It's funny, I, I didn't hear or see anyone. I was awake all night. Well, there aren't any prints leading away from the barn. So whoever made them is still in there. It's so quiet. Not a sign of life anywhere. Well, let's go in. It's not like a private house. Anybody here? 
Well, it's so dark and dingy, Skip. Skip, let's go back out. I don't like this. Well, somebody's got to be here. I mean, the footsteps stopped at the door. Then why won't they answer us? Hey, listen. Well, that was somebody's up in the loft. They're coming down those stairs. Who's down there? Oh, good good morning, ma'am. We're looking for someone to help us. Mercy. Where did you come from? Well, we had an accident with our car last night. We skidded into an embankment. Oh, my word. We, we found the whole town deserted, so we spent the night in the hotel. Oh, how curious. There aren't any beds in that hotel, you know. We sat, or rather stayed, in the lobby. I'm Skip Bartram, and this is my wife, Joan. We were wondering... Oh, please, to meet you. I'm Mrs. McKinney. Well, we were wondering if this is some sort of uh, a restoration. I mean, there were lights on last night. And... and we heard Christmas carols. Oh, yes. Isn't the music lovely? What do you mean by a restoration? This is Taylor Town. But there's no one living here. You're the only person we've seen since last night. Yes, they've all gone. Each season, a few more left. My husband went last year. I'm the last one here. You live here all alone? All alone in, in a deserted town? It's my home. Uh, well, uh, could we uh, use your phone, Mrs. McGinnis? Joan wants to call her dad to pick us up. and Well, I've got to get a tow truck for the car. Oh, mercy me. There's no garage or tow truck. Oh, but there's a pay phone at the railroad station. We never had phones in any of the houses. And just wait till I finish upstairs and I'll show you where it is. I don't know if it works, though. I think it's just there for effect. I wonder what she meant by that. Well, who knows? I, I just feel better now that we've met another human being. She seems friendly enough. But a little strange, don't you think? Well, naturally, <laughs> living alone in a dead town. A ghost town. I wonder how long she'll be. But we could find that railroad station ourselves. Oh, let her be hospitable. A few minutes won't matter. Uh, Mrs. McGinnis? Mr. McGinnis, are you almost finished? That's strange. Well, I'll see. H has something happened to her? Mrs. McGinnis? Skip, what's the matter? Well, she's not here. The loft's absolutely empty. <laughs> no way she could have gotten out of that barn. Oh, the, there are no windows in that loft. Well, she did. Unless we just imagined we saw and talked with her. No, no, she was there all right. She, she just gave us the slip somehow. Oh, look, there's the railroad station. Oh, pray that that phone works. Well, I'm not counting on it, but, well, it's worth a try. It looks like one of Bell's first pay phones. Uh, Skip, have you got a dime? Yeah, I think so. Uh, here you are. Well, here goes. Well, so far, so good. Oh, I got a dial tone. Yeah, at least something works in this town. Well, it's only ten after nine. One of them's bound to be home. Ah, it's ringing. Yeah, they're probably looking out the windows, wondering where we are. Somebody on this line? Oh, Dad. Oh, Dad, thank heaven I reached you. Who is this? It's Joan, Dad. Joan? I can hardly hear you. Speak up. Dad, it's Joan. We've had an accident with the car. You have to pick us up. Where are you? Well, you have to talk louder. A place called... Taylor Town. It's practically a ghost town. Do you know where it is? 
Taylor Town? Look, we'll wait for you in front of the hotel. How long will it take you? Uh, well, it's uh, ten after nine now. About one hour. Oh, we'll be here. Oh, I can't wait to see you, Dad. Dad? Dad? Oh, the line's dead. What's the matter? You look concerned. But Dad sounded so funny. I, I expected more of a, a reaction. He was so matter-of-fact. He didn't ask for details or anything. Oh, I'm sure he figured he'd find out the details when he picks us up. Mm, yes, I suppose. You know, dear, I have the strange feeling I know this village. Well, not the village so much, but, but the houses. The houses look so familiar. Well, a lot of small Midwestern towns have that turn-of-the-century look. I guess so. We used to go shopping in, in Fairmont, and it was full of the same big houses we had in Runyonville. You know, with porches around the whole front and little filigrees under the eaves. <laughs> like that place on the corner. Exactly. And look who's on the porch. <gasps> Mrs. McKinnis. Hello, dear. Well, where did you come from? I don't get many visitors anymore. We wondered where you went. Where I went? Why, I've been here all morning. Sweeping the snow, you know, got to get it off the porch before it freezes. Well, what brings you to Taylor Town? Skip, she doesn't remember us. Uh, uh, Mrs. McGinnis, we met and you. you know my name. Mercy, who are you? Mrs. McGinnis, we... We met you at the barn this morning, and you said... The barn, you say? Oh, there's a nice one behind the hotel. Want to come in for some hot coffee? Takes the chill off. Yeah, thanks, we'd like that. Well, come along in, then. I'll heat up the pot. Yes, I don't know. Well, what harm can it do? Look, we, we've got at least an hour to wait for your dad. We might as well spend it in a cozy kitchen. Yeah, I guess you're right. Come out to the kitchen. Hot coffee in a minute with some fresh scones I made myself. She keeps a neat house. And so, you know, old-fashioned. It's lovely. Yeah, oh. a pretty start. <sighs> Come in and sit down at the kitchen table. I don't have much, as you can see, but there's always something to share. You're planning on moving here, you said. Uh, no, Mrs. McGinnis. Uh, we told you we had an accident with our car. Oh, that's too bad. But I just called my father. He's coming to pick us up. You, you called your father? Yes, just now. On the phone at, at the railroad station. Oh, mercy, that is a miracle. I didn't know that phone ever worked. And we're happy to enjoy your hospitality while we're waiting. We still can't understand why there's no one else in town. You live here all alone? It's my home. Oh, it's not bad living alone. I get by. Yeah, we thought it was some sort of restoration. I don't know what a restoration is. A restoration is an old town or house that's been restored to look the way it did years ago. Oh, this town's looked like this from the beginning, ever since it came from Scotland. The town came over from Scotland? It's an exact duplicate of Taylor Town in Scotland. The streets and the houses... And all the furnishings came from Scotland. Oh, mercy, don't ask me how long ago. Then you were born here. I guess so. You guess so? Well, I've never been anywhere else. Oh, you're not eating the scones. Uh, I guess we'd better get over to the hotel and wait for Dad. Thank you so much for your hospitality, Mrs. McGinnis. Oh, I'll come along. I'd like to see a modern automobile. I'll just get my shawl. It won't be a minute. She shouldn't be living alone like this. 
It's made her completely confused. Oh, I know. But, well, there's nothing we can do, though. And she kept offering us scones. And the plate was empty. Well, she's living in the past. Well, I wish she'd hurry. I, I don't want to miss Dad. Well, we've got lots of time. If he said an hour, well, we've only been here a few minutes. Oh, I, I wonder what's keeping Mrs. McGinnis. Look, why don't we just go on? She'll follow us. She knows where the hotel is. Well, Mrs. McGinnis? You about ready? Mrs. McGinnis? Oh, not again. Oh, talk about the Cheshire Cat. Come on. Let's get out of here. You want your eggs scrambled or fried this morning, Will? Well, fried is easier. Oh, I do hope we hear from the children soon. I'm getting awfully nervous. Oh, I thought they'd at least arrive last night. But not to call. It's not like Joan. Well, that just means there's nothing wrong, Harriet. If they'd had trouble, we'd have been the first to know. Something's not right. I just feel it. Well, it's ten after nine. If they're not here by noon, maybe I'll call the police. Oh, oh. I'll get it. Hello? Hello? Is it Joan? Well, there seems to be a voice, but I can't make it out. Joan? Oh, it's a bad connection. I don't know if it's Joan or not. Oh, dear. Hello? 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 Uh, It's no use. Whoever it was will have to call back. We'll just have to wait. Be frightened. I wasn't before, but now, now I really am. There's something evil here. I mean, no people except that crazy Mrs. McGinnis. But your dad's on the way, huh? I wonder. It's been two hours now. Well, maybe he had trouble. At least he knows where we are. Doesn't he? How do I know? All we do is, is ask each other silly questions. I'm cold and I'm tired and I'm hungry. Joan, Joan. We may just die here. Don't you realize that? We may just die here. (laughs) Stop it. Oh, I'm sorry, hon. I had to stop you. I'll I'll get control of myself. I'm I'm, I'm sorry. We'll, We'll just have to wait. waiting in Taylortown, expecting her father to pick them up any minute. But Joan's father, as we now know, didn't get the call. And he and his wife are waiting to hear from Joan. It looks as though Skip and Joan won't be with her folks for Christmas after all. Or at all, for that matter. We'll just have to wait to see how it turns out when I return shortly with Act Three. After encountering the elusive Mrs. McInnes for a second time, Skip and Joan have gone to the hotel to wait for Joan's father. It's a cold December afternoon, and it's been a long wait. What time is it? Uh, Ten after two. I'm going to phone home again. Maybe there's a reason Dad was delayed. And after that, I'm going to call the state police. I, I should have thought of it before. We're in a real emergency here. They'll tow us out. Come on. But suppose Dad comes after we've gone. We'll ask Mrs. McGinnis to watch for him. Mrs. McGinnis? Mrs. Houdini, you mean. I wouldn't trust her to give Dad a message. Uh, Well, we're getting out of here as fast as we can. Your father or the police, 
Whichever comes first. Okay. Okay, here, try your folks again. It's dead. There's no dial tone. Nothing makes sense in this place. Well, it's no use. It's as dead as... Hands up! Hands up! Stay right where you are! She's got a gun! You better be taking off! Mrs. McGinnis, why the gun? How'd you know my name? A lucky guess. Why are you pointing that gun at us? I want you out of here now. I don't trust strangers. Mrs. McGinnis, you were so hospitable to us before. Why are you... Before? I've never seen you before in my life. Now get out of here. Start walking. Where to? To wherever you come from. I don't allow strangers here. This is a nightmare. You don't scare us. Because I know in a couple of minutes you're going to disappear. What are you talking about? You've been popping up and vanishing all morning. In a few minutes you'll just disappear, poof. So we are waiting right here. Oh, oh, come on, Joan, she means it. But where can we go? Back to the car. She would really shoot us. She couldn't. Keep going. We're not taking chances with that crazy old woman. But we'll freeze out here and Dad won't find us. You'll have to pass the car on the highway. Nothing makes any sense here. Yep, look back. You were right. She's gone. Well, we'll be okay here. The motor works. I'll just turn on the heater. Come on, hop in. Oh, there's there's more damage than I thought. The whole front end's caved in. What a Christmas this has turned out to be. Oh, honey, we'll get out of this. Yeah, let me get the heater going. We might as well get some holiday spirit if the radio still works. Oh, I am so bush. Mm, well, you didn't sleep all night. And I didn't get much myself on that wooden couch. I hope Dad comes soon. Yeah. Yeah, we can't keep the motor running all day. Well, I hope Mrs. McGinnis doesn't show up again. Oh, no, she wouldn't follow us out here. But lock the doors anyway. Oh, I'm so sleepy. Hmm. Hey, you all right in there? Hey, you too. Huh? Huh? Who's that? What's the matter? Are you two okay? Oh, it, oh it's a state trooper. Oh, we, we fell asleep. Oh, oh, my leg. Oh, are we glad to see you. Anybody hurt? No. Oh, no, we, we must have dozed off. Dozed off and ran off the road. The helicopter spotted your car and called us. Oh, thank the Lord for that. How'd you get on this road? It's officially closed. Well, there weren't any signs about that. It connected with Interstate 40, and we just stayed on it. Had the bad luck to skid into boulders. This extension isn't due to open until next summer. Where are you heading? Runyonville. My parents live there. We're going uh, home for the holidays. Uh, you wouldn't have gotten there on this route. It ends about a hundred yards up ahead. I'll radio for a tow and get you folks to Runyonville. And when did you go off the road? Last night. You been here all night? Well, no. We went into Taylor Town. Taylor Town. Yeah, right up the road. But it's a ghost town, except for a crazy old woman who lives there. I. Uh, I better get you folks to the hospital first. Just a checkup. You know, possible concussion. Oh, no, no, no. We're all right. My wife's ankle was twisted, but once we got out of the car, she was okay. We do not need a hospital. You say you spent the night in a place called Taylor Town? Yes. There is no Taylor Town around here. I've lived here all my life. And there just isn't any place called Taylor Town. But right up the road. Look for yourself. We were there all night. 
I'm sorry, ma'am. Uh, maybe you better look. <gasps> oh. There's nothing there. There's no village at all. No, ma'am. The road ends at that vacant field. Not a town as far as you can see. How are they, Doctor? Well, no sign of concussion at all. No injuries except abrasions on the woman's ankle. Yeah, well, what about that story about spending the night in a village called Taylor Town? Uh, hard to say. Huh, maybe they did. Oh, they must have imagined it. Yeah, they show no signs of exposure. They only think they were there through the night. They may have been on the road only a couple of hours. The helicopter spotted them two hours ago. They went to a village named Taylortown. They were hallucinating. Uh, hallucinations quite common in extreme circumstances. Mirages in the desert, man. Anxiety can produce them. Then you think they spent the night, like they said, in a village that isn't there? Well, they had an emotional experience. Physically, they're fine. I see no reason to keep them here. They're better off going home to the woman's parents. Will, they're here. A police car is driving up. We glad to see you. Oh, mother! We were just about to send the police out looking for you when you called from the hospital. Oh, well, I'm going to send that state trooper a whopping Christmas gift. I got his name and badge number. Skiff, it's so good to see you. Oh, again. same here. Thank heaven you're both okay. Come on in, everybody. No use standing here in the cold. What happened, Dad? We thought you were coming to pick us up in that place called Taylor Town. Uh, that's what puzzles me. We never heard from you. The phone rang early this morning, but no one was there. Oh, I know I had a bad connection, but I was sure I heard you say you'd meet us. You seemed to know where we were. You mentioned this Taylor town. There's no place like that around here. Where exactly were you? Oh, I've never heard of it either. But we were there. I know the trooper thought we were loony. Oh, I don't know what to say about all this. Why don't you both just relax? I've got a buffet all ready. We'll have cocktails and you can tell us all about it. That's a good idea. I'll get your suitcases up to the guest room. We had to leave all our gifts in the car, but they're towing it in tonight. So we'll have them in time for Christmas. No, they don't matter, dear. Having you here and safe is what's important. Now, you just relax and enjoy the tree while I get things ready. You must be famished. Oh, it's so good to be home again. And at Christmas time, everything's so pretty. And... Yeah. Ooh, that's some tree. I just love the decor. Skip. Look. What? Under the tree. Look, come closer. Oh. A little village set out under the tree. Cardboard houses. And look, look at the hotel. It's Taylor Town. Mother and Dad got this set when I was a child. I'd forgotten it. Every house, every street is just the way it was. The railroad station, the little store, and oh, Mrs. McKinnis's house. Uh, J Joan, wait a minute. We weren't... We couldn't have been there. That's what the trooper said. What happened to us? Oh, hey, I'm getting the chills. Look at those pine needles from the tree. Those are the green logs that hit the roof. I wonder... What? Mrs. McKinnis. Could she be... I... I think she disappeared for the last time. What should we tell Mother and Dad? I, I don't know. I, I think we've said enough. I don't know what happened to us last night, but... We better stop talking about it. 
I guess you're right. Uh, here are the orders. You can pour the wine, Will. A holiday toast, everybody. <laughs> I see you admiring the village under the tree. Oh, we haven't set it up for years. <laughs> we used to put it up regularly when Joan was a child. Lately, we've just had a table tree. Nah, but this year with you both coming, we went all out. Big tree, everything. Yes, yes, and it's lovely. <laughs> yes, the detail in those houses is exquisite, isn't it? Yes, yes, very... Uh, very realistic. It was imported from Scotland. It's been in my family for years. Well, here's to a wonderful holiday visit. Merry Christmas, everyone. If there were an explanation for everything, where would the magic in life be? I think we'd all lose interest if everything were cut and dried... Neatly packaged, just right. We need a bit of amazement now and then to soften the blow of reality. Skip and Joan left reality for a brief period, and it gave them something to remember all their lives. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>